I am that talks with Srinisargadad Maharaj by Morris Fridman. Chapter 1. The Sense of I Am. Questioner. It is a matter of daily experience that on waking up the world suddenly appears. Where does it come from? Maharaj, before anything can come into being there must be somebody to whom it comes. All appearance and disappearance presupposes a change against some changeless background. Question, before waking up I was unconscious. Maharaj, in what sense? Having forgotten or not having experienced. Don't you experience even when unconscious? Can you exist without knowing? A lapse in memory, is it a proof of non-existence? And can you validly talk about your own non-existence as an actual experience? You cannot even say that your mind did not exist. Did you not wake up on being called? And on waking up, was it not the sense I am that came first? Some seed consciousness, must be existing even during sleep or swoon. On waking up the experience runs, I am the body in the world. It may appear to arise in succession, but in fact it is all simultaneous, a single idea of having a body in a world. Can there be the sense of I am without being somebody or other? Question, I am always somebody with its memories and habits. I know no other I am. Maharaj, maybe something prevents you from knowing? When you do not know something which others know, what do you do? Question, I seek the source of their knowledge under their instruction. Maharaj, is it not important to you to know whether you are a mere body or something else? Or maybe nothing at all? Don't you see that all your problems are your body's problems, food, clothing, shelter, family, friends, name, fame, security, survival, all these lose their meaning the moment you realize that you may not be a mere body. Question, what benefit is there in knowing that I am not the body? Maharaj, even to say that you are not the body is not quite true. In a way you are all the bodies, hearts and minds and much more. Go deep into the sense of I am and you will find. How do you find a thing you have mislaid or forgotten? You keep it in your mind until you recall it. The sense of being of I am is the first to emerge. Ask yourself whence it comes or just watch it quietly. When the mind stays in that I am without moving, you enter a state which cannot be verbalized but can be experienced. All you need to do is try and try again. After all the sense I am is always with you, only you have attached all kinds of things to it body feelings, thoughts, ideas, possessions, etc. All these self-identifications are misleading. Because of them you take yourself to be what you are not. Question, then what am I? Maharaj, it is enough to know what you are not. You need not know what you are. For as long as knowledge means description in terms of what is already known, perceptual or conceptual, there can be no such thing as self-knowledge, for what you are cannot be described except as except as total negation. All you can say is, I am not this, I am not that. You cannot meaningfully say this is what I am. It just makes no sense. What you can point out as this or that cannot be yourself. Surely you cannot be something else. You are nothing perceivable or imaginable. Yet, without you there can be neither perception nor imagination. You observe the heart feeling, the mind thinking, the body acting, the very act of perceiving shows that you are not what you perceive. Can there be perception experience without you? An experience must belong. Somebody must come and declare it as his own. Without an experiencer the experience is not real. It is the experiencer that imparts reality to experience. An experience which you cannot have of what value is it to you? Question. The sense of being an experiencer, the sense of I am, is it not also an experience? Maharaj, obviously everything experienced is an experience. And in every experience there arises the experiencer of it. Memory creates the illusion of continuity. In reality each experience has its own experiencer and the sense of identity is due to the common factor at the root of all experiencer-experience relations. Identity and continuity are not the same. Just as each flower has its own color, 
but all colors are caused by the same light, so do many experiences appear in the undivided and indivisible awareness, each separate in memory, identical in essence. This essence is the root, the foundation, the timeless and spaceless possibility of all experience. Question, how do I get at it? Maharaj, you need not get at it for you are it. It will get at you if you give it a chance. Let go your attachment to the unreal and there I will swiftly and smoothly step into its own. Stop imagining yourself being or doing this or that and the realization that you are the source and heart of all will dawn upon you. With this will come great love which is not choice or predilection, nor attachment, but a power which makes all things love-worthy and lovable. Chapter 2. Obsession with the Body Questioner, Maharaj, you are sitting in front of me and I am here at your feet. What is the basic difference between us? Maharaj, there is no basic difference. Question, still there must be some real difference. I come to you, you do not come to me. Maharaj, because you imagine differences, you go here and there in search of superior people. Question, you too are a superior person. You claim to know the real while I do not. Maharaj, did I ever tell you that you do not know and therefore you are inferior? Let those who invented such distinctions prove them. I do not claim to know what you do not. In fact, I know much less than you do. Question, your words are wise, your behavior noble, your grace all-powerful. Maharaj, I know nothing about it all and see no difference between you and me. My life is a succession of events just like yours. Only I am detached and see the passing show as a passing show while you stick to things and move along with them. Question, what made you so dispassionate? Maharaj, nothing in particular. It so happened that I trusted my guru. He told me I am nothing but myself and I believed him. Trusting him, I behaved accordingly and ceased caring for what was not me nor mine. Question. Why were you lucky to trust your teacher fully, while our trust is nominal and verbal? Maharaj, who can say? It happens so. Things happen without cause and reason and after all, what does it matter, who is who? Your high opinion of me is your opinion only. Any moment you may change it. Why attach importance to opinions, even your own? Question, still, you are different. Your mind seems to be always quiet and happy and miracles happen round you. Maharaj, I know nothing about miracles, and I wonder whether nature admits exceptions to her laws, unless we agree that everything is a miracle. As to my mind, there is no such thing. There is consciousness in which everything happens. It is quite obvious and within the experience of everybody. You just do not look carefully enough. Look well and see what I see. Question, what do you see? Maharaj, I see what you two could see here and now, but for the wrong focus of your attention. You give no attention to yourself. Your mind is all with things, people and ideas, never with yourself. Bring yourself into focus, become aware of your own existence. See how you function, watch the motives and the results of your actions. Study the prison you have built around yourself by inadvertence. By knowing what you are not, you come to know yourself. The way back to yourself is through refusal and rejection. One thing is certain. The real is not imaginary, it is not a product of the mind. Even the sense I am is not continuous, though it is a useful pointer. It shows where to seek, but not what to seek. Just have a good look at it. Once you are convinced that you cannot say truthfully about yourself anything except I am, and that nothing that can be pointed at can be yourself, the need for the I am is over, you are no longer intent on verbalizing what you are. All you need is to get rid of the tendency to define yourself. All definitions apply to your body only and to its expressions. Once this obsession with the body goes, you will revert to your natural state spontaneously and effortlessly. The only difference between us is that I am aware of my natural state while you are bemused. Just like gold made into ornaments has no advantage over gold dust, except when the mind makes it so, so are we one in being, we differ only in appearance. 
We discover it by being earnest, by searching, inquiring, questioning daily and hourly, by giving one's life to this discovery. Chapter 3 The Living Present Questioner, as I can see there is nothing wrong with my body nor with my real being. Both are not of my making and need not be improved upon. What has gone wrong is the inner body, call it mind consciousness and tukarana, whatever the name. Maharaj, what do you consider to be wrong with your mind? Question, it is restless, greedy of the pleasant and afraid of the unpleasant. Maharaj, what is wrong with it seeking the pleasant and shirking the unpleasant? Between the banks of pain and pleasure the river of life flows. It is only when the mind refuses to flow with life and gets stuck at the banks that it becomes a problem. By flowing with life I mean acceptance, letting come what comes and go what goes. Desire not, fear not, observe the actual as and when it happens, for you are not what happens, you are to whom it happens. Ultimately even the observer you are not. You are the ultimate potentiality of which the all-embracing consciousness is the manifestation and expression. Question. Yet, between the body and the self there lies a cloud of thoughts and feelings, which neither serve the body nor the self. These thoughts and feelings are flimsy, transient and meaningless, mere mental dust that blinds and chokes, yet they are there, obscuring and destroying. Maharaj. Surely the memory of an event cannot pass for the event itself. Nor can the anticipation. There is something exceptional, unique about the present event, which the previous or the coming do not have. There is a livingness about it, an actuality. It stands out as if illuminated. There is the stamp of reality on the actual, which the past and the future do not have. Question, what gives the present that stamp of reality? Maharaj, there is nothing peculiar in the present event to make it different from the past and future. For a moment the past was actual and the future will become so. What makes the present so different? Obviously my presence. I am real for I am always now in the present and what is with me now shares in my reality. The past is in memory, the future in imagination. There is nothing in the present event itself that makes it stand out as real. It may be some simple periodical occurrence like the striking of the clock. In spite of our knowing that the successive strokes are identical, the present stroke is quite different from the previous one and the next as remembered or expected. A thing focused in the now is with me, for I am ever present. It is my own reality that I impart to the present event question, but we deal with things remembered as if they were real. Maharaj, we consider memories only when they come into the present. The forgotten is not counted until one is reminded which implies bringing into the now. Question, yes, I can see there is in the now some unknown factor that gives momentary reality to the transient actuality. Maharaj, you need not say it is unknown for you see it in constant operation. Since you were born, has it ever changed? Things and thoughts have been changing all the time. But the feeling that what is now is real has never changed, even in dream. Question. In deep sleep there is no experience of the present reality. Maharaj, the blankness of deep sleep is due entirely to the lack of specific memories. But a general memory of well-being is there. There is a difference in feeling when we say I was deeply asleep from I was absent. Question. We shall repeat the question we began with. Between life source and life's expression which is the body, there is the mind and its ever changeful states. The stream of mental states is endless, meaningless and painful. Pain is the constant factor. What we call pleasure is but a gap and interval between two painful states. Desire and fear are the weft and warp of living, and both are made of pain. Our question is, can there be a happy mind? Maharaj, desire is the memory of pleasure and fear is the memory of pain. Both make the mind restless. Moments of pleasure are merely gaps in the stream of pain. How can the mind be happy? Question, that is true when we desire pleasure or expect pain but there are moments of unexpected, unanticipated joy. 
pure joy uncontaminated by desire unsought, undeserved, God-given. Maharaj, still joy is joy only against a background of pain. Question, is pain a cosmic fact or purely mental? Maharaj, the universe is complete and where there is completeness where nothing lacks what can give pain? Question, the universe may be complete as a whole, but incomplete in details. Maharaj, a part of the whole seen in relation to the whole is also complete. Only when seen in isolation it becomes deficient and thus a seat of pain. What makes for isolation? Question, limitations of the mind of course. The mind cannot see the whole for the part. Maharaj, good enough. The mind by its very nature, divides and opposes. Can there be some other mind, which unites and harmonizes, which sees the whole in the part and the part is totally related to the whole? Question, the other mind where to look for it? Maharaj, in the going beyond the limiting, dividing and opposing mind. In ending the mental process as we know it. When this comes to an end, that mind is born. Question. In that mind the problem of joy and sorrow exist no longer? Maharaj, not as we know them as desirable or repugnant. It becomes rather a question of love seeking expression and meeting with obstacles. The inclusive mind is love in action, battling against circumstances, initially frustrated, ultimately victorious. Question, between the spirit and the body is it love that provides the bridge? Maharaj, what else? Mind creates the abyss, the heart crosses it. Chapter 4, Real World is Beyond the Mind. Questioner, on several occasions the question was raised as to whether the universe is subject to the law of causation, or does it exist and function outside the law? You seem to hold the view that it is uncaused, that everything, however small, is uncaused, arising and disappearing for no known reason whatsoever. Maharaj, causation means succession in time of events in space, the space being physical or mental. Time, space, causation are mental categories, arising and subsiding with the mind. Question, as long as the mind operates, causation is a valid law. Maharaj, like everything mental, the so-called law of causation contradicts itself. No thing in existence has a particular cause. The entire universe contributes to the existence of even the smallest thing. Nothing could be as it is without the universe being what it is. When the source and ground of everything is the only cause of everything, to speak of causality as a universal law is wrong. The universe is not bound by its content, because its potentialities are infinite. Besides, it is a manifestation or expression of a principle fundamentally and totally free. Question. Yes, one can see that ultimately to speak of one thing being the only cause of another thing is altogether wrong. Yet, in actual life we invariably initiate action with a view to a result. Maharaj, yes there is a lot of such activity going on because of ignorance. Would people know that nothing can happen unless the entire universe makes it happen, they would achieve much more with less expenditure of energy. Question. If everything is an expression of the totality of causes, how can we talk of a purposeful action towards an achievement? Maharaj, the very urge to achieve is also an expression of the total universe. It merely shows that the energy potential has risen at a particular point. It is the illusion of time that makes you talk of causality. When the past and the future are seen in the timeless now, as parts of a common pattern, the idea of cause effect loses its validity and creative freedom takes its place. Question. Yet, I cannot see how can anything come to be without a cause. Maharaj, when I say a thing is without a cause, I mean it can be without a particular cause. Your own mother was needed to give you birth, but you could not have been born without the sun and the earth. Even these could not have caused your birth without your own desire to be born. It is desire that gives birth, that gives name and form. The desirable is imagined and wanted and manifests itself as something tangible or conceivable. 
Thus is created the world in which we live, our personal world. The real world is beyond the mind's ken. We see it through the net of our desires, divided into pleasure and pain, right and wrong, inner and outer. To see the universe as it is, you must step beyond the net. It is not hard to do so for the net is full of holes. Question, what do you mean by holes? And how to find them? Meharaj, look at the net and its many contradictions. You do and undo at every step. You want peace, love, happiness and work hard to create pain, hatred and war. You want longevity and overeat, you want friendship and exploit. See your net is made of such contradictions and remove them, your very seeing them will make them go. Question, since my seeing the contradiction makes it go, is there no causal link between my seeing and its going? Maharaj, causality even as a concept does not apply to chaos. Question, to what extent is desire a causal factor? Maharaj, one of the many. For everything there are innumerable causal factors. But the source of all that is, is the infinite possibility, the supreme reality, which is in you and which throws its power and light and love on every experience. But this source is not a cause and no cause is a source. Because of that I say everything is uncaused. You may try to trace how a thing happens, but you cannot find out why a thing is as it is. A thing is as it is because the universe is as it is. Chapter 5 What is born must die. Questioner Is the witness consciousness permanent or not? Maharaj It is not permanent. The knower rises and sets with the known. That in which both the knower and the known arise and set is beyond time. The words permanent or eternal do not apply. Question In sleep there is neither the known nor the knower. What keeps the body sensitive and receptive? Maharaj, surely you cannot say the knower was absent. The experience of things and thoughts was not there, that is all. But the absence of experience too is experience. It is like entering a dark room and saying, I see nothing. A man blind from birth knows not what darkness means. Similarly only the knower knows that he does not know. Sleep is merely a lapse in memory. Life goes on. Question. And what is death? Maharaj, it is the change in the living process of a particular body. Integration ends and disintegration sets in. Question, but what about the knower? With the disappearance of the body, does the knower disappear? Maharaj, just as the knower of the body appears at birth, so he disappears at death. Question, and nothing remains. Maharaj, life remains. Consciousness needs a vehicle and an instrument for its manifestation. When life produces another body, another knower comes into being. Question. Is there a causal link between the successive body knowers or body minds? Maharaj. Yes, there is something that may be called the memory body or causal body, a record of all that was thought, wanted, and done. It is like a cloud of images held together. Question. What is this sense of a separate existence? Maharaj, it is a reflection in a separate body of the one reality. In this reflection the unlimited and the limited are confused and taken to be the same. To undo this confusion is the purpose of yoga. Question, does not death undo this confusion? Maharaj, in death only the body dies. Life does not, consciousness does not, reality does not and the life is never so alive as after death. Question, but does one get reborn? Maharaj, what was born must die. Only the unborn is deathless. Find what is it that never sleeps and never wakes, and whose pale reflection is our sense of I. Question, how am I to go about this finding out? Maharaj, how do you go about finding anything? By keeping your mind and heart in it. Interest there must be in steady remembrance. To remember what needs to be remembered is the secret of success. You come to it through earnestness. Question, do you mean to say that mere wanting to find out is enough? Surely both qualifications and opportunities are needed. Maharaj, these will come with earnestness. 
What is supremely important is to be free from contradictions. The goal and the way must not be on different levels. Life and light must not quarrel. Behavior must not betray belief. Call it honesty, integrity, wholeness. You must not go back, undo, uproot, abandon the conquered ground. Tenacity of purpose and honesty in pursuit will bring you to your goal. Question. Tenacity and honesty are endowments, surely. Not a trace of them I have. Maharaj, all will come as you go on. Take the first step first. All blessings come from within. Turn within. I am, you know. Be with it all time you can spare until you revert to it spontaneously. There is no simpler and easier way. Chapter 6 Meditation Questioner All teachers advise to meditate. What is the purpose of meditation? Maharaj, we know the outer world of sensations and actions, but of our inner world of thoughts and feelings we know very little. The primary purpose of meditation is to become conscious of and familiar with our inner life. The ultimate purpose is to reach the source of life and consciousness. Incidentally practice of meditation affects deeply our character. We are slaves to what we do not know, of what we know we are masters. Whatever vice or weakness in ourselves we discover and understand its causes and its workings, we overcome it by the very knowing. The unconscious dissolves when brought into the conscious. The dissolution of the unconscious releases energy. The mind feels adequate and become quiet. Question. What is the use of a quiet mind? Maharaj, when the mind is quiet we come to know ourselves as the pure witness. We withdraw from the experience and its experiencer and stand apart in pure awareness, which is between and beyond the two. The personality based on self-identification on imagining oneself to be something. I am this, I am that continues but only as a part of the objective world. Its identification with the witness snaps. Question, as I can make out, I live on many levels and life on each level requires energy. The self by its very nature delights in everything and its energies flow outwards. Is it not the purpose of meditation to dam up the energies on the higher levels, or to push them back and up, so as to enable the higher levels to prosper also? Maharaj, it is not so much the matter of levels as of guna's qualities. Meditation is a sattvic activity and aims at complete elimination of tamas inertia and raja's motivity. Pure sava harmony is perfect freedom from sloth and restlessness. Question, how to strengthen and purify the sattva? Meharaj, the sattva is pure and strong always. It is like the sun. It may seem obscured by clouds and dust, but only from the point of view of the perceiver. Deal with the causes of obscuration, not with the sun. Question, what is the use of sattva? Maharaj, what is the use of truth, goodness, harmony, beauty? They are their own goal. They manifest spontaneously and effortlessly when things are left to themselves, are not interfered with, not shunned or wanted or conceptualized, but just experienced in full awareness. Such awareness itself is sattva. It does not make use of things and people, it fulfills them. Question, since I cannot improve sava, am I to deal with tamas and rajas only? How can I deal with them? Maharaj, by watching their influence in you and on you. Be aware of them in operation, watch their expressions in your thoughts, words and deeds and gradually their grip on you will lessen and the clear light of sava will emerge. It is neither difficult nor a protracted process. Earnestness is the only condition of success. Chapter 7 The Mind Questioner There are very interesting books written by apparently very competent people in which the illusoriness of the world is denied though not its transitoriness. According to them, there exists a hierarchy of beings from the lowest to the highest. On each level the complexity of the organism enables and reflects the depth, breadth and intensity of consciousness without any visible or noble culmination. One law supreme rules throughout. Evolution of forms for the growth and enrichment of consciousness and manifestation of its infinite potentialities. 
Maharaj, this may or may not be so. Even if it is, it is only so from the mind's point of view, but in fact the entire universe Mahadakash exists only in consciousness Chittakash, while I have my stand in the absolute Paramakash. In pure being consciousness arises, in consciousness the world appears and disappears. All there is is me, all there is is mine. Before all beginnings, after all endings I am. All has its being in me, in thy am, that shines in every living being. Even not being is unthinkable without me. Whatever happens, I must be there to witness it. Question, why do you deny being to the world? Maharaj, I do not negate the world. I see it as appearing in consciousness, which is the totality of the known in the immensity of the unknown. What begins and ends is mere appearance. The world can be said to appear, but not to be. The appearance may last very long on some scale of time, and be very short on another, but ultimately it comes to the same. Whatever is time-bound is momentary and has no reality. Question. Surely you see the actual world as it surrounds you. You seem to behave quite normally. Maharaj, that is how it appears to you. What in your case occupies the entire field of consciousness is a mere speck in mine. The world lasts but for a moment. It is your memory that makes you think that the world continues. Myself, I don't live by memory. I see the world as it is, a momentary appearance in consciousness. Question, in your consciousness. Maharaj, all idea of me and mine, even if I am is in consciousness. Question, is then your absolute being paramakash unconsciousness? Maharaj, the idea of unconsciousness exists in consciousness only. Question, then, how do you know you are in the supreme state? Maharaj, because I am in it. It is the only natural state. Question, can you describe it? Maharaj, only by negation as uncaused, independent, unrelated, undivided, uncomposed, unshakable, unquestionable, unreachable by effort. Every positive definition is from memory and therefore inapplicable. And yet my state is supremely actual and therefore possible, realizable, attainable. Question. Are you not immersed timelessly in an abstraction? Maharaj, abstraction is mental and verbal and disappears in sleep or swoon. It reappears in time. I am in my own state swarupa timelessly in the now. Past and future are in mind only. I am now. Question. The world too is now. Maharaj, which world? Question. The world around us. Maharaj, it is your world you have in mind, not mine. What do you know of me when even my talk with you is in your world only? You have no reason to believe that my world is identical with yours. My world is real true as it is perceived while yours appears and disappears according to the state of your mind. Your world is something alien and you are afraid of it. My world is myself. I am at home. Question. If you are the world how can you be conscious of it? Is not the subject of consciousness different from its object? Maharaj, consciousness and the world appear and disappear together, hence they are two aspects of the same state. Question. In sleep I am not, and the world continues. Maharaj, how do you know? Question. On waking up I come to know. My memory tells me. Maharaj, memory is in the mind. The mind continues in sleep. Question. It is partly in abeyance. Maharaj, but its world picture is not affected. As long as the mind is there, your body and your world are there. Your world is mind made, subjective, enclosed within the mind, fragmentary, temporary, personal, hanging on the thread of memory. Question, so is yours. Maharaj, oh no. I live in a world of realities while yours is of imagination. Your world is personal, private, unshareable, intimately your own. Nobody can enter it, see as you see, hear as you hear, feel your emotions and think your thoughts. In your world you are truly alone, enclosed in your ever-changing dream which you take for life. My world is an open world, common to all, accessible to all. 
In my world there is community, insight, love, real quality. The individual is the total, the totality in the individual. All are one and the one is all. Question, is your world full of things and people as is mine? Meharaj, no it is full of myself. Question, but do you see and hear as we do? Maharaj, yes I appear to hear and see and talk and act, but to me it just happens as to you digestion or perspiration happens. The body mind machine looks after it, but leaves me out of it. Just as you do not need to worry about growing hair, so I need not worry about words and actions. They just happen and leave me unconcerned, for in my world nothing ever goes wrong. Chapter 8 The Self Stands Beyond Mind Questioner as a child fairly often I experience states of complete happiness, verging on ecstasy. Later they ceased but since I came to India they reappeared, particularly after I met you. Yet these states, however wonderful, are not lasting. They come and go and there is no knowing when they will come back. Maharaj, how can anything be steady in a mind which itself is not steady? Question, how can I make my mind steady? Maharaj, how can an unsteady mind make itself steady? Of course it cannot. It is the nature of the mind to roam about. All you can do is to shift the focus of consciousness beyond the mind. Question, how is it done? Maharaj, refuse all thoughts except one, the thought I am. The mind will rebel in the beginning, but with patience and perseverance it will yield and keep quiet. Once you are quiet, things will begin to happen spontaneously and quite naturally without any interference on your part. Question, can I avoid this protracted battle with my mind? Maharaj, yes you can. Just live your life as it comes, but alertly, watchfully, allowing everything to happen as it happens, doing the natural things the natural way, suffering, rejoicing, as life brings. This also is a way. Question, well then I can as well marry have children run a business be happy. Maharaj, sure. You may or may not be happy take it in your stride. Question, yet, I want happiness. Maharaj, true happiness cannot be found in things that change and pass away. Pleasure and pain alternate inexorably. Happiness comes from the self and can be found in the self only. Find your real self Swarupa and all else will come with it. Question. If my real self is peace and love, why is it so restless? Maharaj. It is not your real being that is restless, but its reflection in the mind appears restless because the mind is restless. It is just like the reflection of the moon in the water stirred by the wind. The wind of desire stirs the mind and the me, which is but a reflection of the self in the mind, appears changeful. But these ideas of movement, of restlessness, of pleasure and pain are all in the mind. The self stands beyond the mind, aware but unconcerned. Question, how to reach it? Maharaj, you are the self, here and now leave the mind alone, stand aware and unconcerned and you will realize that to stand alert but detached watching events come and go is an aspect of your real nature. Question, what are the other aspects? Maharaj, the aspects are infinite in number. Realize one and you will realize all. Question, tell me something that would help me. Maharaj, you know best what you need. Question. I am restless. How can I gain peace? Maharaj, for what do you need peace? Question, to be happy. Maharaj, are you not happy now? Question, no, I am not. Maharaj, what makes you unhappy? Question, I have what I don't want and what would I don't have? Maharaj, why don't you invert it? What would you have and care not for what you don't have? Question, I want what is pleasant and don't want what is painful. Maharaj, how do you know what is pleasant and what is not? Question, from past experience of course. Maharaj, guided by memory you have been pursuing the pleasant and shunning the unpleasant. Have you succeeded? Question, no I have not. The pleasant does not last. Pain sets in again. Maharaj, which pain? Question. The desire for pleasure, the fear of pain, both are states of distress. 
Is there a state of unalloyed pleasure? Maharaj, every pleasure physical or mental needs an instrument. Both the physical and mental instruments are material, they get tired and worn out. The pleasure they yield is necessarily limited in intensity and duration. Pain is the background of all your pleasures. You want them because you suffer. On the other hand, the very search for pleasure is the cause of pain. It is a vicious circle. Question, I can see the mechanism of my confusion, but I do not see my way out of it. Maharaj, the very examination of the mechanism shows the way. After all, your confusion is only in your mind, which never rebelled so far against confusion and never got to grips with it. It rebelled only against pain. Question, so all I can do is to stay confused? Maharaj, be alert. Question, observe, investigate, learn all you can about confusion, how it operates, what it does to you and others. By being clear about confusion, you become clear of confusion. Question, when I look into myself, I find my strongest desire is to create a monument, to build something which will outlast me. Even when I think of a home wife and child, it is because it is a lasting solid testimony to myself. Maharaj, write build yourself a monument. How do you propose to do it? Question, it matters little what I build as long as it is permanent. Maharaj, surely you can see for yourself that nothing is permanent. All wears out breaks down, dissolves. The very ground on which you build gives way. What can you build that will outlast all? Question. Intellectually, verbally, I am aware that all is transient. Yet, somehow my heart wants permanency. I want to create something that lasts. Maharaj, then you must build it of something lasting. What have you that is lasting? Neither your body nor mind will last. You must look elsewhere. Question. I long for permanency but I find it nowhere. Maharaj, are you yourself not permanent? Question. I was born, I shall die. Maharaj, can you truly say you were not before you were born and can you possibly say when dead, now I am no more? You cannot say from your own experience that you are not. You can only say I am. Others, too, cannot tell you you are not. Question, there is no I am in sleep. Maharaj, before you make such sweeping statements, examine carefully your waking state. You will soon discover that it is full of gaps when the min blanks out. Notice how little you remember even when fully awake. You just don't remember. A gap in memory is not necessarily a gap in consciousness. Question. Can I make myself remember my state of deep sleep? Maharaj, of course. By eliminating the intervals of inadvertence, during your waking hours you will gradually eliminate the long interval of absent-mindedness, which you call sleep. You will be aware that you are asleep. Question. Yet, the problem of permanency of continuity of being is not solved. Maharaj, Permanency is a mere idea born of the action of time. Time again depends of memory. By permanency you mean unfailing memory through endless time. You want to eternalize the mind which is not possible. Question, then what is eternal? Maharaj, that which does not change with time. You cannot eternalize a transient thing, only the changeless is eternal. Question, I am familiar with the general sense of what you say. I do not crave for more knowledge. All I want is peace. Maharaj, you can have for the asking all the peace you want. Question, I am asking. Maharaj, you must ask with an undivided heart and live an integrated life. Question, how? Maharaj, detach yourself from all that makes your mind restless. Renounce all that disturbs its peace. If you want peace, deserve it. Question, surely everybody deserves peace. Maharaj, those only deserve it who don't disturb it. Question, in what way do I disturb peace? Maharaj, by being a slave to your desires and fears. Question, even when they are justified? Maharaj, emotional reactions born of ignorance or inadvertence are never justified. Seek a clear mind and a clean heart. 
All you need is to keep quietly alert inquiring into the real nature of yourself. This is the only way to peace. Chapter 9 Responses of Memory Questioner, some say the universe was created. Others say that it always existed and is forever undergoing transformation. Some say it is subject to eternal laws. Others deny even causality. Some say the world is real. Others that it has no being whatsoever. Maharaj, which world are you inquiring about? Question, the world of my perceptions, of course. Maharaj, the world you can perceive is a very small world indeed. And it is entirely private. Take it to be a dream and be done with it. Question, how can I take it to be a dream? A dream does not last. Maharaj, how long will your own world last? Question, after all my little world is but a part of the total. Maharaj, is not the idea of a total world a part of your personal world? The universe does not come to tell you that you are a part of it. It is you who have invented a totality to contain you as a part. In fact all you know is your own private world however well you have furnished it with your imaginations and expectations. Question. Surely perception is not imagination. Maharaj, what else? Perception is recognition, is it not? Something entirely unfamiliar can be sensed but cannot be perceived. Perception involves memory. Question. Granted but memory does not make it illusion. Maharaj, perception, imagination, expectation, anticipation, illusion, all are based on memory. There are hardly any border lines between them. They just merge into each other. All are responses of memory. Question, still, memory is there to prove the reality of my world. Maharaj, how much do you remember? Try to write down from memory what you were thinking, saying and doing on the 30th of the last month. Question. Yes, there is a blank. Maharaj, it is not so bad. You do remember a lot. Unconscious memory makes the world in which you live so familiar. Question. Admitted that the world in which I live is subjective and partial. What about you? In what kind of world do you live? Maharaj, my world is just like yours. I see, I hear, I feel, I think, I speak and act in a world I perceive just like you. But with you it is all, with me it is nothing. Knowing the world to be a part of myself, I pay it no more attention than you pay to the food you have eaten. While being prepared and eaten, the food is separate from you and your mind is on it. Once swallowed, you become totally unconscious of it. I have eaten up the world and I need not think of it any more. Question, don't you become completely irresponsible? Maharaj, how could I? How can I hurt something which is one with me? On the contrary, without thinking of the world, whatever I do will be of benefit to it. Just as the body sets itself right unconsciously, so am I ceaselessly active in setting the world right. Question. Nevertheless, you are aware of the immense suffering of the world? Maharaj, of course I am much more than you are. Question. Then what do you do? Maharaj, I look at it through the eyes of God and find that all is well. Question, how can you say that all is well? Look at the wars, the exploitation, the cruel strife between the citizen and the state. Maharaj, all these sufferings are man-made and it is within man's power to put an end to them. God helps by facing man with the results of his actions and demanding that the balance should be restored. Karma is the law that works for righteousness. It is the healing hand of God. Chapter 10 Witnessing Questioner, I am full of desires and want them fulfilled. How am I to get what I want? Maharaj, do you deserve what you desire? In some way or other, you have to work for the fulfillment of your desires. Put in energy and wait for the results. Question, where am I to get the energy? Maharaj, desire itself is energy. Question, then why does not every desire get fulfilled? Maharaj, maybe it was not strong enough and lasting. Question, yes that is my problem. I want things but I am lazy when it comes to action. Maharaj, when your desire is not clear nor strong it cannot take shape. 
Besides, if your desires are personal, for your own enjoyment, the energy you give them is necessarily limited. It cannot be more than what you have. Question. Yet, often ordinary persons do attain what they desire. Meharaj, after desiring it very much and for a long time, even then their achievements are limited. Question, and what about unselfish desires? Meharaj, when you desire the common good the whole world desires with you, make humanities desire your own and work for it. There you cannot fail. Question, humanity is God's work, not mine. I am concerned with myself. Have I not the right to see my legitimate desires fulfilled? They will hurt no one. My desires are legitimate. They are right desires, why don't they come true? Meharaj, desires are right or wrong according to circumstances. It depends on how you look at them. It is only for the individual that a distinction between right and wrong is valid. Question, what are the guidelines for such distinction? How am I to know which of my desires are right and which are wrong? Meharaj, in your case desires that lead to sorrow are wrong and those which lead to happiness are right. But you must not forget others. Their sorrow and happiness also count. Question, results are in the future. How can I know what they will be? Meharaj, use your mind. Remember. Observe. You are not different from others. Most of their experiences are valid for you too. Think clearly and deeply. Go into the entire structure of your desires and their ramifications. They are a most important part of your mental and emotional makeup and powerfully affect your actions. Remember, you cannot abandon what you do not know. To go beyond yourself, you must know yourself. Question, what does it mean to know myself? By knowing myself, what exactly do I come to know? Meharaj, all that you are not. Question, and not what I am. Meharaj, what you are you already are. By knowing what you are not, you are free of it and remain in your own natural state. It all happens quite spontaneously and effortlessly. Question, and what do I discover? Meharaj, you discover that there is nothing to discover. You are what you are and that is all. Question, I do not understand. Meharaj, it is your fixed idea that you must be something or other that blinds you. Question, how can I get rid of this idea? Meharaj, if you trust me believe when I tell you that you are the pure awareness that illuminates consciousness and its infinite content. Realize this and live accordingly. If you do not believe me, then go within inquiring what an I or focus your mind on I am which is pure and simple being. Question, on what my faith in you depends. Maharaj, on your insight into other people's hearts. If you cannot look into my heart, look into your own. Question, I can do neither. Maharaj, purify yourself by a well-ordered and useful life. Watch over your thoughts, feelings, words and actions. This will clear your vision. Question, must I not renounce everything first and live a homeless life? Meharaj, you cannot renounce. You may leave your home and give trouble to your family, but attachments are in the mind and will not leave you until you know your mind in and out. First thing first, know yourself, all else will come with it. Question, but you already told me that I am the supreme reality. Is it not self-knowledge? Meharaj, of course you are the supreme reality. But what of it? Every grain of sand is God. To know it is important, but that is only the beginning. Question, well, you told me that I am the supreme reality. I believe you. What next is there for me to do? Maharaj, I told you already. Discover all you are not. Body, feelings, thoughts, ideas, time, space, being and not being, this or that, nothing concrete or abstract you can point out to is you. A mere verbal statement will not do, you may repeat a formula endlessly without any result whatsoever. You must watch yourself continuously, particularly your mind moment by moment missing nothing. This witnessing is essential for the separation of the self from the not-self. Question, the witnessing, is it not my real nature? Meharaj, for witnessing there must be something else to witness. 
We are still in duality. Question, what about witnessing the witness? Awareness of awareness. Maharaj, putting words together will not take you far. Go within and discover what you are not. Nothing else matters. Chapter 11 Awareness and Consciousness Questioner, what do you do in a sleep? Maharaj, I am aware of being asleep. Question, is not sleep a state of unconsciousness? Maharaj, yes, I am aware of being unconscious. Question, and when awake or dreaming? Maharaj, I am aware of being awake or dreaming. Question, I do not catch you. What exactly do you mean? Let me make my terms clear. By being asleep I mean unconscious, by being awake I mean conscious, by dreaming I mean conscious of one's mind, but not of the surroundings. Maharaj, well it is about the same with me. Yet, there seems to be a difference. In each state you forget the other two, while to me there is but one state of being, including and transcending the three mental states of waking, dreaming and sleeping. Question. Do you see in the world a direction and a purpose? Maharaj, the world is but a reflection of my imagination. Whatever I want to see, I can see. But why should I invent patterns of creation, evolution and destruction? I do not need them and have no desire to lock up the world in a mental picture. Question, coming back to sleep. Do you dream? Maharaj, of course. Question, what are your dreams? Maharaj, echoes of the waking state. Question, and your deep sleep. Maharaj, the brain consciousness is suspended. Question, are you then unconscious? Maharaj, unconscious of my surroundings, yes. Question, not quite unconscious. Maharaj, I remain aware that I am unconscious. Question, you use the words aware and conscious. Are they not the same? Maharaj, awareness is primordial. It is the original state, beginningless, endless, uncaused, unsupported, without parts, without change. Consciousness is on contact, a reflection against a surface, a state of duality. There can be no consciousness without awareness, but there can be awareness without consciousness as in deep sleep. Awareness is absolute, consciousness is relative to its content. Consciousness is always of something. Consciousness is partial and changeful, awareness is total, changeless, calm and silent and it is the common matrix of every experience. Question, how does one go beyond consciousness into awareness? Maharaj, since it is awareness that makes consciousness possible, there is awareness in every state of consciousness. Therefore, the very consciousness of being conscious is already a movement in awareness. Interest in your stream of consciousness takes you to awareness. It is not a new state. It is at once recognized as the original basic existence, which is life itself, and also love and joy. Question. Since reality is all the time with us, what does self-realization consist of? Maharaj, realization is but the opposite of ignorance. To take the world as real and one's self as unreal is ignorance. The cause of sorrow. To know the self is the only reality and all else as temporal and transient is freedom, peace and joy. It is all very simple. Instead of seeing things as imagined, learn to see them as they are. It is like cleansing a mirror. The same mirror that shows you the world as it is, will also show you your own face. The thought I am is the polishing cloth. Use it. Chapter 12 The Person is Not Reality Questioner, kindly tell us how you realized. Maharaj, I met my Gira when I was 34 and realized by 37. Question, what happened? What was the change? Maharaj, pleasure and pain lost their sway over me. I was free from desire and fear. I had myself full, meeting nothing. I saw that in the ocean of pure awareness, on the surface of the universal consciousness, the numberless waves of the phenomenal worlds arise and subside beginninglessly and endlessly. Consciousness, they are all me. As events, they are all mine. 
There is a mysterious power that looks after them. That power is awareness, self, life, God, whatever name you give it. It is the foundation, the ultimate support of all that is, just like gold is the basis for all gold jewelry. And it is so intimately ours. Abstract the name and shape from the jewelry and the gold becomes obvious. Be free of name and form and of the desires and fears they create, then what remains? Question, nothingness. Maharaj, yes the void remains. But the void is full to the brim. It is the eternal potential as consciousness is the eternal actual. Question, by potential you mean the future. Maharaj, past, present and future they are all there. And infinitely more. Question, but since the void is void, it is of little use to us. Maharaj, how can you say so? Without breach in continuity how can there be rebirth? Can there be renewal without death? Even the darkness of sleep is refreshing and rejuvenating. Without death we would have been bogged up forever in eternal senility. Question, is there no such thing as immortality? Maharaj, when life and death are seen as essential to each other as two aspects of one being that is immortality. To see the end in the beginning and beginning in the end is the intimation of eternity. Definitely immortality is not continuity. Only the process of change continues. Nothing lasts. Question. Awareness lasts. Maharaj. Awareness is not of time. Time exists in consciousness only. Beyond consciousness where are time and space. Question. Within the field of your consciousness there is your body also. Maharaj, of course. But the idea my body is different from other bodies is not there. To me it is a body, not my body, a mind, not my mind. The mind looks after the body all right, I need not interfere. What needs be done is being done in the normal and natural way. You may not be quite conscious of your physiological functions, but when it comes to thoughts and feelings, desires and fears, you become acutely self-conscious. To me these two are largely unconscious. I find myself talking to people, or doing things quite correctly and appropriately, without being very much conscious of them. It looks as if I live my physical waking life automatically, reacting spontaneously and accurately. Question, does this spontaneous response come as a result of realization or by training? Maharaj, both. Devotion to you goal makes you live a clean and orderly life, given to search for truth and to helping people, and realization makes noble virtue easy and spontaneous, by removing for good the obstacles in the shape of desires and fears and wrong ideas. Question, don't you have desires and fears anymore? Maharaj, my destiny was to be born a simple man, a commoner, a humble tradesman with little of formal education. My life was the common kind, with common desires and fears. When through my faith in my teacher and obedience to his words, I realized my true being, I left behind my human nature to look after itself, until its destiny is exhausted. Occasionally an old reaction emotional or mental happens in the mind but it is at once noticed and discarded. After all, as long as one is burdened with a person, one is exposed to its idiosyncrasies and habits. Question, are you not afraid of death? Maharaj, I am dead already. Question, in what sense? Maharaj, I am double dead. Not only am I dead to my body, but to my mind too. Question, well, you do not look dead at all. Maharaj, that's what you say. You seem to know my state better than I do. Question, sorry. But I just do not understand. You say you are bodiless and mindless while I see you very much alive and articulate. Maharaj, a tremendously complex work is going on all the time in your brain and body. Are you conscious of it? Not at all. Yet for an outsider all seems to be going on intelligently and purposefully. Why not admit that one's entire personal life may sink largely below the threshold of consciousness and yet proceed sanely and smoothly? Question, is it normal? Maharaj, what is normal? 
Is your life obsessed by desires and fears, full of strife and struggle, meaningless and joyless, normal? To be acutely conscious of your body, idea it normal? To be torn by feelings, tortured by thoughts, is it normal? A healthy body, a healthy mind live largely unperceived by their owner. Only occasionally, through pain or suffering, they call for attention and insight. Why not extend the same to the entire personal life? One can function rightly, responding well and fully to whatever happens, without having to bring it into the focus of awareness. When self control becomes second nature, awareness shifts its focus to deeper levels of existence and action. Question Don't you become a robot? Maharaj, what harm is there in making automatic what is habitual and repetitive? It is automatic anyhow. But when it is also chaotic, it causes pain and suffering and calls for attention. The entire purpose of a clean and well ordered life is to liberate man from the thraldom of chaos and the burden of sorrow. Question You seem to be in favor of a computerized life. Maharaj, what is wrong with a life which is free from problems? Personality is merely a reflection of the real. Why should not the reflection be true to the original as a matter of course automatically? Need the person have any designs of its own? The life of which it is an expression will guide it. Once you realize that the person is merely a shadow of the reality, but not reality itself, you cease to fret and worry. You agree to be guided from within and life becomes a journey into the unknown. Chapter 13 The Supreme The Mind and the Body Questioner, from what you told us it appears that you are not quite conscious of your surroundings. To us you seem extremely alert and active. We cannot possibly believe that you are in a kind of hypnotic state, which leaves no memory behind. On the contrary, your memory seems excellent. How are we to understand your statement that the world and all it includes does not exist, as far as you are concerned? Maharaj, it is all a matter of focus. Your mind is focused in the world, mine is focused in reality. It is like the moon in daylight, when the sun shines, the moon is hardly visible. Or watch how you take your food. As long as it is in your mouth, you are conscious of it, once swallowed it does not concern you any longer. It would be troublesome to have it constantly in mind until it is eliminated. The mind should be normally in abeyance, incessant activity is a morbid state. The universe works by itself that I know. What else do I need to know? Question, so a Johnny knows what he is doing only when he turns his mind to it. Otherwise he just acts without being concerned. Meharaj, the average man is not conscious of his body as such. He is conscious of his sensations, feelings and thoughts. Even these, once detachment sets in, move away from the center of consciousness and happen spontaneously and effortlessly. Question, what then is in the center of consciousness? Maharaj, that which cannot be given name and form for it is without quality and beyond consciousness. You may say it is a point in consciousness which is beyond consciousness. Like a hole in the paper is both in the paper and yet not of paper, so is the supreme state in the very center of consciousness and yet beyond consciousness. It is as if an opening in the mind through which the mind is flooded with light. The opening is not even the light. It is just an opening. Question, an opening is just void absence. Maharaj, quite so. From the mind's point of view, it is but an opening for the light of awareness to enter the mental space. By itself the light can only be compared to a solid, dense, rock-like, homogeneous and changeless mass of pure awareness, free from the mental patterns of name and shape. Question, is there any connection between the mental space and the supreme abode? Maharaj, the supreme gives existence to the mind. The mind gives existence to the body. Question, and what lies beyond? Maharaj, take an example. A venerable yogi, a master in the art of longevity, himself over 1,000 years old, comes to teach me his art. 
I fully respect and sincerely admire his achievements, yet all I can tell him is, of what use is longevity to me? I am beyond time. However long a life may be, it is but a moment and a dream. In the same way I am beyond all attributes. They appear and disappear in my light, but cannot describe me. The universe is all names and forms, based on qualities and their differences while I am beyond. The world is there because I am, but I am not the world. Question, but you are living in the world. Meharaj, that's what you say. I know there is a world which includes this body and this mind, but I do not consider them to be more mine than other minds and bodies. They are there in time and space, but I am timeless and spaceless. Question, but since all exists by your light, are you not the creator of the world? Maharaj, I am neither the potentiality nor the actualization, nor the actuality of things. In my light they come and go as the specks of dust dancing in the sunbeam. The light illumines the specks, but does not depend on them. Nor can it be said to create them. It cannot be even said to know them. Question. I am asking you a question and you are answering. Are you conscious of the question and the answer? Maharaj, in reality I am neither hearing nor answering. In the world of events the question happens and the answer happens. Nothing happens to me. Everything just happens. Question, and you are the witness. Maharaj, what does witness mean? Mere knowledge. It rained and now the rain is over. I did not get wet. I know it rained, but I am not affected. I just witnessed the rain. Question, the fully realized man spontaneously abiding in the supreme state appears to eat, drink and so on. Is he aware of it or not? Maharaj, that in which consciousness happens, the universal consciousness or mind we call the ether of consciousness. All the objects of consciousness form the universe. What is beyond both, supporting both, is the supreme state, a state of utter stillness and silence. Whoever goes there disappears. It is unreachable by words or mind. You may call it God or Parabrahman or Supreme Reality, but these are names given by the mind. It is the nameless, contentless, effortless and spontaneous state, beyond being and not being. Question, but does one remain conscious? Maharaj, as the universe is the body of the mind, so is consciousness the body of the Supreme. It is not conscious, but it gives rise to consciousness. Question, in my daily actions much goes by habit automatically. I am aware of the general purpose, but not of each movement in detail. As my consciousness broadens and deepens, details tend to recede, leaving me free for the general trends. Does not the same happens to a Johnny, but more so? Maharaj, on the level of consciousness, yes. In the supreme state, no. This state is entirely one and indivisible, a single solid block of reality. The only way of knowing it is to be it. The mind cannot reach it. To perceive it does not need the senses, to know it does not need the mind. Question, that is how God runs the world. Maharaj, God is not running the world. Question, then who is doing it? Maharaj, nobody. All happens by itself. You are asking the question and you are supplying the answer. And you know the answer when you ask the question. All is a play in consciousness. All divisions are illusory. You can know the false only. The true you must yourself be. Question. There is the witnessed consciousness and there is the witnessing consciousness. Is the second the supreme? Maharaj, there are the two, the person and the witness, the observer. When you see them as one and go beyond, you are in the supreme state. It is not perceivable because it is what makes perception possible. It is beyond being and not being. It is neither the mirror nor the image in the mirror. It is what is the timeless reality, unbelievably hard and solid. Question, the Jani, is he the witness or the supreme? Maharaj, he is the supreme of course, but he can also be viewed as the universal witness. Question, but he remains a person. 
Maharaj, when you believe yourself to be a person, you see persons everywhere. In reality, there are no persons, only threads of memories and habits. At the moment of realization, the person ceases. Identity remains, but identity is not a person, it is inherent in the reality itself. The person has no being in itself. It is a reflection in the mind of the witness the I am, which again is a mode of being. Question. Is the Supreme Conscious? Maharaj, neither conscious nor unconscious, I am telling you from experience. Question. Pragnanam Brahma. What is this Pragna? Maharaj, it is the unself-conscious knowledge of life itself. Question. Is it vitality, the energy of life, livingness? Maharaj, energy comes first. For everything is a form of energy. Consciousness is most differentiated in the waking state. Less so in dream. So less in sleep. Homogeneous in the fourth state. Beyond is the inexpressible monolithic reality, the abode of the jhani. Question, I have cut my hand. It healed. By what power did it heal? Maharaj, by the power of life. Question, what is that power? Maharaj, it is consciousness. All is conscious. Question, what is the source of consciousness? Maharaj, consciousness itself is the source of everything. Question, can there be life without consciousness? Maharaj, no nor consciousness without life. They are both one. But in reality only the ultimate is. The rest is a matter of name and form. And as long as you cling to the idea that only what has name and shape exists, the Supreme will appear to you non-existing. When you understand that names and shapes are hollow shells without any content whatsoever, and what is real is nameless and formless, pure energy of life and light of consciousness, you will be at peace, immersed in the deep silence of reality. Question. If time and space are mere illusions and you are beyond, please tell me what is the weather in New York. Is it hot or raining there? Maharaj, how can I tell you? Such things need special training. Or just traveling to New York. I may be quite certain that I am beyond time and space, and yet unable to locate myself at will at some point of time and space. I am not interested enough. I see no purpose in undergoing a special yogic training. I have just heard of New York. To me it is a word. Why should I know more than the word conveys? Every atom may be a universe as complex as ours. Must I know them all? I can if I train. Question. In putting the question about the weather in New York, where did I make the mistake? Meharaj, the world and the mind are states of being. The Supreme is not a state. It pervades all states but it is not a state of something else. It is entirely uncaused, independent, complete in itself, beyond time and space, mind and matter. Question. By what sign do you recognize it? Meharaj, that's the point that it leaves no traces. There is nothing to recognize it by. It must be seen directly by giving up all search for signs and approaches. When all names and forms have been given up, the real is with you. You need not seek it. Plurality and diversity are the play of the mind only. Reality is one. Question. If reality leaves no evidence, there is no speaking about it. Meharaj, it is. It cannot be denied. It is deep and dark mystery beyond mystery. But it is while all else merely happens. Question. Is it the unknown? Maharaj, it is beyond both the known and the unknown. But I would rather call it the known than the unknown. For whenever something is known, it is the real that is known. Question. Is silence an attribute of the real? Maharaj, this too is of the mind. All states and conditions are of the mind. Question. What is the place of samadhi? Maharaj, not making use of one's consciousness as samadhi. You just leave your mind alone. You want nothing neither from your body nor from your mind. Chapter 14. Appearances and the Reality. Questioner. Repeatedly you have been saying that events are causeless, 
a thing just happens and no cause can be assigned to it. Surely everything has a cause or several causes. How am I to understand the causelessness of things? Maharaj, from the highest point of view the world has no cause. Question, but what is your own experience? Maharaj, everything is uncaused. The world has no cause. Question, I am not inquiring about the causes that led to the creation of the world. Who has seen the creation of the world? It may even be without a beginning, always existing. But I am not talking of the world. I take the world to exist somehow. It contains so many things. Surely each must have a cause or several causes. Maharaj, once you create for yourself a world in time and space governed by causality, you are bound to search for and find causes for everything. You put the question and impose an answer. Question, my question is very simple. I see all kinds of things and I understand that each must have a cause or a number of causes. You say they are uncaused from your point of view. But to you nothing has being and therefore the question of causation does not arise. Yet you seem to admit the existence of things, but deny them causation. This is what I cannot grasp. Once you accept the existence of things, why reject their causes? Maharaj, I see only consciousness and know everything to be but consciousness as you know the picture on the cinema screen to be but light. Question, still the movements of light have a cause. Maharaj, the light does not move at all. You know very well that the movement is illusory, a sequence of interceptions and color ings in the film. What moves is the film which is the mind. Question, this does not make the picture causeless. The film is there and the actors with the technicians, the director, the producer, the various manufacturers. The world is governed by causality. Everything is interlinked. Maharaj, of course everything is interlinked. And therefore everything has numberless causes. The entire universe contributes to the least thing. A thing is as it is because the world is as it is. You see, you deal in gold ornaments and I in gold. Between the different ornaments there is no causal relation. When you remelt an ornament to make another, there is no causal relation between the two. The common factor is the gold. But you cannot say gold is the cause. It cannot be called a cause, for it causes nothing by itself. It is reflected in the mind as I am as the ornament's particular name and shape. Yet all is only gold. In the same way reality makes everything possible and yet nothing that makes a thing what it is, its name and form, comes from reality. But why worry so much about causation? What do causes matter when things themselves are transient? Let come what comes and let go what goes. Why catch hold of things and inquire about their causes? Question, from the relative point of view, everything must have a cause. Maharaj, of what use is the relative view to you? You are able to look from the absolute point of view. Why go back to the relative? Are you afraid of the absolute? Question, I am afraid. I am afraid of falling asleep over my so-called absolute certainties. For living a life decently absolutes don't help. When you need a shirt, you buy cloth, call a tailor and so on. Meharaj, all this talk shows ignorance. Question, and what is the knower's view? Meharaj, there is only light and the light is all. Everything else is but a picture made of light. The picture is in the light and the light is in the picture. Life and death, self and not self, abandon all these ideas. They are of no use to you. Question, from what point of view you deny causation? From the relative, the universe is the cause of everything. From Thebesolute, there is no thing at all. Maharaj, from which state are you asking? Question, from the daily waking state in which alone all these discussions take place. Maharaj, in the waking state all these problems arise for such is its nature. But, you are not always in that state. What good can you do in a state into which you fall and from which you emerge helplessly? 
In what way does it help you to know that things are causally related as they may appear to be in your waking state? Question, the world and the waking state emerge and subside together. Maharaj, when the mind is still absolutely silent, the waking state is no more. Question, words like God, universe, the total, absolute, supreme are just noises in the air because no action can be taken on them. Maharaj, you are bringing up questions which you alone can answer. Question, don't brush me off like this. You are so quick to speak for the totality, the universe and such imaginary things. They cannot come and forbid you to talk on their behalf. I hate those irresponsible generalizations. And you are so prone to personalize them. Without causality there will be no order, nor purposeful action will be possible. Maharaj, do you want to know all the causes of each event? Is it possible? Question, I know it is not possible. All I want to know is if there are causes for everything and the causes can be influenced thereby affecting the events. Maharaj, to influence events you need not know the causes. What a roundabout way of doing things. Are you not the source and the end of every event? Control it at the source itself. Question. Every morning I pick up the newspaper and read with dismay that the world's sorrows, poverty, hatred and wars continue unabated. My questions are concerning the fact of sorrow, the cause, the remedy. Don't brush me off saying that it is Buddhism. Don't label me. Your insistence on causelessness removes all hope of the world ever changing. Maharaj, you are confused because you believe that you are in the world, not the world in you. Who came first, you or your parents? You imagine that you were born at a certain time and place, that you have a father and a mother, a body and a name. This is your sin and your calamity. Surely you can change your world if you work at it. By all means work. Who stops you? I have never discouraged you. Causes or no causes, you have made this world and you can change it. Question. A causeless world is entirely beyond my control. Maharaj, on the contrary, a world of which you are the only source and ground is fully within your power to change. What is created can be always dissolved and recreated. All will happen as you want it, provided you really want it. Question, all I want to know is how to deal with the world's sorrows. Maharaj, you have created them out of your own desires and fears, you deal with them. All is due to your having forgotten your own being. Having given reality to the picture on the screen, you love its people and suffer for them and seek to save them. It is just not so. You must begin with yourself. There is no other way. Work of course. You have no harm in working. Question. Your universe seems to contain every possible experience. The individual traces a line through it and experiences pleasant and unpleasant states. This gives rise to questioning and seeking, which broaden the outlook and enable the individual to go beyond his narrow and self-created world limited and self-centered. This personal world can be changed in time. The universe is timeless and perfect. Maharaj, to take appearance for reality is a grievous sin and the cause of all calamities. You are the all-pervading, eternal and infinitely creative awareness consciousness. All else is local and temporary. Don't forget what you are. In the meantime work to your heart's content. Work and knowledge should go hand in hand. Question. My own feeling is that my spiritual development is not in my hands. Making one's own plans and carrying them out leads nowhere. I just run in circles round myself. When God considers the fruit to be ripe he will pluck it and eat it. Whichever fruit seems green to him will remain on the world's tree for another day. Maharaj, you think God knows you? Even the world he does not know. Question. Yours is a different God. Mine is different. Mine is merciful. He suffers along with us. Maharaj, you pray to save one while thousands die. And if all stop dying there will be no space on earth. Question, I am not afraid of death. My concern is with sorrow and suffering. My God is a simple God and rather helpless. He has no power to compel us to be wise. 
he can only stand and wait. Maharaj, if you and your God are both helpless does it not imply that the world is accidental? And if it I, the only thing you can do is to go beyond it. Chapter 15, The Jani Questioner, without God's power nothing can be done. Even you would not be sitting here and talking to us without him. Maharaj, all is his doing no doubt. What is it to me since I want nothing? What can God give me or take away from me? What is mine is mine and was mine even when God was not. Of course it is a very tiny little thing, a speck, the sense I am, the fact of being. This is my own place, nobody gave it to me. The earth is mine, what grows on it is God's. Question, did God take the earth on rent from you? Meharaj, God is my devotee and did all this for me. Question, is there no God apart from you? Maharaj, how can there be? I am as the root God is the tree. Whom am I to worship and what for? Question, are you the devotee or the object of devotion? Maharaj, I am neither I am devotion itself. Question, there is not enough devotion in the world. Maharaj, you are always after the improvement of the world. Do you really believe that the world is waiting for you to be saved? Question, I just do not know how much I can do for the world. All I can do is to try. Is there anything else you would like me to do? Maharaj, without you is there a world? You know all about the world, but about yourself you know nothing. You yourself are the tools of your work, you have no other tools. Why don't you take care of the tools before you think of the work? Question, I can wait while the world cannot. Maharaj, by not inquiring you keep the world waiting. Question, waiting for what? Maharaj, for somebody who can save it. Question, God runs the world, God will save it. Maharaj, that's what you say. Did God come and tell you that the world is his creation and concern and not yours? Question, why should it be my sole concern? Maharaj, consider. The world in which you live, who else knows about it? Question, you know. Everybody knows. Maharaj, did anybody come from outside of your world to tell you? Myself and everybody else appear and disappear in your world. We are all at your mercy. Question, it cannot be so bad. I exist in your world as you exist in mine. Maharaj, you have no evidence of my world. You are completely wrapped up in the world of your own making. Question, I see. Completely but hopelessly? Maharaj, within the prison of your world appears a man who tells you that the world of painful contradictions which you have created is neither continuous nor permanent and is based on a misapprehension. He pleads with you to get out of it by the same way by which you got into it. You got into it by forgetting what you are and you will get out of it by knowing yourself as you are. Question, in what way does it affect the world? Maharaj, when you are free of the world, you can do something about it. As long as you are a prisoner of it, you are helpless to change it. On the contrary, whatever you do will aggravate the situation. Question, righteousness will set me free. Maharaj, righteousness will undoubtedly make you and your world a comfortable, even happy place. But what is the use? There is no reality in it. It cannot last. Question, God will help. Maharaj, to help you God must know your existence. But you and your world are dream states. In dream you may suffer agonies. None knows them and none can help you. Question, so all my questions, my search and study are of no use. Maharaj, these are but the stirrings of a man who is tired of sleeping. They are not the causes of awakening, but its early signs. But you must not ask idle questions to which you already know the answers. Question, how am I to get a true answer? Maharaj, by asking a true question non-verbally but by daring to live according to your lights. A man willing to die for truth will get it. Question, another question. There is the person. There is the knower of the person. There is the witness. Are the knower and the witness the same, or are they separate states? Maharaj, the knower and the witness are two or one. 
when the knower is seen as separate from the known, the witness stands alone. When the known and the knower are seen as one, the witness becomes one with them. Question, who is the Jani? The witness or the Supreme? Maharaj, the Jani is the Supreme and also the witness. He is both being and awareness. In relation to consciousness, he is awareness. In relation to the universe, he is pure being. Question, and what about the person? What comes first, the person or the knower? Maharaj, the person is a very small thing. Actually, it is a composite, it cannot be said to exist by itself. Unperceived, it is just not there. It is but the shadow of the mind, the sum total of memories. Pure being is reflected in the mirror of the mind as knowing. What is known takes the shape of a person, based on memory and habit. It is but a shadow or a projection of the knower onto the screen of the mind. Question. The mirror is there, the reflection is there. But where is the sun? Maharaj, the supreme is the sun. Question. It must be conscious. Maharaj, it is neither conscious nor unconscious. Don't think of it in terms of consciousness or unconsciousness. It is the life which contains both and is beyond both. Question, life is so intelligent. How can it be unconscious? Maharaj, you talk of the unconscious when there is a lapse in memory. In reality there is only consciousness. All life is conscious, all consciousness alive. Question, even stones. Maharaj, even stones are conscious and alive. Question, the worry with me is that I am prone to denying existence to what I cannot imagine. Maharaj, you would be wiser to deny the existence of what you imagine. It is the imagined that is unreal. Question, is all imaginable unreal? Maharaj, imagination based on memories is unreal. The future is not entirely unreal. Question, which part of the future is real and which is not? Maharaj, the unexpected and unpredictable is real. Chapter 16, Desirelessness, the Highest Bliss Questioner, I have met many realized people, but never a liberated man. Have you come across a liberated man, or does liberation mean among other things also abandoning the body? Maharaj, what do you mean by realization and liberation? Question. By realization I mean a wonderful experience of peace, goodness and beauty when the world makes sense and there is an all-pervading unity of both substance and essence. While such experience does not last, it cannot be forgotten. It shines in the mind, both as memory and longing. I know what I am talking about, for I have had such experiences. By liberation I mean to be permanently in that wonderful state. What I am asking is whether liberation is compatible with the survival of the body. Maharaj, what is wrong with the body? Question, the body is so weak and short-lived. It creates needs and cravings. It limits one grievously. Maharaj, so what? Let the physical expressions be limited. But liberation is of the self from its false and self-imposed ideas. It is not contained in some particular experience, however glorious. Question, does it last forever? Maharaj, all experience is time-bound. Whatever has a beginning must have an end. Question, so liberation in my sense of the word does not exist? Maharaj, on the contrary, one is always free. You are both conscious and free to be conscious. Nobody can take this away from you. Do you ever know yourself non-existing or unconscious? Question. I may not remember, but that does not disprove my being occasionally unconscious. Maharaj, why not turn away from the experience to the experiencer and realize the full import of the only true statement you can make, I am? Question. How is it done? Maharaj, there is no how here. Just keep in mind the feeling I am merge in it, till your mind and feeling become one. By repeated attempts you will stumble on the right balance of attention and affection and your mind will be firmly established in the thought-feeling I am. Whatever you think, say, or do, 
this sense of immutable and affectionate being remains as the ever-present background of the mind. Question, and you call it liberation? Maharaj, I call it normal. What is wrong with being, knowing and acting effortlessly and happily? Why consider it so unusual as to expect the immediate destruction of the body? What is wrong with the body that it should die? Correct your attitude to your body and leave it alone. Don't pamper, don't torture. Just keep it going, most of the time below the threshold of conscious attention. Question, the memory of my wonderful experiences haunts me. I want them back. Maharaj, because you want them back, you cannot have them. The state of craving for anything blocks all deeper experience. Nothing of value can happen to a mind which knows exactly what it wants. For nothing the mind can visualize and want is of much value. Question, then what is worth wanting? Maharaj, want the best. The highest happiness, the greatest freedom. Desirelessness is the highest bliss. Question, freedom from desire is not the freedom I want. I want the freedom to fulfill my longings. Maharaj, you are free to fulfill your longings. As a matter of fact, you are doing nothing else. Question, I try but there are obstacles which leave me frustrated. Maharaj, overcome them. Question, I cannot, I am too weak. Maharaj, what makes you weak? What is weakness? Others fulfill their desires, why don't you? Question, I must be lacking energy. Maharaj, what happened to your energy? Where did it go? Did you not scatter it over so many contradictory desires and pursuits? You don't have an infinite supply of energy. Question, why not? Maharaj, your aims are small and low. They do not call for more. Only God's energy is infinite because he wants nothing for himself. Be like him and all your desires will be fulfilled. The higher your aims and vaster your desires, the more energy you will have for their fulfillment. Desire the good of all and the universe will work with you. But if you want your own pleasure, you must earn it the hard way. Before desiring deserve. Question, I am engaged in the study of philosophy, sociology and education. I think more mental development is needed before I can dream of self-realization. Am I on the right track? Maharaj, to earn a livelihood some specialized knowledge is needed. General knowledge develops the mind, no doubt. But if you are going to spend your life in amassing knowledge, you build a wall round yourself. To go beyond the mind, a well-furnished mind is not needed. Question, then what is needed? Maharaj, distrust your mind and go beyond. Question, what shall I find beyond the mind? Maharaj, the direct experience of being, knowing and loving. Question, how does one go beyond the mind? Maharaj, there are many starting points, they all lead to the same goal. You may begin with selfless work, abandoning the fruits of action. You may then give up thinking and end in giving up all desires. Here giving up is the operational factor. Or you may not bother about anything you want or think or do and just stay put in the thought and feeling I am focusing I am firmly in your mind. All kinds of experience may come to you, remain unmoved in the knowledge that all perceivable is transient and only the I am endures. Question. I cannot give all my life to such practices. I have my duties to attend to. Maharaj, by all means attend to your duties. Action, in which you are not emotionally involved, and which is beneficial and does not cause suffering will not bind you. You may be engaged in several directions and work with enormous zest, yet remain inwardly free and quiet with a mirror like mind, which reflects all without being affected. Question, is such a state realizable? Maharaj, I would not talk about it if it were not. Why should I engage in fancies? Question, everybody quotes scriptures. Maharaj, those who know only scriptures know nothing. To know is to be. I know what I am talking about. It is not from reading or hearsay. Question, I am studying Sanskrit under a professor, but really I am only reading scriptures. I am in search of self-realization and I came to get the needed guidance. 
Kindly tell me what am I to do? Maharaj, since you have read the scriptures, why do you ask me? Question. The scriptures show the general directions, but the individual needs personal instructions. Maharaj, your own self is your ultimate teacher, sad guru. The outer teacher, guru, is merely a milestone. It is only your inner teacher that will walk with you to the goal, for he is the goal. Question. The inner teacher is not easily reached. Maharaj, since he is in you and with you, the difficulty cannot be serious. Look within and you will find him. Question. When I look within, I find sensations and perceptions, thoughts and feelings, desires and fears, memories and expectations. I am immersed in this cloud and see nothing else. Maharaj, that which sees all this and the nothing too is the inner teacher. He alone is, all else only appears to be. He is your own self, Swarupa, your hope and assurance of freedom. Find him and cling to him and you will be saved and safe. Question, I do believe you, but when it comes to the actual finding of this inner self, I find it escapes me. Maharaj, the idea it escapes me, where does it arise? Question, in the mind. Maharaj, and who knows the mind? Question, the witness of the mind knows the mind. Maharaj, did anybody come to you and say, I am the witness of your mind? Question, of course not. He would have been just another idea in the mind. Maharaj, then who is the witness? Question, I am. Maharaj, so you know the witness because you are the witness. You need not see the witness in front of you. Here again to be is to know. Question, yes I see that I am the witness, the awareness itself. But in which way does it profit me? Maharaj, what a question. What kind of profit do you expect? To know what you are, is it not good enough? Question, what are the uses of self-knowledge? Maharaj, it helps you to understand what you are not and keeps you free from false ideas, desires and actions. Question, if I am the witness only, what do right and wrong matter? Maharaj, what helps you to know yourself is right? What prevents is wrong? To know one's real self is bliss, to forget is sorrow. Question, is the witness consciousness the real self? Maharaj, it is the reflection of the real in the mind. The real is beyond. The witness is the door through which you pass beyond. Question, what is the purpose of meditation? Maharaj, seeing the false as the false is meditation. This must go on all the time. Question, we are told to meditate regularly. Maharaj, deliberate daily exercise and discrimination between the true and the false and renunciation of the false is meditation. There are many kinds of meditation to begin with, but they all merge finally into one. Question, please tell me which road to self-realization is the shortest. Maharaj, no way is short or long, but some people are more in earnest and some are less. I can tell you about myself. I was a simple man, but I trusted my guru. What he told me to do, I did. He told me to concentrate on I am, I did. He told me that I am beyond all perceivables and conceivables I believed. I gave him my heart and soul, my entire attention and the whole of my spare time I had to work to keep my family alive. As a result of faith and earnest application, I realized myself Swarupa within three years. You may choose any way that suits you. Your earnestness will determine the rate of progress. Question. No hint for me. Maharaj, establish yourself firmly in the awareness of I am. This is the beginning and also the end of all endeavor. Chapter 17, The Ever-Present Questioner, the highest powers of the mind are understanding, intelligence and insight. Man has three bodies, the physical, the mental and the causal prana, mana, karana. Physical reflects his being, the mental his knowing and the causal his joyous creativity. Of course these are all forms in consciousness. But they appear to be separate with qualities of their own. Intelligence is the reflection in the mind of the power to know chit. It is what makes the mind knowledgeable. The brighter the intelligence, the wider, deeper and truer the knowledge. 
To know things, to know people, and to know oneself are all functions of intelligence. The last is the most important and contains the former two. Misunderstanding oneself and the world leads to false ideas and desires, which again lead to bondage. Right understanding of oneself is necessary for freedom from the bondage of illusion. I understand all this in theory, but when it comes to practice, I find that I fail hopelessly in my responses to situations and people and by my inappropriate reactions I merely add to my bondage. Life is too quick for my dull and slow mind. I do understand but too late when the old mistakes have been already repeated. Maharaj, what then is your problem? Question. I need a response to life not only intelligent but also very quick. It cannot be quick unless it is perfectly spontaneous. How can I achieve such spontaneity? Maharaj, the mirror can do nothing to attract the sun. It can only keep bright. As soon as the mind is ready, the sun shines in it. Question. The light is of the self or of the mind? Maharaj, both. It is uncaused and unvarying by itself and colored by the mind, as it moves and changes. It is very much like a cinema. The light is not in the film, but the film colors the light and makes it appear to move by intercepting it. Question. Are you now in the perfect state? Maharaj, perfection is a state of the mind when it is pure. I am beyond the mind, whatever its state, pure or impure. Awareness is my nature. Ultimately I am beyond being and non-being. Question. Will meditation help me to reach your state? Maharaj, meditation will help you to find your bonds, loosen them, untie them and cast your moorings. When you are no longer attached to anything, you have done your share. The rest will be done for you. Question. By whom? Maharaj, by the same power that brought you so far that prompted your heart to desire truth and your mind to seek it. It is the same power that keeps you alive. You may call it life or the supreme. Question. The same power kills me in due course. Maharaj, were you not present at your birth? Will you not be present at your death? Find him who is always present, and your problem of spontaneous and perfect response will be solved. Question. Realization of the eternal and an effortless and adequate response to the ever-changing temporary event are two different and separate questions. You seem to roll them into one. What makes you do so? Maharaj, to realize the eternal is to become the eternal, the whole, the universe with all it contains. Every event is the effect and the expression of the whole, and is in fundamental harmony with the whole. All response from the whole must be right, effortless and instantaneous. It cannot be otherwise if it is right. Delayed response is wrong response. Thought, feeling and action must be one and simultaneous with the situation that calls for them. Question, how does it come? Maharaj, I told you already. Find him who is present at your birth and will witness your death. Question, my father and mother. Maharaj, yes, your father and mother, the source from which you came. To solve a problem you must trace it to its source. Only in the dissolution of the problem and the universal solvents of inquiry and dispassion can its right solution be found. Chapter 18. To know what you are, find what you are not. Questioner. Your way of describing the universe as consisting of matter, mind, and spirit is one of the many. There are other patterns to which the universe is expected to conform, and one is at a loss to know which pattern is true and which is not. One ends in suspecting that all patterns are only verbal and that no pattern can contain reality. According to you, reality consists of three expanses. The expanse of matter energy Mahedakash, the expanse of consciousness Chittakash, and of pure spirit Paramakash. The first is something that has both movement and inertia. That we perceive. We also know that we perceive we are conscious and also aware of being conscious. Thus we have two, matter energy and consciousness. Matter seems to be in space while energy is always in time, being connected with change and measured by the rate of change. 
consciousness seems to be somehow here and now in a single point of time and space. But you seem to suggest that consciousness too is universal, which makes it timeless, spaceless and impersonal. I can somehow understand that there is no contradiction between the timeless and spaceless and the here and now, but impersonal consciousness I cannot fathom. To me consciousness is always focalized, centered, individualized, a person. You seem to say that there can be perceiving without a perceiver, knowing without a knower, loving without a lover, acting without an actor. I feel that the trinity of knowing, knower and known can be seen in every movement of life. Consciousness implies a conscious being, an object of consciousness and the fact of being conscious. That which is conscious I call a person. A person lives in the world, is a part of it, affects it, and is affected by it. Maharaj, why don't you inquire how real are the world and the person? Question, oh no. I need not inquire. Enough if the person is not less real than the world in which the person exists. Maharaj, then what is the question? Question, are persons real and universals conceptual or are universals real and persons imaginary? Maharaj, neither are real. Question, surely I am real enough to merit your reply and I am a person. Maharaj, not when asleep. Question, submergence is not absence. Even though asleep I am. Maharaj, to be a person you must be self-conscious. Are you so always? Question, not when I sleep of course, nor when I am in a swoon or drugged. Maharaj, during your waking hours are you continually self-conscious? Question, no sometimes I am absent-minded or just absorbed. Maharaj, are you a person during the gaps in self-consciousness? Question, of course I am the same person throughout. I remember myself as I was yesterday and yesteryear definitely, I am the same person. Maharaj, so to be a person you need memory? Question, of course. Maharaj, and without memory what are you? Question, incomplete memory entails incomplete personality. Without memory I cannot exist as a person. Maharaj, surely you can exist without memory. You do so in sleep. Question, only in the sense of remaining alive. Not as a person. Maharaj, since you admit that as a person you have only intermittent existence, can you tell me what are you in the intervals in between experiencing yourself as a person? Question, I am but not as a person. Since I am not conscious of myself in the intervals, I can only say that I exist, but not as a person. Maharaj, shall we call it impersonal existence? Question, I would call it rather unconscious existence, I am, but I do not know that I am. Maharaj, you have said just now, I am, but I do not know that I am. Could you possibly say it about your being in an unconscious state? Question, no, I could not. Maharaj, you can only describe it in the past tense, I did not know. I was unconscious in the sense of not remembering. Question, having been unconscious, how could I remember and what? Maharaj, were you really unconscious or you just do not remember? Question, how am I to make out? Maharaj, consider. Do you remember every second of yesterday? Question, of course not. Maharaj, were you then unconscious? Question, of course not. Maharaj, so you are conscious and yet you do not remember? Question, yes. Maharaj, maybe you were conscious in sleep and just do not remember. Question, no I was not conscious. I was asleep. I did not behave like a conscious person. Maharaj, again how do you know? Question, I was told so by those who saw me asleep. Maharaj, all they can testify to is that they saw you lying quietly with closed eyes and breathing regularly. They could not make out whether you were conscious or not. Your only proof is your own memory. A very uncertain proof it is. Question, yes I admit that on my own terms I am a person only during my waking hours. What I am in between, I do not know. Maharaj, at least you know that you do not know. 
Since you pretend not to be conscious in the intervals between the waking hours, leave the intervals alone. Let us consider the waking hours only. Question. I am the same person in my dreams. Maharaj. Agreed. Let us consider them together waking and dreaming. The difference is merely in continuity. Were your dreams consistently continuous, bringing back night after night the same surroundings and the same people, you would be at a loss to know which is the waking and which is the dream. Henceforward, when we talk of the waking state, we shall include the dream state too. Question. Agreed. I am a person in a conscious relation with the world. Maharaj, are the world and the conscious relation with it essential to your being a person? Question. Even immersed in a cave, I remain a person. Maharaj, it implies a body in a cave and a world in which they can exist. Question. Yes. I can see. The world and the consciousness of the world are essential to my existence as a person. Maharaj, this makes the person a part and parcel of the world or vice versa. The two are one. Question. Consciousness stands alone. The person and the world appear in consciousness. Maharaj, you said appear. Could you add disappear? Question. No, I cannot. I can only be aware of my and my world's appearance. As a person I cannot say, the world is not. Without a world I would not be there to say it. Because there is a world I am there to say, there is a world. Maharaj, maybe it is the other way round. Because of you there is a world. Question, to me such statement appears meaningless. Maharaj, its meaninglessness may disappear on investigation. Question, where do we begin? Maharaj, all I know is that whatever depends is not real. The real is truly independent. Since the existence of the person depends on the existence of the world, and it is circumscribed and defined by the world, it cannot be real. Question, it cannot be a dream surely. Maharaj, even a dream has existence when it is cognized and enjoyed or endured. Whatever you think and feel has being, but it may not be what you take it to be. What you think to be a person may be something quite different. Question, I am what I know myself to be. Maharaj, you cannot possibly say that you are what you think yourself to be. Your ideas about yourself change from day to day and from moment to moment. Your self-image is the most changeful thing you have. It is utterly vulnerable at the mercy of a passerby. A bereavement, the loss of a job, an insult, and your image of yourself, which you call your person, changes deeply. To know what you are you must first investigate and know what you are not. And to know what you are not you must watch yourself carefully, rejecting all that does not necessarily go with the basic fact, I am. The idea is, I am born at a given place at a given time for my parents and now I am so and so living at married to father of employed by and so on are not inherent in the sense I am. Our usual attitude is of I am this. Separate consistently and perseveringly the I am from this or that and try to feel what it means to be just to be without being this or that. All our habits go against it and the task of fighting them is long and hard sometimes but clear understanding helps a lot. The clearer you understand that on the level of the mind you can be described in negative terms only, the quicker you will come to the end of your search and realize your limitless being. Chapter 19. Reality Lies in Objectivity Questioner, I am a painter and I earn by painting pictures. Has it any value from the spiritual point of view? Maharaj, when you paint what do you think about? Question, when I paint there is only the painting in myself. Maharaj, what are you doing there? Question, I paint. Maharaj, no you don't. You see the painting going on. You're watching only all else happens. Question, the picture is painting itself. Or is there some deeper me or some God who is painting? Maharaj, consciousness itself is the greatest painter. The entire world is a picture. Question, who painted the picture of the world? Maharaj, the painter is in the picture. Question, 
the picture is in the mind of the painter and the painter is in the picture which is in the mind of the painter who is in the picture. Is not this infinity of states and dimensions absurd? The moment we talk of picture in the mind, which itself is in the picture, we come to an endless succession of witnesses, the higher witness witnessing the lower. It is like standing between two mirrors and wondering at the crowd. Maharaj, quite right, you alone in the double mirror are there. Between the two, your forms and names are numberless. Question, how do you look at the world? Maharaj, I see a painter painting a picture. The picture I call the world, the painter I call God. I am neither. I do not create, nor am I created. I contain all, nothing contains me. Question, when I see a tree, a face, a sunset, the picture is perfect. When I close my eyes, the image in my mind is faint and hazy. If it is my mind that projects the picture, why need I open my eyes to see a lovely flower and with eyes closed I see it vaguely? Maharaj, it is because your outer eyes are better than your inner eyes. Your mind is all turned outward. As you learn to watch your mental world, you will find it even more colorful and perfect than what the body can provide. Of course you will need some training. But why argue? You imagine that the picture must come from the painter who actually painted it. All the time you look for origins and causes. Causality is in the mind only. Memory gives the illusion of continuity and repetitiveness creates the idea of causality. When things repeatedly happen together, we tend to see a causal link between them. It creates a mental habit, but a habit is not a necessity. Question. You have just said that the world is made by God. Maharaj, remember that language is an instrument of the mind. It is made by the mind for the mind. Once you admit a cause, then God is the ultimate cause and the world the effect. They are different but not separate. Question. People talk of seeing God. Maharaj, when you see the world you see God. There is no seeing God apart from the world. Beyond the world to see God is to be God. The light by which you see the world, which is God, is the tiny little spark. I am apparently so small, yet the first and the last in every act of knowing and loving. Question, must I see the world to see God? Maharaj, how else? No world, no God. Question, what remains? Maharaj, you remain as pure being. Question, and what becomes of the world and of God? Maharaj, pure being of Yakta. Question, is it the same as the great expanse Paramakash? Maharaj, you may call it so. Words do not matter, for they do not reach it. They turn back in utter negation. Question, how can I see the world as God? What does it mean to see the world as God? Maharaj, it is like entering a dark room. You see nothing, you may touch, but you do not see no colors, no outlines. The window opens and the room is flooded with light. Colors and shapes come into being. The window is the giver of light, but not the source of it. The sun is the source. Similarly, matter is like the dark room. Consciousness, the window flooding matter with sensations and perceptions, and the supreme is the sun, the source both of matter and of light. The window may be closed or open, the sun shines all the time. It makes all the difference to the room, but none to the sun. Yet all this is secondary to the tiny little thing which is the I am. Without that I am there is nothing. All knowledge is about the I am. False ideas about this I am lead to bondage, right knowledge leads to freedom and happiness. Question. Is I am and there is the same. Maharaj, I am denotes the inner, there is the outer. Both are based on the sense of being. Question. Is it the same as the experience of existence? Maharaj, to exist means to be something, a thing, a feeling, a thought, an idea. All existence is particular. Only being is universal, in the sense that every being is compatible with every other being. Existence is clash being never. Existence means becoming change, birth and death and birth again, while in being there is silent peace. 
Question. If I create the world, why have I made it bad? Maharaj, everyone lives in his own world. Not all the worlds are equally good or bad. Question. What determines the difference? Maharaj, the mind that projects the world colors it its own way. When you meet a man, he is a stranger. When you marry him, he becomes your own self. When you quarrel, he becomes your enemy. It is your mind's attitude that determines what he is to you. Question. I can see that my world is subjective. Does it make it also illusory? Maharaj, it is illusory as long as it is subjective and to that extent only. Reality lies in objectivity. Question. What does objectivity mean? You said the world is subjective and now you talk of objectivity. Is not everything subjective? Maharaj, everything is subjective but the real is objective. Question, in what sense? Maharaj, it does not depend on memories and expectations, desires and fears, likes and dislikes. All is seen as it is. Question, is it what you call the fourth stateria? Maharaj, call it as you like. It is solid, steady, changeless, beginningless and endless, ever new, ever fresh. Question, how is it reached? Maharaj, desirelessness and fearlessness will take you there. Chapter 20, The Supreme is Beyond All. Questioner, you say reality is one. Oneness, unity, is the attribute of the person. Is then reality a person with the universe as its body? Maharaj, whatever you may say will be both true and false. Words do not reach beyond the mind. Question. I am just trying to understand. You are telling us of the person, the self and the supreme. Vyakti Vyakta Avyakta. The light of pure awareness Pragna. Focused as I am in the self give Atma. As consciousness Chitana illumines the mind Antakarana. And as life Prana Vitalis is the body Dha. All this is fine as far as the words go. But when it comes to distinguishing in myself the person from the self and the self from the supreme, I get mixed up. Maharaj, the person is never the subject. You can see a person, but you are not the person. You are always the supreme which appears at a given point of time and space as the witness, a bridge between the pure awareness of the supreme and the manifold consciousness of the person. Question, when I look at myself, I find I am several persons fighting among themselves for the use of the body. Maharaj, they correspond to the various tendencies samskara of the mind. Question, can I make peace between them? Maharaj, how can you? They are so contradictory. See them as they are, mere habits of thoughts and feelings, bundles of memories and urges. Question, yet they all say I am. Maharaj, it is only because you identify yourself with them. Once you realize that whatever appears before you cannot be yourself, and cannot say I am, you are free of all your persons and their demands. The sense I am is your own. You cannot part with it but you can impart it to anything as in saying, I am young. I am rich etc. So self-identifications are patently false and the cause of bondage. Question. I can now understand that I am not the person but that which when reflected in the person gives it a sense of being. Now about the Supreme. In what way do I know myself as the Supreme? Maharaj, the source of consciousness cannot be an object in consciousness. To know the source is to be the source. When you realize that you are not the person but the pure and calm witness and that fearless awareness is your very being, you are the being. It is the source, the inexhaustible possibility. Question, are there many sources or one for all? Maharaj, it depends how you look at it from which end. The objects in the world are many, but the eye that sees them is one. The higher always appears as one to the lower and the lower as many to the higher. Question, shapes and names are all of one and the same God? Maharaj, again it all depends on how you look at it. On the verbal level everything is relative. Absolutes should be experienced, not discussed. Question. How is the absolute experienced? Maharaj, it is not an object to be recognized and stored up in memory. 
It is in the present and in feeling rather. It has more to do with the how than with the what. It is in the quality and the value, being the source of everything, it is in everything. Question, if it is the source why and how does it manifest itself? Maharaj, it gives birth to consciousness. All else is in consciousness. Question, why are there so many centers of consciousness? Maharaj, the objective universe Mahadakash is in constant movement projecting and dissolving innumerable forms. Whenever a form is infused with life prana, consciousness chitana appears by reflection of awareness in matter. Question, how is the supreme affected? Maharaj, what can affect it and how? The source is not affected by the vagaries of the river nor is the metal by the shape of the jewelry. Is the light affected by the picture on the screen? The Supreme makes everything possible that is all. Question, how is it that some things do happen and some don't? Maharaj, seeking out causes is a pastime of the mind. There is no duality of cause and effect. Everything is its own cause. Question, no purposeful action is then possible. Maharaj, all I say is that consciousness contains all. In consciousness all is possible. You can have causes if you want them in your world. Another may be content with a single cause, God's will. The root cause is one, the sense I am. Question, what is the link between the self viacta and the suprema viacta? Maharaj, from the self's point of view the world is the known, the supreme, the unknown. The unknown gives birth to the known, yet remains unknown. The known is infinite, but the unknown is an infinitude of infinities. Just like a ray of light is never seen unless intercepted by the specks of dust, so does the Supreme make everything known, itself remaining unknown. Question, does it mean that the unknown is inaccessible? Meharaj, oh no! The Supreme is the easiest to reach for it is your very being. It is enough to stop thinking and desiring anything but the Supreme. Question, and if I desire nothing, not even the Supreme? Meharaj, then you are as good as dead or you are the Supreme. Question, the world is full of desires, everybody wants something or other. Who is the desirer? The person or the self? Meharaj, the self. All desires, holy and unholy, come from the self. They all hang on the sense I am. Question, I can understand holy desire satyakama emanating from the self. It may be the expression of the bliss aspect of the satyatanand beingness, awareness, happiness of the self. But why unholy desires? Meharaj, all desires aim at happiness. Their shape and quality depend on the psyche antakarana. Where inertia tamas predominates, we find perversions. With energy rajas, passions arise. With lucidity sava the motive behind the desire is goodwill, compassion, the urge to make happy rather than be happy. But the supreme is beyond all, yet because of its infinite permeability all cogent desires can be fulfilled. Question, which desires are cogent? Meharaj desires that destroy their subjects or objects or do not subside on satisfaction are self-contradictory and cannot be fulfilled. Only desires motivated by love, goodwill and compassion are beneficial to both the subject and object and can be fully satisfied. Question. All desires are painful the holy as well as the unholy. Meharaj, they are not the same and pain is not the same. Passion is painful compassion, never. The entire universe strives to fulfill a desire born of compassion. Question, does the Supreme know itself? Is the impersonal conscious? Meharaj, the source of all has all. Whatever flows from it must be there already in seed form. And as a seed is the last of innumerable seeds, and contains the experience and the promise of numberless forests, so does the unknown contain all that was, or could have been and all that shall or would be. The entire field of becoming is open and accessible. Past and future coexist in the eternal now. Question, 
are you living in the supreme unknown? Maharaj, where else? Question, what makes you say so? Maharaj, no desire ever arises in my mind. Question, are you then unconscious? Maharaj, of course not. I am fully conscious but since no desire or fear enters my mind, there is perfect silence. Question, who knows the silence? Maharaj, silence knows itself. It is the silence of the silent mind when passions and desires are silenced. Question, do you experience desires occasionally? Maharaj, desires are just waves in the mind. You know a wave when you see one. A desire is just a thing among many. I feel no urge to satisfy it, no action needs be taken on it. Freedom from desire means this. The compulsion to satisfy is absent. Question, why do desires arise at all? Maharaj, because you imagine that you were born and that you will die if you do not take care of your body. Desire for embodied existence is the root cause of trouble. Question, yet, so many javas get into bodies. Surely it cannot be some error of judgment. There must be a purpose. What could it be? Maharaj, to know itself the self must be faced with its opposite, the not-self. Desire leads to experience. Experience leads to discrimination, detachment, self-knowledge, liberation. And what is liberation after all? To know that you are beyond birth and death. By forgetting who you are and imagining yourself a mortal creature, you created so much trouble for yourself that you have to wake up like from a bad dream. Inquiry also wakes you up. You need not wait for suffering. Inquiry into happiness is better for the mind is in harmony and peace. Question, who exactly is the ultimate experiencer, the self or the unknown? Maharaj, the self of course. Question, then why introduce the notion of the supreme unknown? Maharaj, to explain the self. Question, but is there anything beyond the self? Maharaj, outside the self there is nothing. All is one and all is contained in I am. In the waking and dream states it is the person. In deep sleep and Turiya it is the self. Beyond the alert intentness of Turiya lies the great, silent peace of the Supreme. But in fact all is one in essence and related in appearance. In ignorance the seer becomes the seen and in wisdom he is the seeing. But why be concerned with the Supreme? Know the knowers and all will be known. Chapter 21 Who am I? Questioner, we are advised to worship reality personified as God or as the perfect man. We are told not to attempt the worship of the Absolute as it is much too difficult for a brain-centered consciousness. Maharaj, truth is simple and open to all. Why do you complicate? Truth is loving and lovable. It includes all, accepts all, purifies all. It is untruth that is difficult and a source of trouble. It always wants, expects, demands. Being false, it is empty, always in search of confirmation and reassurance. It is afraid of and avoids inquiry. It identifies itself with any support, however weak and momentary. Whatever it gets, it loses and asks for more. Therefore, put no faith in the conscious. Nothing you can see, feel, or think is so. Even sin and virtue, merit and demerit are not what they appear. Usually the bad and the good are a matter of convention and custom and are shunned or welcomed, according to how the words are used. Question, are there not good desires and bad, high desires and low? Meharaj, all desires are bad but some are worse than others. Pursue any desire, it will always give you trouble. Question, even the desire to be free of desire. Meharaj, why desire at all? Desiring a state of freedom from desire will not set you free. Nothing can set you free because you are free. See yourself with desireless clarity that is all. Question. It takes time to know oneself. Maharaj, how can time help you? Time is a succession of moments. Each moment appears out of nothing and disappears into nothing, never to reappear. How can you build on something so fleeting? Question, what is permanent? 
Maharaj, look to yourself for the permanent. Dive deep within and find what is real in you. Question, how to look for myself? Maharaj, whatever happens, it happens to you. What you do, the doer is in you. Find the subject of all that you are as a person. Question, what else can I be? Maharaj, find out. Even if I tell you that you are the witness, the silent watcher, it will mean nothing to you unless you find the way to your own being. Question, my question is, how to find the way to one's own being? Maharaj, give up all questions except one, who am I? After all, the only fact you are sure of is that you are. The I am is certain. The I am this is not. Struggle to find out what you are in reality. Question, I am doing nothing else for the last sixty years. Maharaj, what is wrong with striving? Why look for results? Striving itself is your real nature. Question, striving is painful. Maharaj, you make it so by seeking results. Strive without seeking, struggle without greed. Question, why has God made me as I am? Maharaj, which God are you talking about? What is God? Is he not the very light by which you ask the question? I am itself as God. The seeking itself is God. In seeking you discover that you are neither the body nor mind, and the love of the self in you is for the self in all. The two are one. The consciousness in you and the consciousness in me apparently two really one seek unity and that is love. Question, how am I to find that love? Maharaj, what do you love now? That I am. Give your heart and mind to it, think of nothing else. This when effortless and natural, is the highest state. In it love itself is the lover and the beloved. Question, everybody wants to live to exist. Is it not self-love? Maharaj, all desire has its source in the self. It is all a matter of choosing the right desire. Question, what is right and what is wrong varies with habit and custom. Standards vary with societies. Maharaj, discard all traditional standards. Leave them to the hypocrites. Only what liberates you from desire and fear and wrong ideas is good. As long as you worry about sin and virtue you will have no peace. Question, I grant that sin and virtue are social norms. But there may be also spiritual sins and virtues. I mean by spiritual the absolute. Is there such a thing as absolute sin or absolute virtue? Maharaj, sin and virtue refer to a person only. Without a sinful or virtuous person, what is sin or virtue? At the level of the Absolute there are no persons. The ocean of pure awareness is neither virtuous nor sinful. Sin and virtue are invariably relative. Question, can I do away with such unnecessary notions? Maharaj, not as long as you think yourself to be a person. Question, by what sign shall I know that I am beyond sin and virtue? Maharaj, by being free from all desire and fear from the very idea of being a person. To nourish the ideas, I am a sinner, I am not a sinner, is sin. To identify oneself with the particular is all the sin there is. The impersonal is real, the personal appears and disappears. I am is the impersonal being. I am this is the person. The person is relative and the pure being fundamental. Question. Surely pure being is not unconscious, nor is it devoid of discrimination. How can it be beyond sin and virtue? Just tell us please, has it intelligence or not? Maharaj, all these questions arise from your believing yourself to be a person. Go beyond the personal and see. Question, what exactly do you mean when you ask me to stop being a person? Maharaj, I do not ask you to stop being that you cannot. I ask you only to stop imagining that you were born, have parents, or a body, will die and so on. Just try, make a beginning, it is not as hard as you think. Question, to think oneself as the personal is the sin of the impersonal. Maharaj, again the personal point of view. Why do you insist on polluting the impersonal with your ideas of sin and virtue? It just does not apply. The impersonal cannot be described in terms of good and bad. 
it is being, wisdom, love, all absolute. Where is the scope for sin there? And virtue is only the opposite of sin. Question. We talk of divine virtue. Maharaj, true virtue is divine nature swarupa. What you are really is your virtue. But the opposite of sin which you call virtue is only obedience born out of fear. Question. Then why all effort at being good? Maharaj, it keeps you on the move. You go on and on till you find God. Then God takes you into himself and makes you as he is. Question. The same action is considered natural at one point and a sin at another. What makes it sinful? Maharaj, whatever you do against your better knowledge is sin. Question. Knowledge depends on memory. Maharaj, remembering yourself is virtue, forgetting yourself is sin. It all boils down to the mental or psychological link between the spirit and matter. We may call the link Saiki Enta Karana. When the psyche is raw, undeveloped, quite primitive, it is subject to gross illusions. As it grows in breadth and sensitivity, it becomes a perfect link between pure matter and pure spirit and gives meaning to matter and expression to spirit. There is the material world Mahadakash and the spiritual Paramakash. Between lies the universal mind Chittakash which is also the universal heart Paramakash. It is wise love that makes the two one. Question. Some people are stupid, some are intelligent. The difference is in their psyche. The ripe ones had more experience behind them. Just like a child grows by eating and drinking, sleeping and playing, so is man's psyche shaped by all he thinks and feels and does, until it is perfect enough to serve as a bridge between the spirit and the body. As a bridge permits the traffic, between the banks, so does the psyche bring together the source and its expression. Maharaj, call it love. The bridge is love. Question. Ultimately all is experience. Whatever we think feel do is experience. Behind it is the experiencer. So all we know consists of these two, the experiencer and the experience. But the two are really one, the experiencer alone is the experience. Still the experiencer takes the experience to be outside. In the same way the spirit and the body are one, they only appear as two. Maharaj, to the spirit there is no second. Question, to whom then does the second appear? It seems to me that duality is an illusion induced by the imperfection of the psyche. When the psyche is perfect, duality is no longer seen. Maharaj, you have said it. Question. Still I have to repeat my very simple question, who makes the distinction between sin and virtue? Maharaj, he who has a body sins with the body, he who has a mind sins with the mind. Question, surely the mere possession of mind and body does not compel to sin. There must be a third factor at the root of it. I come back again and again to this question of sin and virtue because nowadays young people keep on saying that there is no such thing as sin, that one need not be squeamish and should follow the moment's desire readily. They will accept neither tradition nor authority and can be influenced only by solid and honest thought. If they refrain from certain actions, it is through fear of police rather than by conviction. Undoubtedly there is something in what they say, for we can see how our values change from place to place and time to time. For instance, killing in war is great virtue today and may be considered a horrible crime next century. Maharaj, a man who moves with the earth will necessarily experience days and nights. He who stays with the sun will know no darkness. My world is not yours. As I see it, you all are on a stage performing. There is no reality about your comings and goings. And your problems are so unreal. Question, we may be sleepwalkers or subject to nightmares. Is there nothing you can do? Maharaj, I am doing, I did enter your dreamlike state to tell you stop hurting yourself and others, stop suffering, wake up. Question, why then do we wake up? Maharaj, you will. I shall not be thwarted. It may take some time. When you shall begin to question your dream, awakening will be not far away. Chapter 22, 
Life is love and love is life. Questioner, is the practice of yoga always conscious? Or can it be quite unconscious below the threshold of awareness? Maharaj, in the case of a beginner the practice of yoga is often deliberate and requires great determination. But those who are practicing sincerely for many years are intent on self-realization all the time whether conscious of it or not. Unconscious sadhana is most effective because it is spontaneous and steady. Question, what is the position of the man who was a sincere student of yoga for some time and then got discouraged and abandoned all efforts? Maharaj, what a man appears to do or not to do is often deceptive. His apparent lethargy may be just a gathering of strength. The causes of our behavior are very subtle. One must not be quick to condemn, not even to praise. Remember that yoga is the work of the inner self acta on the outer self acti. All that the outer does is merely in response to the inner. Question, still the outer helps. Maharaj, how much can it help and in what way? It has some control over the body and can improve its posture and breathing. Over the mind's thoughts and feelings it has little mastery, for it is itself the mind. It is the inner that can control the outer. The outer will be wise to obey. Question. If it is the inner that is ultimately responsible for man's spiritual development, why is the outer so much exhorted and encouraged? Meharaj, the outer can help by keeping quiet and free from desire and fear. You would have noticed that all advice to the outer is in the form of negations. Don't stop, refrain, forego, give up, sacrifice, surrender, see the false as false. Even the little description of reality that is given is through denials, not this, not this, netty, netty. All positives belong to the inner self, as all absolutes to reality. Question. How are we to distinguish the inner from the outer in actual experience? Maharaj, the inner is the source of inspiration, the outer is moved by memory. The source is untraceable, while all memory begins somewhere. Thus the outer is always determined, while the inner cannot be held in words. The mistake of students consists in their imagining the inner to be something to get hold of, and forgetting that all perceivables are transient and therefore unreal. Only that which makes perception possible, call it life or Brahman, or what you like, is real. Question. Must life have a body for its self-expression? Maharaj, the body seeks to live. It is not life that needs the body, it is the body that needs life. Question. Does life do it deliberately? Maharaj, does love act deliberately? Yes and no. Life is love and love is life. What keeps the body together but love? What is desire but love of the self? What is fear but the urge to protect? And what is knowledge but the love of truth? The means and forms may be wrong, but the motive behind is always love, love of the me and the mine. The me and the mine may be small, or may explode and embrace the universe, but love remains. Question. The repetition of the name of God is very common in India. Is there any virtue in it? Maharaj, when you know the name of a thing or a person you can find it easily. By calling God by his name you make him come to you. Question. In what shape does he come? Maharaj, according to your expectations. If you happen to be unlucky and some saintly soul gives you a mantra for good luck and you repeat it with faith and devotion, your bad luck is bound to turn. Steady faith is stronger than destiny. Destiny is the result of causes, mostly accidental, and is therefore loosely woven. Confidence and good hope will overcome it easily. Question. When a mantra is chanted, what exactly happens? Meharaj. The sound of mantra creates the shape which will embody the self. The self can embody any shape and operate through it. After all, the self is expressing itself in action, and a mantra is primarily energy in action. It acts on you, it acts on your surroundings. Question. The mantra is traditional. Must it be so? 
Meharaj, since time immemorial the link was created between certain words and corresponding energies and reinforced by numberless repetitions. It is just like a road to walk on. It is an easy way, only faith is needed. You trust the road to take you to your destination. Question, in Europe there is no tradition of a mantra, except in some contemplative orders. Of what use is it to a modern young Westerner? Maharaj, none unless he is very much attracted. For him the right procedure is to adhere to the thought that he is the ground of all knowledge, the immutable and perennial awareness of all that happens to the senses and the mind. If he keeps it in mind all the time, aware and alert, he is bound to break the bounds of non-awareness and emerge into pure life, light and love. The idea, I am the witness only will purify the body and the mind and open the eye of wisdom. Then man goes beyond illusion and his heart is free of all desires. Just like ice turns to water and water to vapor, and vapor dissolves in air and disappears in space, so does the body dissolve into pure awareness chittakash, then into pure being paramakash which is beyond all existence and non-existence. Question, the realized man eats, drinks and sleeps. What makes him do so? Maharaj, the same power that moves the universe moves him too. Question, all are moved by the same power. What is the difference? Maharaj, this only, the realized man knows what others merely hear, but don't experience. Intellectually they may seem convinced, but in action they betray their bondage while the realized man is always right. Question, everybody says I am. The realized man too says I am. Where is the difference? Maharaj, the difference is in the meaning attached to the words I am. With the realized man the experience. I am the world, the world is mine is supremely valid, he thinks, feels and acts integrally and in unity with all that lives. He may not even know the theory and practice of self-realization, and be born and bred free of religious and metaphysical notions. But there will not be the least flaw in his understanding and compassion. Question, I may come across a beggar naked and hungry and ask him who are you? He may answer, I am the Supreme Self. Well, I say, suffice you are the Supreme Changer present state. What will he do? Maharaj, he will ask you, which state? What is there that needs changing? What is wrong with me? Question, why should he answer so? Maharaj, because he is no longer bound by appearances, he does not identify himself with the name and shape. He uses memory, but memory cannot use him. Question, is not all knowledge based on memory? Meharaj, lower knowledge, yes. Higher knowledge, knowledge of reality, is inherent in man's true nature. Question, can I say that I am not what I am conscious of, nor am I consciousness itself? Meharaj, as long as you are a seeker, better cling to the idea that you are pure consciousness, free from all content. To go beyond consciousness is the supreme state. Question, the desire for realization, does it originate in consciousness or beyond? Maharaj, in consciousness of course. All desire is born from memory and is within the realm of consciousness. What is beyond is clear of all striving. The very desire to go beyond consciousness is still in consciousness. Question, is there any trace or imprint of the beyond on consciousness? Meharaj, no there cannot be. Question, then what is the link between the two? How can a passage be found between two states which have nothing in common? Is not pure awareness the link between the two? Meharaj, even pure awareness is a form of consciousness. Question, then what is beyond? Emptiness? Meharaj, emptiness again refers only to consciousness. Fullness and emptiness are relative terms. The real is really beyond beyond not in relation to consciousness, but beyond all relations of whatever kind. The difficulty comes with the word state. The real is not a state of something else, it is not a state of mind or consciousness or psyche nor is it something that has a beginning and an end being and not being. 
all opposites are contained in it, but it is not in the play of opposites. You must not take it to be the end of a transition. It is itself after the consciousness as such is no more. Then words I am man or I am God have no meaning. Only in silence and in darkness can it be heard and seen. Chapter 23 Discrimination Leads to Detachment Meharaj, you are all drenched for it is raining hard. In my world, it is always fine weather. There is no night or day, no heat or cold. No worries beset me there, nor regrets. My mind is free of thoughts, for there are no desires to slave for. Questioner, are there two worlds? Maharaj, your world is transient changeful. My world is perfect changeless. You can tell me what you like about your world, I shall listen carefully, even with interest, yet not for a moment shall I forget that your world is not, that you are dreaming. Question, what distinguishes your world from mine? Maharaj, my world has no characteristics by which it can be identified. You can say nothing about it. I am my world. My world is myself. It is complete and perfect. Every impression is erased, every experience rejected. I need nothing, not even myself, for myself I cannot lose. Question, not even God. Maharaj, all these ideas and distinctions exist in your world. In mine there is nothing of the kind. My world is single and very simple. Question, nothing happens there. Maharaj, whatever happens in your world only there it has validity and evokes response. In my world nothing happens. Question, the very fact of your experiencing your own world implies duality inherent in all experience. Maharaj, verbally yes. But your words do not reach me. Mine is a non-verbal world. In your world the unspoken has no existence. In mine the words and their contents have no being. In your world nothing stays, in mine nothing changes. My world is real, while yours is made of dreams. Question, yet we are talking. Meharaj, the talk is in your world. In mine there is eternal silence. My silence sings, my emptiness is full, I lack nothing. You cannot know my world until you are there. Question. It seems as if you alone are in your world. Maharaj, how can you say alone or not alone when words do not apply? Of course I am alone for I am all. Question, are you ever coming into our world? Maharaj, what is coming and going to me? These again are words. I am. Whence am I to come from and where to go? Question, of what use is your world to me? Maharaj, you should consider more closely your own world, examine it critically and suddenly one day you will find yourself in mine. Question, what do we gain by it? Maharaj, you gain nothing. You leave behind what is not your own and find what you have never lost, your own being. Question, who is the ruler of your world? Maharaj, there are no ruler and ruled here. There is no duality whatsoever. You are merely projecting your own ideas. Your scriptures and your gods have no meaning here. Question, still you have a name and shape, display consciousness and activity. Maharaj, in your world I appear so. In mine I have being only. Nothing else. You people are rich with your ideas of possession of quantity and quality. I am completely without ideas. Question. In my world there is disturbance, distress and despair. You seem to be living on some hidden income, while I must slay for a living. Maharaj, do as you please. You are free to leave your world for mine. Question, how is the crossing done? Maharaj, see your world as it is, not as you imagine it to be. Discrimination will lead to detachment. Detachment will ensure right action. Right action will build the inner bridge to your real being. Action is a proof of earnestness. Do what you are told diligently and faithfully and all obstacles will dissolve. Question, are you happy? Maharaj, in your world I would be most miserable. To wake up, to eat, to talk, to sleep again, what a bother. Question, so you do not want to live even? 
Meharaj, to live to die, what meaningless words are these? When you see me alive I am dead. When you think me dead I am alive. How muddled up you are. Question, how indifferent you are. All the sorrows of our world are as nothing to you. Meharaj, I am quite conscious of your troubles. Question, then, what are you doing about them? Meharaj, there is nothing I need doing. They come and go. Question, do they go by the very act of your giving them attention? Meharaj, yes. The difficulty may be physical, emotional, or mental, but it is always individual. Large-scale calamities are the sum of numberless individual destinies and take time to settle. But death is never a calamity. Question, even when a man is killed. Maharaj, the calamity is of the killer. Question, still it seems there are two worlds, mine and yours. Maharaj, mine is real, yours is of the mind. Question, imagine a rock and a hole in the rock and a frog in the hole. The frog may spend its life in perfect bliss, undistracted, undisturbed. Outside the rock the world goes on. If the frog in the hole were told about the outside world, he would say, there is no such thing. My world is of peace and bliss. Your world is a word structure only. It has no existence. It is the same with you. When you tell us that our world simply does not exist, there is no common ground for discussion. Or take another example. I go to a doctor and complain of stomach ache. He examines me and says, You are all right. But it pains, I say. Your pain is mental, he asserts. I say it does not help me to know that my pain is mental. You are a doctor, cure me of my pain. If you cannot cure me, you are not my doctor. Maharaj, quite right. Question, you have built the railroad, but for lack of a bridge no train can pass. Build the bridge. Maharaj, there is no need of a bridge. Question, there must be some link between your world and mine. Meharaj, there is no need of a link between a real world and an imaginary world for there cannot be any. Question, so what are we to do? Meharaj, investigate your world, apply your mind to it, examine it critically, scrutinize every idea about it, that will do. Question, the world is too big for investigation. All I know is that I am the world is, the world troubles me and I trouble the world. Maharaj, my experience is that everything is bliss. Desire for bliss creates pain. Thus bliss becomes the seat of pain. The entire universe of pain is born of desire. Give up the desire for pleasure and you will not even know what is pain. Question, why should pleasure be the seat of pain? Maharaj, because for the sake of pleasure you are committing many sins. And the fruits of sin are suffering and death. Question, you say the world is of no use to us, only a tribulation. I feel it cannot be so. God is not such a fool. The world seems to me a big enterprise for bringing the potential into actual, matter into life, the unconscious into full awareness. To realize the supreme we need the experience of the opposites. Just as for building a temple we need stone and mortar, wood and iron, glass and tiles, so for making a man into a divine sage, a master of life and death, one needs the material of every experience. As a woman goes to the market, buys provisions of every sort, comes home, cooks, bakes and feeds her lord, so we bake ourselves nicely in the fire of life and feed our God. Meharaj, well if you think so act on it. Feed your God by all means. Question. A child goes to school and learns many things, which will be of no use to it later. But in the course of learning it grows. So do we pass through experiences without number and forget them all, but in the meantime we grow all the time. And what is a Johnny but a man with a genius for reality? This world of mine cannot be an accident. It makes sense there must be a plan behind it. My God has a plan. Meharaj, if the world is false, then the plan and its creator are also false. Question. Again you deny the world. There is no bridge between us. Maharaj, there is no need of a bridge. 
Your mistake lies in your belief that you are born. You were never born nor will you ever die, but you believe that you were born at a certain date and place and that a particular body is your own. Question, the world is I am. These are facts. Maharaj, why do you worry about the world before taking care of yourself? You want to save the world, don't you? Can you save the world before saving yourself? And what means being saved? Saved from what? From illusion. Salvation is to see things as they are. I really do not see myself related to anybody in anything. Not even to a self, whatever that self may be. I remain forever undefined. I am, within and beyond, intimate and unapproachable. Question, how did you come to it? Maharaj, by my trust in my guru. He told me you alone are and I did not doubt him. I was merely puzzling over it until I realize that it is absolutely true. Question. Conviction by repetition. Maharaj by self-realization. I found that I am conscious and happy absolutely and only by mistake I thought I owed being consciousness bliss to the body and the world of bodies. Question. You are not a learned man. You have not read much and what you read or heard did perhaps not contradict itself. I am fairly well educated and have read a lot and I found that books and teachers contradict each other hopelessly. Hence whatever I read or hear I take it in a state of doubt. It may be so, it may not be so is my first reaction. And as my mind is unable to decide what is true and what is not, I am left high and dry with my doubts. In yoga a doubting mind is at a tremendous disadvantage. Maharaj, I am glad to hear it, but my guru too taught me to doubt everything and absolutely. He said, deny existence to everything except yourself. Through desire you have created the world with its pains and pleasures. Question, must it be also painful? Maharaj, what else? By its very nature pleasure is limited and transitory. Out of pain desire is born, in pain it seeks fulfillment and it ends in the pain of frustration and despair. Pain is the background of pleasure, all seeking of pleasure is born in pain and ends in pain. Question, all you say is clear to me. But when some physical or mental trouble comes, my mind goes dull and gray or seeks frantically for relief. Maharaj, what does it matter? It is the mind that is dull or restless, not you. Look, all kinds of things happen in this room. Do I cause them to happen? They just happen. So it is with you. The role of destiny unfolds itself and actualizes the inevitable. You cannot change the course of events, but you can change your attitude, and what really matters is the attitude and not the bare event. The world is the abode of desires and fears. You cannot find peace in it. For peace, you must go beyond the world. The root cause of the world is self love. Because of it we seek pleasure and avoid pain. Replace self-love by love of the self and the picture changes. Brahma the creator is the sum total of all desires. The world is the instrument for their fulfillment. Souls take whatever pleasure they desire and pay for them in tears. Time squares all accounts. The law of balance reigns supreme. Question. To be a superman one must be a man first. Manhood is the fruit of innumerable experiences. Desire drives to experience. Hence at its own time and level desire is right. Maharaj, all this is true in a way. But a day comes when you have amassed enough and must begin to build. Then sorting out and discarding Viveka Varajya are absolutely necessary. Everything must be scrutinized and the unnecessary ruthlessly destroyed. Believe me, there cannot be too much destruction. For in reality, nothing is of value. Be passionately dispassionate, that is all. Chapter 24 God is the All-Doer, the Jhani and Non-Doer. Questioner Some Mahatmas enlightened beings maintain that the world is neither an accident nor a play of God, but the result and expression of a mighty plan of work aiming at awakening and developing consciousness throughout the universe. From lifelessness to life, 
from unconsciousness to consciousness, from dullness to bright intelligence, from misapprehension to clarity, that is the direction in which the world moves ceaselessly and relentlessly. Of course there are moments of rest and apparent darkness, when the universe seems to be dormant, but the rest comes to an end and the work on consciousness is resumed. From our point of view, the world is a dale of tears, a place to escape from as soon as possible and by every possible means. To enlightened beings the world is good and it serves a good purpose. They do not deny that the world is a mental structure and that ultimately all is one, but they see and say that the structure has meaning and serves a supremely desirable purpose. What we call the will of God is not a capricious whim of a playful deity, but the expression of an absolute necessity to grow in love and wisdom and power, to actualize the infinite potentials of life and consciousness. Just as a gardener grows flowers from a tiny seed to glorious perfection, so does God in his own garden grow, among other beings, men to supermen, who know and love and work along with him. When God takes rest pralia, those whose growth was not completed, become unconscious for a time, while the perfect ones, who have gone beyond all forms and contents of consciousness, remain aware of the universal silence. When the time comes for the emergence of a new universe, the sleepers wake up and their work starts. The more advanced wake up first and prepare the ground for the less advanced, who thus find forms and patterns of behavior suitable for their further growth. Thus runs the story. The difference with your teaching is this. You insist that the world is no good and should be shunned. They say that distaste for the world is a passing stage necessary yet temporary, and is soon replaced by an all-pervading love, and a steady will to work with God. Maharaj, all you say is right for the outgoing pravriti path. For the path of return of riti nodding oneself is necessary. My stand I take where nothing paramakash is, words do not reach there, nor thoughts. To the mind it is all darkness and silence. Then consciousness begins to stir and wakes up the mind Chittakash, which projects the world Mahadakash, built of memory and imagination. Once the world comes into being all you say may be so. It is in the nature of the mind to imagine goals, to strive towards them, to seek out means and ways, to display vision, energy and courage. These are divine attributes and I do not deny them. But I take my stand where no difference exists, where things are not, nor the minds that create them. There I am at home. Whatever happens does not affect me, things act on things, that is all. Free from memory and expectation, I am fresh, innocent, and wholehearted. Mind is the great worker Mahakarta, and it needs rest. Needing nothing, I am unafraid. Whom to be afraid of? There is no separation, we are not separate selves. There is only one self, the supreme reality in which the personal and the impersonal are one. Question, all I want is to be able to help the world. Maharaj, who says you cannot help? You made up your mind about what help means and needs and got yourself into a conflict between what you should and what you can, between necessity and ability. Question, but why do we do so? Maharaj, your mind projects a structure and you identify yourself with it. It is in the nature of desire to prompt the mind to create a world for its fulfillment. Even a small desire can start a long line of action. What about a strong desire? Desire can produce a universe, its powers are miraculous. Just as a small mastic can set a huge forest on fire, so does a desire light the fires of manifestation. The very purpose of creation is the fulfillment of desire. A desire may be noble or ignoble, space akash is neutral, one can fill it with what one likes. You must be very careful as to what you desire. And as to the people you want to help, they are in their respective worlds for the sake of their desires. There is no way of helping them except through their desires. You can only teach them to have right desires so that they may rise above them and be free from the urge to create and recreate worlds of desires, abodes of pain and pleasure. Question. 
a day must come when the show is wound up, a man must die, a universe come to an end. Meharaj, just as a sleeping man forgets all and wakes up for another day or he dies and emerges into another life, so do the worlds of desire and fear dissolve and disappear. The universal witness, the supreme self never sleeps and never dies. Eternally the great heart beats and at each beat a new universe comes into being. Question, is he conscious? Maharaj, he is beyond all that the mind conceives. He is beyond being and not being. He is the yes and no to everything beyond and within creating and destroying unimaginably real. Question, God and the Mahatma are they one or two? Maharaj, they are one. Question, there must be some difference. Meharaj, God is the all-doer, the jhani is a non-doer. God himself does not say, I am doing all. To him things happen by their own nature. To the jhani all is done by God. He sees no difference between God and nature. Both God and the jhani know themselves to be the immovable center of the movable, the eternal witness of the transient. The center is a point of void, and the witness a point of pure awareness. They know themselves to be as nothing therefore nothing can resist them. Question, how does this look and feel in your personal experience? Meharaj, being nothing I am all. Everything is me, everything is mine. Just as my body moves by my mere thinking of the movement, so do things happen as I think of them. Mind you I do nothing. I just see them happen. Question. Do things happen as you want them to happen or do you want them to happen as they happen? Maharaj, both. I accept and am accepted. I am all and all is me. Being the world, I am not afraid of the world. Being all, what am I to be afraid of? Water is not afraid of water, nor fire of fire. Also I am not afraid because I am nothing that can experience fear or can be in danger. I have no shape nor name. It is attachment to a name and shape that breeds fear. I am not attached. I am nothing and nothing is afraid of no thing. On the contrary, everything is afraid of the nothing, for when a thing touches nothing, it becomes nothing. It is like a bottomless well, whatever falls into it disappears. Question. Isn't God a person? Meharaj, as long as you think yourself to be a person, he too is a person. When you are all, you see him as all. Question, can I change facts by changing attitude? Meharaj, the attitude is the fact. Take anger. I may be furious, pacing the room up and down. At the same time I know what I am, a center of wisdom and love, an atom of pure existence. All subsides and the mind merges into silence. Question, still, you are angry sometimes. Maharaj, with whom am I to be angry and for what? Anger came and dissolved on my remembering myself. It is all a play of Guna's qualities of cosmic matter. When I identify myself with them I am their slave. When I stand apart I am their master. Question, can you influence the world by your attitude? By separating yourself from the world you lose all hope of helping it. Maharaj, how can it be? All is myself, can't I help myself? I do not identify myself with anybody in particular, for I am all both the particular and the universal. Question, can you then help me the particular person? Meharaj, but I do help you always from within. Myself and yourself are one. I know it, but you don't. That is all the difference and it cannot last. Question, and how do you help the entire world? Maharaj Gandhi is dead yet his mind pervades the earth. The thought of a Johnny pervades humanity and works ceaselessly for good. Being anonymous coming from within, it is the more powerful and compelling. That is how the world improves, the inner aiding and blessing the outer. When a Johnny dies, he is no more in the same sense in which a river is no more when it merges in the sea. The name, the shape, are no more, but the water remains and becomes one with the ocean. When a Johnny joins the universal mind, all his goodness and wisdom become the heritage of humanity and uplift every human being. Question, we are attached to our personality. 
our individuality, our being unlike others, we value very much. You seem to denounce both as useless. You're unmanifested of what use is it to us. Maharaj, unmanifested, manifested individuality, personality, nirguna, siguna, vyakta, vyakti, all these are mere words, points of view, mental attitudes. There is no reality in them. The real is experienced in silence. You cling to personality, but you are conscious of being a person only when you are in trouble. When you are not in trouble, you do not think of yourself. Question. You did not tell me the uses of the unmanifested. Meharaj, surely you must sleep in order to wake up. You must die in order to live. You must melt down to shape anew. You must destroy to build and annihilate before creation. The Supreme is the universal solvent. It corrodes every container. It burns through every obstacle. Without the absolute denial of everything, the tyranny of things would be absolute. The Supreme is the great harmonizer, the guarantee of the ultimate and perfect balance of life and freedom. It dissolves you and thus reasserts your true being. Question. It is all well on its own level. But how does it work in daily life? Maharaj, the daily life is a life of action. Whether you like it or not, you must function. Whatever you do for your own sake accumulates and becomes explosive. One day it goes off and plays havoc with you and your world. When you deceive yourself that you work for the good of all, it makes matters worse, for you should not be guided by your own ideas of what is good for others. A man who claims to know what is good for others is dangerous. Question, how is one to work then? Maharaj, neither for yourself nor for others but for the work's own sake. A thing worth doing is its own purpose and meaning, make nothing a means to something else. Why not? God does not create one thing to serve another. Each is made for its own sake. Because it is made for itself, it does not interfere. You are using things and people for purposes alien to them and you play havoc with the world and yourself. Question, our real being is all the time with us you say. How is it that we do not notice it? Meharaj, yes you are always the supreme. But your attention is fixed on things physical or mental. When your attention is off a thing and not yet fixed on another, in the interval you are pure being. When through the practice of discrimination and detachment viveka veragya, you lose sight of sensory and mental states, pure being emerges as the natural state. Question. How does one bring to an end this sense of separateness? Meharaj, by focusing the mind on I am on the sense of being I am so and so dissolves, I am a witness only remains and that too submerges and I am all. Then the all becomes the one and the one, yourself, not to be separate from me. Abandon the idea of a separate I in the question of whose experience will not arise. Question, you speak from your own experience. How can I make it mine? Meharaj, you speak of my experience as different from your experience because you believe we are separate. But we are not. On a deeper level my experience is your experience. Dive deep within yourself and you will find it easily and simply. Go in the direction of I am. Chapter 25 Hold on to I am. Questioner, are you ever glad or sad? Do you know joy and sorrow? Maharaj, call them as you please. To me they are states of mind only, and I am not the mind. Question, is love a state of mind? Maharaj, again it depends what you mean by love. Desire is of course a state of mind. But the realization of unity is beyond mind. To me nothing exists by itself. All is the self, all is myself. To see myself in everybody and everybody in myself most certainly is love. Question, when I see something pleasant I want it. Who exactly wants it? The self or the mind? Maharaj, the question is wrongly put. There is no who. There is desire, fear, anger, and the mind says, this is me, this is mine. There is no thing which could be called me or mine. Desire is a state of the mind, perceived and named by the mind. Without the mind perceiving and naming, where is desire? Question, 
but is there such a thing as perceiving without naming? Maharaj, of course. Naming cannot go beyond the mind, while perceiving is consciousness itself. Question, when somebody dies what exactly happens? Maharaj, nothing happens. Something becomes nothing. Nothing was, nothing remains. Question, surely there is a difference between the living and the dead. You speak of the living as dead and of the dead as living. Maharaj, why do you fret at one man dying and care a little for the millions dying every day? Entire universes are imploding and exploding every moment am I to cry over them? One thing is quite clear to me, all that is lives and moves and has its being in consciousness and I am in and beyond that consciousness. I am in it as the witness. I am beyond it as being. Question, surely you care when your child is ill, don't you? Maharaj, I don't get flustered. I just do the needful. I do not worry about the future. A right response to every situation is in my nature. I do not stop to think what to do. I act and move on. Results do not affect me. I do not even care whether they are good or bad. Whatever they are, they are. If they come back to me, I deal with them afresh. Or rather, I happen to deal with them afresh. There is no sense of purpose in my doing anything. Things happen as they happen, not because I make them happen, but it is because I am that they happen. In reality, nothing ever happens. When the mind is restless, it makes Shiva dance, like the restless waters of the lake make the moon dance. It is all appearance due to wrong ideas. Question, surely you are aware of many things and behave according to their nature. You treat a child as a child and an adult as an adult. Maharaj, just as the taste of salt pervades the great ocean and every single drop of sea water carries the same flavor, so every experience gives me the touch of reality, the ever fresh realization of my own being. Question, do I exist in your world as you exist in mine? Maharaj, of course you are and I am, but only as points in consciousness, we are nothing apart from consciousness. This must be well grasped. The world hangs on the thread of consciousness. No consciousness, no world. Question. There are many points in consciousness. Are there as many worlds? Maharaj, take dream for an example. In a hospital there may be many patients, all sleeping, all dreaming, each dreaming his own private, personal dreams unrelated, unaffected, having one single factor in common illness. Similarly, we have divorced ourselves in our imagination from the real world of common experience and enclosed ourselves in a cloud of personal desire and fears, images and thoughts, ideas and concepts. Question, this I can understand. But what could be the cause of the tremendous variety of the personal worlds? Maharaj, the variety is not so great. All the dreams are superimposed over a common world. To some extent they shape and influence each other. The basic unity operates in spite of all. At the root of it all lies self-forgetfulness, not knowing who I am. Question, to forget one must know. Did I know who I am before I forgot it? Maharaj, of course. Self-forgetting is inherent in self-knowing. Consciousness and unconsciousness are two aspects of one life. They coexist. To know the world you forget the self, to know the self you forget the world. What is world after all? A collection of memories. Cling to one thing, that matters, hold on to I am and let go all else. This is sadhana. In realization there is nothing to hold on to and nothing to forget. Everything is known, nothing is remembered. Question, what is the cause of self-forgetting? Maharaj, there is no cause because there is no forgetting. Mental states succeed one another and each obliterates the previous one. Self-remembering is a mental state and self-forgetting is another. They alternate like day and night. Reality is beyond both. Question. Surely there must be a difference between forgetting and not knowing. Not knowing needs no cause. Forgetting presupposes previous knowledge and also the tendency or ability to forget. I admit, 
I cannot inquire into the reason for not knowing, but forgetting must have some ground. Meharaj, there is no such thing as not knowing. There is only forgetting. What is wrong with forgetting? It is as simple to forget as to remember. Question. Is it not a calamity to forget oneself? Maharaj, as bad as to remember oneself continuously. There is a state beyond forgetting and not forgetting the natural state. To remember to forget these are all states of mind thought bound word bound. Take for example the idea of being born. I am told I was born. I do not remember. I am told I shall die. I do not expect it. You tell me I have forgotten or I lack imagination. But I just cannot remember what never happened, nor expect the patently impossible. Bodies are born and bodies die. But what is it to me? Bodies come and go in consciousness and consciousness itself has its roots in me. I am life and mine or mind and body. Question. You say at the root of the world is self-forgetfulness. To forget I must remember. What did I forget to remember? I have not forgotten that I am. Meharaj, this I am too may be a part of the illusion. Q. How can it be? You cannot prove to me that I am not. Even when convinced that I am not I am. Meharaj, reality can neither be proved nor disproved. Within the mind you cannot, beyond the mind you need not. In the real the question what is real does not arise. The manifested saguna and unmanifested nirguna are not different. Question. In that case all is real. Meharaj, I am all. As myself all is real. Apart from me, nothing is real. Question. I do not feel that the world is the result of a mistake. Meharaj, you may say so only after a full investigation, not before. Of course when you discern and let go all that is unreal, what remains is real. Question. Does anything remain? Meharaj, the real remains. But don't be mislead by words. Question. Since immemorial time during innumerable births, I build and improve and beautify my world. It is neither perfect nor unreal. It is a process. Meharaj, you are mistaken. The world has no existence apart from you. At every moment it is but a reflection of yourself. You create it, you destroy it question and build it again improved. Meharaj, to improve it you must disprove it. One must die to live. There is no rebirth except through death. Question, your universe may be perfect. My personal universe is improving. Meharaj, your personal universe does not exist by itself. It is merely a limited and distorted view of the real. It is not the universe that needs improving, but your way of looking. Question, how do you view it? Maharaj, it is a stage on which a world drama is being played. The quality of the performance is all that matters, not what the actors say and do, but how they say and do it. Question, I do not like this Leela play idea I would rather compare the world to a workyard in which we are the builders. Maharaj, you take it too seriously. What is wrong with play? You have a purpose only as long as you are not complete Purna. Till then completeness perfection is the purpose. But when you are complete in yourself, fully integrated within and without, then you enjoy the universe. You do not labor at it. To the disintegrated you may seem working hard, but that is their illusion. Sportsmen seem to make tremendous efforts, yet their sole motive is to play and display. Question. Do you mean to say that God is just having fun that he is engaged in purposeless action? Maharaj, God is not only true and good, he is also beautiful Satyam Shivam Sundaram. He creates beauty for the joy of it. Question, well then beauty is his purpose. Maharaj, why do you introduce purpose? Purpose implies movement, change, a sense of imperfection. God does not aim at beauty whatever he does is beautiful. Would you say that a flower is trying to be beautiful? It is beautiful by its very nature. Similarly God is perfection itself, not an effort at perfection. Question. The purpose fulfills itself in beauty. 
Maharaj, what is beautiful? Whatever is perceived blissfully is beautiful. Bliss is the essence of beauty. Question, you speak of Sat Chit Ananda. That I am is obvious. That I know is obvious. That I am happy is not at all obvious. Where is my happiness gone? Maharaj, be fully aware of your own being and you will be in bliss consciously. Because you take your mind off yourself and make it dwell on what you are not, you lose your sense of well being of being well. Question There are two paths before us the path of effort yoga marga and the path of ease boga marga. Both lead to the same goal liberation. Maharaj, why do you call boga a path? How can ease bring you perfection? Question. The perfect renouncer yogi will find reality. The perfect enjoyer bogi also will come to it. Maharaj, how can it be? Aren't they contradictory? Question. The extremes meet. To be a perfect bogi is more difficult than to be a perfect yogi. I am a humble man and cannot venture judgments of value. Both the yogi and the bogi, after all, are concerned with the search for happiness. Yogi wants it permanent, the bogi is satisfied with the intermittent. Often the bogi strives harder than the yogi. Maharaj, what is your happiness worth when you have to strive and labor for it? True happiness is spontaneous and effortless. Question, all beings seek happiness. The means only differ. Some seek it within, and are therefore called yogis, some seek it without, and are condemned as bogies. Yet they need each other. Maharaj, pleasure and pain alternate. Happiness is unshakable. What you can seek and find is not the real thing. Find what you have never lost, find the inalienable. Chapter 26 Personality and Obstacle Questioner as I can see the world is a school of yoga and life itself is yoga practice. Everybody strives for perfection and what is yoga but striving. There is nothing contemptible about the so-called common people in their common lives. They strive as hard and suffer as much as the yogi, only they are not conscious of their true purpose. Maharaj, in what way are your common people yogis? Question, their ultimate goal is the same. Yogi secures by renunciation tayaga the common man realizes through experience boga. The way of boga is unconscious and therefore repetitive and protracted while the way of yoga is deliberate and intense and therefore can be more rapid. Maharaj, maybe the periods of yoga and boga alternate. First bogi, then yogi, then again bogi, then again yogi. Question, what may be the purpose? Maharaj, weak desires can be removed by introspection and meditation, but strong, deep-rooted ones must be fulfilled and their fruits sweet or bitter tasted. Question, why then should we pay tribute to yogis and speak slightingly of bogies? All are yogis in a way. Maharaj, on the human scale of values deliberate effort is considered praiseworthy. In reality both the yogi and bogi follow their own nature according to circumstances and opportunities. The yogi's life is governed by a single desire to find the truth. The bogi serves many masters. The yogi becomes a yogi and the yogi may get a rounding up and about of boga. Final result is the same. Question. Buddha is reported to have said that it is tremendously important to have heard that there is enlightenment, a complete reversal and transformation in consciousness. The good news is compared to a spark in a shipload of cotton. Slowly but relentlessly the whole of it will turn to ashes. Similarly the good news of enlightenment will, sooner or later, bring about a transformation. Maharaj, yes first hearing Shravana then remembering Smrana, pondering Manana and so on. We are on familiar ground. The man who heard the news becomes a yogi, while the rest continue in their boga. Question. But you agree that living a life, just living the humdrum life of the world, being born to die and dying to be born advances man by its sheer volume, just like the river finds its way to the sea by the sheer mass of the water it gathers. 
Maharaj before the world was, consciousness was. In consciousness it comes into being, in consciousness it lasts and into pure consciousness it dissolves. At the root of everything is the feeling I am. The state of mind, there is a world is secondary, for to be I do not need the world, the world needs me. Question, the desire to live is a tremendous thing. Maharaj, still greater is the freedom from the urge to live. Question, the freedom of the stone. Maharaj, yes the freedom of the stone and much more besides. Freedom unlimited and conscious. Question, is not personality required for gathering experience? Maharaj, as you are now the personality is only an obstacle. Self-identification with the body may be good for an infant, but true growing up depends on getting the body out of the way. Normally, one should outgrow body-based desires early in life. Even the bogey who does not refuse enjoyments need not hanker after the ones he has tasted. Habit, desire for repetition frustrates both the yogi and the bogey. Question, why do you keep on dismissing the person Vyakti as of no importance? Personality is the primary fact of our existence. It occupies the entire stage. Maharaj, as long as you do not see that it is mere habit built on memory prompted by desire, you will think yourself to be a person living, feeling, thinking, active, passive, pleased or pained. Question yourself, ask yourself. Is it so? Who am I? What is behind and beyond all this? And soon you will see your mistake. And it is in the very nature of a mistake to cease to be when seen. Question, the yoga of living of life itself, we may call the natural yoga nisarga yoga. It reminds me of the primal yoga at high yoga, mentioned in the Rig Veda which was described as the marrying of life with mind. Maharaj, a life lived thoughtfully in full awareness, is by itself nisarga yoga. Question, what does the marriage of life and mind mean? Maharaj, living in spontaneous awareness, consciousness of effortless living, being fully interested in one's life, all this is implied. Question, Sharada Divi, wife of Sri Ramakrishna Paramahamsa, used to scold his disciples for too much effort. She compared them to mangoes on the tree which are being plucked before they are ripe. Why hurry? She used to say, Wait till you are fully ripe, mellow and sweet. Maharaj, how right she was. There are so many who take the dawn for the noon, a momentary experience for full realization and destroy even the little they gain by excess of pride. Humility and silence are essential for a sadhaka, however advanced. Only a fully ripened Johnny can allow himself complete spontaneity. Question. It seems there are schools of yoga where the student, after illumination, is obliged to keep silent for seven or twelve or fifteen or even twenty-five years. Even Bhagavan Sri Ramana Maharshi imposed on himself twenty years of silence before he began to teach. Maharaj, yes the inner fruit must ripen. Until then the discipline, the living in awareness must go on. Gradually the practice becomes more and more subtle until it becomes altogether formless. Question, Krishnamurti too speaks of living in awareness. Maharaj, he always aims directly at the ultimate. Yes, ultimately all yogas end in your high yoga, the marriage of consciousness, the bride to life, the bridegroom. Consciousness and being sad should meet in bliss and anda. For bliss to arise there must be meeting, contact, the assertion of unity and duality. Question, Buddha too has said that for the attainment of nirvana one must go to living beings. Consciousness needs life to grow. Maharaj, the world itself is contact, the totality of all contacts actualized in consciousness. The spirit touches matter and consciousness results. Such consciousness when tainted with memory and expectation becomes bondage. Pure experience does not bind. Experience caught between desire and fear is impure and creates karma. Question, can there be happiness in unity? Does not all happiness imply necessarily contact hence duality? Maharaj, 
There is nothing wrong with duality as long as it does not create conflict. Multiplicity and variety without strife is joy. In pure consciousness there is light. For warmth, contact is needed. Above the unity of being is the union of love. Love is the meaning and purpose of duality. Question, I am an adopted child. My own father I do not know. My mother died when I was born. My foster father, to please my foster mother, who is childless, adopted me, almost by accident. He is a simple man, a truck owner and driver. My mother keeps the house. I am twenty-four years now. For the last two and a half years I am traveling, restless, seeking. I want to live a good life, a holy life. What am I to do? May Haraj, go home, take charge of your father's business, look after your parents in their old age. Marry the girl who is waiting for you, be loyal, be simple, be humble. Hide your virtue, live silently. The five senses and the three qualities, gunas, are your eight steps in yoga. And I am is the great reminder Mahamantra. You can learn from them all you need to know. Be attentive, inquire ceaselessly. That is all. Question. If just living one's life liberates, why are not all liberated? Meharaj, all are being liberated. It is not what you live, but how you live that matters. The idea of enlightenment is of utmost importance. Just to know that there is such possibility changes one's entire outlook. It acts like a burning match in a heap of sawdust. All the great teachers did nothing else. A spark of truth can burn up a mountain of lies. The opposite is also true. The sun of truth remains hidden behind the cloud of self-identification with the body. Question. This spreading the good news of enlightenment seems very important. Meharaj, the very hearing of it is a promise of enlightenment. The very meeting a guru is the assurance of liberation. Perfection is life-giving and creative. Question. Does a realized man ever think, I am realized? Is he not astonished when people make much of him? Does he not take himself to be an ordinary human being? Meharaj, neither ordinary nor extraordinary. Just being aware and affectionate intensely. He looks at himself without indulging in self-definitions and self-identifications. He does not know himself as anything apart from the world. He is the world. He is completely rid of himself, like a man who is very rich, but continually gives away his riches. He is not rich for he has nothing. He is not poor for he gives abundantly. He is just propertyless. Similarly, the realized man is egoless. He has lost the capacity of identifying himself with anything. He is without location, placeless, beyond space and time, beyond the world. Beyond words and thoughts is he. Question, well, it is deep mystery to me. I am a simple man. Meharaj, it is you who are deeply complex, mysterious, hard to understand. I am simplicity itself compared to you. I am what is without any distinction whatsoever into inner and outer, mine and yours, good and bad. What the world is I am, what I am the world is. Question, how does it happen that each man creates his own world? Meharaj, when a number of people are asleep each dreams his own dream. Only on awakening the question of many different dreams arises and dissolves when they are all seen as dreams, as something imagined. Question, even dreams have a foundation. Meharaj, in memory. Even then what is remembered is but another dream. The memory of the false cannot but give rise to the false. There is nothing wrong with memory as such. What is false is its content. Remember facts, forget opinions. Question, what is a fact? Meharaj, what is perceived in pure awareness, unaffected by desire? Chapter 27, The Beginningless Begins Forever Questioner, the other day I was asking you about the two ways of growth, renunciation and enjoyment yoga and bhoga. The difference is not so great as it looks the yogi renounces to enjoy, the bhogi enjoys to renounce. The yogi renounces first. Maharaj, so what? Leave the yogi to his yoga, 
and the bogey to boga. Question, the way of boga seems to me the better one. The yogi is like a green mango, separated from the tree prematurely and kept to open in a basket of straw. Airless and overheated, it does get ripe, but the true flavor and fragrance are lost. The mango left on the tree grows to full size, color and sweetness. A joy in every way. Yet somehow yoga gets all the praises and boga all the curses. As I see it boga is the better of the two. Maharaj, what makes you say so? Question, I watch the yogis and their enormous efforts. Even when they realize there is something bitter or astringent about it. They seem to spend much of their time in trances, and when they speak, they merely voice their scriptures. At their best such jhanis are like flowers, perfect but just little flowers, shedding their fragrance within a short radius. There are some others who are like forests, rich, varied, immense, full of surprises, a world in themselves. There must be a reason for this difference. Maharaj, well you said it. According to you one got stunted in his yoga, while the other flourished in boga. Question, is it not so? The yogi is afraid of life and seeks peace, while the bogi is adventurous, full of spirits, forward going. The yogi is bound by an ideal, while the bogi is ever ready to explore. Maharaj, it is a matter of wanting much or being satisfied with little. The yogi is ambitious while the bogi is merely adventurous. Your bogi seems to be richer and more interesting, but it is not so in reality. The yogi is narrow as the sharp edge of the knife. He has to be to cut deep and smoothly, to penetrate unerringly the many layers of the false. The bogi worships at many altars, the yogi serves none but his own true self. There is no purpose in opposing the yogi to the bogi. The way of outgoing pravritti necessarily precedes the way of returning navritti. To sit in judgment and allot marks is ridiculous. Everything contributes to the ultimate perfection. Some say there are three aspects of reality, truth, wisdom, bliss. He who seeks truth becomes a yogi, he who seeks wisdom becomes a jhani, he who seeks happiness becomes the man of action. Question, we are told of the bliss of non-duality. Maharaj, such bliss is more of the nature of a great peace. Pleasure and pain are the fruits of actions, righteous and unrighteous. Question, what makes the difference? Maharaj, the difference is between giving and grasping. Whatever the way of approach in the end all becomes one. Question, if there be no difference in the goal, why discriminate between various approaches? Maharaj, let each act according to his nature. The ultimate purpose will be served in any case. All your discriminations and classifications are quite all right, but they do not exist in my case. As the description of a dream may be detailed and accurate, though without having any foundation, so does your pattern fit nothing but your own assumptions. You begin with an idea and you end with the same idea under a different garb. Question, how do you see things? Maharaj, one and all are the same to me. The same consciousness chit appears as being sat and as bliss ananda. Chit in movement is ananda. Chit motionless is being. Question, still you are making a distinction between motion and motionlessness. Maharaj, non-distinction speaks in silence. Words carry distinctions. The unmanifested Nirguna has no name, all names refer to the manifested Saguna. It is useless to struggle with words to express what is beyond words. Consciousness Chidananda is spirit Purusha, consciousness is matter Prakriti. Imperfect spirit is matter, perfect matter is spirit. In the beginning as in the end all is one. All division is in the mind Chitta. There is none in reality Chit. Movement and rest are states of mind and cannot be without their opposites. By itself nothing moves, nothing rests. It is a grievous mistake to attribute to mental constructs absolute existence. Nothing exists by itself. Question, you seem to identify rest with the supreme state. Maharaj, 
There is rest as a state of mind shitaram and there is rest as a state of being atmaram. The former comes and goes, while the true rest is the very heart of action. Unfortunately, language is a mental tool and works only in opposites. Question, as a witness you are working or at rest. Meharaj, witnessing is an experience and rest is freedom from experience. Question, can't they coexist as the tumult of the waves and the quiet of the deep coexist in the ocean? Meharaj, beyond the mind there is no such thing as experience. Experience is a dual state. You cannot talk of reality as an experience. Once this is understood, you will no longer look for being and becoming a separate and opposite. In reality they are one and inseparable, like roots and branches of the same tree. Both can exist only in the light of consciousness, which again, arises in the wake of the sense I am. This is the primary fact. If you miss it, you miss all. Question. Is the sense of being a product of experience only? The great saying Mahavakya Tat Sat is it a mere mode of mentation? Maharaj, whatever is spoken is speech only. Whatever is thought is thought only. The real meaning is unexplainable, though experienceable. The Mahavakya is true but your ideas are false for all ideas Kalpana are false. Question, is the conviction, I am that false? Maharaj, of course. Conviction is a mental state. In that there is no I am. With the sense I am emerging, that is obscured, as with the sun rising the stars are wiped out. But as with the sun comes light, so with the sense of self comes bliss Chitananda. The cause of bliss is sought in the not I, and thus the bondage begins. Question. In your daily life are you always conscious of your real state? Maharaj, neither conscious nor unconscious. I do not need convictions. I live on courage. Courage is my essence which is love of life. I am free of memories and anticipations, unconcerned with what I am and what I am not. I am not addicted to self-descriptions, so hem and brahmas me, I am he. I am the supreme or of no use to me, I have the courage to be as nothing and to see the world as it is, nothing. It sounds simple just try it. Question but what gives you courage? Maharaj, how perverted are your views? Need courage be given? Your question implies that anxiety is the normal state and courage is abnormal. It is the other way round. Anxiety and hope are born of imagination. I am free of both. I am simple being and I need nothing to rest on. Question. Unless you know yourself of what use is your being to you. To be happy with what you are, you must know what you are. Meharaj, being shines as knowing, knowing is warm in love. It is all one. You imagine separations and trouble yourself with questions. Don't concern yourself over much with formulations. Pure being cannot be described. Question. Unless a thing is noble and enjoyable, it is of no use to me. It must become a part of my experience, first of all. Meharaj, you are dragging down reality to the level of experience. How can reality depend on experience, when it is the very grounded har of experience? Reality is in the very fact of experience, not in its nature. Experience is, after all, a state of mind, while being is definitely not a state of mind. Question. Again I am confused. Is being separate from knowing? Maharaj, the separation is an appearance. Just as the dream is not apart from the dreamer, so is knowing not apart from being. The dream is the dreamer, the knowledge is the knower, the distinction is merely verbal. Question, I can see now that sad and chit are one. But what about bliss and anda? Being and consciousness are always present together, but bliss flashes only occasionally. Maharaj, the undisturbed state of being is bliss, the disturbed state is what appears as the world. In non-duality there is bliss, in duality, experience. What comes and goes is experience with its duality of pain and pleasure. Bliss is not to be known. One is always bliss but never blissful. 
This is not an attribute. Question: I have another question to ask. Some yogis attain their goal, but it is of no use to others. They do not know or are not able to share. Those who can share out what they have initiate others. Where lies the difference, Maharaj? There is no difference. Your approach is wrong. There are no others to help. A rich man, when he hands over his entire fortune to his family, has not a coin left to give a beggar. So is the wise man Johnny stripped of all his powers and possessions. Nothing, literally, nothing can be said about him. He cannot help anybody, for he is everybody. He is the poor, and also his poverty, the thief, and also his thievery. How can he be said to help when he is not a part? Who thinks of himself as separate from the world? Let him help the world. Question: Still, there is duality. There is sorrow. There is need of help. By denouncing it as mere dream, nothing is achieved. Maharaj, the only thing that can help is to wake up from the dream. Question: An awakening is needed. Maharaj, who again is in the dream? The awakening signifies the beginning of the end. There are no eternal dreams. Question: Even when it is beginningless, Maharaj, everything begins with you. What else is beginningless? Question: I began at birth, Maharaj. That is what you are told. Is it so? Did you see yourself beginning? Question: I began just now. All else is memory, Maharaj. Quite right. The beginningless begins forever. In the same way, I give eternally because I have nothing. To be nothing, to have nothing, to keep nothing for oneself is the greatest gift, the highest generosity. Question: Is there no self-concern left, Maharaj? Of course, I am self-concerned, but the self is all. In practice, it takes the shape of goodwill, unfailing and universal. You may call it love, all-pervading, all-redeeming. Such love is supremely active, without the sense of doing. Chapter twenty-eight. All suffering is born of desire. Questioner, I come from a far-off country. I had some inner experiences on my own, and I would like to compare notes. Maharaj, by all means. Do you know yourself? Question. I know that I am not the body, nor am I the mind. Maharaj, what makes you say so? Question. I do not feel I am in the body. I seem to be all over the place everywhere. As to the mind, I can switch it on and off, so to say. This makes me feel I am not the mind, Maharaj. When you feel yourself everywhere in the world, do you remain separate from the world, or are you the world? Question. Both. Sometimes I feel myself to be neither mind nor body, but one single, all-seeing eye. When I go deeper into it, I find myself to be all I see in the world, and myself become one. Maharaj, very well. What about desires? Do you have any? Question: Yes, they come short and superficial. Maharaj, and what do you do about them? Question: What can I do? They come, they go. I look at them. Sometimes I see my body and my mind engaged in fulfilling them. Maharaj, whose desires are being fulfilled? Question: They are a part of the world in which I live. They are just as trees and clouds are there, Maharaj. Are they not a sign of some imperfection? Question: Why should they be? They are as they are, and I am as I am. How can the appearance and disappearance of desires affect me? Of course, they affect the shape and content of the mind, Maharaj. Very well. What is your work? Question: I am a probation officer, Maharaj. What does it mean? Question: Juvenile offenders are let off on probation, and there are special officers to watch their behavior and to help them get training and find work. Maharaj, must you work? Question: Who works? Work happens to take place. Maharaj, do you need to work? Question: I need it for the sake of money. I like it because it puts me in touch with living beings. Maharaj, what do you need them for? Question. They may need me, and it is their destinies that made me take up this work. It is one life after all. 
Maharaj, how did you come to your present state? Question, Sri Ramana Maharshi's teachings have put me on my way. Then I met one Douglas Harding who helped me by showing me how to work on the Who Am I? Maharaj, was it sudden or gradual? Question, it was quite sudden. Like something quite forgotten coming back into one's mind. Or like a sudden flash of understanding. How simple, I said, how simple. I'm not what I thought I am. I'm neither the perceived nor the perceiver. I'm the perceiving only. Maharaj, not even the perceiving but that which makes all this possible. Question, what is love? Maharaj, when the sense of distinction and separation is absent, you may call it love. Question, why so much stress on love between man and woman? Maharaj, because the element of happiness in it is so prominent. Question, is it not so in all love? Maharaj, not necessarily. Love may cause pain. You call it then compassion. Question, what is happiness? Maharaj, harmony between the inner and the outer is happiness. On the other hand, self-identification with the outer causes is suffering. Q. How does self-identification happen? Maharaj, the self by its nature knows itself only. For lack of experience whatever it perceives it takes to be itself. Battered it learns to look out viveka and to live alone veragia. When right behavior uparati becomes normal, a powerful inner urge mukmakshatva makes it seek its source. The candle of the body is lighted and all becomes clear and bright. Question, what is the real cause of suffering? Maharaj, self-identification with the limited vayaktitva. Sensations as such, however strong, do not cause suffering. It is the mind bewildered by wrong ideas, addicted to thinking. I am this I am that that fears loss and craves gain and suffers when frustrated. Question. A friend of mine used to have horrible dreams night after night. Going to sleep would terrorize him. Nothing could help him. Maharaj, company of the truly good satsang would help him. Question. Life itself is a nightmare. Maharaj. Noble friendship satsang is the supreme remedy for all ills, physical and mental. Question. Generally one cannot find such friendship. Maharaj, seek within. Your own self is your best friend. Question, why is life so full of contradictions? Maharaj, it serves to break down mental pride. We must realize how poor and powerless we are. As long as we delude ourselves by what we imagine ourselves to be, to know, to have, to do, we are in a sad plight indeed. Only in complete self-negation there is a chance to discover our real being. Question, why so much stress on self-negation? Maharaj, as much as on self-realization. False self must be abandoned before the real self can be found. Question, the self you choose to call false is to me most distressingly real. It is the only self I know. What you call the real self is a mere concept, a way of speaking, a creature of the mind, an attractive ghost. My daily self is not a beauty, I admit, but it is my own and only self. You say I am or have another self. Do you see it? Is it a reality to you, or do you want me to believe what you yourself don't see? Maharaj, don't jump to conclusions rashly. The concrete need not be the real, the conceived need not be false. Perceptions based on sensations and shaped by memory imply a perceiver, whose nature you never cared to examine. Give it your full attention, examine it with loving care, and you will discover heights and depths of being which you did not dream of, engrossed as you are in your puny image of yourself. Question. I must be in the right mood to examine myself fruitfully. Maharaj, you must be serious intent truly interested. You must be full of goodwill for yourself. Question, I am selfish all right. Maharaj, you are not. You are all the time destroying yourself and your own by serving strange gods, inimical and false. By all means be selfish the right way. Wish yourself well labor at what is good for you. Destroy all that stands between you and happiness. Be all love all be happy make happy. 
though happiness is greater. Question, why is there so much suffering in love? Meharaj, all suffering is born of desire. True love is never frustrated. How can the sense of unity be frustrated? What can be frustrated is the desire for expression. Such desire is of the mind. As with all things mental frustration is inevitable. Question, what is the place of sex in love? Meharaj, love is a state of being. Sex is energy. Love is wise, sex is blind. Once the true nature of love and sex is understood there will be no conflict or confusion. Question, there is so much sex without love. Meharaj, without love all is evil. Life itself without love is evil. Question, what can make me love? Maharaj, you are love itself when you are not afraid. Chapter 29, Living is Life's Only Purpose. Questioner, what does it mean to fail in yoga? Who is a failure in yoga yoga brashta? Maharaj, it is only a question of incompletion. He who could not complete his yoga for some reason is called failed in yoga. Such failure is only temporary, for there can be no defeat in yoga. This battle is always won, for it is a battle between the true and the false. The false has no chance. Question, who fails? The person viacti or the self-viacta? Maharaj, the question is wrongly put. There is no question of failure, neither in the short run nor in the long. It is like traveling a long and arduous road in an unknown country. Of all the innumerable steps there is only the last which brings you to your destination. Yet you will not consider all previous steps as failures. Each brought you nearer to your goal, even when you had to turn back to bypass an obstacle. In reality each step brings you to your goal, because to be always on the move learning, discovering, unfolding, is your eternal destiny. Living is life's only purpose. The self does not identify itself with success or failure. The very idea of becoming this or that is unthinkable. The self understands that success and failure are relative and related, that they are the very warp and weft of life. Learn from both and go beyond. If you have not learnt, repeat. Question, what am I to learn? Maharaj, to live without self-concern. For this you must know your own true being Swarupa as indomitable, fearless, ever victorious. Once you know with absolute certainty that nothing can trouble you but your own imagination, you come to disregard your desires and fears, concepts and ideas and live by truth alone. Question, what may be the reason that some people succeed and others fail in yoga? Is it destiny or character or just accident? Maharaj, Nobody ever fails in yoga. It is all a matter of the rate of progress. It is slow in the beginning and rapid in the end. When one is fully matured, realization is explosive. It takes place spontaneously or at the slightest hint. The quick is not better than the slow. Slow ripening and rapid flowering alternate. Both are natural and right. Yet all this is so in the mind only. As I see it, there is really nothing of the kind. In the great mirror of consciousness, images arise and disappear, and only memory gives them continuity. And memory is material, destructible, perishable, transient. On such flimsy foundations, we build a sense of personal existence, vague, intermittent, dreamlike. This vague persuasion, I am so and so obscures the changeless state of pure awareness and makes us believe that we are born to suffer and to die. Question. Just as a child cannot help growing so does a man compelled by nature make progress. Why exert oneself? Where is the need of yoga? Maharaj, there is progress all the time. Everything contributes to progress. But this is the progress of ignorance. The circles of ignorance may be ever widening, yet it remains a bondage all the same. In due course a guru appears to teach and inspire us to practice yoga, and a ripening takes place as a result of which the immemorial night of ignorance dissolves before the rising sun of wisdom. But in reality nothing happened. The sun is always there, 
there is no night to it. The mind blinded by they, I am the body idea spins out endlessly, its thread of illusion. Question. If all is a part of a natural process, where is the need of effort? Maharaj, even effort is a part of it. When ignorance becomes obstinate and hard and the character gets perverted, effort and the pain of it become inevitable. In complete obedience to nature, there is no effort. The seed of spiritual life grows in silence and in darkness until its appointed hour. Question. We come across some great people who in their old age become childish, petty, quarrelsome and spiteful. How could they deteriorate so much? Maharaj, they were not perfect yogis having their bodies under complete control. Or they might not have cared to protect their bodies from the natural decay. One must not draw conclusions without understanding all the factors. Above all, one must not make judgments of inferiority or superiority. Youthfulness is more a matter of vitality, prana, than of wisdom, jhana. Question. One may get old, but why should one lose all alertness and discrimination? Maharaj, consciousness and unconsciousness while in the body depend on the condition of the brain. But the self is beyond both beyond the brain, beyond the mind. The fault of the instrument is no reflection on its user. Question. I was told that a realized man will never do anything unseemly. He will always behave in an exemplary way. Maharaj, who sets the example, why should a liberated man necessarily follow conventions? The moment he becomes predictable he cannot be free. His freedom lies in his being free to fulfill the need of the moment, to obey the necessity of the situation. Freedom to do what one likes is really bondage while being free to do what one must, what is right, is real freedom. Question, still there must be some way of making out who has realized and who has not. If one is indistinguishable from the other, of what use is he? Maharaj, he who knows himself has no doubts about it. Nor does he care whether others recognize his state or not. Rare is the realized man who discloses his realization and fortunate are those who have met him, for he does it for their abiding welfare. Question, when one looks round one is appalled by the volume of unnecessary suffering that is going on. People who should be helped are not getting help. Imagine a big hospital ward full of incurables, tossing and moaning. Were you given the authority to kill them all and end their torture? Would you not do so? Maharaj, I would leave it to them to decide. Question, but if their destiny is to suffer, how can you interfere with destiny? Maharaj, their destiny is what happens. There is no thwarting of destiny. You mean to say everybody's life is totally determined at his birth? What a strange idea. Were it so the power that determines would see to it that nobody should suffer. Question, what about cause and effect? Maharaj, each moment contains the whole of the past and creates the whole of the future. Question, but past and future exist. Maharaj, in the mind only. Time is in the mind, space is in the mind. The law of cause and effect is also a way of thinking. In reality all is here and now and all is one. Multiplicity and diversity are in the mind only. Question. Still, you are in favor of relieving suffering, even through destruction of the incurably diseased body. Maharaj, again you look from outside while I look from within. I do not see a sufferer, I am the sufferer. I know him from within and do what is right spontaneously and effortlessly. I follow no rules nor lay down rules. I flow with life faithfully and irresistibly. Question. Still you seem to be a very practical man in full control of your immediate surroundings. Maharaj, what else do you expect me to be? A misfit? Question. Yet you cannot help another much. Maharaj, surely I can help. You too can help. Everybody can help. But the suffering is all the time recreated. Man alone can destroy in himself the roots of pain. Others can only help with the pain, but not with its cause, which is the abysmal stupidity of mankind. Question, will this stupidity ever come to an end? Maharaj, in man of course. 
any moment. In humanity as we know it after very many years. In creation never for creation itself is rooted in ignorance. Matter itself is ignorance. Not to know and not to know that one does not know is the cause of endless suffering. Question. We are told of the great avatars, the saviors of the world. Maharaj, did they save? They have come and gone, and the world plods on. Of course they did a lot and open new dimensions in the human mind. But to talk of saving the world is an exaggeration. Question. Is there no salvation for the world? Maharaj, which world do you want to save? The world of your own projection? Save it yourself. My world? Show me my world and ish I'll deal with it. I am not aware of any world separate from myself which I am free to save or not to save. What business have you with saving the world when all the world needs is to be saved from you? Get out of the picture and see whether there is anything left to save. Question. You seem to stress the point that without you your world would not have existed and therefore the only thing you can do for it is to wind up the show. This is not a way out. Even if the world were of my own creation, this knowledge does not save it. It only explains it. The question remains, why did I create such a wretched world and what can I do to change it? You seem to say, forget it all and admire your own glory. Surely you don't mean it. The description of a disease and its causes does not cure it. What we need is the right medicine. Meharaj, the description and causation are the remedy for a disease caused by obtuseness and stupidity. Just like a deficiency disease is cured through the supply of the missing factor, so are the diseases of living cured by a good dose of intelligent detachment. Viveka Varajya Question you cannot save the world by preaching counsels of perfection. People are as they are. Must they suffer? Meharaj, as long as they are as they are, there is no escape from suffering. Remove the sense of separateness and there will be no conflict. Question. A message in print may be paper and ink only. It is the text that matters. By analyzing the world into elements and qualities, we miss the most important, its meaning. Your reduction of everything to dream disregards the difference between the dream of an insect and the dream of a poet. All is dream granted, but not all are equal. Meharaj, the dreams are not equal but the dreamer is one. I am the insect. I am the poet in dream, but in reality I am neither. I am beyond all dreams. I am the light in which all dreams appear and disappear. I am both inside and outside the dream. Just as a man having headache knows the ache and also knows that he is not the ache, so do I know the dream myself dreaming and myself not dreaming, all at the same time. I am what I am before, during and after the dream. But what I see in dream I am not. Question. It is all a matter of imagination. One imagines that one is dreaming, another imagines one is not dreaming. Are not both the same? Meharaj, the same and not the same. Not dreaming as an interval between two dreams is of course a part of dreaming. Not dreaming as a steady hold on, and timeless abidance in reality has nothing to do with dreaming. In that sense I never dream nor ever shall. Question. If both dream and escape from dream are imaginings what is the way out? Meharaj, there is no need of a way out. Don't you see that a way out is also a part of the dream? All you have to do is to see the dream as dream. Question. If I start the practice of dismissing everything as a dream, where will it lead me? Maharaj, wherever it leads you, it will be a dream. The very idea of going beyond the dream is illusory. Why go anywhere? Just realize that you are dreaming a dream you call the world and stop looking for ways out. The dream is not your problem. Your problem is that you like one part of your dream and not another. Love all or none of it and stop complaining. When you have seen the dream as a dream, you have done all that needs be done. Question. Is dreaming caused by thinking? Meharaj, everything is a play of ideas. In the state free from ideation nervikalpa samadhi nothing is perceived. The root idea is, I am. 
It shatters the state of pure consciousness and is followed by the innumerable sensations and perceptions, feeling and ideas which in their totality constitute God and His world. I am remains as the witness, but it is by the will of God that everything happens. Question, why not by my will? Maharaj, again you have split yourself into God and witness. Both are one. Chapter 30, You are free now. Questioner, there are so many theories about the nature of man and universe. The creation theory, the illusion theory, the dream theory, any number of them. Which is true? Meharaj, all are true, all are false. You can pick up whichever you like best. Question, you seem to favor the dream theory. Meharaj, these are all ways of putting words together. Some favor one way, some favor another. Theories are neither right nor wrong. They are attempts at explaining the inexplicable. It is not the theory that matters, but the way it is being tested. It is the testing of the theory that makes it fruitful. Experiment with any theory you like. If you are truly earnest and honest, the attainment of reality will be yours. As a living being, you are caught in an untenable and painful situation and you are seeking a way out. You are being offered several plans of your prison, none quite true. But they all are of some value, only if you are in dead earnest. It is the earnestness that liberates and not the theory. Question. Theory may be misleading and earnestness blind. Maharaj, your sincerity will guide you. Devotion to the goal of freedom and perfection will make you abandon all theories and systems and live by wisdom, intelligence and active love. Theories may be good as starting points, but must be abandoned, the sooner the better. Question, there is a yogi who says that for realization the Eightfold Yoga is not necessary, that will power alone will do. It is enough to concentrate on the goal with full confidence in the power of pure will to obtain effortlessly and quickly what others take decades to achieve. Maharaj, concentration, full confidence, pure will. With such assets no wonder one attains in no time. This yoga of will is all right for the mature seeker who has shed all desires but one. After all, what is will but steadiness of heart and mind? Given such steadfastness all can be achieved. Question. I feel the yogi did not mean mere steadiness of purpose, resulting in ceaseless pursuit and application. He meant that with will fixed on the goal no pursuit or application are needed. The mere fact of willing attracts its object. Maharaj, whatever name you give it, will or steady purpose or one-pointedness of the mind, you come back to earnestness, sincerity, honesty. When you are in dead earnest, you bend every incident, every second of your life to your purpose. You do not waste time and energy on other things. You are totally dedicated, call it will or love or plain honesty. We are complex beings at war within and without. We contradict ourselves all the time undoing today the work of yesterday. No wonder we are stuck. A little of integrity would make a lot of difference. Question. What is more powerful, desire or destiny? Meharaj, desire shapes destiny. Question. And destiny shapes desire. My desires are conditioned by heredity and circumstances by opportunities and accidents, by what we call destiny. Maharaj, yes you may say so. Question, at what point am I free to desire what I want to desire? Maharaj, you are free now. What is it that you want to desire? Desire it. Question, of course I am free to desire, but I am not free to act on my desire. Other urges will lead me astray. My desire is not strong enough, even if it has my approval. Other desires which I disapprove of are stronger. Maharaj, maybe you are deceiving yourself. Maybe you are giving expression to your real desires and the ones you approve of are kept on the surface for the sake of respectability. Question, it may be as you say, but this is another theory. The fact is that I do not feel free to desire what I think I should, and when I seem to desire rightly, I do not act accordingly. 
Maharaj, it is all due to weakness of the mind and disintegration of the brain. Collect and strengthen your mind and you will find that your thoughts and feelings, words and actions will align themselves in the direction of your will. Question. Again a counsel of perfection. To integrate and strengthen the mind is not an easy task. How does one begin? Maharaj, you can start only from where you are. You are here and now, you cannot get out of here and now. Question, but what can I do here and now? Maharaj, you can be aware of your being here and now. Question, that is all. Maharaj, that is all. There is nothing more to it. Question, all my waking and dreaming I am conscious of myself. It does not help me much. Maharaj, you are aware of thinking, feeling, doing. You are not aware of your being. Question, what is the new factor you want me to bring in? Maharaj, the attitude of pure witnessing of watching the events without taking part in them. Question, what will it do to me? Maharaj, weak-mindedness is due to lack of intelligence of understanding which again is the result of non-awareness. By striving for awareness you bring your mind together and strengthen it. Question, I may be fully aware of what is going on, and yet quite unable to influence it in any way. Maharaj, you are mistaken. What is going on is a projection of your mind. A weak mind cannot control its own projections. Be aware therefore of your mind and its projections. You cannot control what you do not know. On the other hand, knowledge gives power. In practice it is very simple. To control yourself, know yourself. Question, maybe I can come to control myself, but shall I be able to deal with the chaos in the world? Meharaj, there is no chaos in the world except the chaos which your mind creates. It is self-created in the sense that at its very center is the false idea of oneself as a thing different and separate from other things. In reality you are not a thing, nor separate. You are the infinite potentiality, the inexhaustible possibility. Because you are all can be. The universe is but a partial manifestation of your limitless capacity to become. Question. I find that I am totally motivated by desire for pleasure and fear of pain. However noble my desire and justified my fear, pleasure and pain are the two poles between which my life oscillates. Meharaj, go to the source of both pain and pleasure of desire and fear. Observe, investigate, try to understand. Question. Desire and fear both are feelings caused by physical or mental factors. They are there, easily observable. But why are they there? Why do I desire pleasure and fear pain? Meharaj, pleasure and pain are states of mind. As long as you think you are the mind, or rather, the body-mind, you are bound to raise such questions. Question, and when I realize that I am not the body, shall I be free from desire and fear? Meharaj, as long as there is a body and a mind to protect the body, attractions and repulsions will operate. They will be there out in the field of events, but will not concern you. Focus of your attention will be elsewhere. You will not be distracted. Question, still they will be there. Will one never be completely free? Maharaj, you are completely free even now. What you call destiny karma is but the result of your own will to live. How strong is this will you can judge by the universal horror of death? Question. People die willingly quite often. Maharaj, only when the alternative is worse than death. But such readiness to die flows from the same source as the will to live, a source deeper even than life itself. To be a living being is not the ultimate state. There is something beyond, much more wonderful, which is neither being nor non-being neither living nor not living. It is a state of pure awareness, beyond the limitations of space and time. Once the illusion that the body-mind is oneself is abandoned, death loses its terror, it becomes a part of living. Chapter 31 Do Not Undervalue Attention Questioner, as I look at you, you seem to be a poor man with very limited means, facing all the problems of poverty and old age, like everybody else. 
Meharaj, were I very rich, what difference would it make? I am what I am. What else can I be? I am neither rich nor poor, I am myself. Question. Yet, you are experiencing pleasure and pain. Meharaj, I am experiencing these in consciousness, but I am neither consciousness nor its content. Question. You say that in our real being we are all equal. How is it that your experience is so different from ours? Maharaj, my actual experience is not different. It is my evaluation and attitude that differ. I see the same world as you do, but not the same way. There is nothing mysterious about it. Everybody sees the world through the idea he has of himself. As you think yourself to be, so you think the world to be. If you imagine yourself as separate from the world, the world will appear as separate from you and you will experience desire and fear. I do not see the world as separate from me and so there is nothing for me to desire or fear. Question, you are a point of light in the world. Not everybody is. Maharaj, there is absolutely no difference between me and others except in my knowing myself as I am. I am all. I know it for certain and you do not. Question, so we differ all the same. Maharaj, no we do not. The difference is only in the mind and temporary. I was like you, you will be like me. Question, God made a most diversified world. Maharaj, the diversity is in you only. See yourself as you are and you will see the world as it is, a single block of reality, indivisible, indescribable. Your own creative power projects upon it a picture and all your questions refer to the picture. Question. A Tibetan yogi wrote that God creates the world for a purpose and runs it according to a plan. The purpose is good and the plan is most wise. Maharaj, all this is temporary while I am dealing with the eternal. Gods and their universes come and go, avatars follow each other in endless succession, and in the end we are back at the source. I talk only of the timeless source of all the gods with all their universes, past, present and future. Question, do you know them all? Do you remember them? Maharaj, when a few boys stage a play for fun, what is there to see and to remember? Question, why is half humanity male and half female? Maharaj, for their happiness. The impersonal aviacta becomes the personal viacta for the sake of happiness and relationship. By the grace of my guru I can look with equal eye on the impersonal as well as the personal. Both are one to me. In life the personal merges in the impersonal. Question. How does the personal emerge from the impersonal? Maharaj. The two are but aspects of one reality. It is not correct to talk of one preceding the other. All these ideas belong to the waking state. Question. What brings in the waking state? Maharaj, at the root of all creation lies desire. Desire and imagination foster and reinforce each other. The fourth state, Turiya, is a state of pure witnessing, detached awareness, passionless and wordless. It is like space unaffected by whatever it contains. Bodily and mental troubles do not reach it, they are outside there while the witness is always here. Question, what is real, the subjective or the objective? I am inclined to believe that the objective universe is the real one and my subjective psyche is changeful and transient. You seem to claim reality for your inner subjective states and deny all reality to the concrete external world. Maharaj, both the subjective and the objective are changeful and transient. There is nothing real about them. Find the permanent and the fleeting, the one constant factor in every experience. Question, what is this constant factor? Maharaj, my giving it various names and pointing it out in many ways will not help you much unless you have the capacity to see. A dim-sighted man will not see the parrot on the branch of a tree, however much you may prompt him to look. At best you will see your pointed finger. First purify your vision, learn to see instead of staring, and you will perceive the parrot. Also you must be eager to see. You need both clarity and earnestness for self-knowledge. You need maturity of heart and mind, which comes through earnest application in daily life of whatever little you have understood. 
There is no such thing as compromise in yoga. If you want to sin, sin wholeheartedly and openly. Sins too have their lessons to teach the earnest sinner as virtues the earnest saint. It is the mixing up the two that is so disastrous. Nothing can block you so effectively as compromise, for it shows lack of earnestness without which nothing can be done. Question. I approve of austerity but in practice I am all for luxury. The habit of chasing pleasure and shunning pain is so ingrained in me that all my good intentions, quite alive on the level of theory, find no roots in my day-to-day -day life. To tell me that I am not honest does not help me, for I just do not know how to make myself honest. Meharaj, you are neither honest nor dishonest. Giving names to mental states is good only for expressing your approval or disapproval. The problem is not yours, it is your mind's only. Begin by disassociating yourself from your mind. Resolutely remind yourself that you are not the mind and that its problems are not yours. Question. I may go on telling myself, I am not the mind, I am not concerned with its problems, but the mind remains and its problems remain just as they were. Now please do not tell me that it is because I am not earnest enough and I should be more earnest. I know it and admit it and only ask you, how is it done? Maharaj, at least you are asking. Good enough for a start. Go on pondering, wondering, being anxious to find a way. Be conscious of yourself, watch your mind, give it your full attention. Don't look for quick results, there may be none within your noticing. Unknown to you, your psyche will undergo a change, there will be more clarity in your thinking, charity in your feeling, purity in your behavior. You need not aim at these, you will witness the change all the same. For what you are now is the result of inattention, and what you become will be the fruit of attention. Question, why should mere attention make all the difference? Maharaj, so far your life was dark and restless tamas and rajas. Attention, alertness, awareness, clarity, liveliness, vitality are all manifestations of integrity, oneness with your true nature sattva. It is in the nature of sattva to reconcile and neutralize tamas and rajas and rebuild the personality in accordance with the true nature of the self. Sattva is the faithful servant of the self, ever attentive and obedient question, and I shall come to it through mere attention. Maharaj, do not undervalue attention. It means interest and also love. To know, to do, to discover, or to create you must give your heart to it, which means attention. All the blessings flow from it. Question, you advise us to concentrate on I am. Is this too a form of attention? Maharaj, what else? Give your undivided attention to the most important in your life yourself. Of your personal universe you are the center without knowing the center what else can you know? Question, but how can I know myself? To know myself I must be away from myself. But what is away from myself cannot be myself. So it looks that I cannot know myself, only what I take to be myself. Maharaj, quite right. As you cannot see your face, but only its reflection in the mirror, so you can know only your image reflected in the stainless mirror of pure awareness. Question, how am I to get such stainless mirror? Maharaj, obviously by removing stains. See the stains and remove them. The ancient teaching is fully valid. Question, what is seeing and what is removing? Maharaj, the nature of the perfect mirror is such that you cannot see it. Whatever you can see is bound to be a stain. Turn away from it, give it up, know it is unwanted. Question, all perceivables are they stains? Meharaj, all are stains. Question, the entire world is a stain? Meharaj, yes it is. Question, how awful. So the universe is of no value? Meharaj, it is of tremendous value. By going beyond it you realize yourself. Question, but why did it come into being in the first instance? Maharaj, you will know it when it ends. Question, will it ever end? Maharaj, yes for you. Question, when did it begin? Maharaj, now. Question, when will it end? Maharaj, now. Question, it does not end now. Maharaj, you don't let it. 
Question, I want to let it. Maharaj, you don't. All your life is connected with it. Your past and future, your desires and fears all have their roots in the world. Without the world, where are you? Who are you? Question, but that is exactly what I came to find out. Maharaj, and I am telling you exactly this, find a foothold beyond and all will be clear and easy. Chapter 32, Life is the Supreme Guru. Questioner, we two came from far off countries, one of us is British, the other American. The world in which we were born is falling apart and being young, we are concerned. The old people hope they will die their own death, but the young have no such hope. Some of us may refuse to kill, but none can refuse to be killed. Can we hope to set the world right within our lifetime? Maharaj, what makes you think that the world is going to perish? Question, the instruments of destruction have become unbelievably potent. Also, our very productivity has become destructive of nature and of our cultural and social values. Maharaj, you are talking of the present times. It has been so everywhere and always. But the distressing situation may be temporary and local. Once over it will be forgotten. Question. The scale of the impending catastrophe is unbelievably big. We live in the midst of an explosion. Maharaj, each man suffers alone and dies alone. Numbers are irrelevant. There is as much death when a million die as when one perishes. Question. Nature kills by the millions, but this does not frighten me. There may be tragedy or mystery in it, but no cruelty. What horrifies me is man-made suffering, destruction and desolation. Nature is magnificent in its doings and undoings. But there is meanness and madness in the acts of man. Maharaj, right. So it is not suffering and death that are your problem, but the meanness and madness at their root. Is not meanness also a form of madness? And is not madness the misuse of the mind? Humanity's problem lies in this misuse of the mind only. All the treasures of nature and spirit are open to man who will use his mind rightly. Question, what is the right use of mind? Maharaj, fear and greed cause the misuse of the mind. The right use of mind is in the service of love, of life, of truth, of beauty. Question. Easier said than done. Love of truth of man, goodwill, what luxury. We need plenty of it to set the world right, but who will provide? Maharaj, you can spend an eternity looking elsewhere for truth and love, intelligence and goodwill, imploring God and man all in vain. You must begin in yourself, with yourself. This is the inexorable law. You cannot change the image without changing the face. First realize that your world is only a reflection of yourself and stop finding fault with the reflection. Attend to yourself, set yourself right, mentally and emotionally. The physical will follow automatically. You talk so much of reforms, economic, social, political. Leave alone the reforms and mind the reformer. What kind of world can a man create who is stupid, greedy, heartless? Question, if we have to wait for a change of heart, we shall have to wait indefinitely. Yours is a counsel of perfection, which is also a counsel of despair. When all are perfect, the world will be perfect. What useless truism. Maharaj, I did not say it. I only said, you cannot change the world before changing yourself. I did not say before changing everybody. It is neither necessary nor possible to change others. But if you can change yourself, you will find that no other change is needed. To change the picture, you merely change the film. You do not attack the cinema screen. Question, how can you be so sure of yourself? How do you know that what you say is true? Maharaj, it is not of myself that I am sure I am sure of you. All you need is to stop searching outside what can be found only within. Set your vision right before you operate. You are suffering from acute misapprehension. Clarify your mind, purify your heart, sanctify your life. This is the quickest way to a change of your world. Question. So many saints and mystics lived and died. They did not change my world. Maharaj, how could they? Your world is not theirs, nor is there yours. 
Question. Surely there is a factual world common to all. Maharaj, the world of things of energy and matter? Even if there were such a common world of things and forces, it is not the world in which we live. Ours is a world of feelings and ideas, of attractions and repulsions, of scales of values, of motives and incentives, a mental world altogether. Biologically we need very little, our problems are of a different order. Problems created by desires and fears and wrong ideas can be solved only on the level of the mind. You must conquer your own mind and for this you must go beyond it. Question, what does it mean to go beyond the mind? Maharaj, you have gone beyond the body, haven't you? You do not closely follow your digestion, circulation, or elimination. These have become automatic. In the same way the mind should work automatically without calling for attention. This will not happen unless the mind works faultlessly. We are most of our time mind and body conscious because they constantly call for help. Pain and suffering are only the body and the mind screaming for attention. To go beyond the body you must be healthy. To go beyond the mind, you must have your mind in perfect order. You cannot leave a mess behind and go beyond. The mess will bog you up. Pick up your rubbish seems to be the universal law. And it just law too. Question, am I permitted to ask you how did you go beyond the mind? Maharaj, by the grace of my guru. Question, what shape his grace took? Maharaj, he told me what is true. Question, what did he tell you? Maharaj, he told me I am the supreme reality. Question, what did you do about it? Maharaj, I trusted him and remembered it. Question, is that all? Maharaj, yes, I remembered him, I remembered what he said. Question, you mean to say that this was enough? Maharaj, what more needs be done? It was quite a lot to remember the Guru and his words. My advice to you is even less difficult than this, just remember yourself. I am, is enough to heal your mind and take you beyond. Just have some trust. I don't mislead you. Why should I? Do I want anything from you? I wish you well such is my nature. Why should I mislead you? Common sense too will tell you that to fulfill a desire you must keep your mind on it. If you want to know your true nature, you must have yourself in mind all the time until the secret of your being stands revealed. Question, why should self-remembrance bring one to self-realization? Maharaj, because they are but two aspects of the same state. Self-remembrance is in the mind, self-realization is beyond the mind. The image in the mirror is of the face beyond the mirror. Question, fair enough. But what is the purpose? Maharaj, to help others one must be beyond the need of help. Question, all I want is to be happy. Maharaj, be happy to make happy. Question, let others take care of themselves. Maharaj, sir, you are not separate. The happiness you cannot share is spurious. Only the shareable is truly desirable. Question, right. Do I need a guru? What you tell me is simple and convincing. I shall remember it. This does not make you my guru. Maharaj, it is not the worship of a person that is crucial but the steadiness and depth of your devotion to the task. Life itself is the supreme guru. Be attentive to its lessons and obedient to its commands. When you personalize their source, you have an outer guru. When you take them from life directly, the guru is within. Remember, wonder, ponder, live with it, love it, grow into it, grow with it, make it your own, the word of your guru, outer or inner. Put an all and you will get all. I was doing it. All my time I was giving to my guru and to what he told me. Question, I am a writer by profession. Can you give me some advice for me specifically? Maharaj, writing is both a talent and a skill. Grow in talent and develop in skill. Desire what is worth desiring and desire it well. Just like you pick your way in a crowd passing between people, so you find your way between events, without missing your general direction. It is easy if you are earnest. Question. So many times you mention the need of being earnest. But we are not men of single will. 
We are conjuries of desires and needs, instincts and promptings. They crawl over each other, sometimes one, sometimes another dominating, but never for long. Meharaj, there are no needs, desires only. Question, to eat, to drink, to shelter one's body, to live. Meharaj, the desire to live is the one fundamental desire. All else depends on it. Question, we live because we must. Meharaj, we live because we crave sensory existence. Question, a thing so universal cannot be wrong. Meharaj, not wrong of course. In its own place and time nothing is wrong. But when you are concerned with truth, with reality, you must question everything, your very life. By asserting the necessity of sensory and intellectual experience you narrow down your inquiry to search for comfort. Question, I seek happiness, not comfort. Maharaj, beyond comfort of mind and body what happiness do you know? Question, is there any other? Maharaj, find out for yourself. Question every urge, hold no desire legitimate. Empty of possession, physical and mental, free of all self-concern, be open for discovery. Question. It is a part of Indian spiritual tradition that mere living in the proximity of a saint or sage is conducive to liberation and no other means are needed. Why don't you organize an ashram so that people could live near you? Maharaj, the moment I create an institution I become its prisoner. As a matter of fact I am available to all. Common roof and food will not make people more welcome. Living near does not mean breathing the same air. It means trusting and obeying, not letting the good intentions of the teacher go to waste. Have your guru always in your heart and remember his instructions this is real abidance with the true. Physical proximity is least important. Make your entire life an expression of your faith and love for your teacher. This is real dwelling with the Guru. Chapter 33 Everything Happens by Itself Questioner, Does Ajani die? Maharaj, He is beyond life and death. What we take to be inevitable, to be born and to die, appears to him but a way of expressing movement in the immovable, change in the changeless, end in the endless. To the jani it is obvious that nothing is born and nothing dies, nothing lasts and nothing changes, all is as it is, timelessly. Question, you say the jani is beyond. Beyond what? Beyond knowledge? Maharaj, knowledge has its rising and setting. Consciousness comes into being and goes out of being. It is a matter of daily occurrence and observation. We all know that sometimes we are conscious and sometimes not. When we are not conscious it appears to us as a darkness or a blank. But Ajani is aware of himself as neither conscious nor unconscious, but purely aware, a witness to the three states of the mind and their contents. Question, when does this witnessing begin? Maharaj, to Ajani nothing has beginning or ending. As salt dissolves in water, so does everything dissolve into pure being. Wisdom is eternally negating the unreal. See the unreal is wisdom. Beyond this lies the inexpressible. Question, there is in me the conviction, I am the body granted, I am talking from unwisdom. The state of feeling oneself the body, the body mind, the mind body, or even pure mind, when did it begin? Maharaj, you cannot speak of a beginning of consciousness. The very ideas of beginning and time are within consciousness. To talk meaningfully of the beginning of anything, you must step out of it. And the moment you step out, you realize that there is no such thing and never was. There is only reality in which no thing has any being on its own. Like waves are inseparable from the ocean, so is all existence rooted in being. Question. The fact is that here and now I am asking you, when did the feeling I am the body arise? At my birth? Or this morning? Maharaj, now. Question. But I remember having it yesterday too. Maharaj, the memory of yesterday is now only. Question. But surely I exist in time. I have a past and a future. Maharaj, that is how you imagine now. 
Question, there must have been a beginning. Meharaj, now. Question, and what about ending? Meharaj, what has no beginning cannot end. Question, but I am conscious of my question. Meharaj, a false question cannot be answered. It can only be seen as false. Question, to me it is real. Maharaj, when did it appear real to you? Now. Question, yes it is quite real to me now. Maharaj, what is real about your question? It is a state of mind. No state of mind can be more real than the mind itself. Is the mind real? It is but a collection of states, each of them transitory. How can a succession of transitory states be considered real? Question, like beads on a string events follow events forever. Meharaj, they are all strung on the basic idea, I am the body. But even this is a mental state and does not last. It comes and goes like all other states. The illusion of being the body-mind is there, only because it is not investigated. Non-investigation is the thread on which all the states of mind are strung. It is like darkness in a closed room. It is there, apparently. But when the room is opened, where does it go? It goes nowhere because it was not there. All states of mind, all names and forms of existence are rooted in non-inquiry, non-investigation, in imagination and credulity. It is right to say I am, but to say I am this I am that is a sign of not inquiring, not examining of mental weakness or lethargy. Question. If all is light, how did darkness arise? How can there be darkness in the midst of light? Meharaj, there is no darkness in the midst of light. Self-forgetfulness is the darkness. When we are absorbed in other things, in the not-self, we forget the self. There is nothing unnatural about it. But why forget the self through excessive attachment? Wisdom lies in never forgetting the self as the ever-present source of both the experiencer and his experience. Question. In my present state the I am the body idea comes spontaneously, while the I am pure being idea must be imposed on the mind as something true but not experienced. Meharaj. Yes, sadhana practice consists in reminding oneself forcibly of one's pure beingness of not being anything in particular, nor a sum of particulars, not even the totality of all particulars, which make up a universe. All exists in the mind, even the body is an integration in the mind of a vast number of sensory perceptions, each perception also a mental state. If you say, I am the body, show it. Question, here it is. Maharaj, only when you think of it. Both mind and body are intermittent states. The sum total of these flashes creates the illusion of existence. Inquire what is permanent in the transient, real in the unreal. This is sadhana. Question, the fact is that I am thinking of myself as the body. Meharaj, think of yourself by all means. Only don't bring the idea of a body into the picture. There is only a stream of sensations, perceptions, memories and ideations. The body is an abstraction, created by our tendency to seek unity in diversity, which again is not wrong. Question, I am being told that to think I am the body is a blemish in the mind. Maharaj, why talk like this? Such expressions create problems. The self is the source of all, and of all, the final destination. Nothing is external. Question, when the body idea becomes obsessive, is it not altogether wrong? Maharaj, there is nothing wrong in the idea of a body, nor even in the idea I am the body. But limiting oneself to one body only is a mistake. In reality all existence, every form, is my own within my consciousness. I cannot tell what I am because words can describe only what I am not. I am and because I am all is. But I am beyond consciousness and therefore in consciousness I cannot say what I am. Yet, I am. The question who am I has no answer. No experience can answer it, for the self is beyond experience. Question. Still the question who am I must be of some use. 
Maharaj, it has no answer in consciousness and therefore helps to go beyond consciousness. Question, here I am in the present moment. What is real in it and what is not? Now please don't tell me that my question is wrong. Questioning my questions leads me nowhere. Maharaj, your question is not wrong. It is unnecessary. You said, here and now I am. Stop there, this is real. Don't turn a fact into a question. There lies your mistake. You are neither knowing nor not knowing, neither mind nor matter. Don't attempt to describe yourself in terms of mind and matter. Question. Just now a boy came to you with a problem. You told him a few words and he went away. Did you help him? Maharaj, of course. Question. Why can you be so sure? Maharaj, to help is my nature. Question. How did you come to know it? Maharaj, no need to know. It operates by itself. Question. Still you have made a statement. On what is it based? Maharaj, on what people tell me. But it is you who asks for proofs. I do not need them. Setting things right lies in my very nature, which is Satyam, Shivam, Sundaram, the true, the good, the beautiful. Question. When a man comes to you for advice and you give him advice, wherefrom does it come and by what power does it help? Maharaj, his own being affects his mind and induces a response. Question, and what is your role? Maharaj, in me the man and his self come together. Question, why does not the self help the man without you? Maharaj, but I am the self. You imagine me as separate, hence your question. There is no myself and his self. There is the self, the only self of all. Misled by the diversity of names and shapes, minds and bodies, you imagine multiple selves. We both are the self, but you seem to be unconvinced. This talk of personal self and universal self is the learner's stage. Go beyond, don't be stuck in duality. Question, let us come back to the man in need of help. He comes to you. Maharaj, if he comes he is sure to get help. Because he was destined to get help, he came. There is nothing fanciful about it. I cannot help some and refuse others. All who come are helped, for such is the law. Only the shape help takes varies according to the need. Question, why must he come here to get advice? Can't he get it from within? Maharaj, he will not listen. His mind is turned outward. But in fact all experience is in the mind, and even his coming to me and getting help is all within himself. Instead of finding an answer within himself, he imagines an answer from without. To me there is no me, no man and no giving. All this is merely a flicker in the mind. I am infinite peace and silence in which nothing appears, for all that appears disappears. Nobody comes for help, nobody offers help, nobody gets help. It is all but a display in consciousness. Question. Yet the power to help is there and there is somebody or something that displays that power, call it God or self or the universal mind. The name does not matter but the fact does. Maharaj, this is the stand the body mind takes. The pure mind sees things as they are, bubbles and consciousness. These bubbles are appearing, disappearing and reappearing without having real being. No particular cause can be ascribed to them, for each is caused by all and affects all. Each bubble is a body and all these bodies are mine. Question. Do you mean to say that you have the power to do everything rightly? Maharaj, there is no power as separate from me. It is inherent in my very nature. Call it creativity. Out of a lump of gold you can make many ornaments, each will remain gold. Similarly, in whatever role I may appear and whatever function I may perform, I remain what I am. Th I am immovable, unshakable, independent. What you call the universe nature is my spontaneous creativity. Whatever happens, happens. But such is my nature that all ends in joy. Question. I have a case of a boy gone blind because his stupid mother fed him methyl alcohol. I am requesting you to help him. You are full of compassion and obviously eager to help. By what power can you help him? Maharaj, his case is registered in consciousness. 
It is there, indelibly. Consciousness will operate. Question, does it make any difference that I ask you to help? Maharaj, your asking is a part of the boy's blindness. Because he is blind, you ask. You have added nothing. Question, but your help will be a new factor. Maharaj, no all is contained in the boy's blindness. All is in it, the mother, the boy, you and me and all else. It is one event. Question, you mean to say that even our discussing the boy's case was predestined? Maharaj, how else? All things contain their future. The boy appears in consciousness. I am beyond. I do not issue orders to consciousness. I know that it is in the nature of awareness to set things right. Let consciousness look after its creations. The boy's sorrow, your pity, my listening and consciousness acting, all this is one single fact. Don't split it into components and then ask questions. Question, how strangely does your mind work? Meharaj, you are strange, not me. I am normal. I am sane. I see things as they are, and therefore I am not afraid of them. But you are afraid of reality. Question, why should I? Meharaj, it is ignorance of yourself that makes you afraid and also unaware that you are afraid. Don't try not to be afraid. Break down the wall of ignorance first. People are afraid to die because they do not know what is death. The Johnny has died before his death. He saw that there was nothing to be afraid of. The moment you know your real being, you are afraid of nothing. Death gives freedom and power. To be free in the world, you must die to the world. Then the universe is your own. It becomes your body, an expression and a tool. The happiness of being absolutely free is beyond description. On the other hand, he who is afraid of freedom cannot die. Question, you mean that one who cannot die, cannot live? Maharaj, put it as you like, attachment is bondage, detachment is freedom. To crave is to slave. Question, does it follow that if you are saved, the world is saved? Maharaj, as a whole the world does not need saving. Man makes mistakes and creates sorrow. When it enters the field of awareness, the consciousness of a jhani it is set right. Such is his nature. Question, we can observe what may be called spiritual progress. A selfish man turns religious, controls himself, refines his thoughts and feelings, takes his spiritual practice, realizes his true being. Is such progress ruled by causality or is it accidental? Maharaj, from my point of view everything happens by itself quite spontaneously. But man imagines that he works for an incentive towards a goal. He has always a reward in mind and strives for it. Question. A crude, unevolved man will not work without a reward. Is it not right to offer him incentives? Maharaj, he will create for himself incentives anyhow. He does not know that to grow is in the nature of consciousness. He will progress from motive to motive and will chase gurus for the fulfillment of his desires. When by the laws of his being he finds the way of return of Riddhi he abandons all motives, for his interest in the world is over. He wants nothing neither from others nor from himself. He dies to all and becomes the all. To want nothing and do nothing that is true creation. To watch the universe emerging and subsiding in one's heart is a wonder. Question. The great obstacle to inner effort is boredom. The disciple gets bored. Maharaj, inertia and restlessness tamas and rajas work together and keep clarity and harmony sava down. Tamas and rajas must be conquered before sava can appear. They will all come in due course quite spontaneously. Question, is there no need of effort then? Maharaj, when effort is needed effort will appear. When effortlessness becomes essential, it will assert itself. You need not push life about. Just flow with it and give yourself completely to the task of the present moment, which is the dying now to the now. For living is dying. Without death life cannot be. Get hold of the main thing that the world and the self are one and perfect. Only your attitude is faulty and needs readjustment. 
This process or readjustment is what you call sadhana. You come to it by putting an end to indolence and using all your energy to clear the way for clarity and charity. But in reality these all are signs of inevitable growth. Don't be afraid Dantrisis, don't delay. Be what you are. There is nothing to be afraid of. Trust and try. Experiment honestly. Give your real being a chance to shape your life. You will not regret. Chapter 34 Mind is restlessness itself. Questioner, I am a Swede by birth. Now I am teaching Hatha Yoga in Mexico and in the States. Maharaj, where did you learn it? Question, I had a teacher in the States, an Indian Swami. Maharaj, what did it give you? Question, it gave me good health and a means of livelihood. Maharaj, good enough. Is it all you want? Question, I seek peace of mind. I got disgusted with all the cruel things done by the so-called Christians in the name of Christ. For some time I was without religion. Then I got attracted to yoga. Maharaj, what did you gain? Question, I studied the philosophy of yoga, and it did help me. Maharaj, in what way did it help you? By what signs did you conclude that you have been helped? Question, good health is something quite tangible. Maharaj, no doubt it is very pleasant to feel fit. Is pleasure all you expected from yoga? Question, the joy of well-being is the reward of Hatha Yoga. The yoga in general yields more than that. It answers many questions. Maharaj, what do you mean by yoga? Question, the whole teaching of India, evolution, reincarnation, karma and so on. Maharaj, all right, you got all the knowledge you wanted. But in what way are you benefited by it? Question, it gave me peace of mind. Maharaj, did it? Is your mind at peace? Is your search over? Question, no, not yet. Maharaj, naturally. There will be no end to it because there is no such thing as peace of mind. Mind means disturbance, restlessness itself is mind. Yoga is not an attribute of the mind, nor is it a state of mind. Question. Some measure of peace I did derive from yoga. Maharaj, examine closely and you will see that the mind is seething with thoughts. It may go blank occasionally, but it does it for a time and reverts to its usual restlessness. A becalmed mind is not a peaceful mind. You say you want to pacify your mind. Is he who wants to pacify the mind himself peaceful? Question, no. I am not at peace, I take the help of yoga. Maharaj, don't you see the contradiction? For many years you sought your peace of mind. You could not find it, for a thing essentially restless cannot be at peace. Question, there is some improvement. Maharaj, the peace you claim to have found is very brittle, any little thing can crack it. What you call peace is only absence of disturbance. It is hardly worth the name. The real peace cannot be disturbed. Can you claim a peace of mind that is unassailable? Question, I am striving. Maharaj, striving too is a form of restlessness. Question, so what remains? Maharaj, the self does not need to be put to rest. It is peace itself, not at peace. Only the mind is restless. All it knows is restlessness with its many modes and grades. Pleasant are considered superior and the painful are discounted. What we call progress is merely a change over from the unpleasant to the pleasant. The changes by themselves cannot bring us to the changeless, for whatever has a beginning must have an end. The real does not begin. It only reveals itself as beginningless and endless, all-pervading, all-powerful, immovable prime mover, timelessly changeless. Question, so what has one to do? Maharaj, through yoga you have accumulated knowledge and experience. This cannot be denied. But of what use is it all to you? Yoga means union joining. What have you reunited rejoin? Question, I am trying to rejoin the personality back to the real self. Maharaj, the personality Vyakti is but a product of imagination. The self Vyakta is the victim of this imagination. 
it is the taking yourself to be what you are not that binds you. The person cannot be said to exist on its own rights, it is the self that believes there is a person and is conscious of being it. Beyond the self lies the unmanifested, the causeless cause of everything. Even to talk of reuniting the person with the self is not right, because there is no person, only a mental picture given a false reality by conviction. Nothing was divided and there is nothing to unite. Question, yoga helps in the search for and the finding of the self. Maharaj, you can find what you have lost, but you cannot find what you have not lost. Question, had I never lost anything, I would have been enlightened, but I am not. I am searching. Is not my very search a proof of my having lost something? Maharaj, it only shows that you believe you have lost. But who believes it? And what is believed to be lost? Have you lost a person like yourself? What is the self you are in search of? What exactly do you expect to find? Question. The true knowledge of the self. Maharaj, the true knowledge of the self is not a knowledge. It is not something that you find by searching by looking everywhere. It is not to be found in space or time. Knowledge is but a memory, a pattern of thought, a mental habit. All these are motivated by pleasure and pain. It is because you are goaded by pleasure and pain that you are in search of knowledge. Being oneself is completely beyond all motivation. You cannot be yourself for some reason. You are yourself and no reason is needed. Question, by doing yoga, I shall find peace. Maharaj, can there be peace apart from yourself? Are you talking from your own experience or from books only? Your book knowledge is useful to begin with, but soon it must be given up for direct experience which by its very nature is inexpressible. Words can be used for destruction also, of words images are built, by words they are destroyed. You got yourself into your present state through verbal thinking, you must get out of it the same way. Question, I did attain a degree of inner peace. Am I to destroy it? Maharaj, what has been attained may be lost again. Only when you realize the true peace, the peace you have never lost, that peace will remain with you, for it was never away. Instead of searching for what you do not have, find out what is it that you have never lost. That which is there before the beginning and after the ending of everything, that to which there is no birth nor death, that immovable state which is not affected by the birth and death of a body or a mind, that state you must perceive. Question, what are the means to such perception? Maharaj, in life nothing can be had without overcoming obstacles. The obstacles to the clear perception of one's true being are desire for pleasure and fear of pain. It is the pleasure-pain motivation that stands in the way. The very freedom from all motivation, the state in which no desire arises is the natural state. Question. Such giving up of desires does it need time? Maharaj, if you leave it to time millions of years will be needed. Giving up desire after desire is a lengthy process with the end never in sight. Leave alone your desires and fears, Give your entire attention to the subject, to him who is behind the experience of desire and fear. Ask, who desires? Let each desire bring you back to yourself. Question, the root of all desires and fears is the same, the longing for happiness. Maharaj, the happiness you can think of and long for is mere physical or mental satisfaction. Such sensory or mental pleasure is not the real, the absolute happiness. Question, even sensory and mental pleasures and the general sense of well-being which arises with physical and mental health must have their roots in reality. Maharaj, they have their roots in imagination. A man who is given a stone and assured that it is a priceless diamond will be mightily pleased until he realizes his mistake. In the same way pleasures lose their tang and pains their barb when the self is known. Both are seen as they are, conditional responses, mere reactions, plain attractions and repulsions, based on memories or preconceptions. Usually pleasure and pain are experienced when expected. It is all a matter of acquired habits and convictions. 
Question. Well, pleasure may be imaginary, but pain is real. Maharaj, pain and pleasure go always together. Freedom from one means freedom from both. If you do not care for pleasure, you will not be afraid of pain. But there is happiness which is neither, which is completely beyond. The happiness you know is describable and measurable. It is objective, so to say. But the objective cannot be your own. It would be a grievous mistake to identify yourself with something external. This churning up of levels leads nowhere. Reality is beyond the subjective and objective, beyond all levels, beyond every distinction. Most definitely it is not their origin, source or root. These come from ignorance of reality, not from reality itself, which is indescribable, beyond being and not being. Question. Many teachers have I followed and studied many doctrines, yet none gave me what I wanted. Maharaj, the desire to find the self will be surely fulfilled provided you want nothing else. But you must be honest with yourself and really want nothing else. If in the meantime you want many other things and are engaged in their pursuit, your main purpose may be delayed until you grow wiser and cease being torn between contradictory urges. Go within without swerving, without ever looking outward. Question, but my desires and fears are still there. Maharaj, where are they but in your memory? Realize that their root is in expectation born of memory and they will cease to obsess you. Question, I have understood very well that social service is an endless task because improvement and decay, progress and regress go side by side. We can see it on all sides and on every level. What remains? Maharaj, whatever work you have undertaken, complete it. Do not take up new task, unless it is called for by a concrete situation of suffering and relief from suffering. Find yourself first and endless blessings will follow. Nothing profits the world as much as the abandoning of profits. A man who no longer thinks in terms of loss and gain is the truly non-violent man, for he is beyond all conflict. Question. Yes, I was always attracted by the idea of ahimsa non-violence. Maharaj, primarily ahimsa means what it says, don't hurt. It is not doing good that comes first, but ceasing to hurt, not adding to suffering. Pleasing others is not ahimsa. Question, I am not talking of pleasing, but I am all for helping others. Maharaj, the only help worth giving is freeing from the need for further help. Repeated help is no help at all. Do not talk of helping another, unless you can put him beyond all need of help. Question, how does one go beyond the need of help? And can one help another to do so? Maharaj, when you have understood that all existence and separation and limitation is painful and when you are willing and able to live integrally in oneness with all life as pure being, you have gone beyond all need of help. You can help another by percept, an example and above all by your being. You cannot give what you do not have and you don't have what you are not. You can only give what you are and of that you can give limitlessly. Question, but is it true that all existence is painful? Maharaj, what else can be the cause of this universal search for pleasure? Does a happy man seek happiness? How restless people are, how constantly on the move. It is because they are in pain that they seek relief in pleasure. All the happiness they can imagine is in the assurance of repeated pleasure. Question. If what I am as I am the person I take myself to be cannot be happy then what am I to do? Maharaj, you can only cease to be as you seem to be now. There is nothing cruel in what I say. To wake up a man from a nightmare is compassion. You came here because you are in pain and all I say is, wake up, know yourself, be yourself. The end of pain lies not in pleasure. When you realize that you are beyond both pain and pleasure, aloof and unassailable, then the pursuit of happiness ceases and the resultant sorrow too. For pain aims at pleasure and pleasure ends in pain, relentlessly. Question. In the ultimate state there can be no happiness, mayharaj, nor sorrow, only freedom. Happiness depends on something or other and can be lost. Freedom from everything depends on nothing and cannot be lost. 
freedom from sorrow has no cause and therefore cannot be destroyed realize that freedom. Question, am I not born to suffer as a result of my past? Is freedom possible at all? Was I born of my own will? Am I not just a creature? Maharaj, what is birth and death but the beginning and the ending of a stream of events in consciousness? Because of the idea of separation and limitation they are painful. Momentary relief from pain we call pleasure, and we build castles in the air hoping for endless pleasure which we call happiness. It is all misunderstanding and misuse. Wake up go beyond live really. Question. My knowledge is limited, my power negligible. Meharaj, being the source of bot, the self is beyond both knowledge and power. The observable is in the mind. The nature of the self is pure awareness, pure witnessing, unaffected by the presence or absence of knowledge or liking. Have your being outside this body of birth and death and all your problems will be solved. They exist because you believe yourself born to die. Undeceive yourself and be free. You are not a person. Chapter 35 Greatest Guru is Your Inner Self Questioner, on all sides I hear that freedom from desires and inclinations is the first condition of self-realization. But I find the condition impossible of fulfillment. Ignorance of oneself causes desires and desires perpetuate ignorance. A truly vicious circle. Meharaj, there are no conditions to fulfill. There is nothing to be done, nothing to be given up. Just look and remember whatever you perceive is not you nor yours. It is there in the field of consciousness, but you are not the field and its contents, nor even the knower of the field. It is your idea that you have to do things that entangle you in the results of your efforts, the motive, the desire, the failure to achieve, the sense of frustration, all this holds you back. Simply look at whatever happens and know that you are beyond it. Question. Does it mean I should abstain from doing anything? Meharaj, you cannot. What goes on must go on. If you stop suddenly, you will crash. Question. Is it a matter of the known and the knower becoming one? Meharaj, both are ideas in the mind and words that express them. There is no self in them. The self is neither between nor beyond. To look for it on the mental level is futile. Stop searching and see it is here and now, it is that I am you know so well. All you need to do is to cease taking yourself to be within the field of consciousness. Unless you have already considered these matters carefully, listening to me once will not do. Forget your past experiences and achievements, stand naked, exposed to the winds and rains of life and you will have a chance. Question, has devotion bhakti any place in your teaching? Meharaj, when you are not well, you go to a physician who tells you what is wrong and what is the remedy. If you have confidence in him, it makes things simple. You take the medicine, follow the diet restrictions and get well. But if you do not trust him, you may still take a chance, or you may study medicine yourself. In all cases it is your desire for recovery that moves you, not the physician. Without trust there is no peace. Somebody or other you always trust, it may be your mother or your wife. Of all the people the knower of the self, the liberated man, is the most trustworthy. But merely to trust is not enough. You must also desire. Without desire for freedom of what use is the confidence that you can acquire freedom. Desire and confidence must go together. The stronger your desire, the easier comes the help. The greatest guru is helpless as long as the disciple is not eager to learn. Eagerness and earnestness are all important. Confidence will come with experience. Be devoted to your goal and devotion to him who can guide you will follow. If your desire and confidence are strong, they will operate and take you to your goal, for you will not cause delay by hesitation and compromise. The greatest cure is your inner self. Truly he is the supreme teacher. He alone can take you to your goal and he alone meets you at the end of the road. Confide in him and you need no outer guru. But again you must have the strong desire to find him and do nothing that will create obstacles and delays. 
and do not waste energy and time on regrets. Learn from your mistakes and do not repeat them. Question, if you do not mind my asking a personal question, Maharaj, yes, go ahead. Question, I see you sitting on an antelope skin. How does it tally with nonviolence? Maharaj, all my working life I was a cigarette maker helping people to spoil their health. And in front of my door the municipality has put up a public lavatory, spoiling my health. In this violent world, how can one keep away from violence of some kind or other? Question. Surely all avoidable violence should be avoided. And yet in India every holy man has his tiger, lion, leopard or antelope skin to sit on. Maharaj, maybe because no plastics were available in ancient times and a skin was best to keep the damp away. Rheumatism has no charm even for a saint. Thus the tradition arose that for lengthy meditations a skin is needed. Just like the drum hide in a temple, so is the antelope skin of a yogi. We hardly notice it. Question, but the animal had to be killed. Maharaj, I have never heard of a yogi killing a tiger for his hide. The killers are not yogis and the yogis are not killers. Question, should you not express your disapproval by refusing to sit on a skin? Maharaj, what an idea! I disapprove of the entire universe, why only a skin? Question, what is wrong with the universe? Maharaj, forgetting yourself is the greatest injury, all the calamities flow from it. Take care of the most important, the lesser will take care of itself. You do not tidy up a dark room. You open the windows first. Letting in the light makes everything easy. So, let us wait with improving others until we have seen ourselves as we are and have changed. There is no need to turn round and round in endless questioning. Find yourself and everything will fall into its proper place. Question. The urge to return to the source is very rare. Is it at all natural? Maharaj, outgoing is natural in the beginning, ingoing in the end. But in reality the two are one, just like breathing in and out are one. Question, in the same way are not the body and the dweller in the body one? Maharaj, events in time and space, birth and death, cause and effect, these may be taken as one, but the body and the embodied are not of the same order of reality. The body exists in time and space, transient and limited, while the dweller is timeless and spaceless, eternal and all-pervading. To identify the two is a grievous mistake and the cause of endless suffering. You can speak of the mind and body as one, but the body-mind is not the underlying reality. Question, whoever he may be, the dweller is in control of the body and therefore responsible for it. Maharaj, there is a universal power which is in control and is responsible. Question, and so I can do as I like and put the blame on some universal power. How easy! Maharaj, yes, very easy. Just realize the one mover behind all that moves and leave all to him. If you do not hesitate or cheat, this is the shortest way to reality. Stand without desire and fear, relinquishing all control and all responsibility. Question, what madness? Maharaj, yes divine madness. What is wrong in letting go the illusion of personal control and personal responsibility? Both are in the mind only. Of course as long as you imagine yourself to be in control, you should also imagine yourself to be responsible. One implies the other. Question, how can the universal be responsible for the particular? Maharaj, all life on earth depends on the sun. Yet you cannot blame the sun for all that happens, though it is the ultimate cause. Light causes the color of the flower, but it neither controls nor is responsible for it directly. It makes it possible that is all. Question. What I do not like in all this is taking refuge in some universal power. Maharaj, you cannot quarrel with facts. Question. Whose facts? Yours or mine? Maharaj, yours. You cannot deny my facts, for you do not know them. Could you know them, you would not deny them. Here lies the trouble. You take your imagining for facts and my facts for imagination. I know for certain that all is one. 
Differences do not separate. Either you are responsible for nothing or for everything. To imagine that you are in control and responsible for one body only is the aberration of the body mind. Question, still, you are limited by your body. Maharaj, only in matters pertaining to the body. This I do not mind. It is like enduring the seasons of the year. They come, they go, they hardly affect me. In the same way body minds come and go, life is forever in search of new expressions. Question, as long as you do not put all the burden of evil on God, I am satisfied. There may be a God for all I know, but to me he is a concept projected by the human mind. He may be a reality to you, but to me society is more real than God, for I am both its creature and its prisoner. Your values are wisdom and compassion, society's sagacious selfishness. I live in a world quite different from yours. Maharaj, none compels. Question, none compels you, but I am compelled. My world is an evil world full of tears, toil, and pain. To explain it away by the intellectualizing, by putting forth theories of evolution and karma, is merely adding insult to injury. The god of an evil world is a cruel god. Maharaj, you are the god of your world and you are both stupid and cruel. Let God be a concept, your own creation. Find out who you are, how did you come to live longing for truth, goodness and beauty in a world full of evil. Of what use is your arguing for or against go, when you just do not know who is God and what are you talking about? The God born of fear and hope, shaped by desire and imagination, cannot be the power that is, the mind and the heart of the universe. Question. I agree that the world I live in and the God I believe in are both creatures of imagination. But in what way are they created by desire? Why do I imagine a world so painful and a God so indifferent? What is wrong with me that I should torture myself so cruelly? The enlightened man comes and tells me, it is but a dream to put an end to, but is he not himself a part of the dream? I find myself trapped and see no way out. You say you are free. Of what are you free? For heaven's sake, don't feed me on words, enlighten me, help me to wake up, since it is you who sees me tossing in my sleep. Maharaj, when I say I am free I merely state a fact. If you are an adult, you are free from infancy. I am free from all description and identification. Whatever you may hear, see or think of, I am not that. I am free from being a percept or a concept. Question, still, you have a body and you depend on it. Maharaj, again you assume that your point of view is the only correct one. I repeat, I was not am not shall not be a body. To me this is a fact. I too was under the illusion of having been born, but my guru made me see that birth and death are mere ideas birth is merely the idea, I have a body. And death, I have lost my body. Now when I know I am not a body, the body may be there or may not, what difference does it make? The body mind is like a room. It is there, but I need not live in it all the time. Question. Yeah, there is a body and you do take care of it. Maharaj, the power that created the body takes care of it. Question. We are jumping from level to level all the time. Maharaj, there are two levels to consider the physical effects and mental of ideas. I am beyond both. Neither your facts nor ideas are mine. What I see is beyond. Cross over to my side and see with me. Question, what I want to say is very simple. As long as I believe, I am the body I must not say, God will look after my body. God will not. He will let it starve, sicken and die. Maharaj, what else do you expect from a mere body? Why are you so anxious about it? Because you think you are the body, you want it indestructible. You can extend its life considerably by appropriate practices, but for what ultimate good? Question, it is better to live long and healthy. It gives us a chance to avoid the mistakes of childhood and youth, the frustrations of adulthood, the miseries and imbecility of old age. Maharaj, by all means live long. But you are not the master. 
Can you decide the days of your birth and death? We are not speaking the same language. Yours is a make-believe talk, all hangs on suppositions and assumptions. You speak with assurance about things you are not sure of. Question, therefore I am here. Meharaj, you are not yet here. I am here. Come in. But you don't. You want me to live your life, feel your way, use your language. I cannot and it will not help you. You must come to me. Words are of the mind and the mind obscures and distorts. Hence the absolute need to go beyond words and move over to my side. Question, take me over. Maharaj, I am doing it but you resist. You give reality to concepts while concepts are distortions of reality. Abandon all conceptualization and stay silent and attentive. Be earnest about it and all will be well with you. Chapter 36 Killing Hurts the Killer Not the Killed Questioner A thousand years ago, a man lived and died. His identity and Takarana reappeared in a new body. Why does he not remember his previous life? And if he does, can the memory be brought into the conscious? Maharaj, how do you know that the same person reappeared in the new body? A new body may mean a new person altogether. Question. Imagine a pot of ghee. Indian clarified butter. When the pot breaks, the ghee remains and can be transferred to another pot. The old pot had its own scent, the new its own. The ghee will carry the scents from pot to pot. In the same way the personal identity is transferred from body to body. Maharaj, it is all right. When there is the body, its peculiarities affect the person. Without the body we have the pure identity in the sense of I am. But when you are reborn in a new body, where is the world formerly experienced? Question, every body experiences its own world. Maharaj, in the present body the old body is it merely an idea, or is it a memory? Question, an idea of course. How can a brain remember what it has not experienced? Maharaj, you have answered your own question. Why play with ideas? Be content with what you are sure of. And the only thing you can be sure of is I am. Stay with it and reject everything else. This is yoga. Question. I can reject only verbally. At best I remember to repeat the formula, this is not me, this is not mine. I am beyond all this. Maharaj, good enough. First verbally, then mentally and emotionally, then in action. Give attention to the reality within you and it will come to light. It is like churning the cream for butter. Do it correctly and assiduously and the result is sure to come. Question. How can the absolute be the result of a process? Maharaj, you are right, the relative cannot result in the absolute. But the relative can block the absolute, just as the non-churning of the cream may prevent the butter from separating. It is the real that creates the urge. The inner prompts the outer and the outer responds in interest and effort. But ultimately there is no inner nor outer. The light of consciousness is both the creator and the creature, the experiencer and the experience, the body and the embodied. Take care of the power that projects all this and your problems will come to an end. Question, which is the projecting power? Maharaj, it is imagination prompted by desire. Question, I know all this but have no power over it. Maharaj, this is another illusion of yours born from craving for results. Question. What is wrong with purposeful action? Maharaj, it does not apply. In these matters there is no question of purpose nor of action. All you need is to listen, remember, ponder. It is like taking food. All you can do is to bite off, chew and swallow. All else is unconscious and automatic. Listen, remember and understand. The mind is both the actor and the stage. All is of the mind and you are not the mind. The mind is born and reborn, not you. The mind creates the world and all the wonderful variety of it. Just like in a good play you have all sorts of characters and situations, so you need a little of everything to make a world. Question, nobody suffers in a play. Maharaj, unless one identifies himself with it. 
Don't identify yourself with the world and you will not suffer. Question, others will. Maharaj, then make your world perfect by all means. If you believe in God, work with him. If you do not, become one. Either see the world as a play or work at it with all your might. Or both. Question, what about the identify of the dying man? What happens to it when he is dead? Do you agree that it continues in another body? Maharaj, it continues and yet it does not. All depends how you look at it. What is identity after all? Continuity in memory? Can you talk of identity without memory? Question. Yes, I can. The child may not know its parents, yet the hereditary characteristics will be there. Maharaj, who identifies them? Somebody with a memory to register and compare. Don't you see that memory is the warp of your mental life? And identity is merely a pattern of events in time and space. Change the pattern and you have changed the man. Question. The pattern is significant and important. It has its own value. By saying that a woven design is merely colored threads you miss the most important, the beauty of it. Or by describing a book as paper with ink stains on it, you miss the meaning. Identity is valuable because it is the basis of individuality, that which makes us unique and irreplaceable. I am is the intuition of uniqueness. Meharaj, yes and no. Identity, individuality, uniqueness, they are the most valuable aspects of the mind yet of the mind only. I am all there is to is an experience equally valid. The particular and the universal are inseparable. They are the two aspects of the nameless as seen from without and from within. Unfortunately, words only mention but don't convey. Try to go beyond the words. Question, what dies with death? Maharaj, the idea I am this body dies, the witness does not. Question, the Jains believe in a multiplicity of witnesses, forever separate. Maharaj, that is their tradition based on the experience of some great people. The one witness reflects itself in the countless bodies as I am. As long as the bodies, however subtle, last, the I am appears as many. Beyond the body there is only the one. Question. God. Maharaj, the creator is a person whose body is the world. The nameless one is beyond all gods. Question. Sri Ramana Maharshi died. What difference did it make to him? Maharaj, none. What he was, he is the absolute reality. Question. But to the common man death makes a difference. Maharaj, what he thinks himself to be before death he continues to be after death. His self-image survives. Question. The other day there was a talk about the use by the Jani of animal skins for meditation etc. I was not convinced. It is easy to justify everything by referring to custom and tradition. Customs may be cruel and tradition corrupt. They explain but do not justify. Maharaj, I never meant to say that lawlessness follows self-realization. A liberated man is extremely law-abiding. But his laws are the laws of his real self, not of his society. These he observes or breaks according to circumstances and necessity. But he will never be fanciful and disorderly. Question. What I cannot accept is justification by custom and habit. Maharaj. The difficulty lies in our differing points of view. You speak from the body minds. Mine is of the witness. The difference is basic. Question. Still, cruelty is cruelty. Maharaj, none compels you to be cruel. Question. Taking advantage of other people's cruelty is cruelty by proxy. Maharaj, if you look into living process closely, you will find cruelty everywhere for life feeds on life. This is a fact, but it does not make you feel guilty of being alive. You began a life of cruelty by giving your mother endless trouble. To the last day of your life you will compete for food, clothing, shelter, holding on to your body, fighting for its needs, wanting it to be secure in a world of insecurity and death. From the animal's point of view being killed is not the worst form of dying, surely preferable to sickness and senile decay.
The cruelty lies in the motive, not in the fact. Killing hurts the killer, not the killed. Question. Agreed. Then one must not accept the services of hunters and butchers. Maharaj, who wants you to accept? Question. You accept. Maharaj, that is how you see me. How quickly you accuse, condemn, sentence, and execute. Why begin with me and not with yourself? Question. A man like you should set an example. Maharaj, are you ready to follow my example? I am dead to the world. I want nothing, not even to live. Be as I am. Do as I do. You are judging me by my clothes and food, while I only look at your motives. If you believe to be the body and the mind and act on it, you are guilty of the greatest cruelty, cruelty to your own real being. Compared to it, all other cruelties do not count. Q. You are taking refuge in the claim that you are not the body. But you are in control of the body and responsible for all it does. To allow the body full autonomy would be imbecility, madness. Maharaj, cool down. I am also against all killing of animals for flesh or fur, but I refuse to give it first place. Vegetarianism is a worthy cause, but not the most urgent. All causes are served best by the man who has returned to his source. Question. When I was at Sri Raman Ashram, I felt bad when all over the place, all pervading, all perceiving. Maharaj, you had the necessary faith. Those who have true faith in him will see him everywhere and at all times. All happens according to your faith and your faith is the shape of your desire. Question. The faith you have in yourself is not that to a shape of a desire? Maharaj, when I say... I am, I do not mean a separate entity with a body as its nucleus. I mean the totality of being, the ocean of consciousness, the entire universe of all that is and knows. I have nothing to desire for I am complete forever. Question. Can you touch the inner life of other people? Maharaj, I am the people. Question. I do not mean identity of essence or substance nor similarity of form. I mean the actual entering into the minds and hearts of others and participating in their personal experiences. Can you suffer and rejoice with me, or you only infer what I feel from observation and analogy? Maharaj, all beings are in me. But bringing down into the brain the content of another brain requires special training. There is nothing that cannot be achieved by training. Question. I am not your projection, nor are you mine. I am on my own right, not merely as your creation. This crude philosophy of imagination and projection does not appeal to me. You are depriving me of all reality. Who is the image of whom? You are my image or am I yours? Or am I an image in my own image? No, something is wrong somewhere. Maharaj, words betray their hollowness. The real cannot be described, it must be experienced. I cannot find better words for what I am now. What I say may sound ridiculous. But what the words try to convey is the highest truth. All is one, however much we quibble. And all is done to please the one source and goal of every desire, whom we all know as the I am. Question. It is pain that is at the root of desire. The basic urge is to escape from pain. Maharaj, what is the root of pain? Ignorance of yourself. What is the root of desire? The urge to find yourself. All creation toils for itself and will not rest until it returns to it. Question, when will it return? Maharaj, it can return whenever you want it. Question, and the world? Maharaj, you can take it with you. Question, must I wait with helping the world until I reach perfection? Maharaj, by all means help the world. You will not help much, but the effort will make you grow. There is nothing wrong in trying to help the world. Question. Surely there were people, common people, who helped greatly. Maharaj, when the time comes for the world to be helped, some people are given the will, the wisdom, and the power to cause great changes. Chapter 37. Beyond pain and pleasure there is bliss. Maharaj, you must realize first of all that you are the proof of everything including yourself. None can prove your existence, because his existence must be confirmed by you first. 
your being and knowing you owe nobody. Remember, you are entirely on your own. You do not come from somewhere, you do not go anywhere. You are timeless being in awareness. Questioner, there is a basic difference between us. You know the real while I know only the workings of my mind. Therefore what you say is one thing, what I hear is another. What you say is true, what I understand is false, though the words are the same. There is a gap between us. How to close the gap? Maharaj, give up the idea of being what you think yourself to be and there will be no gap. By imagining yourself as separate you have created the gap. You need not cross it. Just don't create it. All is you and yours. There is nobody else. This is a fact. Question, how strange. The very same words which to you are true to me are false. There is nobody else. How obviously untrue. Maharaj, let them be true or untrue. Words don't matter. What matters is the idea you have of yourself, for it blocks you. Give it up. Question. From early childhood I was taught to think that I am limited to my name and shape. A mere statement to the contrary will not erase the mental groove. A regular brainwashing is needed, if at all it can be done. Maharaj, you call it brainwashing, I call it yoga leveling up all the mental ruts. You must not be compelled to think the same thoughts again and again. Move on. Question. Easier said than done. Maharaj, don't be childish. Easier to change than to suffer. Grow out of your childishness, that is all. Question, such things are not done. They happen. Maharaj, everything happens all the time but you must be ready for it. Readiness is ripeness. You do not see the real because your mind is not ready for it. Question, if reality is my real nature, how can I ever be unready? Maharaj, unready means afraid. You are afraid of what you are. Your destination is the whole. But you are afraid that you will lose your identity. This is childishness, clinging to the toys, to your desires and fears, opinions and ideas. Give it all up and be ready for the real to assert itself. This self-assertion is best expressed in words, I am. Nothing else has being. Of this you are absolutely certain. Question. I am of course but I know also. And I know that I am so and so, the owner of the body in manifold relations with other owners. Maharaj, it is all memory carried over into the now. Question. I can be certain only of what is now. Past and future memory and imagination, these are mental states, but they are all I know and they are now. You are telling me to abandon them. How does one abandon the now? Maharaj, you are moving into the future all the time whether you like it or not. Question. I am moving from now into now. I do not move at all. Everything else moves, not me. Maharaj, granted. But your mind does move. In the now you are both the movable and the immovable. So far you took yourself to be the movable and overlooked the immovable. Turn your mind inside out. Overlook the movable and you will find yourself to be the ever-present, changeless reality, inexpressible, but solid like a rock. Question. If it is now, why am I not aware of it? Maharaj, because you hold on to the idea that you are not aware of it. Let go the idea. Question. It does not make me aware. Maharaj, wait. You want to be on both sides of the wall at the same time. You can't, but you must remove the wall. Or realize that too, all and both sides of it are one single space, to which no idea like here or there applies. Question, similes prove nothing. My only complaint is this, why do I not see what you see, why your words do not sound true in my mind? Let me know this much, all else can wait. You are wise and I am stupid, you see I don't. Where and how shall I find my wisdom? Maharaj, if you know yourself to be stupid, you are not stupid at all. Question. Just as knowing myself sick does not make me well, so knowing myself foolish cannot make me wise. Maharaj, to know that you are ill must you not be well initially? Question. Oh no. I know by comparison. 
If I am blind from birth and you tell me that you know things without touching them, while I must touch to know, I am aware that I am blind without knowing what does it mean to see. Similarly, I know that I am lacking something when you assert things which I cannot grasp. You are telling me such wonderful things about myself. According to you I am eternal, omnipresent, omniscient, supremely happy creator, preserver and destroyer of all there is, the source of all life, the heart of being, the Lord and the beloved of every creature. You equate me with the ultimate reality, the source and the goal of all existence. I just blink, for I know myself to be a tiny little bundle of desires and fears, a bubble of suffering, a transient flash of consciousness in an ocean of darkness. Maharaj, before pain was you were. After pain had gone you remained. Pain is transient, you are not. Question, I am sorry but I do not see what you see. From the day I was born till the day I die, pain and pleasure will weave the pattern of my life. Of being before birth and after death I know nothing. I neither accept nor deny you. I hear what you say, but I do not know it. Maharaj, now you are conscious, are you not? Question, please do not ask me about before and after. I just know only what is now. Maharaj, good enough. You are conscious. Hold on to it. There are states when you are not conscious. Call it unconscious being. Question, being unconscious. Maharaj, consciousness and unconsciousness do not apply here. Existence is in consciousness, essence is independent of consciousness. Question, it is void. Is it silence? Maharaj, why elaborate? Being pervades and transcends consciousness. Objective consciousness is a part of pure consciousness, not beyond it. Question, how do you come to know a state of pure being which is neither conscious nor unconscious? All knowledge is in consciousness only. There may be such a state as the abeyance of the mind. Does consciousness then appear as the witness? Maharaj, the witness only registers events. In the abeyance of the mind even the sense I am dissolves. There is no I am without the mind. Question, without the mind means without thoughts. I am as a thought subsides. I am as the sense of being remains. Maharaj, all experience subsides with the mind. Without the mind there can be no experience or nor experience. Question, does not the witness remain? Maharaj, the witness merely registers the presence or absence of experience. It is not an experience by itself, but it becomes an experience when the thought, I am the witness arises. Question, all I know is that sometimes the mind works and sometimes it stops. The experience of mental silence I call the abeyance of the mind. Meharaj, call it silence or void or abeyance the fact is that the three experience or experiencing experience are not. In witnessing and awareness, self-consciousness, the sense of being this or that is not. Unidentified being remains. Question, as a state of unconsciousness. Meharaj, with reference to anything it is the opposite. It is also between and beyond all opposites. It is neither consciousness nor unconsciousness, nor midway, nor beyond the two. It is by itself, not with reference to anything which may be called experience or its absence. Question, how strange. You speak of it as if it were an experience. Maharaj, when I think of it it becomes an experience. Question like the invisible light intercepted by a flower becoming color. Maharaj, yes you may say so. It is in the color but not the color. Question, the same old fourfold negation of Nagarjuna. Neither this nor that nor both nor either. My mind reels. Maharaj, your difficulty stems from the idea that reality is a state of consciousness one among many. You tend to say, this is real. That is not real. And this is partly real, partly unreal, as if reality were an attribute or quality to have in varying measures. Question, let me put it differently. After all consciousness becomes a problem only when it is painful. 
an ever blissful state does not give rise to questions. We find all consciousness to be a mixture of the pleasant and the painful. Why? Maharaj, all consciousness is limited and therefore painful. At the root of consciousness lies desire, the urge to experience. Question. Do you mean to say that without desire there can be no consciousness? And what is the advantage of being unconscious? If I have to forego pleasure for the freedom from pain, I'd better keep both. Maharaj, beyond pain and pleasure there is bliss. Question. Unconscious bliss of what use is it? Maharaj, neither conscious nor unconscious. Real. Question. What is your objection to consciousness? Maharaj, it is a burden. Body means burden. Sensations, desires, thoughts, these are all burdens. All consciousness is of conflict. Question. Reality is described as true being, pure consciousness, infinite bliss. What has pain to do with it? Maharaj, pain and pleasure happen, but pain is the price of pleasure, pleasure is the reward of pain. In life too you often please by hurting and hurt by pleasing. To know that pain and pleasure are one is peace. Question. All this is very interesting, no doubt, but my goal is more simple. I want more pleasure and less pain in life. What am I to do? Maharaj, as long as there is consciousness, there must be pleasure and pain. It is in the nature of the I am of consciousness to identify itself with the opposites. Question, then of what use is all this to me? It does not satisfy. Maharaj, who are you who is unsatisfied? Question, I am the pain-pleasure man. Maharaj, pain and pleasure are both an end to bliss. Here I am sitting in front of you and telling you, from my own immediate and unchanging experience, pain and pleasure are the crests and valleys of the waves in the ocean of bliss. Deep down there is utter fullness. Question, is your experience constant? Maharaj, it is timeless and changeless. Question, all I know is desire for pleasure and fear of pain. Maharaj, that is what you think about yourself. Stop it. If you cannot break a habit all at once, consider the familiar way of thinking and see its falseness. Questioning the habitual is the duty of the mind. What the mind created, the mind must destroy. Or realize that there is no desire outside the mind and stay out. Question. Honestly, I distrust this explaining everything as mind made. The mind is only an instrument as the eye is an instrument. Can you say that perception is creation? I see the world through the window, not in the window. All you say holds well together because of the common foundation, but I do not know whether your foundation is in reality or only in the mind. I can have only a mental picture of it. What it means to you I do not know. Maharaj, as long as you take your stand in the mind, you will see me in the mind. Question, how inadequate are words for understanding? Maharaj, without words, what is there to understand? The need for understanding arises from misunderstanding. What I say is true, but to you it is only a theory. How will you come to know that it is true? Listen, remember, ponder, visualize experience. Also apply it in your daily life. Have patience with me and above all have patience with yourself for you are your only obstacle. The way leads through yourself beyond yourself. As long as you believe only the particular to be real, conscious and happy and reject the non-dual reality as something imagined, an abstract concept, you will find me doling out concepts and abstractions. But once you have touched the real within your own being, you will find me describing what for you is the nearest and the dearest. Chapter 38 Spiritual practice is will asserted and reasserted. Questioner, the Westerners who occasionally come to see you are faced with a peculiar difficulty. The very notion of a liberated man, a realized man, a self knower, a God knower, a man beyond the world is unknown to them. All they have in their Christian culture is the idea of a saint a pious man, law-abiding, God-fearing, fellow-loving, 
prayerful, sometimes prone to ecstasies and confirmed by a few miracles. The very idea of a Johnny is foreign to Western culture, something exotic and rather unbelievable. Even when his existence is accepted, he is looked at with suspicion as a case of self-induced euphoria caused by strange physical postures and mental attitudes. The very idea of a new dimension in consciousness seems to them implausible and improbable. What will help them is the opportunity of hearing Ajani relate his own experience of realization, its causes and beginnings, its progress and attainments, and its actual practice in daily life. Much of what he says may remain strange, even meaningless, yet there will remain a feeling of reality, an atmosphere of actual experiencing ineffable yet very real, a center from which an exemplary life can be lived. Maharaj, the experience may be incommunicable. Can one communicate an experience? Question. Yes, if one is an artist. The essence of art is communication of feeling, of experience. Maharaj, to receive communication, you must be receptive. Question. Of course. There must be a receiver. But if the transmitter does not transmit, of what use is the receiver? Maharaj, the Johnny belongs to all. He gives himself tirelessly and completely to whoever comes to him. If he is not a giver, he is not a Johnny. Whatever he has, he shares. Question, but can he share what he is? Maharaj, you mean can he make others into Johnnies? Yes and no. No, since Johnnies are not made, they realize themselves as such when they return to their source, their real nature. I cannot make you into what you already are. All I can tell you is the way I traveled and invite you to take it. Question. This does not answer my question. I have in mind a critical and skeptical Westerner who denies the very possibility of higher states of consciousness. Recently drugs have made a breach in his disbelief without affecting his materialistic outlook. Drugs are no drugs. The body remains the primary fact and the mind is secondary. Beyond the mind they see nothing. From Buddha onwards the state of self-realization was described in negative terms as not this, not that. Is it inevitable? Is it not possible to illustrate it if not describe? I admit no verbal description will do when the state described is beyond words. Yet it is also within words. Poetry is the art of putting into words the inexpressible. Maharaj, there is no lack of religious poets. Turn to them for what you want. As far as I am concerned, my teaching is simple. Trust me for a while and do what I tell you. If you persevere, you will find that your trust was justified. Question, and what to do with people who are interested but cannot trust? Maharaj, if they could stay with me, they would come to trust me. Once they trust me, they will follow my advice and discover for themselves. Question, it is not for the training that I am asking just now, but for its results. You had both. You are willing to tell us all about the training, but when it comes to results you refuse to share. Either you tell us that your state is beyond words, or that there is no difference, that where we see a difference you see none. In both cases we are left without any insight into your state. Maharaj, how can you have insight into my state when you are without insight into your own? When the very instrument of insight is lacking, is it not important to find it first? It is like a blind man wanting to learn painting before he regains his eyesight. You want to know my state, but do you know the state of your wife or servant? Question, I am asking for some hints only. Maharaj, well I gave you a very significant clue where you see differences I don't to me it is enough. If you think it is not enough I can only repeat it is enough. Think it out deeply and you will come to see what I see. You seem to want instant insight, forgetting that the instant is always preceded by a long preparation. The fruit falls suddenly but the ripening takes time. After all when I talk of trusting me it is only for a short time just enough time to start you moving. The more earnest you are, the less belief you need, for soon you will find your faith in me justified. 
You want me to prove to you that I am trustworthy. How can I and why should I? After all, what I am offering you is the operational approach so current in Western science. When a scientist describes an experiment and its results, usually you accept his statements on trust and repeat his experiment as he describes it. Once you get the same or similar results, you need not trust him anymore, you trust your own experience. In courage, you proceed and arrive in the end at substantially identical results. Question. The Indian mind was made ready for metaphysical experiments by culture and nurture. To the Indian words like direct perception of the supreme reality make sense and bring out responses from the very depths of his being. They mean little to a Westerner. Even when brought up in his own variety of Christianity, he does not think beyond conformity with God's commandments and Christ's injunctions. First-hand knowledge of reality is not only beyond ambition, but also beyond conceiving. Some Indians tell me, hopeless. The Westerner will not, for he cannot. Tell him nothing about self-realization. Let him live a useful life and earn a rebirth in India. Then only will he have a chance. Some say reality is for all equally, but not all are equally endowed with the capacity to grasp it. The capacity will come with desire, which will grow into devotion and ultimately into total self-dedication. With integrity and earnestness and iron determination to overcome all obstacles, the Westerner has the same chance as the Oriental man. All he needs is the rousing of interest. To rouse his interest in self-knowledge he needs to be convinced about its advantages. Maharaj, you believe it is possible to transmit a personal experience? Question, I do not know. You speak of unity identity of the seer with the seen. When all is one communication should be feasible. Maharaj, to have the direct experience of a country one must go and live there. Don't ask for the impossible. A man's spiritual victory no doubt benefits mankind, but to benefit another individual, a close personal relation is required. Such relation is not accidental and not everybody can claim it. On the other hand, the scientific approach is for all. Trust has taste. What more do you need? Why push the truth down unwilling throats? It cannot be done anyhow. Without a receiver what can the giver do? Question. The essence of art is to use the outer form to convey an inner experience. Of course one must be sensitive to the inner before the outer can be meaningful. How does one grow in sensitivity? Maharaj, whichever way you put it, it comes to the same. Givers there are many, where are the takers? Question. Can you not share your own sensitivity? Maharaj, yes I can, but sharing is a two-way street. Two are needed in sharing. Who is willing to take what I am willing to give? Question. You say we are one. Is this not enough? Maharaj, I am one with you. Are you one with me? If you are, you will not ask questions. If you are not, if you do not see what I see, what can I do beyond showing you the way to improve your vision? Question. What you cannot give is not your own. Maharaj, I claim nothing as my own. When the eye is not, where is the mind? Two people look at a tree. One sees the fruit hidden among the leaves and the other does not. Otherwise there is no difference between the two. The one that sees knows that with a little attention the other will also see, but the question of sharing does not arise. Believe me, I am not close-fisted holding back your share of reality. On the contrary, I am all yours, eat me and drink me. But while you repeat verbally, give, give, you do nothing to take what is offered. I am showing you a short and easy way to being able to see what I see, but you cling to your old habits of thought, feeling and action and put all the blame on me. I have nothing which you do not have. Self-knowledge is not a piece of property to be offered and accepted. It is a new dimension altogether where there is nothing to give or take. Question. Give us at least some insight into the content of your mind while you live your daily life. To eat, to drink, to talk, to sleep, how does it feel at your end? 
Maharaj, the common things of life, I experience them just as you do. The difference lies in what I do not experience. I do not experience fear or greed, hate or anger. I ask nothing, refuse nothing, keep nothing. In these matters I do not compromise. Maybe this is the outstanding difference between us. I will not compromise. I am true to myself while you are afraid of reality. Question. From the Westerner's point of view there is something disturbing in your ways. To sit in a corner all by oneself and keep on repeating. I am God, God I am appears to be plain madness. How to convince a Westerner that such practices lead to supreme sanity? Maharaj, the man who claims to be God and the man who doubts it, both are deluded. They talk in their dream. Question, if all is dreaming what is waking? Maharaj, how to describe the waking state in dreamland language? Words do not describe, they are only symbols. Question. Again the same excuse that words cannot convey reality. Maharaj, if you want words I shall give you some of the ancient words of power. Repeat any of them ceaselessly, they can work wonders. Question. Are you serious? Would you tell a Westerner to repeat Om or Ram or Hare Krishna ceaselessly, though he lacks completely the faith and conviction born of the right cultural and religious background? Without confidence and fervor repeating mechanically the same sounds will he ever achieve anything? Maharaj, why not? It is the urge, the hidden motive that matters, not the shape it takes. Whatever he does, if he does it for the sake of finding his own real self, will surely bring him to himself. Question. No need of faith in the efficacy of the means. Maharaj, no need of faith which is but expectation of results. Here the action only counts. Whatever you do for the sake of truth will take you to truth. Only be earnest and honest. The shape it takes hardly matters. Question. Then where is the need of giving expression to one's longing? Maharaj, no need. Doing nothing is as good. Mere longing, undiluted by thought and action, pure, concentrated longing, will take you speedily to your goal. It is the true motive that matters, not the manner. Question. Unbelievable. How can dull repetition and boredom verging on despair be effective? Maharaj. The very facts of repetition, of struggling on and on and of endurance and perseverance, in spite of boredom and despair and complete lack of conviction are really crucial. They are not important by themselves, but the sincerity behind them is all important. There must be a push from within and pull from without. Question. My questions are typical of the West. Their people think in terms of cause and effect, means and goals. They do not see what causal connection can there be between a particular word and the absolute reality. Maharaj, none whatsoever. But there is a connection between the word and its meaning, between the action and its motive. Spiritual practice is will asserted and reasserted. Who is not the daring will not accept the real even when offered. Unwillingness born out of fear is the only obstacle. Question, what is there to be afraid of? Maharaj, the unknown. The not being, not knowing, not doing. The beyond. Question, you mean to say that while you can share the manner of your achievement, you cannot share the fruits? Maharaj, of course I can share the fruits and I am doing so all the time. But mine is a silent language. Learn to listen and understand. Question. I do not see how one can begin without conviction. Maharaj, stay with me for some time or give your mind to what I say and do and conviction will dawn. Question. Not everybody has the chance of meeting you. Maharaj, meet your own self. Be with your own self, listen to it, obey it, cherish it. Keep it in mind ceaselessly. You need no other guide. As long as your urge for truth affects your daily life, all is well with you. Live your life without hurting anybody. Harmlessness is a most powerful form of yoga, and it will take you speedily to your goal. This is what I call Nasarga Yoga, the natural yoga. It is the art of living in peace and harmony, in friendliness and love. The fruit of it is happiness 
uncaused and endless. Question, still all this presupposes some faith. Maharaj, turn within and you will come to trust yourself. In everything else confidence comes with experience. Question, when a man tells me that he knows something I do not know, I have the right to ask, what is if that you know that I do not know? Maharaj, and if he tells you that it cannot be conveyed in words? Question, then I watch him closely and try to make out. Maharaj, and this is exactly what I want you to do. Be interested, give attention, until a current of mutual understanding is established. Then the sharing will be easy. As a matter of fact, all realization is only sharing. You enter a wider consciousness and share in it. Unwillingness to enter and to share is the only hindrance. I never talk of differences, for to me there are none. You do, so it is up to you to show them to me. By all means, show me the differences. For this you will have to understand me, but then you will no longer talk of differences. Understand one thing well, and you have arrived. What prevents you from knowing is not the lack of opportunity, but the lack of ability to focus in your mind what you want to understand. If you could but keep in mind what you do not know, it would reveal to you its secrets. But if you are shallow and impatient, not earnest enough to look and wait, you are like a child crying for the moon. Chapter 39 By itself nothing has existence. Questioner, as I listen to you, I find that it is useless to ask you questions. Whatever the question, you invariably turn it upon itself and bring me to the basic fact that I am living in an illusion of my own making and that reality is inexpressible in words. Words merely add to the confusion and the only wise course is the silent search within. Meharaj, after all, it is the mind that creates illusion and it is the mind that gets free of it. Words may aggravate illusion, words may also help dispel it. There is nothing wrong in repeating the same truth again and again until it becomes reality. Mother's work is not over with the birth of the child. She feeds it day after day, year after year until it needs her no longer. People need hearing words, until facts speak to them louder than words. Question, so we are children to be fed on words. Meharaj, as long as you give importance to words, you are children. Question, all right then be our mother. Maharaj, where was the child before it was born? Was it not with the mother? Because it was already with the mother it could be born. Question, surely the mother did not carry the child when she was a child herself. Maharaj, potentially she was the mother. Go beyond the illusion of time. Question, your answer is always the same. A kind of clockwork which strikes the same hours again and again. Maharaj, it cannot be helped. Just like the one sun is reflected in a billion dew drops, so is the timeless endlessly repeated. When I'll repeat, I am, I am, I merely assert and reassert an ever-present fact. You get tired of my words because you do not see the living truth behind them. Contact it and you will find the full meaning of words and of silence both. Question. You say that the little girl is already the mother of her future child. Potentially, yes. Actually, no. Maharaj, the potential becomes actual by thinking. The body and its affairs exist in the mind. Question. And the mind is consciousness in motion and consciousness is the conditioned siguna aspect of the self. The unconditioned nirguna is another aspect and beyond lies the abyss of the absolute paramartha. Maharaj, quite right, you have put it beautifully. Question, but these are mere words to me. Hearing and repeating them is not enough, they must be experienced. Maharaj, nothing stops you but preoccupation with the outer which prevents you from focusing the inner. It cannot be helped, you cannot skip your sadhana. You have to turn away from the world and go within until the inner and the outer merge and you can go beyond the condition, whether inner or outer. Question. Surely the unconditioned is merely an idea in the conditioned mind. By itself it has no existence. Maharaj, by itself nothing has existence. Everything needs its own absence. 
To be is to be distinguishable, to be here and not there, to be now and not then, to be thus and not otherwise. Like water is shaped by the container, so is everything determined by conditions guinness. As water remains water regardless of the vessels, as light remains itself regardless of the colors it brings out, so does the real remain real, regardless of conditions in which it is reflected. Why keep the reflection only in the focus of consciousness? Why not the real itself? Question. Consciousness itself is a reflection. How can it hold the real? Maharaj, to know that consciousness and its content are but reflections changeful and transient is the focusing of the real. The refusal to see the snake in the rope is the necessary condition for seeing the rope. Question only necessary or also sufficient. Maharaj, one must also know that a rope exists and looks like a snake. Similarly, one must know that the real exists and is of the nature of witness consciousness. Of course, it is beyond the witness, but to enter it one must first realize the state of pure witnessing. The awareness of conditions brings one to the unconditioned. Question, can the unconditioned be experienced? Maharaj, to know the conditioned as conditioned is all that can be said about the unconditioned. Positive terms are mere hints and misleading. Question, can we talk of witnessing the real? Maharaj, how can we? We can talk only of the unreal, the illusory, the transient, the conditioned. To go beyond, we must pass through total negation of everything as having independent existence. All things depend. Question. On what do they depend? Maharaj, on consciousness. And consciousness depends on the witness. Question, and the witness depends on the real. Maharaj, the witness is the reflection of the real in all its purity. It depends on the condition of the mind. Where clarity and detachment predominate, the witness consciousness comes into being. It is just like saying that where the water is clear and quiet, the image of the moon appears. Or like daylight that appears a sparkle in the diamond. Question, can there be consciousness without the witness? Maharaj, without the witness it becomes unconsciousness just living. The witness is latent in every state of consciousness, just like light in every color. There can be no knowledge without the knower and no knower without his witness. Not only you know, but you know that you know. Question. If the unconditioned cannot be experienced for all experience is conditioned then why talk of it at all? Maharaj, how can there be knowledge of the condition without the unconditioned? There must be a source from which all this flows, a foundation on which all stands. Self-realization is primarily the knowledge of one's conditioning and the awareness that the infinite variety of conditions depends on our infinite ability to be conditioned and to give rise to variety. To the conditioned mind the unconditioned appears as the totality as well as the absence of everything. Neither can be directly experienced, but this does not make it not existent. Question. Is it not a feeling? Maharaj, a feeling too is a state of mind. Just like a healthy body does not call for attention, so is the unconditioned free from experience. Take the experience of death. The ordinary man is afraid to die because he is afraid of change. The Johnny is not afraid because his mind is dead already. He does not think, I live. He knows there is life. There is no change in it and no death. Death appears to be a change in time and space. Where there is neither time nor space, how can there be death? The Johnny is already dead to name and shape. How can their loss affect him? The man in the train travels from place to place, but the man off the train goes nowhere, for he is not bound for a destination. He has nowhere to go, nothing to do, nothing to become. Those who make plans will be born to carry them out. Those who make no plans need not be born. Question. What is the purpose of pain and pleasure? Maharaj, do they exist by themselves or only in the mind? Question. Still they exist. Never mind the mind. Maharaj, 
pain and pleasure are merely symptoms the results of wrong knowledge and wrong feeling. A result cannot have a purpose of its own. Question. In God's economy everything must have a purpose. Maharaj, do you know God that you talk of him so freely? What is God to you? A sound, a word on paper, an idea in the mind? Question. By his power I am born and kept alive. Maharaj, and suffer and die. Are you glad? Question. It may be my own fault that I suffer and die. I was created unto life eternal. Maharaj, why eternal in the future and not in the past? What has a beginning must have an end. Only the beginningless is endless. Question. God may be a mere concept, a working theory. A very useful concept all the same. Meharaj, for this it must be free of inner contradictions which is not the case. Why not work on the theory that you are your own creation and creator? At least there will be no external God to battle with. Question, this world is so rich and complex, how could I create it? Meharaj, do you know yourself enough to know what you can do and what you cannot? You do not know your own powers. You never investigated. Begin with yourself now. Question. Everybody believes in God. Meharaj, to me you are your own God. But if you think otherwise, think to the end. If there be God, then all is God's and all is for the best. Welcome all that comes with a glad and thankful heart. And love all creatures. This too will take you to yourself. Chapter 40. Only the self is real. Meharaj, the world is but a show glittering and empty. It is and yet is not. It is there as long as I want to see it and take part in it. When I cease caring it dissolves. It has no cause and serves no purpose. It just happens when we are absent-minded. It appears exactly as it looks, but there is no depth in it nor meaning. Only the onlooker is real. Call himself or Atma. To the self the world is but a colorful show which he enjoys as long as it lasts and forgets when it is over. Whatever happens on the stage makes him shudder in terror or roll with laughter, yet all the time he is aware that it is but a show. Without desire or fear he enjoys it as it happens. Questioner, the person immersed in the world has a life of many flavors. He weeps, he laughs, loves and hates desires and fears, suffers and rejoices. The desireless and fearless Johnny, what life has he? Is he not left high and dry in his aloofness? Meharaj, his state is not so desolate. It tastes of the pure, uncaused, undiluted bliss. He is happy and fully aware that happiness is his very nature and that he need not do anything, nor strive for anything to secure it. It follows him more real than the body, nearer than the mind itself. You imagine that without cause there can be no happiness. To me dependence on anything for happiness is utter misery. Pleasure and pain have causes while my state is my own, totally uncaused, independent, unassailable. Question, like a play on the stage. Maharaj, the play was written, planned and rehearsed. The world just spouts into being out of nothing and returns to nothing. Question. Is there no creator? Was not the world in the mind of Brahma before it was created? Meharaj, as long as you are outside my state, you will have creators, preservers and destroyers, but once with me you will know the self only and see yourself in all. Question. You function nevertheless. Meharaj, when you are giddy you see the world running circles round you. Obsessed with the idea of means and end of work and purpose, you see me apparently functioning. In reality I only look. Whatever is done is done on the stage. Joy and sorrow, life and death, they all are real to the man in bondage. To me they are all in the show as unreal as the show itself. I may perceive the world just like you, but you believe to be in it while I see it as an iridescent drop in the vast expanse of consciousness. Question, we are all getting old. Old age is not pleasant, all aches and pains, weakness and the approaching end. How does a Johnny feel as an old man? How does his inner self look at his own senility? 
Maharaj, as he gets older he grows more and more happy and peaceful. After all, he is going home. Like a traveler nearing his destination and collecting his luggage, he leaves the train without regret. Question. Surely there is a contradiction. We are told that Johnny is beyond all change. His happiness neither grows nor wanes. How can he grow happier because older, and that in spite of physical weakness and so on? Maharaj, there is no contradiction. The reel of destiny is coming to its end. The mind is happy. The mist of bodily existence is lifting the burden of the body, is growing less from day to day. Question, let us say the Johnny is ill. He has caught some flu and every joint aches and burns. What is his state of mind? Maharaj, every sensation is contemplated in perfect equanimity. There is no desire for it, nor refusal. It is as it is and then he looks at it with a smile of affectionate detachment. Question, he may be detached from his own suffering, but still it is there. Maharaj, it is there but it does not matter. Whatever state I am in, I see it as a state of mind to be accepted as it is. Question, pain is pain. You experience it all the same. Maharaj, he who experiences the body experiences its pains and pleasures. I am neither the body nor the experiencer of the body. Question, let us say you are twenty-five years old. Your marriage is arranged and performed, and the household duties crowd upon you. How would you feel? Maharaj, just as I feel now. You keep on insisting that my inner state is molded by outer events. It is just not so. Whatever happens I remain. At the root of my being is pure awareness, a speck of intense light. This speck by its very nature radiates and creates pictures in space and events in time effortlessly and spontaneously. As long as it is merely aware there are no problems. But when the discriminative mind comes into being and creates distinctions, pleasure and pain arise. During sleep the mind is in abeyance and so are pain and pleasure. The process of creation continues but no notice is taken. The mind is a form of consciousness, and consciousness is an aspect of life. Life creates everything but the Supreme is beyond all. Question, the Supreme is the Master and consciousness his servant. Maharaj, the Master is in consciousness not beyond it. In terms of consciousness the Supreme is both creation and dissolution, concretion and abstraction, the focal and the universal. It is also neither. Words do not reach there, nor mind. Question, the Jani seems to be a very lonely being all by himself. Maharaj, he is alone but he is all. He is not even a being. He is the beingness of all beings. Not even that. No words apply. He is what he is, the ground from which all grows. Question, are you not afraid to die? Maharaj, I shall tell you how my Guru's Guru died. After announcing that his end was nearing, he stopped eating without changing the routine of his daily life. On the eleventh day at prayer time he was singing and clapping vigorously and suddenly died. Just like that between two movements like a blown out candle. Everybody dies as he lives. I am not afraid of death because I am not afraid of life. I live a happy life and shall die a happy death. Misery is to be born, not to die. All depends how you look at it. Question, there can be no evidence of your state. All I know about it is what you say. All I see is a very interesting old man. Maharaj, you are the interesting old man not me. I was never born. How can I grow old? What I appear to be to you exists only in your mind. I am not concerned with it. Question, even as a dream you are a most unusual dream. Maharaj, I am a dream that can wake you up. You will have the proof of it in your very waking up. Question. Imagine news reach you that I have died. Somebody tells you, you know so and so? He died. What would be your reaction? Maharaj, I would be very happy to have you back home. Really glad to see you out of this foolishness. Question. Which foolishness? 
Meharaj, of thinking that you were born and will die, that you are a body displaying a mind and all such nonsense. In my world nobody is born and nobody dies. Some people go on a journey and come back, some never leave. What difference does it make since they travel in dream lands, each wrapped up in his own dream? Only the waking up is important. It is enough to know that I am as reality and also love. Question, my approach is not so absolute, hence my question. Throughout the West people are in search of something real. They turn to science which tells them a lot about matter, a little about the mind and nothing about the nature and purpose of consciousness. To them reality is objective, outside the observable and describable, directly or by inference. About the subjective aspect of reality they know nothing. It is extremely important to let them know that there is reality, and it is to be found in the freedom of consciousness from matter and its limitations and distortions. Most of the people in the world just do not know that there is reality which can be found and experienced in consciousness. It is very important that they should hear the good news from somebody who has actually experienced. Such witnesses have always existed and their testimony is precious. Maharaj, of course. The gospel of self-realization once heard will never be forgotten. Like a seed left in the ground, it will wait for the right season and sprout and grow into a mighty tree. Chapter 41. Develop the Witness Attitude. Questioner. What is the daily and hourly state of mind of a realized man? How does he see, hear, eat, drink, wake and sleep, work and rest? What proof is there of his state as different from ours? Apart from the verbal testimony of the so-called realized people, is there no way of verifying their state objectively? Are there not some observable differences in their physiological and nervous responses, in their metabolism, or brain waves, or in their psychosomatic structure? Meharaj, you may find differences or you may not. All depends on your capacity of observation. The objective differences are, however, the least important. What matters is their outlook, their attitude, which is that of total detachment, aloofness, standing apart. Question, does not a Johnny feel sorrow when his child dies? Does he not suffer? Maharaj, he suffers with those who suffer. The event itself is of little importance but he is full of compassion for the suffering being, whether alive or dead, in the body or out of it. After all, love and compassion are his very nature. He is one with all that lives and love is that oneness in action. Question, people are very much afraid of death. Meharaj, the Johnny is afraid of nothing, but he pities the man who is afraid. After all, to be born, to live and to die is natural. To be afraid is not. To the event, of course, attention is given. Question. Imagine you are ill, high fever, aches, shivers. The doctor tells you the condition is serious. There are only a few days to live. What would be your first reaction? Meharaj, no reaction. As it is natural for the incense stick to burn out, so it is natural for the body to die. Really, it is a matter of very little importance. What matters is that I am neither the body nor the mind. I am. Question. Your family will be desperate, of course. What would you tell them? Maharaj. The usual stuff. Fear not, life goes on. God will protect you. We shall be soon together again, and so on. But to me the entire commotion is meaningless, for I am not the entity that imagines itself alive or dead. I am neither born nor can I die. I have nothing to remember or to forget. Question, what about the prayers for the dead? Maharaj, by all means pray for the dead. It pleases them very much. They are flattered. The Johnny does not need your prayers. He is himself the answer to your prayers. Question, how does the Johnny fare after death? Maharaj, the Johnny is dead already. Do you expect him to die again? Question. Surely the dissolution of the body is an important event even to Ajani. Meharaj. There are no important events for Ajani except when somebody reaches the highest goal. 
then only his heart rejoices. All else is of no concern. The entire universe is his body, all life is his life. As in a city of lights, when one bulb burns out, it does not affect the network, so the death of a body does not affect the whole. Question. The particular may not matter to the whole, but it does matter to the particular. The whole is an abstraction, the particular, the concrete, is real. Maharaj, that is what you say. To me it may be the other way, the whole is real, the part comes and goes. The particular is born and reborn, changing name and shape, the jhani is the changeless reality, which makes the changeful possible. But he cannot give you the conviction. It must come with your own experience. With me all is one, all is equal. Question, are sin and virtue one and the same? Maharaj, these are all man-made values. What are they to me? What ends in happiness is virtue, what ends in sorrow is sin. Both are states of mind. Mine is not a state of mind. Question, we are like the blind people at a loss to understand what does it mean to see. Maharaj, you can put it as you like. Question, is the practice of silence as a sadhana effective? Maharaj, anything you do for the sake of enlightenment takes you nearer. Anything you do without remembering enlightenment puts you off. But why complicate? Just know that you are above and beyond all things and thoughts. What you want to be, you are it already. Just keep it in mind. Question. I hear you saying it but I cannot believe. Meharaj, I was in the same position myself. But I trusted my guru and he proved right. Trust me if you can. Keep in mind what I tell you. Desire nothing for you lack nothing. The very seeking prevents you from finding. Question. You seem to be so very indifferent to everything. Meharaj, I am not indifferent I am impartial. I give no preference to the me and the mine. A basket of earth and a basket of jewels are both unwanted. Life and death are all the same to me. Question. Impartiality makes you indifferent. Meharaj, on the contrary, compassion and love are my very core. Void of all predilections, I am free to love. Question. Buddha said that the idea of enlightenment is extremely important. Most people go through their lives not even knowing that there is such a thing as enlightenment, leave alone the striving for it. Once they have heard of it, a seed was sown which cannot die. Therefore, he would send his bhikkhus to preach ceaselessly for eight months every year. Maharaj, one can give food, clothes, shelter, knowledge, affection, but the highest gift is the gospel of enlightenment, my guru used to say. You are right, enlightenment is the highest good. Once you have it, nobody can take it away from you. Question. If you would talk like this in the West, people would take you for mad. Maharaj, of course they would. To the ignorant, all that they cannot understand is madness. What of it? Let them be as they are. I am as I am, for no merit of mine, and they are as they are, for no fault of theirs. The supreme reality manifests itself in innumerable ways. Infinite in number are its names and shapes. All arise, all merge in the same ocean, the source of all is one. Looking for causes and results is but the pastime of the mind. What is is lovable. Love is not a result, it is the very ground of being. Wherever you go, you will find being consciousness and love. Why and what for make preferences? Question. When by natural causes thousands and millions of lives are extinguished as it happens in floods and earthquakes, I do not grieve. But when one man dies at the hand of man, I grieve extremely. The inevitable has its own majesty, but killing is avoidable and therefore ugly and altogether horrible. Meharaj, all happens as it happens. Calamities, whether natural or man-made, happen, and there is no need to feel horrified. Question, how can anything be without cause? Maharaj, in every event the entire universe is reflected. The ultimate cause is untraceable. The very idea of causation is only a way of thinking and speaking. We cannot imagine uncaused emergence. 
This, however, does not prove the existence of causation. Question. Nature is mindless, hence irresponsible. But man has a mind. Why is it so perverse? Maharaj, the causes of perversity are also natural, heredity, environment, and so on. You are too quick to condemn. Do not worry about others. Deal with your own mind first. When you realize that your mind too is a part of nature, the duality will cease. Question. There is some mystery in it which I cannot fathom. How can the mind be a part of nature? Maharaj, because nature is in the mind. Without the mind where is nature? Question. If nature is in the mind and the mind is my own, I should be able to control nature which is not really the case. Forces beyond my control determine my behavior. Maharaj, develop the witness attitude and you will find in your own experience that detachment brings control. The state of witnessing is full of power. There is nothing passive about it. Chapter 42 Reality cannot be expressed. Questioner, I have noticed a new self emerging in me independent of the old self. They somehow coexist. The old self goes on its habitual ways. The new lets the old be, but does not identify itself with it. Maharaj, what is the main difference between the old self and the new? Question, the old self wants everything defined and explained. It wants things to fit each other verbally. The new does not care for verbal explanations. It accepts things as they are and does not seek to relate them to things remembered. Maharaj, are you fully and constantly aware of the difference between the habitual and the spiritual? What is the attitude of the new self to the old? Question, the new just looks at the old. It is neither friendly nor inimical. It just accepts the old self along with everything else. It does not deny its being, but does not accept its value and validity. Maharaj, the new is the total denial of the old. The permissive new is not really new. It is but a new attitude of the old. The really new obliterates the old completely. The two cannot be together. Is there a process of self-denudation, a constant refusal to accept the old ideas and values, or is there just a mutual tolerance? What is their relation? Question. There is no particular relation. They coexist. Maharaj, when you talk of the old self and new, whom do you have in mind? As there is continuity in memory between the two, each remembering the other, how can you speak of two selves? Question. One is a slave to habits, the other is not. One conceptualizes, the other is free from all ideas. Maharaj, why two selves? Between the bound and the free, there can be no relationship. The very fact of coexistence proves their basic unity. There is but one self, it is always now. What you call the other self, old or new, is but a modality, another aspect of the one self. The self is single. You are that self and you have ideas of what you have been or will be. But an idea is not the self. Just now, as you are sitting in front of me, which self are you? The old or the new? Question. The two are in conflict. Maharaj, how can there be conflict between what is and what is not? Conflict is the characteristic of the old. When the new emerges, the old is no longer. You cannot speak of the new and the conflict in the same breath. Even the effort of striving for the new self is of the old. Wherever there is conflict, effort, struggle, striving, longing for a change, the new is not. To what extent are you free from the habitual tendency to create and perpetuate conflicts? Question. I cannot say that I am now a different man. But I did discover new things about myself, states so unlike what I knew before that I feel justified in calling them new. Maharaj, the old self is your own self. State which sprouts suddenly and without cause, carries no stain of self. You may call it God. What is seedless and rootless, what does not sprout and grow flower and fruit, what comes into being suddenly and in full glory mysteriously and marvelously, you may call that God. It is entirely unexpected yet inevitable, 
infinitely familiar yet most surprising, beyond all hope yet absolutely certain. Because it is without cause, it is without hindrance. It obeys one law only, the law of freedom. Anything that implies a continuity, a sequence, a passing from stage to stage cannot be the real. There is no progress in reality, it is final, perfect, unrelated. Question, how can I bring it about? Maharaj, you can do nothing to bring it about but you can avoid creating obstacles. Watch your mind, how it comes into being, how it operates. As you watch your mind, you discover yourself as the watcher. When you stand motionless, only watching, you discover yourself as the light behind the watcher. The source of light is dark, unknown is the source of knowledge. That source alone is. Go back to that source and abide there. It is not in the sky nor in the all-pervading ether. God is all that is great and wonderful. I am nothing, have nothing, can do nothing. Yet all comes out of me, the source is me, the root, the origin is me. When reality explodes in you, you may call it experience of God. Or rather it is God experiencing you. God knows you when you know yourself. Reality is not the result of a process. It is an explosion. It is definitely beyond the mind, but all you can do is to know your mind well. Not that the mind will help you, but by knowing your mind you may avoid your mind disabling you. You have to be very alert or else your mind will play false with you. It is like watching a thief, not that you expect anything from a thief, but you do not want to be robbed. In the same way, you give a lot of attention to the mind without expecting anything from it. Or take another example. We wake and we sleep. After a day's work sleep comes. Now do I go to sleep or does inadvertence characteristic of the sleeping state come to me? In other words, we are awake because we are asleep. We do not wake up into a really waking state. In the waking state the world emerges due to ignorance and takes one into a waking dream state. Both sleep and waking are misnomers. We are only dreaming. True waking and true sleeping only the Johnny knows. We dream that we are awake, we dream that we are asleep. The three states are only varieties of the dream state. Treating everything as a dream liberates. As long as you give reality to dreams, you are their slave. By imagining that you are born a so-and-so, you become a slave to the so-and-so. The essence of slavery is to imagine yourself to be a process, to have past and future, to have history. In fact, we have no history, we are not a process, we do not develop nor decay, also see all as a dream and stay out of it. Question, what benefit do I derive from listening to you? Maharaj, I am calling you back to yourself. All I ask you is to look at yourself, towards yourself, into yourself. Question, to what purpose? Maharaj, you live you feel you think. By giving attention to your living, feeling and thinking, you free yourself from them and go beyond them. Your personality dissolves and only the witness remains. Then you go beyond the witness. Do not ask how it happens. Just search within yourself. Question. What makes the difference between the person and the witness? Maharaj. Both are modes of consciousness. In one you desire and fear. In the other you are unaffected by pleasure and pain and are not ruffled by events. You let them come and go. Question. How does one get established in the higher state? the state of pure witnessing. Maharaj, consciousness does not shine by itself. It shines by a light beyond it. Having seen the dreamlike quality of consciousness, look for the light in which it appears which gives it being. There is the content of consciousness as well as the awareness of it. Question, I know and I know that I know. Maharaj, quite so provided the second knowledge is unconditional and timeless. Forget the known, but remember that you are the knower. Don't be all the time immersed in your experiences. Remember that you are beyond the experience ever unborn and deathless. In remembering it, the quality of pure knowledge will emerge, the light of unconditional awareness. Question, at what point does one experience reality? 
Meharaj experiences of change it comes and goes. Reality is not an event it cannot be experienced. It is not perceivable in the same way as an event is perceivable. If you wait for an event to take place, for the coming of reality, you will wait forever, for reality neither comes nor goes. It is to be perceived not expected. It is not to be prepared for and anticipated. But the very longing and search for reality is the movement, operation, action of reality. All you can do is to grasp the central point that reality is not an event and does not happen and whatever happens, whatever comes and goes, is not reality. See the event as event only the transient as transient experience is mere experience and you have done all you can. Then you are vulnerable to reality, no longer armored against it, as you were when you gave reality to events and experiences. But as soon as there is some like or dislike, you have drawn a screen. Question. Would you say that reality expresses itself in action rather than in knowledge? Or is it a feeling of sorts? Maharaj, neither action nor feeling nor thought express reality. There is no such thing as an expression of reality. You are introducing a duality where there is none. Only reality is there is nothing else. The three states of waking, dreaming and sleeping are not me and I am not in them. When I die the world will say, Oh Maharaj is dead. But to me these are words without content, they have no meaning. When the worship is done before the image of the Guru, all takes place as if he wakes and bathes and eats and rests and goes for a stroll and returns, blesses all and goes to sleep. All is attended to in minutous details and yet there is a sense of unreality about it all. So is the case with me. All happens as it needs yet nothing happens. I do what seems to be necessary, but at the same time I know that nothing is necessary, that life itself is only a make-belief. Question, why then live at all? Why all this unnecessary coming and going, waking and sleeping, eating and digesting? Maharaj, nothing is done by me, everything just happens, I do not expect, I do not plan, I just watch events happening, knowing them to be unreal. Question, were you always like this from the first moment of enlightenment? Maharaj, the three states rotate as usual, there is waking and sleeping and waking again, but they do not happen to me. They just happen. To me nothing ever happens. There is something changeless, motionless, immovable, rock-like, unassailable, a solid mass of pure being consciousness bliss. I am never out of it. Nothing can take me out of it, no torture, no calamity. Question. Yet, you are conscious. Meharaj, yes and no. There is peace deep, immense, unshakable. Events are registered in memory, but are of no importance. I am hardly aware of them. Question. If I understand you rightly, this state did not come by cultivation. Maharaj, there was no coming. It was so always. There was discovery and it was sudden. Just as at birth you discover the world suddenly, as suddenly, I discovered my real being. Question. Was it clouded over and your sadhana dissolved the mist? When your true state became clear to you, did it remain clear or did it get obscured again? Is your condition permanent or intermittent? Maharaj, absolutely steady. Whatever I may do it stays like a rock motionless. Once you have awakened into reality, you stay in it. A child does not return to the womb. It is a simple state smaller than the smallest, bigger than the biggest. It is self-evident and yet beyond description. Question. Is there a way to it? Maharaj. Everything can become a way provided you are interested. Just puzzling over my words and trying to grasp their full meaning is a sod down a quite sufficient for breaking down the wall. Nothing troubles me. I offer no resistance to trouble therefore it does not stay with me. On your side there is so much trouble. On mine there is no trouble at all. Come to my side. You are trouble prone. I am immune. Anything may happen. What is needed is sincere interest. Earnestness does it. 
Question, can I do it? Maharaj, of course. You are quite capable of crossing over. Only be sincere. Chapter 43, Ignorance can be recognized, not jhana. Questioner, from year to year your teaching remains the same. There seems to be no progress in what you tell us. Maharaj, in a hospital the sick are treated and get well. The treatment is routine with hardly any change but there is nothing monotonous about health. My teaching may be routine but the fruit of it is new from man to man. Question, what is realization? Who is a realized man? By what is the jhani recognized? Maharaj, there are no distinctive marks of jhana. Only ignorance can be recognized, not jhana. Nor does a jhani claim to be something special. All those who proclaim their own greatness and uniqueness are not jhanis. They are mistaking some unusual development for realization. The jhani shows no tendency to proclaim himself to be a jhani. He considers himself to be perfectly normal, true to his real nature. Proclaiming oneself to be an omnipotent, omniscient and omnipotent deity is a clear sign of ignorance. Question, can the jhani convey his experience to the ignorant? Can jhana be transmitted from one man to another? Meharaj, yes it can. The words of a jhani have the power of dispelling ignorance and darkness in the mind. It is not the words that matter but the power behind them. Question, what is that power? Maharaj, the power of conviction based on personal realization on one's own direct experience. Question, some realized people say that knowledge must be one, not God. Another can only teach, but the learning is one's own. Maharaj, it comes to the same. Question, there are many who have practiced yoga for years and years without any result. What may be the cause of their failure? Maharaj, some are addicted to trances with their consciousness in abeyance. Without full consciousness what progress can there be? Question, many are practicing samadhi's states of rapturous absorption. In samadhi's consciousness is quite intense, yet they do not result in anything. Maharaj, what results do you expect? And why should jhana be the result of anything? One thing leads to another, but jhana is not a thing to be bound by causes and results. It is beyond causality altogether. It is abidance in the self. The yogi comes to know many wonders, but of the self he remains ignorant. The jhani may look and feel quite ordinary, but the self he knows well. Question. There are many who strive for self-knowledge earnestly, but with scant results. What may be the cause of it? Maharaj, they have not investigated the sources of knowledge sufficiently, their sensations, feelings and thoughts they do not know well enough. This may be one cause of delay. The other, some desires may still be alive. Question, ups and downs in sadhana are inevitable. Yet the earnest seeker plods on in spite of all. What can the jhani do for such a seeker? Maharaj, if the seeker is earnest the light can be given. The light is for all and always there, but the seekers are few, and among those few, those who are ready are very rare. Rightness of heart and mind is indispensable. Question, did you get your own realization through effort or by the grace of your guru? Maharaj, his was the teaching and mine was the trust. My confidence in him made me accept his words as true, go deep into them, live them, and that is how I came to realize what I am. The Guru's person and words made me trust him, and my trust made them fruitful. Question, but can a Guru give realization without words, without trust, just like this, without any preparation? Maharaj, yes one can, but where is the taker? You see, I was so attuned to my Guru, so completely trusting him, there was so little of resistance in me, that it all happened easily and quickly. But not everybody is so fortunate. Laziness and restlessness often stand in the way and until they are seen and removed, the progress is slow. All those who have realized on the spot by mere touch, look or thought have been ripe for it. But such are very few. The majority needs some time for ripening sadhana, is accelerated ripening. 
Question, what makes one ripe? What is the ripening factor? Maharaj, earnestness of course, one must be really anxious. After all, the realized man is the most earnest man. Whatever he does, he does it completely, without limitations and reservations. Integrity will take you to reality. Question, do you love the world? Maharaj, when you are hurt you cry. Why? Because you love yourself. Don't bottle up your love by limiting it to the body, keep it open. It will be then the love for all. When all the false self-identifications are thrown away, what remains is all-embracing love. Get rid of all ideas about yourself, even of the idea that you are God. No self-definition is valid. Question. I am tired of promises. I am tired of sadhanas, which take all my time and energy and bring nothing. I want reality here and now. Can I have it? Maharaj, of course you can provided you are really fed up with everything including your sadhanas. When you demand nothing of the world, nor of God, when you want nothing, seek nothing, expect nothing, then the supreme state will come to you uninvited and unexpected. Question. If a man engrossed in family life and in the affairs of the world does his sadhana strictly as prescribed by his scriptures, will he get results? Maharaj, results he will get, but he will be wrapped up in them like in a cocoon. Question. So many saints say that when you are ripe and ready, you will realize. Their words may be true, but they are of little use. There must be a way out, independent of ripening which needs time, of sadhana which needs effort. Maharaj, don't call it a way, it is more a kind of skill. It is not even that. Stay open and quiet, that is all. What you seek is so near you, that there is no place for a way. Question, there are so many ignorant people in the world and so few jhanis. What may be the cause of it? Maharaj, don't concern yourself with others, take care of yourself. You know that you are. Don't burden yourself with names, just be. Any name or shape you give yourself obscures your real nature. Question, why should seeking end before one can realize? Maharaj, the desire for truth is the highest of all desires, yet it is still a desire. All desires must be given up to the real to be. Remember that you are. This is your working capital. Rotate it and there will be much profit. Question, why should there be seeking at all? Maharaj, life is seeking, one cannot help seeking. When all search ceases, it is the supreme state. Question, why does the supreme state come and go? Maharaj, it neither comes nor goes. It is. Question, do you speak from your own experience? Maharaj, of course. It is a timeless state, ever present. Question, with me it comes and goes, with you it does not. Why this difference? Maharaj, maybe because I have no desires. Or you do not desire the Supreme strongly enough. You must feel desperate when your mind is out of touch. Question, all my life I was striving and achieved so little. I was reading, I was listening, all in vain. Maharaj, listening and reading became a habit with you. Question, I gave it up too. I do not read nowadays. Maharaj, what you gave up is of no importance now. What have you not given up? Find that out and give up Tha Sadhyana is a search for what to give up. Empty yourself completely. Question. How can a fool desire wisdom? One needs to know the object of desire to desire it. When the Supreme is not known, how can it be desired? Maharaj, man naturally ripens and becomes ready for realization. Question, but what is the ripening factor? Maharaj, self-remembrance awareness of Elam ripens him powerfully and speedily. Give up all ideas about yourself and simply be. Question, I am tired of all the ways and means and skills and tricks of all these mental acrobatics. Is there a way to perceive reality directly and immediately? Maharaj, stop making use of your mind and see what happens. Do this one thing thoroughly. That is all. Question. When I was younger I had strange experiences, 
short but memorable, of being nothing, just nothing, yet fully conscious. But the danger is that one has the desire to recreate from memory the moments that have passed. Meharaj, this is all imagination. In the light of consciousness, all sorts of things happen and one need not give special importance to any. The sight of a flower is as marvelous as the vision of God. Let them be. Why remember them and then make memory into a problem? Be bland about them. Do not divide them into high and low, inner and outer, lasting and transient. Go beyond, go back to the source, go to the self that is the same whatever happens. Your weakness is due to your conviction that you were born into the world. In reality the world is ever recreated in you and by you. See everything as emanating from the light which is the source of your own being. You will find that in that light there is love and infinite energy. Question. If I am that light why do I not know it? Maharaj, to know you need a knowing mind, a mind capable of knowing. But your mind is ever on the run, never still, never fully reflecting. How can you see the moon in all her glory when the eye is clouded with disease? Question, can we say that while the sun is the cause of the shadow one cannot see the sun in the shadow? One must turn round. Maharaj, again you have introduced the trinity of the sun, the body and shadow. There is no such division in reality. What I am talking about has nothing to do with dualities and trinities. Don't mentalize and verbalize. Just see and be. Question, must I see to be? Meharaj, see what you are. Don't ask others, don't let others tell you about yourself. Look within and see. All the teacher can tell you is only this. There is no need of going from one to another. The same water is in all the wells. You just draw from the nearest. In my case the water is within me and I am the water. Chapter 44 I am as true all else is inference. Maharaj, the perceiver of the world, is he prior to the world or does he come into being along with the world? Questioner, what a strange question. Why do you ask such questions? Maharaj, unless you know the correct answer you will not find peace. Question, when I wake up in the morning the world is already there waiting for me. Surely the world comes into being first. I do but much later at the earliest at my birth. The body mediates between me and the world. Without the body there would be neither me nor the world. Maharaj, the body appears in your mind, your mind is the content of your consciousness. You are the motionless witness of the river of consciousness which changes eternally without changing you in any way. Your own changelessness is so obvious that you do not notice it. Have a good look at yourself and all these misapprehensions and misconceptions will dissolve. Just as all the little watery lives are in water and cannot be without water, so all the universe is in you and cannot be without you. Question, we call it God. Maharaj, God is only an idea in your mind. The fact is you. The only thing you know for sure is, here and now I am. Remove the here and now the I am remains unassailable. The word exists in memory. Memory comes into consciousness. Consciousness exists in awareness and awareness is the reflection of the light on the waters of existence. Question, still I do not see how can the world be in me when the opposite I am in the world is so obvious. Meharaj, even to say I am the world, the world is me is a sign of ignorance. But when I keep in mind and confirm in life my identity with the world, a power arises in me which destroys the ignorance, burns it up completely. Question, is the witness of ignorance separate from ignorance? Is not to say, I am ignorant a part of ignorance? Meharaj, of course. All I can say truly is, I am all else's inference. But the inference has become a habit. Destroy all habits of thinking and seeing. The sense I am is the manifestation of a deeper cause, which you may call self, God, reality, or by any other name. The I am is in the world, but it is the key which can open the door out of the world. The moon dancing on the water is seen in the water, but it is caused by the moon in the sky and not by the water. Question, still the main point seems to escape me. 
I can admit that the world in which I live and move and have my being is of my own creation, a projection of myself, of my imagination, on the unknown world, the world as it is, the world of absolute matter, whatever this matter may be. The world of my own creation may be quite unlike the ultimate, the real world, just like the cinema screen is quite unlike the pictures projected onto it. Nevertheless, this absolute world exists quite independent of myself. Maharaj, quite so the world of absolute reality onto which your mind has projected a world of relative unreality is independent of yourself, for the very simple reason that it is yourself. Question, is there no contradiction in terms? How can independence prove identity? Maharaj, examine the motion of change and you will see. What can change while you do not change, can be said to be independent of you. But what is changeless must be one with whatever else is changeless. Or duality implies interaction and interaction meets change. In other words, the absolutely material and the absolutely spiritual, the totally objective and the totally subjective are identical, both in substance and essence. Question. Like in a tri-dimensional picture, the light forms its own screen. Maharaj, any comparison will do. The main point to grasp is that you have projected onto yourself a world of your own imagination, based on memories, on desires and fears, and that you have imprisoned yourself in it. Break the spell and be free. Question, how does one break the spell? Maharaj, assert your independence in thought and action. After all, all hangs on your faith in yourself, on the conviction that what you see and hear, think and feel is real. Why not question your faith? No doubt, this world is painted by you on the screen of consciousness and is entirely your own private world. Only your sense I am, though in the world, is not of the world. By no fruit of logic or imagination can you change the I am into I am not. In the very denial of your being you assert it. Once you realize that the world is your own projection, you are free of it. You need not free yourself of a world that does not exist except in your own imagination. However is the picture, beautiful or ugly, you are painting it and you are not bound by it. Realize that there is nobody to force it on you, that it is due to the habit of taking the imaginary to be real. See the imaginary as imaginary and be free of fear. Just as the colors in this carpet are brought out by light, but light is not the color, so is the world caused by you, but you are not the world. That which creates and sustains the world, you may call it God or providence, but ultimately you are the proof that God exists, not the other way round. For before any question about God can be put, you must be there to put it. Question. God is an experience in time, but the experiencer is timeless. Maharaj, even the experiencer is secondary. Primary is the infinite expanse of consciousness, the eternal possibility, the immeasurable potential of all that was, is, and will be. When you look at anything, it is the ultimate you see, but you imagine that you see a cloud or a tree. Learn to look without imagination, to listen without distortion, that is all. Stop attributing names and shapes to the essentially nameless and formless. Realize that every mode of perception is subjective, that what is seen or heard, touched or smelt, felt or thought, expected or imagined, is in the mind and not in reality, and you will experience peace and freedom from fear. Even the sense of I am is composed of the pure light and the sense of being. The I is there even without the am. So is the pure light there whether you say I or not. Become aware of that pure light and you will never lose it. The beingness in being, the awareness in consciousness, the interest in every experience that is not describable, yet perfectly accessible, for there is nothing else. Question. You talk of reality directly as the all-pervading, ever-present, eternal, all-knowing, all-energizing first cause. There are other teachers who refuse to discuss reality at all. They say reality is beyond the mind while all discussions are within the realm of the mind, which is the home of the unreal. Their approach is negative. 
they pinpoint the unreal and thus go beyond it into the real. Maharaj, the difference lies in the words only. After all, when I talk of the real, I describe it as not unreal, space less, time less, cause less, beginning less, and end less. It comes to the same. As long as it leads to enlightenment, what does the wording matter? Does it matter whether you pull the cart or push it as long as it is kept rolling? You may feel attracted to reality at one time and repelled from the false at another. These are only moods which alternate, both are needed for perfect freedom. You may go one way or another, but each time it will be the right way at the moment. Just go wholeheartedly, don't waste time on doubting or hesitating. Many kinds of food are needed to make the child grow, but the act of eating is the same. Theoretically all approaches are good. In practice and at a given moment, you proceed by one road only. Sooner or later you are bound to discover that if you really want to find, you must dig at one place only within. Neither your body nor mind can give you what you seek, the being and knowing yourself and the great peace that comes with it. Question. Surely there is something valid and valuable in every approach. Maharaj, in each case the value lies in bringing you to the need of seeking within. Playing with various approaches may be due to resistance to going within, to the fear of having to abandon the illusion of being something or somebody in particular. To find water you do not dig small pits all over the place but drill deep in one place only. Similarly, to find yourself you have to explore yourself. When you realize that you are the light of the world, you will also realize that you are the love of it, that to know is to love and to love is to know. Of all the affections the love of one's self comes first. Your love of the world is the reflection of your love of yourself, for your world is of your own creation. Light and love are impersonal but they are reflected in your mind as knowing and wishing oneself well. We are always friendly towards ourselves, but not always wise. A yogi is a man whose goodwill is allied to wisdom. Chapter 45 What comes and goes has no being. Questioner, I have come to be with you rather than to listen. Little can be said in words, much more can be conveyed in silence. Maharaj, first words then silence. One must be ripe for silence. Question, can I live in silence? Maharaj, unselfish work leads to silence for when you work selflessly, you don't need to ask for help. Indifferent to results, you are willing to work with the most inadequate means. You do not care to be much gifted and well equipped. Nor do you ask for recognition and assistance. You just do what needs be done, leaving success and failure to the unknown. For everything is caused by innumerable factors, of which your personal endeavor is but one. Yet such is the magic of man's mind and heart, that the most improbable happens when human will and love pull together. Question, what is wrong with asking for help when the work is worthy? Maharaj, where is the need of asking? It merely shows weakness and anxiety. Work on and the universe will work with you. After all the very idea of doing the right thing comes to you from the unknown. Leave it to the unknown as far as the results go, just go through the necessary movements. You are merely one of the links in the long chain of causation. Fundamentally, all happens in the mind only. When you work for something wholeheartedly and steadily, it happens for it is the function of the mind to make things happen. In reality nothing is lacking and nothing is needed, all work is on the surface only. In the depths there is perfect peace. All your problems arise because you have defined and therefore limited yourself. When you do not think yourself to be this or that, all conflict ceases. Any attempt to do something about your problems is bound to fail for what is caused by desire can be undone only in freedom from desire. You have enclosed yourself in time and space, squeezed yourself into the span of a lifetime and the volume of a body and thus created the innumerable conflicts of life and death, pleasure and pain, hope and fear. You cannot be rid of problems without abandoning illusions. Question. A person is naturally limited. Maharaj, there is no such thing as a person. 
there are only restrictions and limitations. The sum total of these defines the person. You think you know yourself when you know what you are. But you never know who you are. The person merely appears to be like the space within the pot appears to have the shape and volume and smell of the pot. See that you are not what you believe yourself to be. Fight with all the strength at your disposal against the idea that you are nameable and describable. You are not. Refuse to think of yourself in terms of this or that. There is no other way out of misery, which you have created for yourself through blind acceptance without investigation. Suffering is a call for inquiry, all pain needs investigation. Don't be too lazy to think. Question, activity is the essence of reality. There is no virtue in not working. Along with thinking something must be done. Meharaj, to work in the world is hard, to refrain from all unnecessary work is even harder. Question, for the person I am all this seems impossible. Meharaj, what do you know about yourself? You can only be what you are in reality, you can only appear what you are not. You have never moved away from perfection. All idea of self-improvement is conventional and verbal. As the sun knows not darkness, so does the self know not the non-self. It is the mind which by knowing the other becomes the other. Yet the mind is nothing else but the self. It is the self that becomes the other, the not-self, and yet remains the self. All else is an assumption. Just as a cloud obscures the sun without in any way affecting it, so does assumption obscure reality without destroying it. The very idea of destruction of reality is ridiculous. The destroyer is always more real than the destroyed. Reality is the ultimate destroyer. All separation, every kind of estrangement and alienation is false. All is one. This is the ultimate solution of every conflict. Question, how is it that in spite of so much instruction and assistance we make no progress? Maharaj, as long as we imagine ourselves to be separate personalities, one quite apart from another, we cannot grasp reality which is essentially impersonal. First we must know ourselves as witnesses only, dimensionless and timeless centers of observation, and then realize that immense ocean of pure awareness, which is both mind and matter and beyond both. Question, whatever I may be in reality, yet I feel myself to be a small and separate person, one amongst many. Maharaj, your being a person is due to the illusion of space and time. You imagine yourself to be at a certain point occupying a certain volume. Your personality is due to your self-identification with the body. Your thoughts and feelings exist in succession. They have their span in time and make you imagine yourself, because of memory, as having duration. In reality time and space exist in you. You do not exist in them. They are modes of perception, but they are not the only ones. Time and space are like words written on paper. The paper is real, the words merely a convention. How old are you? Question 48. Maharaj, what makes you say 48? What makes you say, I am here? Verbal habits born from assumptions. The mind creates time and space and takes its own creations for reality. All is here and now, but we do not see it. Truly all is in me and by me. There is nothing else. The very idea of else is a disaster and a calamity. Question, what is the cause of personification of self-limitation in time and space? Meharaj, that which does not exist cannot have a cause. There is no such thing as a separate person. Even taking the empirical point of view, it is obvious that everything is the cause of everything, that everything is as it is, because the entire universe is as it is. Question, yet personality must have a cause. Maharaj, how does personality come into being? By memory. By identifying the present with the past and projecting it into the future. Think of yourself as momentary, without past and future and your personality dissolves. Question, does not I am remain? Meharaj, the word remain does not apply. I am is ever fresh. 
you do not need to remember in order to be. As a matter of fact, before you can experience anything, there must be the sense of being. At present your being is mixed up with experiencing. All you need is to unravel being from the tangle of experiences. Once you have known pure being, without being this or that, you will discern it among experiences, and you will no longer be misled by names and forms. Self-limitation is the very essence of personality. Question, how can I become universal? Maharaj, but you are universal. You need not and you cannot become what you are already. Only cease imagining yourself to be the particular. What comes and goes has no being. It owes its very appearance to reality. You know that there is a world, but does the world know you? All knowledge flows from you, as all being and all Joe realize that you are the eternal source and accept all as your own. Such acceptance is true love. Question, all you say sounds very beautiful. But how has one to make it into a way of living? Maharaj, having never left the house you are asking for the way home. Get rid of wrong ideas, that is all. Collecting right ideas also will take you nowhere. To cease imagining. Question, it is not a matter of achievement but of understanding. Maharaj, don't try to understand. Enough if you do not misunderstand. Don't rely on your mind for liberation. It is the mind that brought you into bondage. Go beyond it altogether. What is beginningless cannot have a cause. It is not that you knew what you are and then you have forgotten. Once you know, you cannot forget. Ignorance has no beginning but can have an end. Inquire who is ignorant and ignorance will dissolve like a dream. The world is full of contradictions, hence your search for harmony and peace. These you cannot find in the world, for the world is the child of chaos. To find order you must search within. The world comes into being only when you are born in a body. No body, no world. First inquire whether you are the body. The understanding of the world will come later. Question. What you say sounds convincing, but of what use is it to the private person who knows itself to be in the world and of the world? Maharaj, millions eat bread but few know all about wheat. And only those who know can improve the bread. Similarly, only those who know the self who have seen beyond the world can improve the world. Their value to private persons is immense, for they are their only hope of salvation. What is in the world cannot save the world. If you really care to help the world you must step out of it. Question, but can one step out of the world? Maharaj, who was born first, you are the world. As long as you give first place to the world, you are bound by it. Once you realize beyond all trace of doubt that the world is in you and not you in the world, you are out of it. Of course your body remains in the world and of the world, but you are not deluded by it. All scriptures say that before the world was, the Creator was. Who knows the Creator? He alone who was before the Creator, your own real being, the source of all the worlds with their creators. Question, all you say is held together by your assumption that the world is your own projection. You admit that you mean your personal, subjective world, the world given you through your senses and your mind. In that sense each one of us lives in a world of his own projection. These private worlds hardly touch each other and they arise from and merge into the I am at their center. Purely behind these private worlds there must be a common objective world, of which the private worlds are mere shadows. Do you deny the existence of such an objective world common to all? Maharaj, reality is neither subjective nor objective, neither mind nor matter, neither time nor space. These divisions need somebody to whom to happen, a conscious separate center. The reality is all and nothing, the totality and the exclusion, the fullness and the emptiness, fully consistent, absolutely paradoxical. You cannot speak about it, you can only lose yourself in it. When you deny reality to anything, you come to a residue which cannot be denied. All talk of jhana is a sign of ignorance. It is the mind that imagines that it does not know and then comes to know. Reality knows nothing of these contortions. 
Even the idea of God as the Creator is false. Do I owe my being to any other being? Because I am all is. Question, how can it be? A child is born into the world, not the world into the child. The world is old and the child is new. Maharaj, the child is born into your world. Now were you born into your world or did your world appear to you? To be born means to create a world round yourself as the center. But do you ever create yourself? Or did anyone create you? Everyone creates a world for himself and lives in it, imprisoned by one's ignorance. All we have to do is to deny reality to our prison. Question. Just as the waking state exists in seed form during sleep, so does the world the child creates on being born exist before its birth. With whom does the seed lie? Maharaj, with him who is the witness of birth and death but is neither born nor dies. He alone is the seed of creation as well as its residue. Don't ask the mind to confirm what is beyond the mind. Direct experience is the only valid confirmation. Chapter 46 Awareness of Being is Bliss Questioner, by profession I am a physician. I began with surgery, continued with psychiatry and also wrote some books on mental health and healing by faith. I came to you to learn the laws of spiritual health. Maharaj, when you are trying to cure a patient, what exactly are you trying to cure? What is cure? When can you say that a man is cured? Question. I seek to cure the body as well as improve the link between the body and the mind. I also seek to set right the mind. Maharaj, did you investigate the connection between the mind and the body? At what point are they connected? Question. Between the body and the indwelling consciousness lies the mind. Maharaj, is not the body made of food? And can there be a mind without food? Question. The body is built and maintained by food. Without food the mind usually goes weak. But the mind is not mere food. There is a transforming factor which creates a mind in the body. What is that transforming factor? Maharaj, just like the wood produces fire which is not wood, so does the body produce the mind which is not the body. But to whom does the mind appear? Who is the perceiver of the thoughts and feelings which you call the mind? There is wood, there is fire, and there is the enjoyer of the fire. Who enjoys the mind? Is the enjoyer also a result of food, or is it independent? Question. The perceiver is independent. Maharaj, how do you know? Speak from your own experience. You are not the body nor the mind. You say so. How do you know? Question. I really do not know. I guess so. Maharaj, truth is permanent. The real is changeless. What changes is not real, what is real does not change. Now what is it in you that does not change? As long as there is food, there is body and mind. When the food is stopped, the body dies and the mind dissolves. But does the observer perish? Question, I guess it does not. But I have no proof. Maharaj, you yourself are the proof. You have not, nor can you have any other proof. You are yourself, you know yourself, you love yourself. Whatever the mind does, it does for the love of its own self. The very nature of the self is love. It is loved, loving and lovable. It is the self that makes the body and the mind so interesting, so very dear. Very attention given to them comes from the self. Question. If the self is not the body nor the mind, can it exist without the body and the mind? Maharaj, yes it can. It is a matter of actual experience that the self has being independent of mind and body. It is being awareness bliss. Awareness of being is bliss. Question. It may be a matter of actual experience to you, but it is not my case. How can I come to the same experience? What practices to follow, what exercises to take up? Maharaj, to know that you are neither body nor mind, watch yourself steadily and live unaffected by your body and mind completely aloof as if you were dead. It means you have no vested interests either in the body or in the mind. Question. Dangerous. 
Maharaj, I am not asking you to commit suicide. Nor can you. You can only kill the body. You cannot stop the mental process, nor can you put an end to the person you think you are. Just remain unaffected. This complete aloofness, unconcern with mind and body is the best proof that at the core of your being you are neither mind nor body. What happens to the body and the mind may not be within your power to change, but you can always put an end to your imagining yourself to be body and mind. Whatever happens, remind yourself that only your body and mind are affected, not yourself. The more earnest you are at remembering what needs to be remembered, the sooner will you be aware of yourself as you are, for memory will become experience. Earnestness reveals being. What is imagined and willed becomes actuality. Here lies the danger as well as the way out. Tell me, what steps have you taken to separate your real self, that in you which is changeless, from your body and mind? Question. I am a medical man, I have studied a lot, I imposed on myself a strict discipline in the way of exercises and periodical fasts and I am a vegetarian. Maharaj, but in the depth of your heart what is it that you want? Question, I want to find reality. Maharaj, what price are you willing to pay for reality? Any price? Question, while in theory I am ready to pay any price, in actual life again and again, I am being prompted to behave in ways which come in between me and reality. Desire carries me away. Maharaj, increase and widen your desires till nothing but reality can fulfill them. It is not desire that is wrong, but its narrowness and smallness. Desire is devotion. By all means be devoted to the real, the infinite, the eternal heart of being. Transform desire into love. All you want is to be happy. All your desires, whatever they may be, are expressions of your longing for happiness. Basically, you wish yourself well. Question, I know that I should not, Maharaj, wait. Who told you that you should not? What is wrong with wanting to be happy? Question, the self must go, I know. Maharaj, but the self is there. Your desires are there. Your longing to be happy is there. Why? Because you love yourself. By all means love yourself wisely. What is wrong is to love yourself stupidly, so as to make yourself suffer. Love yourself wisely. Both indulgence and austerity have the same purpose in view, to make you happy. Indulgence is the stupid way, austerity is the wise way. Question, what is austerity? Maharaj, once you have gone through an experience not to go through it again is austerity. To eschew the unnecessary is austerity. Not to anticipate pleasure or pain is austerity. Having things under control at all times is austerity. Desire by itself is not wrong. It is life itself, the urge to grow in knowledge and experience. It is the choices you make that are wrong. To imagine that some little thing, foo, sex, power, fame, will make you happy is to deceive yourself. Only something as vast and deep as your real self can make you truly and lastingly happy. Question. Since there is nothing basically wrong in desire as an expression of love of self, how should desire be managed? Maharaj, live your life intelligently with the interests of your deep self always in mind. After all, what do you really want? Not perfection, you are already perfect. What you seek is to express in action what you are. For this you have a body and a mind. Take them in hand and make them serve you. Question, who is the operator here? Who is to take the body mind in hand? Maharaj, the purified mind is the faithful servant of the self. It takes charge of the instruments, inner and outer, and makes them serve their purpose. Question, and what is their purpose? Maharaj, the self is universal and its aims are universal. There is nothing personal about the self. Live an orderly life, but don't make it a goal by itself. It should be the starting point for high adventure. Question. Do you advise me to come to India repeatedly? Maharaj, if you are earnest, you don't need moving about. You are yourself wherever you are, and you create your own climate. 
locomotion and transportation will not give you salvation. You are not the body and dragging the body from place to place will take you nowhere. Your mind is free to roam the three worlds make full use of it. Question, if I am free why am I in a body? Meharaj, you are not in the body the body is in you. The mind is in you. They happen to you. They are there because you find them interesting. Your very nature has the infinite capacity to enjoy. It is full of zest and affection. It sheds its radiance on all that comes within its focus of awareness and nothing is excluded. It does not know evil nor ugliness it hopes it trusts it loves. You people do not know how much you miss by not knowing your own true self. You are neither the body nor the mind, neither the fuel nor the fire. They appear and disappear according to their own laws. That which you are, your true self, you love it, and whatever you do, you do for your own happiness. To find it, to know it, to cherish it is your basic urge. Since time immemorial you loved yourself, but never wisely. Use your body and mind wisely in the service of the self, that is all. Be true to your own self, love yourself absolutely. Do not pretend that you love others as yourself. Unless you have realized them as one with yourself, you cannot love them. Don't pretend to be what you are not. Don't refuse to be what you are. Your love of others is the result of self-knowledge, not its cause. Without self-realization, no virtue is genuine. When you know beyond all doubting that the same life flows through all that is, and you are that life, you will love all naturally and spontaneously. When you realize the depth and fullness of your love of yourself, you know that every living being and the entire universe are included in your affection. But when you look at anything as separate from you, you cannot love it for you are afraid of it. Alienation causes fear and fear deepens alienation. It is a vicious circle. Only self-realization can break it. Go for it resolutely. Chapter 47. Watch your mind. Questioner. In one's search for the essential, one soon realizes one's inadequacy and the need for a guide or a teacher. This implies a certain discipline for you are expected to trust your guide and follow implicitly his advice and instruction. Yet the social urgencies and pressures are so great, personal desires and fears so powerful, that the simplicity of mind and will, essential in obedience, are not forthcoming. How to strike a balance between the need for a guru and the difficulty in obeying him implicitly? Maharaj, what is done under pressure of society and circumstances does not matter much for it is mostly mechanical, mere reacting to impacts. It is enough to watch oneself dispassionately to isolate oneself completely from what is going on. What has been done without minding blindly may add to one's karma destiny, otherwise it hardly matters. The Guru demands one thing only, clarity and intensity of purpose, a sense of responsibility for oneself. The very reality of the world must be questioned. Who is the Guru after all? He who knows the state in which there is neither the world nor the thought of it, he is the supreme teacher. To find him means to reach the state in which imagination is no longer taken for reality. Please understand that the Guru stands for reality, for truth, for what is. He is a realist in the highest sense of the term. He cannot and shall not come to terms with the mind and its delusions. He comes to take you to the real, don't expect him to do anything else. The guru you have in mind, one who gives you information and instructions, is not the real guru. The real guru is he who knows the real, beyond the glamour of appearances. To him your questions about obedience and discipline do not make sense, for in his eyes the person you take yourself to be does not exist, your questions are about a non-existing person. What exists for you does not exist for him. What you take for granted he denies absolutely. He wants you to see yourself as he sees you. Then you will not need a cure to obey and follow, for you will obey and follow your own reality, realize that whatever you think yourself to be is just a stream of events, that while all happens, comes and goes, you alone are the changeless among the changeful, 
the self-evident among the inferred. Separate the observed from the observer and abandon false identifications. Question. In order to find the reality, one should discard all that stands in the way. On the other hand, the need to survive within a given society compels one to do and endure many things. Does one need to abandon one's profession and one's social standing in order to find reality? Maharaj, do your work. When you have a moment free, look within. What is important is not to miss the opportunity when it presents itself. If you are earnest, you will use your leisure fully. That is enough. Question, in my search for the essential and discarding the unessential, is there any scope for creative living? For instance, I love painting. Will it help me if I give my leisure hours to painting? Maharaj, whatever you may have to do, watch your mind. Also, you must have moments of complete inner peace and quiet when your mind is absolutely still. If you miss it, you miss the entire thing. If you do not, the silence of the mind will dissolve and absorb all else. Your difficulty lies in your wanting reality and being afraid of it at the same time. You are afraid of it because you do not know it. The familiar things are known, you feel secure with them. The unknown is uncertain and therefore dangerous. But to know reality is to be in harmony with it. And in harmony there is no place for fear. An infant knows its body, but not the body-based distinctions. It is just conscious and happy. After all, that was the purpose for which it was born. The pleasure to be is the simplest form of self-love, which later grows into love of the self. Be like an infant with nothing standing between the body and the self. The constant noise of the psychic life is absent. In deep silence the self contemplates the body. It is like the white paper on which nothing is written yet. Be like that infant instead of trying to be this or that, be happy to be. You will be a fully awakened witness of the field of consciousness. But there should be no feelings and ideas to stand between you and the field. Question, to be content with mere being seems to be a most selfish way of passing time. Maharaj, a most worthy way of being selfish. By all means be selfish by foregoing everything but the self. When you love the self and nothing else, you go beyond the selfish and the unselfish. All distinctions lose their meaning. Love of one and love of all merge together in love, pure and simple, addressed to none, denied to none. Stay in that love, go deeper and deeper into it, investigate yourself and love the investigation and you will solve not only your own problems but also the problems of humanity. You will know what to do. Do not ask superficial questions, apply yourself to fundamentals, to the very roots of your being. Question, is there a way for me to speed up my self-realization? Maharaj, of course there is. Question, who will do this speeding up? Will you do it for me? Maharaj, neither you will do it nor me. It will just happen. Question, my very coming here has proved it. Is this speeding up due to holy company? When I left last time I hoped to come back. And I did. Now I am desperate that so soon I have to leave for England. Maharaj, you are like a newly born child. It was there before but not conscious of its being. At its birth a world arose in it, and with it the consciousness of being. Now you have just to grow in consciousness, that is all. The child is the king of the world, when it grows up it takes charge of its kingdom. Imagine that in its infancy it fell seriously ill, and the physician cured it. Does it mean that the young king owes his kingdom to the physician? Only perhaps as one of the contributing factors. There were so many others, all contributed. But the main factor, the most crucial, was the fact of being born the son of a king. Similarly, the Kiru may help. But the main thing that helps is to have reality within. It will assert itself. Your coming here definitely helped you. It is not the only thing that is going to help you. The main thing is your own being. Your very earnestness testifies to it. Question, does my pursuing a vocation deny my earnestness? Maharaj, I told you already. As long as you allow yourself an abundance of moments of peace, 
you can safely practice your most honorable profession. These moments of inner quiet will burn out all obstacles without fail. Don't doubt its efficacy. Try it. Question, but I did try. Maharaj, never faithfully, never steadily. Otherwise you would not be asking such questions. You are asking because you are not sure of yourself. And you are not sure of yourself because you never paid attention to yourself, only to your experiences. Be interested in yourself beyond all experience, be with yourself, love yourself. The ultimate security is found only in self-knowledge. The main thing is earnestness. Be honest with yourself and nothing will betray you. Virtues and powers are mere tokens for children to play with. They are useful in the world but do not take you out of it. To go beyond you need alert immobility, quiet attention. Question. What then becomes of one's physical being? Meharaj, as long as you are healthy, you live on. Question. This life of inner immobility, will it not affect one's health? Meharaj, your body is food transformed. As your food grows and subtle, so will be your health. Question. And what happens to the sex instinct? How can it be controlled? Meharaj, sex is an acquired habit. Go beyond. As long as your focus is on the body, you will remain in the clutches of food and sex, fear and death. Find yourself and be free. Chapter 48 Awareness is Free Questioner, I have just arrived from Sri Raman Ashram. I have spent seven months there. Maharaj, what practice were you following at the ashram? Question, as far as I could, I concentrated on the who am I. Maharaj, which way were you doing it? Verbally? Question, in my free moments during the course of the day. Sometimes I was murmuring to myself, who am I? I am, but who am I? Or I did it mentally. Occasionally I would have some nice feeling, or get into moods of quiet happiness. On the whole I was trying to be quiet and receptive, rather than laboring for experiences. Maharaj, what were you actually experiencing when you were in the right mood? Question, a sense of inner stillness, peace and silence. Maharaj, did you notice yourself becoming unconscious? Question, yes, occasionally and for a very short time. Otherwise I was just quiet, inwardly and outwardly. Maharaj, what kind of quiet was it? Something akin to deep sleep, yet conscious all the same. A sort of wakeful sleep? Question, yes. Alertly asleep. Jagrat Sashapti. Maharaj, the main thing is to be free of negative emotions, desire, fear, etc. The six enemies of the mind. Once the mind is free of them, the rest will come easily. Just as cloth kept in soap water will become clean, so will the mind get purified in the stream of pure feeling. When you sit quiet and watch yourself, all kinds of things may come to the surface. Do nothing about them, don't react to them, as they have come so will they go by themselves. All that matters is mindfulness, total awareness of oneself or rather of one's mind. Question, by oneself do you mean the daily self? Maharaj, yes the person which alone is objectively observable. The observer is beyond observation. What is observable is not the real self. Question, I can always observe the observer in endless recession. Maharaj, you can observe the observation but not the observer. You know you are the ultimate observer by direct insight, not by a logical process based on observation. You are what you are but you know what you are not. The self is known as being, the not self is known as transient. But in reality all is in the mind. The observe, observation and observer are mental constructs. The self alone is. Question. Why does the mind create all these divisions? Maharaj. To divide and particularize is in the mind's very nature. There is no harm in dividing. But separation goes against fact. Things and people are different, but they are not separate. Nature is one, reality is one. There are opposites, but no opposition. Question, I find that by nature I am very active. 
Here, I am advised to avoid activity. The more I try to remain inactive, the greater the urge to do something. This makes me not only active outwardly, but also struggling inwardly to be what by nature I am not. Is there a remedy against longing for work? Maharaj, there is a difference between work and mere activity. All nature works. Work is nature, nature is work. On the other hand, activity is based on desire and fear, on longing to possess and enjoy, on fear of pain and annihilation. Work is by the whole for the whole, activity is by oneself for oneself. Question. Is there a remedy against activity? Maharaj, watch it and it shall cease. Use every opportunity to remind yourself that you are in bondage, that whatever happens to you is due to the fact of your bodily existence. Desire, fear, trouble, joy, they cannot appear unless you are there to appear to. Yet, whatever happens points to your existence as a perceiving center. Disregard the pointers and be aware of what they are pointing to. It is quite simple but it needs be done. What matters is the persistence with which you keep on returning to yourself. Question. I do get into peculiar states of deep absorption into myself, but unpredictably and momentarily. I do not feel myself to be in control of such states. Maharaj, the body is a material thing and needs time to change. The mind is but a set of mental habits, of ways of thinking and feeling, and to change they must be brought to the surface and examined. This also takes time. Just resolve and persevere, the rest will take care of itself. Question. I seem to have a clear idea of what needs be done, but I find myself getting tired and depressed and seeking human company and thus wasting time that should be given to solitude and meditation. Maharaj, do what you feel like doing. Don't bully yourself. Violence will make you hard and rigid. Do not fight with what you take to be obstacles on your way. Just be interested in them, watch them, observe, inquire. Let anything happen, good or bad. But don't let yourself be submerged by what happens. Question. What is the purpose in reminding oneself all the time that one is the watcher? Maharaj. The mind must learn that beyond the moving mind there is the background of awareness which does not change. The mind must come to know the true self and respect it and cease covering it up, like the moon which obscures the sun during solar eclipse. Just realize that nothing observable or experienceable is you or binds you. Take no notice of what is not yourself. Question. To do what you tell me I must be ceaselessly aware. Maharaj. To be aware is to be awake. Unaware means asleep. You're aware anyhow. You need not try to be. What you need is to be aware of being aware. Be aware deliberately and consciously, broaden and deepen the field of awareness. You are always conscious of the mind, but you are not aware of yourself as being conscious. Question, as I can make out, you give distinct meanings to the words mind consciousness and awareness. Maharaj, look at it this way. The mind produces thoughts ceaselessly, even when you do not look at them. When you know what is going on in your mind, you call it consciousness. This is your waking state. Your consciousness shifts from sensation to sensation, from perception to perception, from idea to idea, in endless succession. Then comes awareness, the direct insight into the whole of consciousness, the totality of the mind. The mind is like a river flowing ceaselessly in the bed of the body. You identify yourself for a moment with some particular ripple and call it, my thought. All you are conscious of is your mind. Awareness is the cognizance of consciousness as a whole. Question. Everybody is conscious but not everybody is aware. Maharaj, don't say, everybody is conscious. Say, there is consciousness in which everything appears and disappears. Our minds are just waves on the ocean of consciousness. As waves they come and go. As ocean they are infinite and eternal. Know yourself as the ocean of being, the womb of all existence. These are all metaphors, of course. The reality is beyond description. You can know it only by being it. Question. Is the search for it worth the trouble? 
Maharaj, without it all is trouble. If you want to live sanely, creatively and happily and have infinite riches to share, search for what you are. While the mind is centered in the body and consciousness is centered in the mind, awareness is free. Body has its urges and mind its pains and pleasures. Awareness is unattached and unshaken. It is lucid, silent, peaceful, alert and unafraid without desire and fear. Meditate on it as your true being and try to be it in your daily life, and you shall realize it in its fullness. Mind is interested in what happens, while awareness is interested in the mind itself. The child is after the toy, but the mother watches the child, not the toy. By looking tirelessly, I became quite empty and with that emptiness all came back to me except the mind. I find I have lost mind irretrievably. Question, as you talk to us just now, are you unconscious? Maharaj, I am neither conscious nor unconscious, I am beyond the mind and its various states and conditions. Distinctions are created by the mind and apply to the mind only. I am pure consciousness itself, unbroken awareness of all that is. I am in a more real state than yours. I am undistracted by the distinctions and separations which constitute a person. As long as the body lasts, it has its needs like any other, but my mental process has come to an end. Question, you behave like a person who thinks. Maharaj, why not? But my thinking, like my digestion, is unconscious and purposeful. Question, if your thinking is unconscious, how do you know that it is right? Maharaj, there is no desire nor fear to thwart it. What can make it wrong? Once I know myself and what I stand for, I do not need to check on myself all the time. When you know that your watch shows correct time, you do not hesitate each time you consult it. Question, at this very moment who talks if not the mind? Maharaj, that which hears the question answers it. Question, but who is it? Maharaj, not who but what? I'm not a person in your sense of the word, though I may appear a person to you. I am that infinite ocean of consciousness in which all happens. I am also beyond all existence and cognition, pure bliss of being. There is nothing I feel separate from, hence I am all. No thing is me, so I am nothing. The same power that makes the fire burn and the water flow, the seeds sprout and the trees grow, makes me answer your questions. There is nothing personal about me, though the language and the style may appear personal. A person is a set pattern of desires and thoughts and resulting actions. There is no such pattern in my case. There is nothing I desire or fear. How can there be a pattern? Question, surely you will die. Maharaj, life will escape, the body will die, but it will not affect me in the least. Beyond space and time I am uncaused, uncausing, yet the very matrix of existence. Question, may I be permitted to ask how did you arrive at your present condition? Maharaj, my teacher told me to hold on to the sense I am tenaciously and not to swerve from it even for a moment. I did my best to follow his advice and in a comparatively short time I realized within myself the truth of his teaching. All I did was to remember his teaching, his face, his words constantly. This brought an end to the mind. In the stillness of the mind, I saw myself as I am unbound. Question, was your realization sudden or gradual? Maharaj, neither. One is what one is timelessly. It is the mind that realizes as and when it get cleared of desires and fears. Question. Even the desire for realization. Maharaj. The desire to put an end to all desires is a most peculiar desire just like the fear of being afraid is a most peculiar fear. One stops you from grabbing and the other from running. You may use the same words, but the states are not the same. The man who seeks realization is not addicted to desires. He is a seeker who goes against desire, not with it. A general longing for liberation is only the beginning. To find the proper means and use them is the next step. The seeker has only one goal in view, to find his own true being. Of all desires it is the most ambitious, for nothing and nobody can satisfy it. 
the seeker and the sought are one and the search alone matters. Question. The search will come to an end. The seeker will remain. Meharaj. No, the seeker will dissolve. The search will remain. The search is the ultimate and timeless reality. Question. Search means lacking, wanting, incompleteness and imperfection. Maharaj. No, it means refusal and rejection of the incomplete and the imperfect. Search for reality is itself the movement of reality. In a way all search is for the real bliss or the bliss of the real. But here we mean by search the search for oneself as the root of being conscious, as the light beyond the mind. This search will never end, while the restless craving for all else must end, for real progress to take place. One has to understand that the search for reality or God or Guru and the search for the self are the same. When one is found, all are found. When I am and God is become in your mind indistinguishable, then something will happen, and you will know without a trace of doubt that God is because you are, you are because God is. The two are one. Question. Since all is preordained, is our self-realization also preordained? Or are we free there at least? Maharaj, destiny refers only to name and shape. Since you are neither body nor mind, destiny has no control over you. You are completely free. The cup is conditioned by its shape, material, use and so on. But the space within the cup is free. It happens to be in the cup only when viewed in connection with the cup. Otherwise it is just space. As long as there is a body, you appear to be embodied. Without the body you are not disembodied, you just are. Even destiny is but an idea. Words can be put together in so many ways. Statements can differ, but do they make any change in the actual? There are so many theories devised for explaining things, all are plausible, none is true. When you drive a car, you are subjected to the laws of mechanics and chemistry. Step out of the car and you are under the laws of physiology and biochemistry. Question. What is meditation and what are its uses? Meharaj, as long as you are a beginner certain formalized meditations or prayers may be good for you. But for a seeker for reality there is only one meditation, the rigorous refusal to harbor thoughts. To be free from thoughts is itself meditation. Question, how is it done? Maharaj, you begin by letting thoughts flow and watching them. The very observation slows down the mind till it stops altogether. Once the mind is quiet, keep it quiet. Don't get bored with peace, be in it, go deeper into it. Question. I heard of holding onto one thought in order to keep other thoughts away. But how to keep all thoughts away? The very idea is also a thought. Meharaj, experiment anew, don't go by past experience. Watch your thoughts and watch yourself watching the thoughts. The state of freedom from all thoughts will happen suddenly, and by the bliss of it you shall recognize it. Hit your question. Are you not at all concerned about the state of the world? Look at the horrors in East Pakistan, 1971, now Bangladesh. Do they not touch you at all? Maharaj, I am reading newspapers, I know what is going on. But my reaction is not like yours. You are looking for a cure, while I am concerned with prevention. As long as there are causes, there must also be results. As long as people are bent on dividing and separating, as long as they are selfish and aggressive, such things will happen. If you want peace and harmony in the world, you must have peace and harmony in your hearts and minds. Such change cannot be imposed, it must come from within. Those who abhor war must get war out of their system. Without peaceful people how can you have peace in the world? As long as people are as they are, the world must be as it is. I am doing my part in trying to help people to know themselves as the only cause of their own misery. In that sense I am a useful man. But what I am in myself, what is my normal state cannot be expressed in terms of social consciousness and usefulness. I may talk about it use metaphors or parables, but I am acutely aware that it is just not so. Not that it cannot be experienced. It is experiencing itself. 
but it cannot be described in the terms of a mind that must separate and oppose in order to know. The world is like a sheet of paper on which something is typed. The reading and the meaning will vary with the reader, but the paper is the common factor, always present, rarely perceived. When the ribbon is removed, typing leaves no trace on the paper. So is my mind, the impressions keep on coming, but no trace is left. Question, why do you sit here talking to people? What is your real motive? Maharaj, no motive. You say I must have a motive. I am not sitting here nor talking, no need to search for motives. Don't confuse me with the body. I have no work to do, no duties to perform. That part of me which you may call God will look after the world. This world of yours that so much needs looking after, lives and moves in your mind. Delve into it, you will find your answers there and there only. Where else do you expect them to come from? Outside your consciousness does anything exist? Question. It may exist without my ever knowing it. Maharaj, what kind of existence would it be? Can being be divorced from knowing? All being like all knowing relates to you. A thing is because you know it to be either in your experience or in your being. Your body and your mind exist as long as you believe so. Cease to think that they are yours and they will just dissolve. By all means let your body and mind function, but do not let them limit you. If you notice imperfections, just keep on noticing. Your very giving attention to them will set your heart and mind and body right. Question. Can I cure myself of a serious illness by merely taking cognizance of it? Maharaj, take cognizance of the whole of it, not only of the outer symptoms. All illness begins in the mind. Take care of the mind first by tracing and eliminating all wrong ideas and emotions. Then live and work disregarding illness and think no more of it. With the removal of causes the effect is bound to depart. Man becomes what he believes himself to be. Abandon all ideas about yourself and you will find yourself to be the pure witness, beyond all that can happen to the body or the mind. Question. If I become anything I think myself to be and I start thinking that I am the supreme reality, will not my supreme reality remain a mere idea? Maharaj, first reach that state and then ask the question. Chapter 49. Mind Causes Insecurity Questioner, people come to you for advice. How do you know what to answer? Meharaj, as I hear the question so do I hear the answer. Question, and how do you know that your answer is right? Meharaj, once I know the true source of the answers I need not doubt them. From a pure source only pure water will flow. I am not concerned with people's desires and fears. I am in tune with facts not with opinions. Man takes his name and shape to be himself while I take nothing to be myself. Were I to think myself to be a body known by its name, I would not have been able to answer your questions. Were I to take you to be a mere body, there would be no benefit to you from my answers. No true teacher indulges in opinions. He sees things as they are and shows them as they are. If you take people to be what they think themselves to be, you will only hurt them as they hurt themselves so grievously all the time. But if you see them as they are in reality, it will do them enormous good. If they ask you what to do, what practices to adopt, which way of life to follow, answer, do nothing, just be. In being all happens naturally. Question. It seems to me that in your talks you use the words naturally and accidentally indiscriminately. I feel there is a deep difference in the meaning of the two words. The natural is orderly, subject to law. One can trust nature. The accidental is chaotic, unexpected, unpredictable. One could plead that everything is natural, subject to nature's laws. To maintain that everything is accidental, without any cause, is surely an exaggeration. Maharaj, would you like it better if I use the word spontaneous instead of accidental? Question. You may use the word spontaneous or natural as opposed to accidental. In the accidental there is the element of disorder of chaos. An accident is always a breach of rules, an exception, a surprise. 
Maharaj, is not life itself a stream of surprises? Question. There is harmony in nature. The accidental is a disturbance. Maharaj, you speak as a person limited in time and space, reduced to the contents of a body and a mind. What you like, you call natural, and what you dislike, you call accidental. Question. I like the natural, and the law abiding, the expected, and I fear the law breaking, the disorderly, the unexpected, the meaningless. The accidental is always monstrous. There may be so called lucky accidents, but they only prove the rule that in an accident prone universe life would be impossible. Maharaj, I feel there is a misunderstanding. By accidental, I mean something to which no known law applies. When I say everything is accidental, uncaused, I only mean that the causes and the laws according to which they operate are beyond our knowing or even imagining. If you call what you take to be orderly, harmonious, predictable, to be natural, then what obeys higher laws and is moved by higher powers may be called spontaneous. Thus we shall have two natural orders, the personal and predictable and the impersonal or superpersonal and unpredictable. Call it lower nature and higher nature and drop the word accidental. As you grow in knowledge and insight, the borderline between lower and higher nature keeps on receding, but the two remain until they are seen as one. For in fact, everything is most wonderfully inexplicable. Question, science explains a lot. Maharaj, science deals with names and shapes, quantities and qualities, patterns and laws. It is all right in its own place. But life is to be lived, there is no time for analysis. The response must be instantaneous, hence the importance of the spontaneous, the timeless. It is in the unknown that we live in mauve, the known is the past. Question, I can take my stand on what I feel I am. I am an individual, a person among persons. Some people are integrated and harmonized and some are not. Some live effortlessly, respond spontaneously to every situation correctly, doing full justice to the need of the moment, while others fumble air and generally make a nuisance of themselves. The harmonized people may be called natural, ruled by law, while the disintegrated are chaotic and subject to accidents. Maharaj, the very idea of chaos presupposes the sense of the orderly, the organic, the interrelated. Chaos and cosmos, are they not two aspects of the same state? Question, but you seem to say that all is chaos, accidental, unpredictable. Maharaj, yes in the sense that not all the laws of being are known and not all events are predictable. The more you are able to understand, the more the universe becomes satisfactory, emotionally and mentally. Reality is good and beautiful, we create the chaos. Question. If you mean to say that it is the free will of man that causes accidents, I would agree. But we have not yet discussed free will. Maharaj, your order is what gives you pleasure and disorder is what gives you pain. Question, you may put it that way, but do not tell me that the two are one. Talk to me in my own language, the language of an individual in search of happiness. I do not want to be misled by non-dualistic talks. Maharaj, what makes you believe that you are a separate individual? Question, I behave as an individual. I function on my own. I consider myself primarily, and others only in relation to myself. In short, I am busy with myself. Maharaj, well, go on being busy with yourself. On what business have you come here? Question, on my old business of making myself safe and happy. I confess I have not been too successful. I am neither safe nor happy. Therefore, you find me here. This place is new to me, but my reason for coming here is old. The search for safe happiness, happy safety. So far I did not find it. Can you help me? Maharaj, what was never lost can never be found. Your very search for safety and joy keeps you away from them. Stop searching, cease losing. The disease is simple and the remedy equally simple. It is your mind only that makes you insecure and unhappy. Anticipation makes you insecure, memory unhappy. 
Stop misusing your mind and all will be well with you. You need not set it right, it will set itself right, as soon as you give up all concern with the past and the future and live entirely in the now. Question, but the now has no dimension. I shall become a nobody, a nothing. Meharaj, exactly. As nothing and nobody you are safe and happy. You can have the experience for the asking. Just try. But let us go back to what is accidental and what is spontaneous or natural. You said nature is orderly while accident is a sign of chaos. I deny the difference and said that we call an event accidental when its causes are untraceable. There is no place for chaos in nature. Only in the mind of man there is chaos. The mind does not grasp the whole, its focus is very narrow. It sees fragments only and fails to perceive the picture. Just as a man who hears sounds, but does not understand the language, may accuse the speaker of meaningless jabbering and be altogether wrong. What to one is a chaotic stream of sounds is a beautiful poem to another. King Nanaka once dreamt that he was a beggar. On waking up he asked his guru Vasishta, Am I a king dreaming of being a beggar, or a beggar dreaming of being a king? The guru answered, You are neither, you are both. You are, and yet you are not what you think yourself to be. You are because you behave accordingly, you are not because it does not last. Can you be a king or a beggar forever? All must change. You are what does not change. What are you? Janaka said, Yes, I am neither king nor beggar, I am the dispassionate witness. The guru said, This is your last illusion that you are a jani, that you are different from and superior to the common man. Again you identify yourself with your mind, in this case a well-behaved, and in every way an exemplary mind. As long as you see the least difference, you are a stranger to reality. You are on the level of the mind. When the I am myself goes, the I am all comes. When the I am all goes, I am comes. When even I am goes, reality alone is and in it every I am is preserved and glorified. Diversity without separateness is the ultimate that the mind can touch. Beyond that all activity ceases, because in it all goals are reached and all purposes fulfilled. Question, once the supreme state is reached, can it be shared with others? Maharaj, the supreme state is universal here and now, everybody already shares in it. It is the state of being, knowing and liking. Who does not like to be or does not know his own existence? But we take no advantage of this joy of being conscious, we do not go into it and purify it of all that is foreign to it. This work of mental self-purification, the cleansing of the psyche is essential. Just as a speck in the eye by causing inflammation may wipe out the world, so the mistaken idea, I am the body-mind causes the self-concern which obscures the universe. It is useless to fight the sense of being a limited and separate person unless the roots of it are laid bare. Selfishness is rooted in the mistaken ideas of oneself. Clarification of the mind is yoga. Chapter 50 Self-Awareness is the witness. Questioner, you told me that I can be considered under three aspects, the personal viacti, the superpersonal viacta, and the impersonal aviacta. The aviacta is the universal and real pure I. The viacta is its reflection in consciousness as I am. The viacti is the totality of physical and vital processes. Within the narrow confines of the present moment, the superpersonal is aware of the person, both in space and time. Not only one person, but the long series of persons strung together on the thread of karma. It is essentially the witness as well as the residue of the accumulated experiences, the seat of memory, the connecting link Sutratma. It is man's character which life builds and shapes from birth to birth. The universal is beyond all name and shape, beyond consciousness and character, pure unself-conscious being. Did I put down your views rightly? Meharaj, on the level of the mind, yes. Beyond the mental level not a word applies. Question. 
I can understand that the person is a mental construct, a collective noun for a set of memories and habits. But he to whom the person happens, the witnessing center, is it mental too? Maharaj, the personal needs a base, a body to identify oneself with, just as a color needs a surface to appear on. The seeing of the color is independent of the color, it is the same whatever the color. One needs an eye to see a color. The colors are many, the eye is single. The personal is like the light in the color and also in the eye, yet simple, single, indivisible and unperceivable, except in its manifestations. Not unknowable, but unperceivable, unobjectival, inseparable. Neither material nor mental, neither objective nor subjective, it is the root of matter and the source of consciousness. Beyond mere living and dying, it is the all-inclusive, all-exclusive life in which birth is death and death is birth. Question. The absolute or life you talk about, is it real or a mere theory to cover up our ignorance? Meharaj, both. To the mind a theory, in itself a reality. It is reality in its spontaneous and total rejection of the false. Just as light destroys darkness by its very presence, so does the absolute destroy imagination. To see that all knowledge is a form of ignorance is itself a movement of reality. The witness is not a person. The person comes into being when there is a basis for it, an organism, a body. In it the absolute is reflected as awareness. Pure awareness becomes self-awareness. When there is a self, self-awareness is the witness. When there is no self to witness, there is no witnessing either. It is all very simple. It is the presence of the person that complicates. See that there is no such thing as a permanently separate person and all becomes clear. Awareness, mind, matter, they are one reality in its two aspects as immovable and movable and the three attributes of inertia, energy and harmony. Question, what comes first, consciousness or awareness? Maharaj, awareness becomes consciousness when it has an object. The object changes all the time. In consciousness there is movement, awareness by itself is motionless and timeless, here and now. Question, there is suffering and bloodshed in East Pakistan at the present moment. How do you look at it? How does it appear to you? How do you react to it? Maharaj, in pure consciousness nothing ever happens. Question. Please come down from these metaphysical heights. Of what use is it to a suffering man to be told that nobody is aware of his suffering but himself? To relegate everything to illusion is insult added to injury. The Bengali of East Pakistan is a fact and his suffering is a fact. Please do not analyze them out of existence. You're reading newspapers, you hear people talking about it. You cannot plead ignorance. Now what is your attitude to what is happening? Maharaj, no attitude. Nothing is happening. Question, any day there may be a riot right in front of you, perhaps people killing each other. Surely you cannot say, nothing is happening and remain aloof. Maharaj, I never talked of remaining aloof. You could as well see me jumping into the fray to save somebody and getting killed. Yet to me nothing happened. Imagine a big building collapsing. Some rooms are in ruins, some are intact. But can you speak of the space as ruined or intact? It is only the structure that suffered and the people who happened to live in it. Nothing happened to space itself. Similarly, nothing happens to life when forms break down and names are wiped out. The goldsmith melts down old ornaments to make new. Sometimes a good piece goes with the bad. He takes it in his stride, for he knows that no gold is lost. Question, it is not death that I rebel against. It is the manner of dying. Meharaj, death is natural, the manner of dying is man-made. Separateness causes fear and aggression, which again cause violence. Do away with man-made separations, and all this horror of people killing each other will surely end. But in reality there is no killing and no dying. The real does not die, the unreal never lived. Set your mind right and all will be right. 
When you know that the world is one, that humanity is one, you will act accordingly. But first of all, you must attend to the way you feel, think, and live. Unless there is order in yourself, there can be no order in the world. In reality, nothing happens. Onto the screen of the mind, destiny forever projects its pictures, memories of former projections, and thus illusion constantly renews itself. The pictures come and go, light intercepted by ignorance. See the light and disregard the picture. Question: What a callous way of looking at things! People are killing and getting killed, and here you talk of pictures. Maharaj, by all means, go and get killed yourself if that is what you think you should do, or even go and kill if you take it to be your duty. But that is not the way to end the evil. Evil is the stench of a mind that is diseased. Heal your mind, and it will cease to project distorted, ugly pictures. Question: What you say, I understand, but emotionally, I cannot accept it. This merely idealistic view of life repels me deeply. I just cannot think myself to be permanently in a state of dream, Maharaj. How can anybody be permanently in a state caused by an impermanent body? The misunderstanding is based on your idea that you are the body. Examine the idea, see its inherent contradictions, realize that your present existence is like a shower of sparks, each spark lasting a second, and the shower itself, a minute or two. Surely, a thing of which the beginning is the end. Can have no middle. Respect your terms. Reality cannot be momentary. It is timeless, but timelessness is not duration. Question: I admit that the world in which I live is not the real world, but there is a real world of which I see a distorted picture. The distortion may be due to some blemish in my body or mind, but when you say there is no real world, only a dream world in my mind, I just cannot take it. I wish I could believe that all horrors of existence are due to my having a body. Suicide would be the way out, Maharaj. As long as you pay attention to ideas, your own or of others, you will be in trouble. But if you disregard all teachings, all books, anything out into words, and dive deeply within yourself and find yourself, this alone will solve all your problems and leave you in full mastery of every situation. Because you will not be dominated by your ideas about the situation. Take an example: you are in the company of an attractive woman. You get ideas about her, and this creates a sexual situation. A problem is created, and you start looking for books on continence or enjoyment. Were you a baby, both of you could be naked and together without any problem arising. Just stop thinking you are the bodies, and the problems of love and sex will lose their meaning. With all sense of limitation gone, fear, pain, and the search for pleasure all cease. Only awareness remains. Chapter Fifty One: Be indifferent to pain and pleasure. Questioner: I am a Frenchman by birth and domicile, and since about ten years I have been practicing yoga. Maharaj, after ten years of work, are you anywhere nearer your goal? Question: A little nearer, maybe. It is hard work, you know. Maharaj, the self is near, and the way to it is easy. All you need doing is doing nothing. Question: Yet I found my sadhana very difficult. Maharaj, your sadhana is to be. The doing happens. Just be watchful. Where is the difficulty in remembering that you are? You are all the time. Question: The sense of being is there all the time, no doubt. But the field of attention is often overrun by all sorts of mental events, emotions, images, ideas. Your sense of being is usually crowded out. Maharaj, what is your procedure for clearing the mind of the unnecessary? What are your means, your tools for the purification of the mind? Question: Basically, man is afraid. He is afraid of himself most. I feel I am like a man who is carrying a bomb that is going to explode. He cannot defuse it. He cannot throw it away. He is terribly frightened and is searching frantically for a solution which he cannot find. To me, liberation is getting rid of this bomb. I do not know much about the bomb. I only know that it comes from early childhood. I feel like the frightened child protesting passionately against not being loved. 
The child is craving for love and because he does not get it, he is afraid and angry. Sometimes I feel like killing somebody or myself. This desire is so strong that I am constantly afraid. And I do not know how to get free from fear. You see there is a difference between a Hindu mind and a European mind. The Hindu mind is comparatively simple. The European is a much more complex being. The Hindu is basically sadhic. He does not understand the European's restlessness, hid tireless pursuit of what he thinks needs be done, his greater general knowledge. Maharaj, his reasoning capacity is so great that he will reason himself out of all reason. His self-assertiveness is due to his reliance on logic. Question, but thinking reasoning is the mind's normal state. The mind just cannot stop working. Maharaj, it may be the habitual state but it need not be the normal state. A normal state cannot be painful while a habit often leads to chronic pain. Question, if it is not the natural or normal state of mind then how to stop it? There must be a way to quiet in the mind. How often I tell myself, enough please stop enough of this endless chatter of sentences repeated round and round. But my mind would not stop. I feel that one can stop it for a while, but not for long. Even the so-called spiritual people use tricks to keep their mind quiet. They repeat formulas, they sing, pray, breathe forcibly or gently, shake, rotate, concentrate, meditate, chase trances, cultivate virtues, working all the time in order to cease working, cease chasing, cease moving. Were it not so tragic it would be ridiculous. Maharaj, the mind exists in two states, as water and as honey. The water vibrates at the least disturbance while the honey, however disturbed, returns quickly to immobility. Question, by its very nature the mind is restless. It can perhaps be made quiet, but it is not quiet by itself. Maharaj, you may have a chronic fever and shiver all the time. It is desires and fears that make the mind restless. Free from all negative emotions it is quiet. Question. You cannot protect the child from negative emotions. As soon as it is born it learns pain and fear. Hunger is a cruel master and teaches dependence and hate. The child loves the mother because she feeds it and hates her because she is late with food. Our unconscious mind is full of conflicts which overflow into the conscious. We live on a volcano. We are always in danger. I agree that the company of people whose mind is peaceful has a very soothing effect, but as soon as I am away from them, the old trouble starts. This is why I come periodically to India to seek the company of my guru. Maharaj, you think you are coming and going passing through various states and moods. I see things as they are momentary events, presenting themselves to me in rapid succession, deriving their being from me, yet definitely neither me nor mine. Among phenomena I am not one, nor subject to any. I am independent so simply and totally that your mind accustomed to opposition and denial cannot grasp it. I mean literally what I say. I do not need oppose or deny because it is clear to me that I cannot be the opposite or denial of anything. I am just beyond in a different dimension altogether. Do not look for me in identification with or opposition to something. I am where desire and fear are not. Now what is your experience? Do you also feel that you stand totally aloof from all transient things? Question. Yes I do occasionally. But at once a sense of danger sets in I feel isolated outside all relationship with others. You see here lies the difference in our mentalities. With the Hindu the emotion follows the thought. Give a Hindu an idea and his emotions are roused. With a Westerner it is the opposite. Give him an emotion and he will produce an idea. Your ideas are very attractive intellectually, but emotionally I do not respond. Maharaj set your intellect aside. Don't use it in these matters. Question. Of what use is an advice which I cannot carry out? These are all ideas and you want me to respond feelingly to ideas, for without feelings there can be no action. Maharaj, why do you talk of action? 
Are you acting ever? Some unknown power acts and you imagine that you are acting. You are merely watching what happens without being able to influence it in any way. Question. Why is there such a tremendous resistance in me against accepting that I just can do nothing? Maharaj, but what can you do? You are like a patient under anus, thetics on whom a surgeon performs an operation. When you wake up you find the operation over. Can you say you have done something? Question, but it is me who has chosen to submit to an operation. Maharaj, certainly not. It is your illness on one side and the pressure of your physician and family on the other that have made you decide. You have no choice, only the illusion of it. Question, yet I feel I am not as helpless as you make me appear. I feel I can do everything I can think of, only I do not know how. It is not the power I lack, but the knowledge. Meharaj, not knowing the means is admittedly as bad as not having the power. But let us drop the subject for the moment. After all, it is not important why we feel helpless, as long as we see clearly that for the time being we are helpless. I am now seventy-four years old, and yet I feel that I am an infant. I feel clearly that in spite of all the changes I am a child. My guru told me, that child, which is you even now, is your real self Swarupa. Go back to that state of pure being, where the I am is still in its purity before it got contaminated with this I am or that I am. Your burden is of false self-identifications, abandon them all. My guru told me trust me. I tell you, you are divine. Take it as the absolute truth. Your joy is divine, your suffering is divine too. All comes from God. Remember it always. You are God, your will alone is done. I did believe him and soon realized how wonderfully true and accurate were his words. I did not condition my mind by thinking, I am God, I am wonderful, I am beyond. I simply followed his instruction which was to focus the mind on pure being I am and stay in it. I used to sit for hours together, with nothing but the I am in my mind and soon peace and joy and a deep all-embracing love became my normal state. And it all disappeared myself, my guru, the life I lived, the world around me. Only peace remained in unfathomable silence. Question, it all looks very simple and easy, but it is just not so. Sometimes the wonderful state of joyful peace dawns on me and I look and wonder. How easily it comes and how intimate it seems, how totally my own. Where was the need to strive so hard for a state so near at hand? This time, surely it has come to stay. Yet how soon it all dissolves and leaves me wondering, was it a taste of reality or another aberration? If it was reality, why did it go? Maybe some unique experience is needed to fix me for good in the new state and until the crucial experience comes, this game of hide and seek must continue. Maharaj, your expectation of something unique and dramatic of some wonderful explosion is merely hindering and delaying your self-realization. You are not to expect an explosion, for the explosion has already happened at the moment when you were born when you realized yourself as being knowing feeling. There is only one mistake you are making, you take the inner for the outer and the outer for the inner. What is in you, you take to be outside you and what is outside, you take to be in you. The mind and feelings are external, but you take them to be intimate. You believe the world to be objective while it is entirely a projection of your psyche. That is the basic confusion and no new explosion will set it right. You have to think yourself out of it. There is no other way. Question, how am I to think myself out when my thoughts come and go as they like? Their endless chatter distracts and exhausts me. Maharaj, watch your thoughts as you watch the street traffic. People come and go, you register without response. It may not be easy in the beginning, but with some practice you will find that your mind can function on many levels at the same time and you can be aware of them all. It is only when you have a vested interest in any particular level that your attention gets caught in it and you black out on other levels. Even then the work on the blacked out levels goes on, outside the field of consciousness. Do not struggle with your memories and thoughts. 
try only to include in your field of attention the other more important questions, like who am I? How did I happen to be born? Whence this universe around me? What is real and what is momentary? No memory will persist if you lose interest in it. It is the emotional link that perpetuates the bondage. You are always seeking pleasure, avoiding pain, always after happiness and peace. Don't you see that it is your very search for happiness that makes you feel miserable? Try the other way. Indifferent to pain and pleasure, neither asking nor refusing, give all your attention to the level on which I am is timelessly present. Soon you will realize that peace and happiness are in your very nature and it is only seeking them through some particular channels that disturbs. Avoid the disturbance, that is all. To seek there is no need, you would not seek what you already have. You yourself are God, the supreme reality. To begin with, trust me, trust the teacher. It enables you to make the first step, and then your trust is justified by your own experience. In every walk of life initial trust is essential, without it little can be done. Every undertaking is an act of faith. Even your daily bread you eat on trust. By remembering what I told you you will achieve everything. I am telling you again, you are the all-pervading, all-transcending reality. Behave accordingly, think, feel and act in harmony with the whole and the actual experience of what I say will dawn upon you in no time. No effort is needed. Have faith and act on it. Please see that I want nothing from you. It is in your own interest that I speak because above all you love yourself, you want yourself secure and happy. Don't be ashamed of it, don't deny it. It is natural and good to love oneself. Only you should know what exactly do you love. It is not the body that you love, it is life perceiving, feeling, thinking, doing, loving, striving, creating. It is that life you love, which is you, which is Al, realize it in its totality, beyond all divisions and limitations, and all your desires will merge in it, for the greater contains the smaller. Therefore find yourself, for in finding that you find all. Everybody is glad to be, but few know the fullness of it. You come to know by dwelling in your mind on I am, I know, I love, with the will of reaching the deepest meaning of these words. Question. Can I think I am God? Maharaj, don't identify yourself with an idea. If you mean by God the unknown, then you merely say, I do not know what I am. If you know God as you know yourself, you need not say it. Best is the simple feeling I am. Dwell on it patiently. Here patience is wisdom. Don't think of failure. There can be no failure in this undertaking. Question, my thoughts will not let me. Maharaj, pay no attention. Don't fight them. Just do nothing about them. Let them be whatever they are. Your very fighting them gives them life. Just disregard. Look through. Remember to remember. Whatever happens, happens because I am. All reminds you that you are. Take full advantage of the fact that to experience you must be. You need not stop thinking. Just cease being interested. It is disinterestedness that liberates. Don't hold on, that is all. The world is made of rings. The hooks are all yours. Make straight your hooks and nothing can hold you. Give up your addictions. There is nothing else to give up. Stop your routine of acquisitiveness, your habit of looking for results, and the freedom of the universe is yours. Be effortless. Question, life is effort. There are so many things to do. Maharaj, what needs doing, do it. Don't resist. Your balance must be dynamic based on doing just the right thing from moment to moment. Don't be a child unwilling to grow up. Stereotype gestures and postures will not help you. Rely entirely on your clarity of thought, purity of motive and integrity of action. You cannot possibly go wrong. Go beyond and leave all behind. Question, but can anything be left for good? Maharaj, you want something like a round-the-clock ecstasy. Ecstasies come and go, necessarily, for the human brain cannot stand the tension for a long time. 
A prolonged ecstasy will burn out your brain unless it is extremely pure and subtle. In nature nothing is at standstill. Everything pulsates, appears and disappears. Heart, breath, digestion, sleep and waking, birth and death, everything comes and goes in waves. Rhythm, periodicity, harmonious alternation of extremes is the rule. No use rebelling against the very pattern of life. If you seek the immutable, go beyond experience. When I say, remember I am all the time I mean, come back to it repeatedly. No particular thought can be mind's natural state, only silence. Not the idea of silence, but silence itself. When the mind is in its natural state, it reverts to silence spontaneously after every experience or rather, every experience happens against the background of silence. Now what you have learnt here becomes the seed. You may forget it apparently, but it will live and in due season sprout and grow and bring forth flowers and fruits. All will happen by itself. You need not do anything, only don't prevent it. Chapter 52 Being happy, making happy is the rhythm of life. Questioner I came from Europe a few months ago on one of my periodical visits to my guru near Calcutta. Now I am on my way back home. I was invited by a friend to meet you and I am glad I came. Maharaj, what did you learn from your guru and what practice did you follow? Question, he is a venerable old man of about 80. Philosophically he is a Vedantine and the practice he teaches has much to do with rousing the unconscious energies of the mind and bringing the hidden obstacles and blockages into the conscious. My personal sadhana was related to my peculiar problem of early infancy and childhood. My mother could not give me the feeling of being secure and loved, so important to the child's normal development. She was a woman not fit to be a mother, ridden with anxieties and neuroses, unsure of herself. She felt me to be a responsibility and a burden beyond her capacity to bear. She never wanted me to be born. She did not want me to grow and to develop. She wanted me back in her womb, unborn, non-existent. Any movement of life in me she resisted. Any attempt to go beyond the narrow circle of her habitual existence she fought fiercely. As a child I was both sensitive and affectionate. I craved for love above everything else and love, the simple, instinctive love of a mother for her child was denied me. The child's search for its mother became the leading motive of my life and I never grew out of it. A happy child, a happy child had became an obsession with me. Pregnancy, birth, infancy interested me passionately. I became an obstetrician of some renown and contributed to the development of the method of painless childbirth. A happy child of a happy mother, that was my ideal all my life. But my mother was always there unhappy herself unwilling and incapable to see me happy. It manifested itself in strange ways. Whenever I was unwell she felt better, when I was in good shape she was down again cursing herself and me too. As if she never forgave me my crime of having been born, she made me feel guilty of being alive. You live because you hate me. If you love me die was her constant though silent message and so I spent my life being offered death instead of love. Imprisoned as I was in my mother, the perennial infant, I could not develop a meaningful relation with a woman. The image of the mother would stand between, unforgiving, unforgiven. I sought solace in my work and found much, but I could not move from the pit of infancy. Finally I turned to spiritual search and I am on this line steadily for many years. But in a way it is the same old search for mother's love, call it God or Atma or Supreme Reality. Basically I want to love and be loved. Unfortunately the so-called religious people are against life and all for the mind. When faced with life's needs and urges, they begin by classifying, abstracting and conceptualizing and then make the classification more important than life itself. They ask to concentrate on and impersonate a concept. Instead of the spontaneous integration through love they recommend a deliberate and laborious concentration on a formula. 
Whether it is God or Atma, the me or the other, it comes to the same. Something to think about, not somebody to love. It is not theories and systems that I need. There are many equally attractive or plausible. I need a stirring of the heart, a renewal of life, and not a new way of thinking. There are no new ways of thinking, but feelings can be ever fresh. When I love somebody, I meditate on him spontaneously and powerfully with warmth and vigor which my mind cannot command. Words are good for shaping feelings. Words without feeling are like clothes with no body inside, cold and limp. This mother of mine, she dreamed me of all feelings my sources have run dry. Can I find here the richness and abundance of emotions which I needed in such ample measure as a child? Maharaj, where is your childhood now? And what is your future? Question, I was born, I have grown, I shall die. Maharaj, you mean your body, of course. And your mind. I am not talking of your physiology and psychology. They are a part of nature and are governed by nature's laws. I am talking of your search for love. Had it a beginning? Will it have an end? Question. I really cannot say. It is there from the earliest to the last moment of my life. This yearning for love, how constant and how hopeless. Meharaj, in your search for love, what exactly are you searching for? Question, simply this, to love and to be loved. Meharaj, you mean a woman? Question, not necessarily. A friend, a teacher, a guy, as long as the feeling is bright and clear. Of course a woman is the usual answer. But it need not be the only one. Maharaj, of the two what would you prefer to love or to be loved? Question, I would rather have both. But I can see that to love is greater, nobler, deeper. To be loved is sweet, but it does not make one grow. Maharaj, can you love on your own or must you be made to love? Question, one must meet somebody lovable, of course. My mother was not only not loving, she was also not lovable. Maharaj, what makes a person lovable? Is it not the being loved? First you love and then you look for reasons. Question, it can be the other way round. You love what makes you happy. Maharaj, but what makes you happy? Question, there is no rule about it. The entire subject is highly individual and unpredictable. Maharaj, right. Whichever way you put it, unless you love there is no happiness. But does love make you always happy? Is not the association of love with happiness a rather early, infantile stage? When the beloved suffers, don't you suffer too? And do you cease to love because you suffer? Must love and happiness come and go together? Is love merely the expectation of pleasure? Question. Of course not. There can be much suffering in love. Maharaj, then what is love? Is it not a state of being rather than a state of mind? Must you know that you love in order to love? Did you not love your mother unknowingly? Your craving for her love, for an opportunity to love her, is it not the movement of love? Is not love as much a part of you as consciousness of being? You sought the love of your mother because you loved her. Question, but she would not let me. Meharaj, she could not stop you. Question, then, why was I unhappy all my life? Meharaj, because you did not go down to the very roots of your being. It is your complete ignorance of yourself that covered up your love and happiness and made you seek for what you had never lost. Love is will, the will to share your happiness with all. Being happy, making happy, this is the rhythm of love. Chapter 53. Desires Fulfill, Breed More Desires Questioner, I must confess I came today in a rebellious mood. I got a raw deal at the airline's office. When faced with such situations everything seems doubtful, everything seems useless. Meharaj, this is a very useful mood. Doubting all, refusing all, unwilling to learn through another. It is the fruit of your long sadhana. After all, one does not study forever. Question, enough of it. It took me nowhere. Meharaj, don't say nowhere. It took you where you are now. 
question, it is again the child and its tantrums. I have not moved an inch from where I was. Maharaj, you began as a child and you will end as a child. Whatever you have acquired in the meantime, you must lose and start at the beginning. Question, but the child kicks. When it is unhappy or denied anything it kicks. Maharaj, let it kick. Just look at the kicking. And if you are too afraid of the society to kick convincingly, look at that too. I know it is a painful business, but there is no remedy except one. The search for remedies must cease. If you are angry or in pain, separate yourself from anger and pain and watch them. Externalization is the first step to liberation. Step away and look. The physical events will go on happening, but by themselves they have no importance. It is the mind alone that matters. Whatever happens, you cannot kick and scream in an airline office or in a bank. Society does not allow it. If you do not like their ways, or are not prepared to endure them, don't fly or carry money. Walk, and if you cannot walk, don't travel. If you deal with society, you must accept its ways, for its ways are your ways. Your needs and demands have created them. Your desires are so complex and contradictory, no wonder the society you create is also complex and contradictory. Question. I do see and admit that the outer chaos is merely a reflection of my own inner disharmony. But what is the remedy? Maharaj, don't seek remedies. Question. Sometimes one is in a state of grace and life is happy and harmonious. But such a state does not last. The mood changes and all goes wrong. Maharaj, if you could only keep quiet clear of memories and expectations, you would be able to discern the beautiful pattern of events. It is your restlessness that causes chaos. Question. For full three hours that I spent in the airline office I was practicing patience and forbearance. It did not speed up matters. Maharaj, at least it did not slow them down as your kicking would have surely done. You want immediate results. We do not dispense magic here. Everybody does the same mistake, refusing the means but wanting the ends. You want peace and harmony in the world, but refuse to have them in yourself. Follow my advice implicitly, and you will not be disappointed. I cannot solve your problem by mere words. You have to act on what I told you and persevere. It is not the right advice that liberates, but the action based on it. Just like a doctor after giving the patient an injection tells him, now keep quiet. Do nothing more, just keep quiet. I am telling you, you have got your injection, now keep quiet, just keep quiet. You have nothing else to do. My guru did the same. He would tell me something and then said, now keep quiet. Don't go on ruminating all the time. Stop. Be silent. Question. I can keep quiet for an hour in the morning. But the day is long and many things happen that throw me out of balance. It is easy to say be silent, but to be silent when all is screaming in me and round me, please tell me how it is done. Maharaj, all that needs doing can be done in peace and silence. There is no need to get upset. Question, it is all theory which does not fit the facts. I am returning to Europe with nothing to do there. My life is completely empty. Maharaj, if you just try to keep quiet all will come the work, the strength for work, the right motive. Must you know everything beforehand? Don't be anxious about your future, be quiet now and all will fall in place. The unexpected is bound to happen, while the anticipated may never come. Don't tell me you cannot control your nature. You need not control it. Throw it overboard. Have no nature to fight or to submit to. No experience will hurt you provided you don't make it into a habit. Of the entire universe you are the subtle cause. All is because you are. Grasp this point firmly and deeply and dwell on it repeatedly. To realize this is absolutely true is liberation. Question. If I am the seed of my universe then a rotten seed I am. By the fruit the seed is known. Maharaj, what is wrong with your world that you swear at it? Question, it is full of pain. Maharaj, nature is neither pleasant nor painful. 
It is all intelligence and beauty. Pain and pleasure are in the mind. Change your scale of values and all will change. Pleasure and pain are mere disturbances of the senses. Treat them equally and there will be only bliss. And the world is what you make it, by all means make it happy. Only contentment can make you happy, desires fulfilled breed more desires. Keeping away from all desires and contentment in what comes by itself is a very fruitful state, a precondition to the state of fullness. Don't distrust its apparent sterility and emptiness. Believe me, it is the satisfaction of desires that breeds misery. Freedom from desires is bliss. Question, there are things we need. Maharaj, what you need will come to you if you do not ask for what you do not need. Yet only few people reach this state of complete dispassion and detachment. It is a very high state, the very threshold of liberation. Question, I have been barren for the last two years, desolate and empty and often was I praying for death to come. Maharaj, well with your coming here events have started rolling. Let things happen as they happen, they will sort themselves out nicely in the end. You need not strain towards the future, the future will come to you on its own. For some time longer you will remain sleepwalking, as you do now, bereft of meaning and assurance. But this period will end and you will find your work both fruitful and easy. There are always moments when one feels empty and estranged. Such moments are most desirable for, it means the soul had cast its moorings and is sailing for distant places. This is detachment when the old is over and the new has not yet come. If you are afraid, the state may be distressing, but there is really nothing to be afraid of. Remember the instruction, whatever you come across, go beyond. Question, the Buddha's rule, to remember what needs to be remembered. But I find it so difficult to remember the right thing at the right moment. With me forgetting seems to be the rule. Meharaj, it is not easy to remember when every situation brings up a storm of desires and fears. Craving born of memory is also the destroyer of memory. Question, how am I to fight desire? There is nothing stronger. Meharaj, the waters of life are thundering over the rocks of objects desirable or hateful. Remove the rocks by insight and detachment and the same waters will flow deep and silent and swift in greater volume and with greater power. Don't be theoretical about it. Give time to thought and consideration. If you desire to be free, neglect not the nearest step to freedom. It is like climbing a mountain. Not a step can be missed. One step less and the summit is not reached. Chapter 54 Body and Mind Are Symptoms of Ignorance Questioner, we were discussing one day the person, the witness, the Absolute. As far as I remember, you said that the Absolute alone is real and the witness is absolute only at a given point of space and time. The person is the organism, gross and subtle, illumined by the presence of the witness. I do not seem to grasp the matter clearly. Could we discuss it again? You also use the terms Mahadakash, Chittakash, and Paramakash. How are they related to person, witness, and the Absolute? Maharaj, Mahadakash is nature, the ocean of existences, the physical space with all that can be contacted through the senses. Chittakash is the expanse of awareness, the mental space of time, perception, and cognition. Paramakash is the timeless and spaceless reality, mindless, undifferentiated, the infinite potentiality, the source and origin, the substance and the essence, both matter and consciousness, yet beyond both. It cannot be perceived, but can be experienced as ever witnessing the witness, perceiving the perceiver, the origin and the end of all manifestation, the root of time and space, the prime cause in every chain of causation. Question, what is the difference between Vyakta and Avyakta? Meharaj, there is no difference. It is like light and daylight. The universe is full of light which you do not see, but the same light you see as daylight. And what the daylight reveals is the Vyakti. The person is always the object. 
the witness is the subject and their relation of mutual dependence is the reflection of their absolute identity. You imagine that they are distinct and separate states. They are not. They are the same consciousness at rest and in movement, each state conscious of the other. In Chit man knows God and God knows man. In Chit the man shapes the world and the world shapes man. Chit is the link, the bridge between extremes, the balancing and uniting factor in every experience. The totality of the perceived is what you call matter. The totality of all perceivers is what you call the universal mind. The identity of the two, manifesting itself as perceptibility and perceiving, harmony and intelligence, loveliness and loving, reasserts itself eternally. Question. The three gunas after Rajas Tamas, are they only in matter or also in the mind? Meharaj, in both of course because the two are not separate. It is only the absolute that is beyond gunas. In fact these are but points of view ways of looking. They exist only in the mind. Beyond the mind all distinctions cease. Question. Is the universe a product of the senses? Meharaj, just as you recreate your world on waking up, so is the universe unrolled. The mind with its five organs of perception, five organs of action, and five vehicles of consciousness appears as memory, thought, reason, and selfhood. Question. The sciences have made much progress. We know the body and the mind much better than our ancestors. Your traditional way describing and analyzing mind and matter is no longer valid. Maharaj, but where are your scientists with their sciences? Are they not again images in your own mind? Question, here lies the basic difference. To me they are not my own projections. They were before I was born and shall be there when I am dead. Maharaj, of course. Once you accept time and space as real, you will consider yourself minute and short-lived. But are they real? Do they depend on you, or you on them? As body, you are in space. As mind, you are in time. Have you your body with a mind in it? Have you ever investigated? Question, I had neither the motive nor the method. Maharaj, I am suggesting both. But the actual work of insight and detachment is yours. Question, the only motive I can perceive is my own causeless and timeless happiness. And what is the method? Maharaj, happiness is incidental. The true and effective motive is love. You see people suffer and you seek the best way of helping them. The answer is obvious. First put yourself beyond the need of help. Be sure your attitude is of pure goodwill free of expectation of any kind. Those who seek mere happiness may end up in sublime indifference while love will never rest. As to method, there is only one. You must come to know yourself, both what you appear to be and what you are. Clarity and charity go together, each needs and strengthens the other. Question. Compassion implies the existence of an objective world, full of avoidable sorrow. Maharaj, the world is not objective and the sorrow of it is not avoidable. Compassion is but another word for the refusal to suffer for imaginary reasons. Question. If the reasons are imaginary, why should the suffering be inevitable? Maharaj, it is always the false that makes you suffer, the false desires and fears, the false values and ideas, the false relationships between people. Abandon the false and you are free of pain. Truth makes happy, truth liberates. Question. The truth is that I am a mind imprisoned in a body and this is a very unhappy truth. Maharaj, you are neither the body nor in the body there is no such thing as body. You have grievously misunderstood yourself, to understand rightly, investigate. Question, but I was born as a body in a body and shall die with the body as a body. Maharaj, this is your misconception. Inquire, investigate, doubt yourself and others. To find truth, you must not cling to your convictions. If you are sure of the immediate, you will never reach the ultimate. Your idea that you were born and that you will die is absurd. Both logic and experience contradict it. Question. All right, I shall not insist that I am the body. 
You have a point here. But here and now as I talk to you I am in my body obviously. The body may not be me but it is mine. Maharaj, the entire universe contributes incessantly to your existence. Hence the entire universe is your body. In that sense I agree. Question, my body influences me deeply. In more than one way my body is my destiny. My character, my moods, the nature of my reactions, my desires and fears, inborn or acquired, they are all based on the body. A little alcohol, some drug or other in all changes. Until the drug wears off I become another man. Maharaj, all this happens because you think yourself to be the body. Realize your real self and even drugs will have no power over you. Question, you smoke. Maharaj, my body kept a few habits which may as well continue till it dies. There's no harm in them. Question, you eat meat. Maharaj, I was born among meat-eating people and my children are eating meat. I eat very little and make no fuss. Question, meat-eating implies killing. Maharaj, obviously. I make no claims of consistency. You think absolute consistency is possible. Prove it by example. Don't preach what you do not practice. Coming back to the idea of having been born. You are stuck with what your parents told you. All about conception, pregnancy and birth, infant child, youngster, teenager and so on. Now divest yourself of the idea that you are the body with the help of the contrary idea that you are not the body. It is also an idea, no doubt, treated like something to be abandoned when its work is done. The idea that I am not the body gives reality to the body when in fact, there is no such thing as body, it is but a state of mind. You can have as many bodies and as diverse as you like. Just remember steadily what you want and reject the incompatibles. Question. I am like a box within box within box the outer box acting as the body and the one next to it as the indwelling soul. Abstract the outer box and the next becomes the body and the one next to it the soul. It is an infinite series, an endless opening of boxes, is the last one the ultimate soul. Maharaj, if you have a body, you must have a soul, here your simile of a nest of boxes applies. Here and now, through all your bodies and souls shines awareness, the pure light of chit. Hold on to it unswervingly. Without awareness the body would not last a second. There is in the body a current of energy, affection and intelligence which guides, maintains and energizes the body. Discover that current and stay with it. Of course all these are manners of speaking. Words are as much a barrier as a bridge. Find the spark of life that weaves the tissues of your body and be with it. It is the only reality the body has. Question, what happens to that spark of life after death? Maharaj, it is beyond time. Birth and death are but points in time. Life weaves eternally its many webs. The weaving is in time, but life itself is timeless. Whatever name and shape you give to its expressions, it is like the ocean never changing, ever changing. Question, all you say sounds beautifully convincing, yet my feeling of being just a person in a world strange and alien, often inimical and dangerous, does not cease. Being a person, limited in space and time, how can I possibly realize myself as the opposite? A depersonalized, universalized awareness of nothing in particular. Maharaj, you assert yourself to be what you are not and deny yourself to be what you are. You omit the element of pure cognition, of awareness free from all personal distortions. Unless you admit the reality of chit, you will never know yourself. Question, what am I to do? I do not see myself as you see me. Maybe you are right and I am wrong, but how can I cease to be what I feel I am? Maharaj, a prince who believes himself to be a beggar can be convinced conclusively in one way only. He must behave as a prince and see what happens. Behave as if what I say is true and judge by what actually happens. All I ask is the little faith needed for making the first step. With experience will come confidence and you will not need me anymore. I know what you are and I am telling you. 
Trust me for a while. Question, to be here and now I need my body and its senses. To understand, I need a mind. Maharaj, the body and the mind are only symptoms of ignorance of misapprehension. Behave as if you were pure awareness, bodiless and mindless, spaceless and timeless, beyond where and when and how. Dwell on it, think of it, learn to accept its reality. Don't oppose it and deny it all the time. Keep an open mind at least. Yoga is bending the outer to the inner. Make your mind and body express the real which is all and beyond all. By doing you succeed, not by arguing. Question, kindly allow me to come back to my first question. How does the error of being a person originate? Maharaj, the absolute precedes time. Awareness comes first. A bundle of memories and mental habits attracts attention. Awareness gets focalized and a person suddenly appears. Remove the light of awareness, go to sleep or swoon away, and the person disappears. The person Vyakti flickers, awareness Vyakta contains all space and time, the absolute Avyakta is. Chapter 55 Give up all and you gain all. Questioner, what is your state at the present moment? Maharaj, a state of non experiencing. In it all experience is included. Question. Can you enter into the mind and heart of another man and share his experience? Maharaj, no. Such things require special training. I am like a dealer in wheat. I know little about breads and cakes. Even the taste of a wheat gruel I may not know. But about the wheat grain I know all and well. I know the source of all experience. But the innumerable particular forms experience can take I do not know. Nor do I need to know. From moment to moment, the little I need to know to live my life, I somehow happen to know. Question, your particular existence and my particular existence, do they both exist in the mind of Brahma? Maharaj, the universal is not aware of the particular. The existence as a person is a personal matter. A person exists in time and space, has name and shape, beginning and end. The universal includes all persons and the absolute is at the root of and beyond all. Question, I am not concerned with the totality. My personal consciousness and your personal consciousness, what is the link between the two? Maharaj, between two dreamers what can be the link? Question, they may dream of each other. Maharaj, that is what people are doing. Everyone imagines others and seeks a link with them. The seeker is the link, there is none other. Question. Surely there must be something in common between the many points of consciousness we are. Maharaj, where are the many points? In your mind. You insist that your world is independent of your mind. How can it be? Your desire to know other people's minds is due to your not knowing your own mind. First know your own mind and you will find that the question of other minds does not arise at all for there are no other people. You are the common factor, the only link between the minds. Being is consciousness, I am applies to all. Question. The supreme reality Parabrahman may be present in all of us. But of what use is it to us? Maharaj, you are like a man who says, I need a place where to keep my things, but of what use is space to me? Or I need milk, tea, coffee, or soda, but for water I have no use. Don't you see that the supreme reality is what makes everything possible? But if you ask of what use is it to you, I must answer, none. In matters of daily life the knower of the real has no advantage. He may be at a disadvantage rather. Being free from greed and fear, he does not protect himself. The very idea of profit is foreign to him. He abhors accretions. His life is constant divesting oneself, sharing, giving. Question. If there is no advantage in gaining the supreme, then why take the trouble? Maharaj, there is trouble only when you cling to something. When you hold on to nothing, no trouble arises. The relinquishing of the lesser is the gaining of the greater. Give up all and you gain all. Then life becomes what it was meant to be, pure radiation from an inexhaustible source. In that light the world appears dimly like a dream. Question. 
If my world is merely a dream and you are a part of it, what can you do for me? If the dream is not real, having no being, how can reality affect it? Maharaj, while at last the dream has temporary being, it is your desire to hold on to it that creates the problem. Let go. Stop imagining that the dream is yours. Question. You seem to take for granted that there can be a dream without a dreamer and that I identify myself with the dream of my own sweet will. But I am the dreamer in the dream too. Who is to stop dreaming? Maharaj, let the dream unroll itself to its very end. You cannot help it. But you can look at the dream as a dream refuse it the stamp of reality. Question, here am I sitting before you. I am dreaming and you are watching me talking in my dream. What is the link between us? Maharaj, my intention to wake you up is the link. My heart wants you awake. I see you suffer in your dream and I know that you must wake up to end your woes. When you see your dream as dream, you wake up. But in your dream itself I am not interested. Enough for me to know that you must wake up. You need not bring your dream to a definite conclusion or make it noble or happy or beautiful. All you need is to realize that you are dreaming. Stop imagining, stop believing. See the contradictions, the incongruities, the falsehood and the sorrow of the human state, the need to go beyond. Within the immensity of space floats a tiny atom of consciousness and in it, the entire universe is contained. Question. There are affections in the dream which seem real and everlasting. Do they disappear on waking up? Maharaj, in dream you love some and not others. On waking up you find your love itself embracing all. Personal love, however intense and genuine, invariably binds. Love in freedom is love of all. Question. People come and go. One loves whom one meets, one cannot love all. Maharaj, when you are love itself, you are beyond time and numbers. In loving one you love all, in loving all, you love each. One and all are not exclusive. Question, you say you are in a timeless state. Does it mean that past and future are open to you? Did you meet Vashish to Muni Rama's Kuru? Maharaj, the question is in time and about time. Again you are asking me about the contents of a dream. Timelessness is beyond the illusion of time. It is not an extension in time. He who called himself Ashish, Tanu Vashishta. I am beyond all names and shapes. Ashishtu is a dream in your dream. How can I know him? You are too much concerned with past and future. It is all due to your longing to continue, to protect yourself against extinction. And as you want to continue, you want others to keep you company, hence your concern with their survival. But what you call survival is but the survival of a dream. Death is preferable to it. There is a chance of waking up. Question, you are aware of eternity, therefore you are not concerned with survival. Maharaj, it is the other way round. Freedom from all desires is eternity. All attachment implies fear, for all things are transient and fear makes one a slave. This freedom from attachment does not come with practice. It is natural when one knows one's true being. Love does not cling, clinging is not love. Question, so there is no way to gain detachment. Maharaj, there is nothing to gain. Abandon all imaginings and know yourself as you are. Self-knowledge is detachment. All craving is due to a sense of insufficiency. When you know that you lack nothing, that all there is, is you and yours, desire ceases. Question. To know myself must I practice awareness? Maharaj, there is nothing to practice. To know yourself, be yourself. To be yourself, stop imagining yourself to be this or that. Just be. Let your true nature emerge. Don't disturb your mind with seeking. Question. It will take much time if I just wait for self-realization. Maharaj, what have you to wait for when it is already here and now? You have only to look and see. Look at yourself, at your own being. You know that you are and you like it. Abandon all imagining that is all. Do not rely on time. Time is death. Who waits dies. Life is now only. 
Do not talk to me about past and future, they exist only in your mind. Question, you too will die. Maharaj, I am dead already. Physical death will make no difference in my case. I am timeless being. I am free of desire or fear because I do not remember the past or imagine the future. Where there are no names and shapes, how can there be desire and fear? With desirelessness comes timelessness. I am safe because what is not cannot touch what is. You feel unsafe because you imagine danger. Of course your body as such is complex and vulnerable and needs protection. But not you. Once you realize your own unassailable being, you will be at peace. Question, how can I find peace when the world suffers? Maharaj, the world suffers for very valid reasons. If you want to help the world, you must be beyond the need of help. Then all you're doing as well as not doing will help the world most effectively. Question, how can non-action be of use where action is needed? Maharaj, where action is needed action happens. Man is not the actor. His is to be aware of what is going on. His very presence is action. The window is the absence of the wall, and it gives air and light because it is empty. The empty of all mental content, of all imagination and effort, and the very absence of obstacles will cause reality to rush in. If you really want to help a person keep away, if you are emotionally committed to helping, you will fail to help. You may be very busy and be very pleased with your charitable nature, but not much will be done. A man is really helped when he is no longer in need of help. All else is just futility. Question. There is not enough time to sit and wait for help to happen. One must do something. Maharaj, by all means do. But what you can do is limited, the self alone is unlimited. Give limitlessly of yourself. All else you can give in small measures only. You alone are immeasurable. To help is your very nature. Even when you eat and drink you help your body. For yourself you need nothing. You are pure giving, beginning less endless, inexhaustible. When you see sorrow and suffering be with it. Do not rush into activity. Neither learning nor action can really help. Be with sorrow and lay bare its roots, helping to understand is real help. Question, my death is nearing. Maharaj, your body is short of time, not you. Time and space are in the mind only. You are not bound. Just understand yourself that itself is eternity. Chapter 56 Consciousness Arising World Arises Questioner When an ordinary man dies, what happens to him? Maharaj, according to his belief, it happens as life before death is but imagination, so is life after. The dream continues. Question And what about the Jani? Maharaj, the Jani does not die because he was never born. Question, he appears so to others. Maharaj, but not to himself. In himself he is free of things, physical and mental. Question, still you must know the state of the man who died. At least from your own past lives. Maharaj, until I met my guru I knew so many things. Now I know nothing, for all knowledge is in dream only and not valid. I know myself and I find no life nor death in me, only pure being, not being this or that, but just being. At the moment the mind, drawing on its stock of memories, begins to imagine, it fills the space with objects and time with events. As I do not know even this birth, how can I know past births? It is the mind that, itself in movement, sees everything moving, and having created time, worries about the past and future. All the universe is cradled in consciousness Mahatattva, which arises where there is perfect order and harmony Mahasattva. As all waves are in the ocean, so are all things physical and mental in awareness. Hence awareness itself is all important, not the content of it. Deepen and broaden your awareness of yourself, and all the blessings will flow. You need not seek anything, all will come to you most naturally and effortlessly. The five senses and the four functions of the mind, memory, thought, understanding and selfhood. The five elements, earth, water, fire, air and ether. 
the two aspects of creation, matter and spirit, all are contained in awareness. Question. Yet, you must believe in having lived before. Meharaj, the scriptures say so, but I know nothing about it. I know myself as I am, as I appeared or will appear is not within my experience. It is not that I do not remember. In fact, there is nothing to remember. Reincarnation implies a reincarnating self. There is no such thing. The bundle of memories and hopes, called the I, imagines itself existing everlastingly and creates time to accommodate its false eternity. To be, I need no past or future. All experience is born of imagination. I do not imagine, so no birth or death happens to me. Only those who think themselves born can think themselves reborn. You are accusing me of having been born, I plead not guilty. All exists in awareness and awareness neither dies nor is reborn. It is the changeless reality itself. All the universe of experience is born with the body and dies with the body. It has its beginning and end in awareness, but awareness knows no beginning nor end. If you think it out carefully and brood over it for a long time, you will come to see the light of awareness in all its clarity and the world will fade out of your vision. It is like looking at a burning incense stick. You see the stick and the smoke first. When you notice the fiery point, you realize that it has the power to consume mountains of sticks and fill the universe with smoke. Timelessly the self actualizes itself without exhausting its infinite possibilities. In the incense stick simile the stick is the body and the smoke is the mind. As long as the mind is busy with its contortions, it does not perceive its own source. The guru comes and turns your attention to the spark within. By its very nature the mind is outward turned. It always tends to seek for the source of things among the things themselves. To be told to look for the source within, is in a way, the beginning of a new life. Awareness takes the place of consciousness, in consciousness there is the I, who is conscious while awareness is undivided, awareness is aware of itself. The I am is a thought while awareness is not a thought, there is no I am aware in awareness. Consciousness is an attribute while awareness is not. One can be aware of being conscious, but not conscious of awareness. God is the totality of consciousness, but awareness is beyond all, being as well as not being. Question. I had started with the question about the condition of a man after death. When his body is destroyed, what happens to his consciousness? Does he carry his senses of seeing, hearing, etc., along with him, or does he leave them behind? And, if he loses his senses, what becomes to his consciousness? Maharaj, senses are mere modes of perception. As the grosser modes disappear, finer states of consciousness emerge. Question, is there no transition to awareness after death? Maharaj, there can be no transition from consciousness to awareness, for awareness is not a form of consciousness. Consciousness can only become more subtle and refined and that is what happens after death. As the various vehicles of man die off, the modes of consciousness induced by them also fade away. Question. Until only unconsciousness remains. Maharaj, look at yourself talking of unconsciousness as something that comes and goes. Who is there to be conscious of unconsciousness? As long as the window is open, there is sunlight in the room. With the windows shut, the sun remains, but does it see the darkness in the room? Is there anything like darkness to the sun? There is no such thing as unconsciousness, for unconsciousness is not experienceable. We infer unconsciousness when there is a lapse in memory or communication. If I stop reacting, you will say that I am unconscious. In reality I may be most acutely conscious, only unable to communicate or remember. Question. I am asking a simple question. There are about four billion people in the world and they are all bound to die. What will be their condition after death, not physically, but psychologically? Will their consciousness continue? 
and if it does in what form, do not tell me that I am not asking the right question, or that you do not know the answer, or that in your world my question is meaningless. The moment you start talking about your world and my world is different and incompatible, you build a wall between us. Either we live in one world or your experience is of no use to us. Maharaj, of course we live in one world. Only I see it as it is while you don't. You see yourself in the world while I see the world in myself. To you you get born and die while to me the world appears and disappears. Our world is real but your view of it is not. There is no wall between us except the one built by you. There is nothing wrong with the senses, it is your imagination that misleads you. It covers up the world as it is, with what you imagine it to be, something existing independently of you and yet closely following your inherited or acquired patterns. There is a deep contradiction in your attitude, which you do not see and which is the cause of sorrow. You cling to the idea that you were born into a world of pain and sorrow. I know that the world is a child of love having its beginning growth and fulfillment in love. But I am beyond love even. Question, if you have created the world out of love, why is it so full of pain? Maharaj, you are right from the body's point of view. But you are not the body. You are the immensity and infinity of consciousness. Don't assume what is not true and you will see things as I see them. Pain and pleasure, good and bad, right and wrong. These are relative terms and must not be taken absolutely. They are limited and temporary. Question. In the Buddhist tradition it is stated that a nirvani, an enlightened Buddha, has the freedom of the universe. He can know and experience for himself all that exists. He can command, interfere with nature, with the chain of causation, change the sequence of events, even undo the past. The world is still with him but he is free in it. Maharaj, what you describe is God. Of course where there is a universe there will also be its counterpart which is God. But I am beyond both. There was a kingdom in search of a king. They found the right man and made him king. In no way had he changed. He was merely given the title, the rights and the duties of a king. His nature was not affected, only his actions. Similarly with the enlightened man, the content of his consciousness undergoes a radical transformation. But he is not misled. He knows the changeless. Question. The changeless cannot be conscious. Consciousness is always of change. The changeless leaves no trace in consciousness. Maharaj, yes and no. The paper is not the writing, yet it carries the writing. The ink is not the message, nor is the reader's mind the message, but they all make the message possible. Question, does consciousness come down from reality, or is it an attribute of matter? Maharaj, consciousness as such is the subtle counterpart of matter. Just as inertia tamas and energy rajas are attributes of matter, so does harmony sadha manifest itself as consciousness. You may consider it in a way as a form of very subtle energy. Wherever matter organizes itself into a stable organism, consciousness appears spontaneously. With the destruction of the organism, consciousness disappears. Question, then what survives? Maharaj, that of which matter and consciousness are but aspects which is neither born nor dies. Question. If it is beyond matter and consciousness, how can it be experienced? Maharaj, it can be known by its effects on both, look for it in beauty and in bliss. But you will understand neither body nor consciousness, unless you go beyond both. Question. Please tell us squarely, are you conscious or unconscious? Maharaj, the enlightened jhani is neither. But in his enlightenment jhana all is contained. Awareness contains every experience. But he who is aware is beyond every experience. He is beyond awareness itself. Question, there is the background of experience, call it matter. There is the experiencer, call it mind. What makes the bridge between the two? Maharaj, the very gap between is the bridge. 
that which at one end looks like matter and at the other as mind, is in itself the bridge. Don't separate reality into mind and body and there will be no need of bridges. Consciousness arising, the world arises. When you consider the wisdom and the beauty of the world, you call it God. Know the source of it all, which is in yourself, and you will find all your questions answered. Question, the seer and the seen, are they one or two? Meharaj, there is only seeing, both the seer and the seen are contained in it. Don't create differences where there are none. Question, I began with the question about the man who died. You said that his experiences will shape themselves according to his expectations and beliefs. Maharaj, before you were born you expected to live according to a plan which you yourself had laid down. Your own will was the backbone of your destiny. Question. Surely karma interfered. Maharaj, karma shapes the circumstances. The attitudes are your own. Ultimately your character shapes your life and you alone can shape your character. Question. How does one shape one's character? Maharaj, by seeing it as it is and being sincerely sorry. This integral seeing feeling can work miracles. It is like casting a bronze image. Metal alone or fire alone will not do. Nor will the mold be of any use. You have to melt down the metal in the heat of the fire and cast it in the mold. Chapter 57. Beyond mind there is no suffering. Questioner. I see you sitting in your son's house waiting for lunch to be served. And I wonder whether the content of your consciousness is similar to mine, or partly different, or totally different. Are you hungry and thirsty as I am, waiting rather impatiently for the meals to be served, or are you in an altogether different state of mind? Meharaj, there is not much difference on the surface, but very much of it in depth. You know yourself only through the senses and the mind. You take yourself to be what they suggest. Having no direct knowledge of yourself, you have mere ideas, all mediocre second-hand by hearsay. Whatever you think you are you take it to be true. The habit of imagining yourself perceivable and describable is very strong with you. I see as you see, hear as you hear, taste as you taste, eat as you eat. I also feel thirst and hunger and expect my food to be served on time. When starved or sick my body and mind go weak. All this I perceive quite clearly, but somehow I am not in it. I feel myself as if floating over it aloof and detached. Even not aloof and detached. There is aloofness and detachment as there is thirst and hunger. There is also the awareness of it all and a sense of immense distance, as if the body and the mind and all that happens to them were somewhere far out on the horizon. I am like a cinema screen, clear and empty, the pictures pass over it and disappear, leaving it as clear and empty as before. In no way is the screen affected by the pictures, nor are the pictures affected by the screen. The screen intercepts and reflects the pictures, it does not shape them. It has nothing to do with the rolls of films. These are as they are, lumps of destiny prerabta, but not my destiny the destinies of the people on the screen. Question, you do not mean to say that the people in a picture have destinies. They belong to the story, the story is not theirs. Maharaj, and what about you? Do you shape your life or are you shaped by it? Question, yes, you are right. A life story unrolls itself of which I am one of the actors. I have no being outside it as it has no being without me. I am merely a character, not a person. Maharaj, the character will become a person when he begins to shape his life instead of accepting it as it comes and identifying himself with it. Question, when I ask a question and you answer, what exactly happens? Maharaj, the question and the answer both appear on the screen. The lips move, the body speaks, and again the screen is clear and empty. Question, when you say, clear and empty, what do you mean? Maharaj, I mean free of all contents. To myself I am neither perceivable nor conceivable, there is nothing I can point out and say, this I am. You identify yourself with everything so easily, I find it impossible. The feeling, I am not this or that, 
nor is anything mine is so strong in me that as soon as a thing or a thought appears, there comes at once the sense this I am not. Question. Do you mean to say that you spend your time repeating this I am not that I am not? Maharaj, of course not. I am merely verbalizing for your sake. By the grace of my guru, I have realized once and for good that I am neither object nor subject, and I do not need to remind myself all the time. Question. I find it hard to grasp what exactly do you mean by saying that you are neither the object nor the subject. At this very moment as we talk am I not the object of your experience and you the subject? Maharaj, look my thumb touches my forefinger. Both touch and are touched. When my attention is on the thumb the thumb is the feeler and the forefinger the self. If the focus of attention and the relationship is reversed. I find that somehow by shifting the focus of attention, I become the very thing I look at and experience the kind of consciousness it has. I become the inner witness of the thing. I call this capacity of entering other focal points of consciousness love. You may give it any name you like. Love says, I am everything. Wisdom says, I am nothing between the two my life flows. Since at any point of time and space I can be both the subject and the object of experience, I express it by saying that I am both and neither and beyond both. Question. You make all these extraordinary statements about yourself. What makes you say those things? What do you mean by saying that you are beyond space and time? Meharaj, you ask and the answer comes. I watch myself, I watch the answer and see no contradiction. It is clear to me that I am telling you the truth. It is all very simple. Only you must trust me that I mean what I say, that I am quite serious. As I told you already, my guru showed me my true nature and the true nature of the world. Having realized that I am one with, and yet beyond the world, I became free from all desire and fear. I did not reason out that I should be free, I found myself free unexpectedly, without the least effort. This freedom from desire and fear remained with me since then. Another thing I noticed was that I do not need to make an effort. The deed follows the thought without delay and friction. I have also found that thoughts become self-fulfilling. Things would fall in place smoothly and rightly. The main change was in the mind. It became motionless and silent, responding quickly, but not perpetuating the response. Spontaneity became a way of life, the real became natural and the natural became real. And above all, infinite affection, love, dark and quiet, radiating, in all directions, embracing all, making all interesting and beautiful, significant and auspicious. Question. We are told that various yogic powers arise spontaneously in a man who has realized his own true being. What is your experience in these matters? Maharaj, man's five full body physical etc. has potential powers beyond our wildest dreams. Not only is the entire universe reflected in man, but also the power to control the universe is waiting to be used by him. The wise man is not anxious to use such powers, except when the situation calls for them. He finds the abilities and skills of the human personality quite adequate for the business of daily living. Some of the powers can be developed by specialized training, but the man who flaunts such powers is still in bondage. The wise man counts nothing as his own. When at some time and place some miracle is attributed to some person, he will not establish any causal link between events and people, nor will he allow any conclusions to be drawn. All happened as it happened because it had to happen, everything happens as it does, because the universe is as it is. Question. The universe does not seem a happy place to live in. Why is there so much suffering? Maharaj, pain is physical, suffering is mental. Beyond the mind there is no suffering. Pain is merely a signal that the body is in danger and requires attention. Similarly, suffering warns us that the structure of memories and habits, which we call the person viacti, is threatened by loss or change. Pain is essential for the survival of the body, but none compels you to suffer. 
Suffering is due entirely to clinging or resisting. It is a sign of our unwillingness to move on to flow with life. As a sane life is free of pain, so is a saintly life free from suffering. Question, nobody has suffered more than saints. Maharaj, did they tell you or do you say so on your own? The essence of saintliness is total acceptance of the present moment, harmony with things as they happen. A saint does not want things to be different from what they are. He knows that, considering all factors, they are unavoidable. He is friendly with the inevitable and therefore does not suffer. Pain he may know, but it does not shatter him. If he can, he does the needful to restore the lost balance where he lets things take their course. Question, he may die. Maharaj, so what? What does he gain by living on? And what does he lose by dying? What was born must die. What was never born cannot die. It all depends on what he takes himself to be. Question. Imagine you fall mortally ill. Would you not regret and resent? Maharaj, but I am dead already or rather neither alive nor dead. You see my body behaving the habitual way and draw your own conclusions. You will not admit that your conclusions bind nobody but you. Do see that the image you have of me may be altogether wrong. Your image of yourself is wrong too, but that is your problem. But you need not create problems for me and then ask me to solve them. I am neither creating problems nor solving them. Chapter 58 Perfection, Destiny of All Questioner, when asked about the means for self-realization, you invariably stress the importance of the mind dwelling on the sense I am. Where is the causal factor? Why should this particular thought result in self-realization? How does the contemplation of I am affect me? Maharaj, the very fact of observation alters the observer and the observed. After all, what prevents the insight into one's true nature is the weakness and obtuseness of the mind and its tendency to skip the subtle and focus on the gross only. When you follow my advice and try to keep your mind on the notion of I am only, you become fully aware of your mind and its vagaries. Awareness, being lucid harmony sattva in action, dissolves dullness and quietens the restlessness of the mind and gently, but steadily changes its very substance. This change need not be spectacular. It may be hardly noticeable. Yet it is a deep and fundamental shift from darkness to light, from inadvertence to awareness. Question, must it be the I am formula? Will not any other sentence do? If I concentrate on there is a table, will it not serve the same purpose? Maharaj, as an exercise in concentration, yes. But it will not take you beyond the idea of a table. You are not interested in tables, you want to know yourself. But this keeps steadily in the focus of consciousness the only clue you have, your certainty of being. Be with it, play with it, ponder over it, delve deeply into it, till the shell of ignorance breaks open and you emerge into the realm of reality. Question. Is there any causal link between my focusing the I am and the breaking of the shell? Meharaj, the urge to find oneself is a sign that you are getting ready. The impulse always comes from within. Unless your time has come, you will have neither the desire nor the strength to go for self-inquiry wholeheartedly. Question, is not the grace of the Guru responsible for the desire and its fulfillment? Is not the Guru's radiant face the bait on which we are caught and pulled out of this mire of sorrow? Maharaj, it is the inner Guru sad Guru who takes you to the outer Guru as a mother takes her child to a teacher. Trust and obey your Kiru, for he is the messenger of your real self. Question, how do I find a Guru whom I can trust? Maharaj, your own heart will tell you. There is no difficulty in finding a Guru, because the Guru is in search of you. The Guru is always ready, you are not ready. You have to be ready to learn, or you may meet your Guru and waste your chance by sheer inattentiveness and obstinacy. Take my example. There was nothing in me of much promise, but when I met my guru, I listened, trusted, and obeyed. Question, must I not examine the teacher before I put myself entirely into his hands? Meharaj, by all means examine. 
But what can you find out? Only as he appears to you on your own level. Question, I shall watch whether he is consistent, whether there is harmony between his life and his teaching. Maharaj, you may find plenty of disharmony, so what? It proves nothing. Only motives matter. How will you know his motives? Question, I should at least expect him to be a man of self-control who lives a righteous life. Maharaj, such you will find many and of no use to you. A guru can show the way back home to your real self. What has this to do with the character or temperament of the person he appears to be? Does he not clearly tell you that he is not the person? The only way you can judge is by the change in yourself when you are in his company. If you feel more at peace and happy, if you understand yourself with more than usual clarity and depth, it means you have met the right man. Take your time, but once you have made up your mind to trust him, trust him absolutely and follow every instruction fully and faithfully. It does not matter much if you do not accept him as your guru and are satisfied with his company only. Satsang alone can also take you to your goal, provided it is unmixed and undisturbed. But once you accept somebody as your guru listen, remember and obey. Half-heartedness is a serious drawback and the cause of much self-created sorrow. The mistake is never the guru's. It is always the obtuseness and cussness of the discipline that is at fault. Question. Does the guru then dismiss or disqualify a disciple? Maharaj, he would not be a guru if he did. He bides his time and waits till the disciple, chastened and sobered, comes back to him in a more receptive mood. Question. What is the motive? Why does the guru take so much trouble? Maharaj, sorrow and the ending of sorrow. He sees people suffering in their dreams and he wants them to wake up. Love is intolerant of pain and suffering. The patience of a guru has no limits and therefore it cannot be defeated. The guru never fails. Question, is my first guru also my last, or do I have to pass from guru to guru? Maharaj, the entire universe is your guru. You learn from everything if you are alert and intelligent. Were your mind clear and your heart clean, you would learn from every passerby. It is because you are indolent or restless that your inner self manifests as the outer guru and makes you trust him and obey. Question. Is a guru inevitable? Maharaj, it is like asking is a mother inevitable? To rise in consciousness from one dimension to another you need help. The help may not always be in the shape of a human person. It may be a subtle presence or a spark of intuition, but help must come. The inner self is watching and waiting for the son to return to his father. At the right time he arranges everything affectionately and effectively. Where a messenger is needed or a guide he sends the guru to do the needful. Question, there is one thing I cannot grasp. You speak of the inner self as wise and good and beautiful and in every way perfect, and of the person as mere reflection without a being of its own. On the other hand you take so much trouble in helping the person to realize itself. If the person is so unimportant, why be so concerned with its welfare? Who cares for a shadow? Maharaj, you have brought in duality where there is none. There is the body and there is the self. Between them is the mind, in which the self is reflected as I am. Because of the imperfections of the mind, its crudity and restlessness, lack of discernment and insight, it takes itself to be the body, not the self. All that is needed is to purify the mind so that it can realize its identity with the self. When the mind merges in the self, the body presents no problems. It remains what it is, an instrument of cognition and action, the tool and the expression of the creative fire within. The ultimate value of the body is that it serves to discover the cosmic body, which is the universe in its entirety. As you realize yourself in manifestation, you keep on discovering that you are ever more than what you have imagined. Question, is there no end to self-discovery? Maharaj, as there is no beginning, there is no end. But what I have discovered by the grace of my guru is, I am nothing that can be pointed at. I am neither a this nor a that. 
This holds absolutely. Question, then, where comes in the never-ending discovery, the endless transcending oneself into he dimensions? Maharaj, all this belongs to the realm of manifestation. It is in the very structure of the universe that the higher can be at only through the freedom from the lower. Question, what is lower and what is higher? Maharaj, look at it in terms of awareness. Wider and deeper consciousness is higher. All that lives works for protecting, perpetuating and expanding consciousness. This is the world's sole meaning and purpose. It is the very essence of yoga, ever raising the level of consciousness, discovery of new dimensions with their properties, qualities and powers. In that sense the entire universe becomes a school of yoga yogakshetra. Question, is perfection the destiny of all human beings? Maharaj, of all living beings, ultimately. The possibility becomes a certainty when the notion of enlightenment appears in the mind. Once a living being has heard and understood that deliverance is within his reach, he will never forget, for it is the first message from within. It will take roots and grow and in due course take the blessed shape of the Guru. Question, so all we are concerned with is the redemption of the mind? Maharaj, what else? The mind goes astray, the mind returns home. Even the word astray is not proper. The mind must know itself in every mood. Nothing is a mistake unless repeated. Chapter 59 Desire and Fear Self-Centered States Questioner, I would like to go again into the question of pleasure and pain, desire and fear. I understand fear which is memory and anticipation of pain. It is essential for the preservation of the organism and its living pattern. Needs when felt are painful and their anticipation is full of fear. We are rightly afraid of not being able to meet our basic needs. The relief experienced when a need is met or an anxiety allayed is entirely due to the ending of pain. We may give it positive names like pleasure or joy or happiness but essentially it is relief from pain. It is this fear of pain that holds together our social, economic and political institutions. What puzzles me is that we derive pleasure from things and states of mind which have nothing to do with survival. On the contrary, our pleasures are usually destructive. They damage or destroy the object, the instrument and also the subject of pleasure. Otherwise, pleasure and pursuit of pleasure would be no problem. This brings me to the core of my question. Why is pleasure destructive? Why, in spite of its destructiveness, is it wanted? I may add, I do not have in mind the pleasure-pain pattern by which nature compels us to go her way. I think of the man-made pleasures, both sensory and subtle, ranging from the grossest, like overreading, to the most refined. Addiction to pleasure, at whatever cost, is so universal that there must be something significant at the root of it. Of course, not every activity of man must be utilitarian, designed to meet a need. Play, for example, is natural and man is the most playful animal in existence. Play fulfills the need for self-discovery and self-development. But even on his play man becomes destructive of nature, others and himself. Meharaj, in short you do not object to pleasure but only to its price and pain and sorrow. Question. If reality itself is bliss, then pleasure in some way must be related to it. Meharaj, let us not proceed by verbal logic. The bliss of reality does not exclude suffering. Besides, you know only pleasure, not the bliss of pure being. So let us examine pleasure at its own level. If you look at yourself in your moments of pleasure or pain, you will invariably find that it is not the thing in itself that is pleasant or painful but the situation of which it is a part. Pleasure lies in the relationship between the enjoyer and the enjoyed. And the essence of it is acceptance. Whatever may be the situation, if it is acceptable, it is pleasant. If it is not acceptable, it is painful. What makes it acceptable is not important. The cause may be physical or psychological or untraceable. Acceptance is the decisive factor. Obviously, suffering is due to non-acceptance. Question. 
pain is not acceptable. Maharaj, why not? Did you ever try? Do try and you will find in pain a joy which pleasure cannot yield, for the simple reason that acceptance of pain takes you much deeper than pleasure does. The personal self by its very nature is constantly pursuing pleasure and avoiding pain. The ending of this pattern is the ending of the self. The ending of the self with its desires and fears enables you to return to your real nature, the source of all happiness and peace. The perennial desire for pleasure is the reflection of the timeless harmony within. It is an observable fact that one becomes self-conscious only when caught in the conflict between pleasure and pain which demands choice and decision. It is this clash between desire and fear that causes anger, which is the great destroyer of sanity in life. When pain is accepted for what it is, a lesson and a warning and deeply looked into and heeded, the separation between pain and pleasure breaks down, both become experience, painful when resisted, joyful when accepted. Question. Do you advise shunning pleasure and pursuing pain? Meharaj, no, nor pursuing pleasure and shunning pain. Accept both as they come, enjoy both while they last, let them go as they must. Question. How can I possibly enjoy pain? Physical pain calls for action. Meharaj, of course and so does mental. The bliss is in the awareness of it and not shrinking or in any way turning away from it. All happiness comes from awareness. The more we are conscious, the deeper the joy. Acceptance of pain, non-resistance, courage and endurance, these open deep and perennial sources of real happiness, true bliss. Question. Why should pain be more effective than pleasure? Meharaj, pleasure is readily accepted while all the powers of the self reject pain. As the acceptance of pain is the denial of the self and the self stands in the way of true happiness, the wholehearted acceptance of pain releases the springs of happiness. Question, does the acceptance of suffering act the same way? Meharaj, the fact of pain is easily brought within the focus of awareness. With suffering it is not that simple. To focus suffering is not enough for mental life as we know it, is one continuous stream of suffering. To reach the deeper layers of suffering you must go to its roots and uncover their vast underground network, where fear and desire are closely interwoven and the currents of life's energy oppose, obstruct and destroy each other. Question. How can I set right a tangle which is entirely below the level of my consciousness? Maharaj, by being with yourself that I am, by watching yourself in your daily life with alert interest, with the intention to understand rather than to judge, in full acceptance of whatever may emerge, because it is there you encourage the deep to come to the surface and enrich your life and consciousness with its captive energies. This is the great work of awareness. It removes obstacles and releases energies by understanding the nature of life and mind. Intelligence is the door to freedom and alert attention is the mother of intelligence. Question. One more question. Why does pleasure end in pain? Maharaj, everything has a beginning and an end and so does pleasure. Don't anticipate and don't regret. And there will be no pie. It is memory and imagination that cause suffering. Of course pain after pleasure may be due to the misuse of the body or the mind. The body knows its measure, but the mind does not. Its appetites are numberless and limitless. Watch your mind with great diligence, for there lies your bondage and also the key to freedom. Question, my question is not yet fully answered, why are man's pleasures destructive? Why does he find so much pleasure in destruction? Life's concern lies in protection, perpetuation and expansion of itself. In this it is guided by pain and pleasure. At what point do they become destructive? Maharaj, when the mind takes over, remembers and anticipates, it exaggerates, it distorts, it overlooks. The past is projected into future and the future betrays the expectations. The organs of sensation and action are stimulated beyond capacity and they inevitably break down. 
the objects of pleasure cannot yield what is expected of them and get worn out or destroyed by misuse. It results in excessive pain where pleasure was looked for. Question, we destroy not only ourselves but others too. Meherad, naturally selfishness is always destructive. Desire and fear, both are self-centered states. Between desire and fear anger arises, with anger hatred, with hatred passion for destruction. War is hatred in action, organized and equipped with all the instruments of death. Question, is there a way to end these horrors? Maharaj, when more people come to know their real nature, their influence, however subtle, will prevail and the world's emotional atmosphere will sweeten up. People follow their leaders, and when among the leaders appear some, great in heart and mind, and absolutely free from self-seeking, their impact will be enough to make the crudities and crimes of the present age impossible. A new golden age may come and last for a time and succumb to its own perfection. Where it begins when the tide is at its highest. Question. Is there no such thing as permanent perfection? Maharaj, yes there is but it includes all imperfection. It is the perfection of our self-nature which makes everything possible, perceivable, interesting. It knows no suffering for it neither likes nor dislikes neither accepts nor rejects. Creation and destruction are the two poles between which it weaves its ever-changing pattern. Be free from predilections and preferences and the mind with its burden of sorrow will be no more. Question, but I am not alone to suffer. There are others. Maharaj, when you go to them with your desires and fears you merely add to their sorrows. First be free of suffering yourself and then only hope of helping others. You do not even need to hope, your very existence will be the greatest help a man can give his fellowmen. Chapter 60, Live Facts Not Fancies Questioner, you say that whatever you see is yourself. You also admit that you see the world as we see it. Here is today's newspaper with all the horrors going on. Since the world is yourself, how can you explain such misbehavior? Maharaj, which world do you have in mind? Question, our common world in which we live. Maharaj, are you sure we live in the same world? I do not mean nature, the sea and the land, plants and animals. They are not the problem, nor the endless space, the infinite time, the inexhaustible power. Do not be misled by my eating and smoking, reading and talking. My mind is not here, my life is not here. Your world of desires and their fulfillments of fears and their escapes is definitely not my world. I do not even perceive it except through what you tell me about it. It is your private dream world and my only reaction to it is to ask you to stop dreaming. Question, surely wars and revolutions are not dreams. Sick mothers and starving children are not dreams. Wealth, ill-gotten and misused is not a dream. Maharaj, what else? Question, a dream cannot be shared. Maharaj, nor can waking state. All the three states of waking, dreaming and sleeping are subjective, personal, intimate. They all happen to and are contained within the little bubble in consciousness called I. The real world lies beyond the self. Question, self or no self, facts are real. Maharaj, of course facts are real. I live among them but you live with fancies, not with facts. Facts never clash while your life and world are full of contradictions. Contradiction is the mark of the false. The real never contradicts itself. For instance, you complain that people are abjectly poor. Yet you do not share your riches with them. You mind the war next door, but you hardly give it a thought when it is in some far-off country. The shifting fortunes of your ego determine your values, I think, I want, I must are made into absolutes. Question. Nevertheless the evil is real. Meharaj, not more real than you are. Evil is in the wrong approach to problems created by misunderstanding and misuse. It is a vicious circle. Question. Can the circle be broken? Meharaj, a false circle need not be broken. It is enough to see it as it is, non-existent. Question, 
but real enough to make us submit to and inflict indignities and atrocities. Maharaj, insanity is universal. Sanity is rare. Yet there is hope because the moment we perceive our insanity, we are on the way to sanity. This is the function of the Guru, to make us see the madness of our daily living. Life makes you conscious, but the teacher makes you aware. Question, sir, you are neither the first nor the last. Since immemorial times people were breaking into reality. Yet how little it affected our lives. The Ramas and the Krishnas, the Buddhas and the Christs have come and gone and we are as we were, wallowing in sweat and tears. What have the great ones done whose lives we witnessed? What have you done, sir, to alleviate the world's thrall? Maharaj, you alone can undo the evil you have created. Your own callous selfishness is at the root of it. But first your own house in order and you will see that your work is done. Question. The men of wisdom and of love who came before us did set themselves right, often at a tremendous cost. What was the outcome? A shooting star, however bright, does not make the night less dark. Maharaj, to judge them in their work you must become one of them. Prague in a well knows nothing about the birds in the sky. Question. Do you mean to say that between good and evil there is no wall? Maharaj, there is no wall because there is no good and no evil. In every concrete situation there is only the necessary and the unnecessary. The needful is right, the needless is wrong. Question, who decides? Maharaj, the situation decides. Every situation is a challenge which demands the right response. When the response is right, the challenge is met and the problem ceases. If the response is wrong, the challenge is not met and the problem remains unsolved. Your unsolved problems, that is what constitutes your karma. Solve them rightly and be free. Question. You seem to drive me always back into myself. Is there no objective solution to the world's problems? Maharaj. The world problems were created by numberless people like you, each full of his own desires and fears. Who can free you of your past personal and social except yourself? And how will you do it unless you see the urgent need of your being first free of cravings born of illusion? How can you truly help as long as you need help yourself? Question. In what way did the ancient sages help? In what way do you help? A few individuals profit, no doubt. Your guidance and example may mean a lot to them. But in what way do you affect humanity? the totality of life and consciousness. You say that you are the world and the world is you. What impact have you made on it? Maharaj, what kind of impact do you expect? Question, man is stupid, selfish, cruel. Maharaj, man is also wise, affectionate and kind. Question, why does not goodness prevail? Maharaj, it does in my real world. In my world even what you call evil is the servant of the good and therefore necessary. It is like boils and fevers that clear the body of impurities. Disease is painful, even dangerous but if dealt with rightly it heals. Question or kills. Maharaj, in some cases death is the best cure. A life may be worse than death, which is but rarely an unpleasant experience, whatever the appearances. Therefore pity the living, never the dead. This problem of things, good and evil in themselves, does not exist in my world. The needful is good and the needless is evil. In your world the pleasant is good and the painful is evil. Question, what is necessary? Maharaj, to grow is necessary. To outgrow is necessary. To leave behind the good for the sake of the better is necessary. Question, to what end? Maharaj, the end is in the beginning. You end where you start in the absolute. Question, why all this trouble then? To come back to where I started. Maharaj, whose trouble? Which trouble? Do you pity this seed that is to grow and multiply till it becomes a mighty forest? Do you kill an infant to save him from the bother of living? What is wrong with life ever more life? Remove the obstacles to growing in all your personal, social, 
economic and political problems will just dissolve. The universe is perfect as a whole, and the part striving for perfection is a way of joy. Willingly sacrifice the imperfect to the perfect, and there will be no more talk about good and evil. Question, yet we are afraid of the better and cling to the worse. Maharaj, this is our stupidity verging on insanity. Chapter 61, Matter is Consciousness Itself Questioner, I was lucky to have holy company all my life. Is it enough for self-realization? Maharaj, it depends what you make of it. Question, I was told that the liberating action of satsang is automatic. Just like a river carries one to the estuary, so the subtle and silent influence of good people will take me to reality. Maharaj, it will take you to the river but the crossing is your own. Freedom cannot be gained nor kept without will to freedom. You must strive for liberation. The least you can do is uncover and remove the obstacles diligently. If you want peace you must strive for it. You will not get peace just by keeping quiet. Question, a child just grows. He does not make plans for growth, nor has he a pattern, nor does he grow by fragments, a hand here a leg there, he grows integrally and unconsciously. Maharaj, because he is free of imagination. You can also grow like this, but you must not indulge in forecasts and plans born of memory and anticipation. It is one of the peculiarities of Ajani that he is not concerned with the future. Your concern with future is due to fear of pain and desire for pleasure, to the Jani all is bliss, he is happy with whatever comes. Question, surely there are many things that would make even a Jani miserable. Maharaj, a Jani may meet with difficulties but they do not make him suffer. Bringing up a child from birth to maturity may seem a hard task, but to a mother the memories of hardships are a joy. There is nothing wrong with the world. What is wrong is in the way you look at it. It is your own imagination that misleads you. Without imagination there is no world. Your conviction that you are conscious of a world is the world. The world you perceive is made of consciousness, what you call matter is consciousness itself. You are the space akash in which it moves, the time in which it lasts, the love that gives it life. Cut off imagination and attachment and what remains? Question, the world remains. I remain. Maharaj, yes. But how different it is when you can see it as it is, not through the screen of desire and fear. Question, what for are all these distinctions, reality and illusion, wisdom and ignorance, saint and sinner? Everyone is in search of happiness, everyone strives desperately. Everyone is a yogi and his life a school of wisdom. Each learns his own way the lessons he needs. Society approves of some, disapproves of others. There are no rules that apply everywhere and for all time. Maharaj, in my world love is the only law. I do not ask for love, I give it. Such is my nature. Question, I see you living your life according to a pattern. You run a meditation class in the morning lecture and have discussions regularly. Twice daily there is worship puja and religious singing bhajan in the evening. You seem to adhere to the routine scrupulously. Meharaj, the worship and the singing are as I found them and I saw no reason to interfere. The general routine is according to the wishes of the people with whom I happen to live or who come to listen. They are working people, with many obligations and the timings are for their convenience. Some repetitive routine is inevitable. Even animals and plants have their timetables. Question, yes we see a regular sequence in all life. Who maintains the order? Is there an inner ruler who lays down laws and enforces order? Maharaj, everything moves according to its nature. Where is the need of a policeman? Every action creates a reaction which balances and neutralizes the action. Everything happens but there is a continuous cancelling out, and in the end it is as if nothing happened. Question, do not console me with final harmonies. The accounts tally but the loss is mine. Maharaj, wait and see. 
you may end up with a profit good enough to justify the outlays. Question. There is a long life behind me and I often wonder whether its many events took place by accident or there was a plan. Was there a pattern laid down before I was born by which I had to live my life? If yes, who made the plans and who enforced them? Could there be deviations and mistakes? Some say destiny is immutable and every second of life is predetermined. Others say that pure accident decides everything. Maharaj, you can have it as you like. You can distinguish in your life a pattern or see merely a chain of accidents. Explanations are meant to please the mind. They need not be true. Reality is indefinable and indescribable. Question, sir, you are escaping my question. I want to know how you look at it. Wherever we look we find structure of unbelievable intelligence and beauty. How can I believe that the universe is formless and chaotic? Your world, the world in which you live may be formless, but it need not be chaotic. Meharaj, the objective universe has structure is orderly and beautiful. Nobody can deny it. But structure and pattern imply constraint and compulsion. My world is absolutely free. Everything in it is self-determined. Therefore I keep on saying that all happens by itself. There is order in my world too, but it is not imposed from outside. It comes spontaneously and immediately because of its timelessness. Perfection is not in the future. It is now. Question, does your world affect mine? Maharaj, at one point only at the point of the now. It gives it momentary being, a fleeting sense of reality. In full awareness the contact is established. It needs effortless, unself-conscious attention. Question. Is not attention an attitude of mind? Maharaj, yes when the mind is eager for reality it gives attention. There is nothing wrong with your world, it is your thinking yourself to be separate from it that creates disorder. Selfishness is the source of all evil. Question. I am coming back to my question. Before I was born, did my inner self decide the details of my life, or was it entirely accidental and at the mercy of heredity and circumstances? Meharaj, those who claim to have selected their father and mother and decided how they are going to live their next life may know for themselves. I know for myself. I was never born. Question. I see you sitting in front of me and replying my questions. Maharaj, you see the body only which of course was born and will die. Question. It is the life story of thus body mind that I am interested in. Was it laid down by you or somebody else or did it happen accidentally? Maharaj, there is a catch in your very question. I make no distinction between the body and the universe. Each is the cause of the other. Each is the other in truth. But I am out of it all. When I am telling you that I was never born, why go on asking me what were my preparations for the next birth? The moment you allow your imagination to spin, it at once spins out a universe. It is not at all as you imagine and I am not bound by your imaginings. Question. It requires intelligence and energy to build and maintain a living body. Where do they come from? Maharaj, there is only imagination. The intelligence and power are all used up in your imagination. It has absorbed you so completely that you just cannot grasp how far from reality you have wandered. No doubt imagination is richly creative. Universe within universe are built on it. Yet they are all in space and time past and future which just do not exist. Question. I have read recently a report about a little girl who was very cruelly handled in her early childhood. She was badly mutilated and disfigured and grew up in an orphanage, completely estranged from its surroundings. This little girl was quiet and obedient, but completely indifferent. One of the nuns who were looking after the children was convinced that the girl was not mentally retarded, but merely withdrawn irresponsive. A psychoanalyst was asked to take up the case and for full two years he would see the child once a week and try to break the wall of isolation. She was docile and well-behaved but would give no attention to her doctor. 
He brought her a toy house, with rooms and movable furniture and dolls representing father, mother, and their children. It brought out a response. The girl got interested. One day, the old hurts revived and came to the surface. Gradually, she recovered. A number of operations brought back her face and body to normal, and she grew into an efficient and attractive young woman. It took the doctor more than five years, but the work was done. He was a real guru. He did not put down conditions nor talk about readiness and eligibility. Without faith, without hope, out of love only he tried and tried again. Maharaj, yes, that is the nature of a guru. He will never give up. But to succeed he must not be met with too much resistance. Doubt and disobedience necessarily delay. Given confidence and pliability, he can bring about a radical change in the disciple speedily. Keep insight in the guru and earnestness in the disciple. Both are needed. Whatever was her condition, the girl in your story suffered for lack of earnestness in people. The most difficult are the intellectuals. They talk a lot but are not serious. What you call realization is a natural thing. When you are ready, your cure will be waiting. Sadhana is effortless. When the relationship with your teacher is right, you grow. Above all, trust him. He cannot mislead you. Question, even when he asks me to do something patently wrong? Maharaj, do it. A sannyasi had been asked by his guru to marry. He obeyed and suffered bitterly. But his four children were all saints and seers, the greatest in Maharashtra. Be happy with whatever comes from your guru, and you will grow to perfection without striving. Question, sir, have you any wants or wishes? Can I do anything for you? Maharaj, what can you give me that I do not have? Material things are needed for contentment. But I am contented with myself. What else do I need? Question, surely when you are hungry you need food and when sick you need medicine. Maharaj, hunger brings the food and illness brings the medicine. It is all nature's work. Question, Aleph I bring something I believe you need will you accept it? Maharaj, the love that made you offer will make me accept. Question, if somebody offers to build you a beautiful ashram, Maharaj, let him by all means. Let him spend a fortune, employ hundreds, feed thousands. Question, is it not a desire? Maharaj, not at all. I am only asking him to do it properly, not stingily, half-heartedly. He is fulfilling his own desire, not mine. Let him do it well and be famous among men and gods. Question, but do you want it? Maharaj, I do not want it. Question, will you accept it? Maharaj, I don't need it. Question, will you stay in it? Maharaj, if I am compelled. Question, what can compel you? Maharaj, love of those who are in search of light. Question, yes, I see your point. Now how am I to go into Samadhi? Maharaj, if you are in the right state, whatever you see will put you into Samadhi. After all, Samadhi is nothing unusual. When the mind is intensely interested, it becomes one with the object of interest. The seer and the seen become one in seeing, the hearer and the heard become one in hearing, the lover and the loved become one in loving. Every experience can be the ground for Samadhi. Question, are you always in a state of Samadhi? Maharaj, of course not Samadhi is a state of mind after all. I am beyond all experience, even of Samadhi. I am the great devourer and destroyer. Whatever I touch dissolves into void Akash. Question, I need Samadhis for self-realization. Maharaj, you have all the self-realization you need, but you do not trust it. Have courage, trust yourself, go talk, act. Give it a chance to prove itself. With some realization comes imperceptibly, but somehow they need convincing. They have changed, but they do not notice it. Such non-spectacular cases are often the most reliable. Question, can one believe himself to be realized and be mistaken? Maharaj, of course. The very idea I am self-realized is a mistake. There is no I am this. I am that in the natural state. Chapter 62 in the Supreme the Witness appears. 
Questioner. Some forty years ago J. Krishnamurti said that there is life only in all talk of personalities and individualities has no foundation in reality. He did not attempt to describe life, he merely said that while life need not and cannot be described, it can be fully experienced, if the obstacles to its being experienced are removed. The main hindrance lies in our idea of an addiction to time and our habit of anticipating a future in the light of the past. The sum total of the past becomes the I was, the hoped for future becomes that I shall be and life is a constant effort of crossing over from what I was to what I shall be. The present moment the now is lost sight of. Maharaj speaks of I am. Is it an illusion like I was and I shall be, or is there something real about it? And if the I am too is an illusion, how does one free oneself from it? The very notion of I am free of I am is an absurdity. Is there something real, something lasting about the I am in distinction from the I was, or I shall be, which change with time as added memories create new expectations? Maharaj, the present I am is as false as the I was and I shall be. It is merely an idea in the mind, an impression left by memory, and the separate identity it creates as fouls. This habit of referring to a false center must be done away with. The notion I see, I feel, I think, I do must disappear from the field of consciousness. What remains when the false is no more is real. Question. What is this big talk about elimination of the self? How can the self eliminate itself? What kind of metaphysical acrobatics can lead to the disappearance of the acrobat? In the end he will reappear, mightily proud of his disappearing. Maharaj, you need not chase the I am to kill it. You cannot. All you need is a sincere longing for reality. We call it Atma Bhakti, the love of the supreme, or Moksha Sankalpa, the determination to be free from the false. Without love, and will inspired by love, nothing can be done. Merely talking about reality without doing anything about it is self-defeating. There must be love in the relation between the person who says I am and the observer of that I am. As long as the observer, the inner self, the higher self, considers himself apart from the observed, the lower self, despises it and condemns it, the situation is hopeless. It is only when the observer Vyakta accepts the person Vyakti as a projection or manifestation of himself, and so to say, takes the self into the self, the duality of I and this goes and in the identity of the outer and the inner the supreme reality manifests itself. This union of the seer and the seen happens when the seer becomes conscious of himself as the seer, he is not merely interested in the seen, which he is anyhow, but also interested in being interested, giving attention to attention, aware of being aware. Affectionate awareness is the crucial factor that brings reality into focus. Question. According to the Theosophists and Allied Occultists, man consists of three aspects, personality, individuality, and spirituality. Beyond spirituality lies divinity. The personality is strictly temporary and valid for one birth only. It begins with the birth of the body and ends with the birth of the next body. Once over, it is over for good. Nothing remains of it except a few sweet or bitter lessons. The individuality begins with the animal man and ends with the fully human. The split between the personality and individuality is characteristic of our present-day humanity. On one side the individuality with its longing for the true, the good and the beautiful, on the other side an ugly struggle between habit and ambition, fear and greed, passivity and violence. The spirituality aspect is still in abeyance. It cannot manifest itself in an atmosphere of duality. Only when the personality is reunited with the individuality and becomes a limited, perhaps, but true expression of it, that the light and love and beauty of the spiritual come into their own. You teach of the Vyakti, Vyakta, Vyakta, observer, observed, and ground of observation. Does it tally with the other view? 
Maharaj, yes, when the Vyakti realizes its non-existence in separation from the Vyakta, and the Vyakta sees the Vyakti as his own expression, then the peace and silence of the Avyakta state come into being. In reality, the three are one. The Vyakta and the Avyakta are inseparable, while the Vyakti is the sensing-feeling-thinking process, based on the body made of and fed by the five elements. Question, what is the relation between the Vyakta and the Avyakta? Maharaj, how can there be relation when they are one? All talk of separation and relation is due to the distorting and corrupting influence of I am the body idea. The outer self Vyakti is merely a projection on the body mind of the inner self Vyakta, which again is only an expression of the supreme self Avyakta which is all and none. Question, there are teachers who will not talk of the higher self and lower self. They address the man as if only the lower self existed. Neither Buddha nor Christ ever mentioned a higher self. J. Krishnamurti too fights shy of any mention of the higher self. Why is it so? Maharaj, how can there be two selves in one body? The I am is one. There is no higher I am and lower I am. All kinds of states of mind, are presented to awareness and there is self-identification with them. The objects of observation are not what they appear to be and the attitudes they are met with are not what they need be. If you think that Buddha, Christ or Krishnamurti speak to the person, you are mistaken. They know well that the Vyakti, the outer self, is but a shadow of the Vyakta, the inner self, and they address and admonish the Vyakta only. They tell him to give attention to the outer self, to guide and help it, to feel responsible for it, in short, to be fully aware of it. Awareness comes from the Supreme and pervades the inner self. The so-called outer self is only that part of one's being of which one is not aware. One may be conscious for every being is conscious but one is not aware. What is included in awareness becomes the inner and partakes of the inner. You may put it differently. The body defines the outer self-consciousness, the inner, and in pure awareness the Supreme is contacted. Question, you said the body defines the outer self. Since you have a body, do you have also an outer self? Maharaj, I would were I attached to the body and take it to be myself. Question, but you are aware of it and attend to its needs. Maharaj, the contrary is near to truth, the body knows me and is aware of my needs. But neither is really so. This body appears in your mind, in my mind nothing is. Question, do you mean to say you are quite unconscious of having a body? Maharaj, on the contrary I am conscious of not having a body. Question, I see you smoking. Maharaj, exactly so. You see me smoking? Find out for yourself how did you come to see me smoking, and you will easily realize that it is your I am the body state of mind that is responsible for this, I see you smoking idea. Question, there is the body and there is myself. I know the body. Apart from it, what am I? Maharaj, there is no I apart from the body nor the world. The three appear and disappear together. At the root is the sense I am. Go beyond it. The idea, I am not the body is merely an antidote to the idea I am the body which is false. What is that I am? Unless you know yourself, what else can you know? Question, from what you say I conclude that without the body there can be no liberation. If the idea, I am not the body leads to liberation, the presence of the body is essential. Maharaj, quite right. Without the body, how can the idea... I am not the body come into being. The idea I am free is as false as the idea I am in bondage. Find out the I am common to both and go beyond. Question, all is a dream only. Maharaj, all are mere words of what use are they to you? You are entangled in the web of verbal definitions and formulations. Go beyond your concepts and ideas in the silence of desire and thought the truth is found. Question, one has to remember not to remember. What a task. Maharaj, it cannot be done of course. It must happen. But it does happen when you truly see the need of it. 
Again, earnestness is the golden key. Question, at the back of my mind there is a hum going on all the time. Numerous weak thoughts swarm and buzz and this shapeless cloud is always with me. Is it the same with you? What is at the back of your mind? Meharaj, where there is no mind there is no back to it. I am all front no back. The void speaks, the void remains. Question, is there no memory left? Meharaj, no memory of past pleasure or pain is left. Each moment is newly born. Question, without memory you cannot be conscious. Meharaj, of course I am conscious and fully aware of it. I am not a block of wood. Compare consciousness and its content to a cloud. You are inside the cloud while I look at. You are lost in it, hardly able to see the tips of your fingers while I see the cloud and many other clouds and the blue sky too and the sun, the moon, the stars. Reality is one for both of us, but for you, it is a prison and for me it is a home. Question. You spoke of the person Vyakti, the witness Vyakta and the Suprema Vyakta. Which comes first? Maharaj, in the Supreme the witness appears. The witness creates the person and thinks itself as separate from it. The witness sees that the person appears in consciousness which again appears in the witness. This realization of the basic unity is the working of the Supreme. It is the power behind the witness, the source from which all flows. It cannot be contacted, unless there is unity and love and mutual help between the person and the witness, unless the doing is in harmony with the being and the knowing. The Supreme is both the source and the fruit of such harmony. As I talk to you, I am in this state of detached but affectionate awareness, Teria. When this awareness turns upon itself, you may call it the Supreme State, Teria Tita. But the fundamental reality is beyond awareness, beyond the three states of becoming, being and not being. Question. How is it that here my mind is engaged in high topics and finds dwelling on them easy and pleasant? When I return home I find myself forgetting all I have learned here, worrying and fretting, unable to remember my real nature even for a moment. What may be the cause? Meharaj. It is your childishness you are returning to. You are not fully grown up. There are levels left undeveloped because unattended. Just give full attention to what in you is crude and primitive, unreasonable and unkind, altogether childish, and you will ripen. It is the maturity of heart and mind that is essential. It comes effortlessly when the main obstacle is removed in attention, unawareness. In awareness you grow. Chapter 63 Notion of doership is bondage. Questioner, we have been staying at the Saitya Sai Baba Ashram for some time. We have also spent two months at Sri Raman Ashram at Turavanamalai. Now we are on our way back to the United States. Maharaj, did India cause any change in you? Question, we feel we have shed our burden. Sri Satya Sai Baba told us to leave everything to him and just live from day to day as righteously as possible. Be good and leave the rest to me, he used to tell us. Maharaj, what were you doing at the Sri Ramana Ashram? Question, we were going on with the mantra given to us by the Guru. We also did some meditation. There was not much of thinking or study, we were just trying to keep quiet. We are on the back to eye path and rather poor in philosophy. We have not much to think about, just trust our Guru and live our lives. Meharaj, most of the Baptists trust their guru only as long as all is well with them. When troubles come, they feel let down and go out in search of another guru. Question, yes, we were warned against this danger. We are trying to take the heart along with a soft. The feeling, all is grace, must be very strong. A sad who was walking eastwards from where a strong wind started blowing. The sad who just turned round and walked west. We hope to live just like that, adjusting ourselves to circumstances as sent us by our Guru. Meharaj, there is only life. There is nobody who lives a life. Question, that we understand, yet constantly we make attempts to live our lives instead of just living. Making plans for the future seems to be an inveterate habit with us. Meharaj, whether you plan or don't life goes on. 
but in life itself a little whirl arises in the mind, which indulges in fantasies and imagines itself dominating and controlling life. Life itself is desireless, but the false self wants to continue pleasantly. Therefore, it is always engaged in ensuring one's continuity. Life is unafraid and free. As long as you have the idea of influencing events, liberation is not for you. The very notion of doership of being a cause is bondage. Question. How can we overcome the duality of the doer and the done? Maharaj, contemplate life as infinite, undivided, ever-present, ever-active until you realize yourself as one with it. It is not even very difficult, for you will be returning only to your own natural condition. Once you realize that all comes from within, that the world in which you live has not been projected onto you but by you, your fear comes to an end. Without this realization you identify yourself with the externals like the body, mind, society, nation, humanity, even God or the Absolute. But these are all escapes from fear. It is only when you fully accept your responsibility for the little world in which you live and watch the process of its creation, preservation and destruction, that you may be free from your imaginary bondage. Question, why should I imagine myself so wretched? Maharaj, you do it by habit only. Change your ways of feeling and thinking, take stock of them and examine them closely. You are in bondage by inadvertence. Attention liberates. You are taking so many things for granted. Begin to question. The most obvious things are the most doubtful. Ask yourself such questions as, Was I really born? Am I really so and so? How do I know that I exist? Who are my parents? Have they created me or have I created them? Must I believe all I am told about myself? Who am I anyhow? You have put so much energy into building a prison for yourself. Now spend as much on demolishing it. In fact, demolition is easy for the false dissolves when it is discovered. All hangs on the idea I am. Examine it very thoroughly. It lies at the root of every trouble. It is a sort of skin that separates you from the reality. The real is both within and without the skin, but the skin itself is not real. This I am idea was not born with you. You could have lived very well without it. It came later due to your self-identification with the body. It created an illusion of separation where there was none. It made you a stranger in your own world and made the world alien and inimical. Without the sense of I am life goes on. There are moments when we are without the sense of I am at peace and happy. With the return of the I am trouble starts. Question, how is one to be free from thy sense? Maharaj, you must deal with the I sense if you want to be free of it. Watch it in operation and at peace, how it starts and when it ceases, what it wants and how it gets it, till you see clearly and understand fully. After all, all the yogas, whatever their source and character, have only one aim, to save you from the calamity of separate existence, of being a meaningless dot in a vast and beautiful picture. You suffer because you have alienated yourself from reality and now you seek an escape from this alienation. You cannot escape from your own obsessions. You can only cease nursing them. It is because the I am is false that it wants to continue. Reality need not continue, knowing itself indestructible, it is indifferent to the destruction of forms and expressions. Strengthen and stabilize the I am we do all sorts of things, all in vain, for the I am is being rebuilt from moment to moment. It is unceasing work and the only radical solution is to dissolve the separative sense of I am such and such person once and for good. Being remains but not self-being. Question, I have definite spiritual ambitions. Must I not work for their fulfillment? Maharaj, no ambition is spiritual. All ambitions are for the sake of the I am. If you want to make real progress you must give up all idea of personal attainment. The ambitions of the so-called yogas are preposterous. A man's desire for a woman is innocence itself compared to the lusting for an everlasting personal bliss. The mind is a cheat. The more pious it seems, the worse the betrayal. 
question, people come to you very often with their worldly troubles and ask for help. How do you know what to tell them? Maharaj, I just tell them what comes to my mind at the moment. I have no standardized procedure in dealing with people. Question, you are sure of yourself. But when people come to me for advice, how am I to be sure that my advice is right? Maharaj, watch in what state you are from what level you talk. If you talk from the mind, you may be wrong. If you talk from full insight into the situation, with your own mental habits and abeyance your advice may be a true response. The main point is to be fully aware that neither you nor the man in front of you are mere bodies. If your awareness is clear and full, a mistake is less probable. Chapter 64 Whatever pleases you keeps you back. Questioner I am a retired chartered accountant and my wife is engaged in social work for poor women. Our son is leaving for the United States and we came to see him off. We are Panjabis but we live in Delhi. We have a Kuru of the Radha Somi faith and we value Sassing highly. We feel very fortunate to be brought here. We have met many holy people and we are glad to meet one more. Maharaj, you have met many anchorites and ascetics, but a fully realized man conscious of his divinity Swarupa is hard to find. The saints and yogis, by immense efforts and sacrifices, acquire many miraculous powers and can do much good in the way of helping people and inspiring faith, yet it does not make them perfect. It is not a way to reality, but merely an enrichment of the false. All effort leads to more effort, whatever was built up must be maintained, whatever was acquired must be protected against decay or loss. Whatever can be lost is not really one's own, and what is not your own of what use can it be to you? In my world nothing is pushed about, all happens by itself. All existence is in space and time, limited and temporary. He who experiences existence is also limited and temporary. I am not concerned either with what exists or with who exists. I take my stand beyond where I am both and either. The persons who, after much effort and penance, have fulfilled their ambitions and secured higher levels of experience and action, are usually acutely conscious of their standing. They grade people into hierarchies ranging from the lowest non-achiever to the highest achiever. To me all are equal. Differences in appearance and expression are there but they do not matter. Just as the shape of a gold ornament does not affect the gold, so does man's essence remain unaffected. Where this sense of equality is lacking it means that reality had not been touched. Mere knowledge is not enough, the knower must be known. The pandits and the yogis may know many things, but of what use is mere knowledge when the self is not known? It will be certainly misused. Without the knowledge of the knower there can be no peace. Question. How does one come to know the knower? Maharaj, I can only tell you what I know from my own experience. When I met my guru he told me, You are not what you take yourself to be. Find out what you are. Watch the sense I am, find your real self. I obeyed him because I trusted him. I did as he told me. All my spare time I would spend looking at myself in silence. And what a difference it made and how soon. It took me only three years to realize my true nature. My guru died soon after I met him, but it made no difference. I remembered what he told me and persevered. The fruit of it is here with me. Question, what is it? Maharaj, I know myself as I am in reality. I am neither the body nor the mind nor the mental faculties. I am beyond all these. Question, are you just nothing? Maharaj, come on be reasonable. Of course I am most tangibly. Only I am not what you may think me to be. This tells you all. Question, it tells me nothing. Maharaj, because it cannot be told. You must gain your own experience. You are accustomed to deal with things physical and mental. I am not a thing, nor are you. We are neither matter nor energy, neither body nor mind. Once you have a glimpse of your own being, you will not find me difficult to understand. We believe in so many things on hearsay. 
We believe in distant lands and people in heavens and hells, in gods and goddesses, because we were told. Similarly, we were told about ourselves, our parents' name, position, duties, and so on. We never cared to verify. The way to truth lies through the destruction of the false. To destroy the false, you must question your most inveterate beliefs. Of these, the idea that you are the body is the worst. With the body comes the world, with the world God, who is supposed to have created the world and thus it starts, fears, religions, prayers, sacrifices, all sorts of systems, all to protect and support the child man, frightened out of his wits by monsters of his own makin, realize that what you are cannot be born nor die and with the fear gone all suffering ends. What the mind invents the mind destroys. That the real is not invented and cannot be destroyed. Hold on to that over which the mind has no power. What I am telling you about is neither in the past nor in the future. Nor is it in the daily life as it flows in the now. It is timeless and the total timelessness of it is beyond the mind. My guru and his words, you or myself are timelessly with me. In the beginning I had to fix my mind on them, but now it has become natural and easy. The point when mind accepts the words of the Guru as true and lies by them spontaneously, and in every detail of daily life is the threshold of realization. In a way it is salvation by faith, but the faith must be intense and lasting. However, you must not think that faith itself is enough. Faith expressed in action is a sure means to realization. Of all the means it is the most effective. There are teachers who deny faith and trust reason only. Actually it is not faith they deny, but blind beliefs. Faith is not blind. It is the willingness to try. Question, we were told that of all forms of spiritual practices the practice of the attitude of a mere witness is the most efficacious. How does it compare with faith? Maharaj, the witness attitude is also faith, it is faith in oneself. You believe that you are not what you experience and you look at everything as from a distance. There is no effort in witnessing. You understand that you are the witness only and the understanding acts. You need nothing more, just remember that you are the witness only. If in this state of witnessing you ask yourself, who am I? The answer comes at once, though it is wordless and silent. Cease to be the object and become the subject of all that happens, once having turned within, you will find yourself beyond the subject. When you have found yourself, you will find that you are also beyond the object, that both the subject and the object exist in you, but you are neither. Question. You speak of the mind, of the witnessing consciousness beyond the mind and of the supreme which is beyond awareness. Do you mean to say that even awareness is not real? Maharaj, as long as you deal in terms, Real unreal awareness is the only reality that can be. But the supreme is beyond all distinctions and to it the term real does not apply, for in it all is real and therefore need not be labeled as such. It is the very source of reality. It imparts reality to whatever it touches. It just cannot be understood through words. Even a direct experience however sublime merely bears testimony nothing more. Question, but who creates the world? Maharaj, the universal mind Chittakash makes and unmakes everything. The supreme Paramakash imparts reality to whatever comes into being. To say that it is the universal love may be the nearest we can come to it in words. Just like love it makes everything real, beautiful, desirable. Question, why desirable? Maharaj, why not? Wherefrom come all the powerful attractions that make all created things respond to each other, that bring people together, if not from the supreme? Should not desire. See only that it flows into the right channels. Without desire you are dead. But with low desires you are a ghost. Question, what is the experience which comes nearest to the supreme? Maharaj, immense peace and boundless love, realize that whatever there is true, noble and beautiful in the universe, it all comes from you, that you yourself are at the source of it. 
the gods and goddesses that supervise the world may be most wonderful and glorious beings, yet they are like the gorgeously dressed servants who proclaim the power and the riches of their master. Question, how does one reach the supreme state? Meharaj, by renouncing all lesser desires. As long as you are pleased with the lesser, you cannot have the highest. Whatever pleases you keeps you back. Until you realize the unsatisfactoriness of everything, its transiency and limitation, and collect your energies in one great longing, even the first step is not made. On the other hand, the integrity of the desire for the Supreme is by itself a call from the Supreme. Nothing physical or mental can give you freedom. You are free once you understand that your bondage is of your own making and you cease forging the chains that bind you. Question, how does one find the faith in a guru? Maharaj, to find the guru and also the trust in him is rare luck. It does not happen often. Question, is it destiny that ordains? Maharaj, calling it destiny explains little. When it happens you cannot say why it happens, and you merely cover up your ignorance by calling it karma or grace, or the will of God. Question, Krishnamurti says that Guru is not needed. Maharaj, somebody must tell you about the supreme reality in the way that leads to it. Krishnamurti is doing nothing else. In a way he is right. Most of the so-called disciples do not trust their gurus. They disobey them and finally abandon them. For such disciples, it would have been infinitely better if they had no guru at all and just looked within for guidance to find a living guru is a rare opportunity and a great responsibility. One should not treat these matters lightly. You people are out to buy yourself the heaven, and you imagine that the guru will supply it for a price. You seek to strike a bargain by offering little but asking much. You cheat nobody except yourselves. Question. You were told by your guru that you are the supreme and you trusted him and acted on it. What gave you this trust? Maharaj, say I was just reasonable. It would have been foolish to distrust him. What interest could he possibly have in misleading me? Question. You told a questioner that we are the same, that we are equals. I cannot believe it. Since I do not believe it, of what use is your statement to me? Meharaj, your disbelief does not matter. My words are true and they will do their work. This is the beauty of noble company satsang. Question. Just sitting near you can it be considered spiritual practice? Meharaj, of course. The river of life is flowing. Some of its water is here, but so much of it has already reached its goal. You know only the present. I see much further into the past and future into what you are and what you can be. I cannot but see you as myself. It is in the very nature of love to see no difference. Question, how can I come to see myself as you see me? Maharaj, it is enough if you do not imagine yourself to be the body. It is the I am the body idea that is so calamitous. It blinds you completely to your real nature. Even for a moment do not think that you are the body. Give yourself no name, no shape. In the darkness and the silence reality is found. Question, must not I think with some conviction that I am not the body? Where am I to find such conviction? Maharaj, behave as if you were fully convinced and the confidence will come. What is the use of mere words? A formula, a mental pattern will not help you. But unselfish action, free from all concern with the body and its interests will carry you into the very heart of reality. Question, where am I to get the courage to act without conviction? Maharaj, love will give you the courage. When you meet somebody wholly admirable, love-worthy, sublime, your love and admiration will give you the urge to act nobly. Question, not everybody knows to admire the admirable. Most of the people are totally insensitive. Maharaj, life will make them appreciate. The very weight of accumulated experience will give them eyes to see. When you meet a worthy man, you will love and trust him and follow his advice. This is the role of the realized people, to set an example of perfection for others to admire and love.
beauty of life and character is a tremendous contribution to the common good. Question, must we not suffer to grow? Maharaj, it is enough to know that there is suffering that the world suffers. By themselves neither pleasure nor pain enlighten. Only understanding does. Once you have grasped the truth that the world is full of suffering, that to be born is a calamity, you will find the urge and the energy to go beyond it. Pleasure puts you to sleep and pain wakes you up. If you do not want to suffer, don't go to sleep. You cannot know yourself through bliss alone, for bliss is your very nature. You must face the opposite what you are not to find enlightenment. Chapter 65 A Quiet Mind is All You Need Questioner, I am not well. I feel rather weak. What am I to do? Maharaj, who is unwell, you are the body. Question, my body, of course. Maharaj, yesterday you felt well. What felt well? Question, the body. Maharaj, you are glad when the body was well and you are sad when the body is unwell. Who is glad one day and sad the next? Question, the mind. Maharaj, and who knows the variable mind? Question, the mind. Maharaj, the mind is the knower. Who knows the knower? Question, does not the knower know itself? Maharaj, the mind is discontinuous. Again and again it blanks out like in sleep or swoon or distraction. There must be something continuous to register discontinuity. Question, the mind remembers. This stands for continuity. Maharaj, memory is always partial, unreliable and evanescent. It does not explain the strong sense of identity pervading consciousness, the sense I am. Find out what is at the root of it. Question, however deeply I look I find only the mind. Your words beyond the mind give me no clue. Maharaj, while looking with the mind you cannot go beyond it. To go beyond, you must look away from the mind and its contents. Question, in what direction am I to look? Maharaj, all directions are within the mind. I am not asking you to look in any particular direction. Just look away from all that happens in your mind and bring it to the feeling I am. The I am is not a direction. It is the negation of all direction. Ultimately even the I am will have to go, for you need not keep on asserting what is obvious. Bringing the mind to the feeling I am merely helps in turning the mind away from everything else. Question, where does it all lead me? Maharaj, when the mind is kept away from its preoccupations it becomes quiet. If you do not disturb this quiet and stay in it, you find that it is permeated with a light and a love you have never known, and yet you recognize it at once as your own nature. Once you have passed through this experience, you will never be the same man again. The unruly mind may break its peace and obliterate its vision but it is bound to return, provided the effort is sustained, until the day when all bonds are broken, delusions and attachments end and life becomes supremely concentrated in the present. Question, what difference does it make? Maharaj, the mind is no more. There is only love in action. Question, how shall I recognize this state when I reach it? Maharaj, there will be no fear. Question, Surrounded by a world full of mysteries and dangers, how can I remain unafraid? Maharaj, your own little body too is full of mysteries and dangers, yet you are not afraid of it for you take it as your own. What you do not know is that the entire universe is your body, and you need not be afraid of it. You may say you have two bodies, the personal and the universal. The personal comes and goes, the universal is always with you. The entire creation is your universal body. You are so blinded by what is personal that you do not see the universal. This blindness will not end by itself. It must be undone skillfully and deliberately. When all illusions are understood and abandoned, you reach the error-free and perfect state in which all distinctions between the personal and the universal are no more. Question, I am a person and therefore limited in space and time. I occupy little space and last but a few moments, I cannot even conceive myself to be eternal and all-pervading. 
Maharaj, nevertheless you are. As you dive deep into yourself in search of your true nature, you will discover that only your body is small and only your memory is short, while the vast ocean of life is yours. Question. The very words I and universal are contradictory. One excludes the other. Maharaj, they don't. The sense of identity pervades the universal. Search and you shall discover the universal person, who is yourself and infinitely more. Anyhow, begin by realizing that the world is in you, not you in the world. Question, how can it be? I am only a part of the world. How can the whole world be contained in the part, except by reflection mirror-like? Meharaj, what you say is true. Your personal body is a part in which the whole is wonderfully reflected. But you have also a universal body. You cannot even say that you do not know it because you see and experience it all the time. Only you call it the world and are afraid of it. Question. I feel I know my little body while the other I do not know except through science. Meharaj. Your little body is full of mysteries and wonders which you do not know. There also science is your only guide. Both anatomy and astronomy describe you. Question. Even if I accept your doctrine of the universal body as a working theory, in what way can I test it and of what use is it to me? Maharaj, knowing yourself as the dweller in both the bodies you will disown nothing. All the universe will be your concern, every living thing you will love and help most tenderly and wisely. There will be no clash of interests between you and others. All exploitation will cease absolutely. Your every action will be beneficial, every movement will be a blessing. Question. It is all very tempting, but how am I to proceed to realize my universal being? Maharaj, you have two ways. You can give your heart and mind to self-discovery where you accept my words on trust and act accordingly. In other words, either you become totally self-concerned or totally unself-concerned. It is the word totally that is important. You must be extreme to reach the supreme. Question. How can I aspire to such heights small and limited as I am? Maharaj, realize yourself as the ocean of consciousness in which all happens. This is not difficult. A little of attentiveness of close observation of oneself, and you will see that no event is outside your consciousness. Question. The world is full of events which do not appear in my consciousness. Maharaj, even your body is full of events which do not appear in your consciousness. This does not prevent you from claiming your body to be your own. You know the world exactly as you know your body through your senses. It is your mind that has separated the world outside your skin from the world inside and put them in opposition. This created fear and hatred and all the miseries of living. Question, what I do not follow is what you say about going beyond consciousness. I understand the words, but I cannot visualize the experience. After all, you yourself have said that all experience is in consciousness. Maharaj, you are right there can be no experience beyond consciousness. Yet there is the experience of just being. There is a state beyond consciousness which is not unconscious. Some call it superconsciousness or pure consciousness or supreme consciousness. It is pure awareness free from the subject object nexus. Question I have studied Theosophy and I find nothing familiar in what you say. I admit Theosophy deals with manifestation only. It describes the universe and its inhabitants in great details. It admits many levels of matter and corresponding levels of experience, but it does not seem to go beyond. What you say goes beyond all experience. If it is not experienceable, why at all talk about it? Maharaj, consciousness is intermittent, full of gaps. Yet there is the continuity of identity. What does this sense of identity do to, if not to something beyond consciousness? Question. If I am beyond the mind, how can I change myself? Maharaj, where is the need of changing anything? The mind is changing anyhow all the time. Look at your mind dispassionately. This is enough to calm it. When it is quiet, you can go beyond it. Do not keep it busy all the time. 
Stop it and just be. If you give it rest, it will settle down and recover its purity and strength. Constant thinking makes it decay. Question. If my true being is always with me, how is it that I am ignorant of it? Maharaj, because it is very subtle and your mind is gross, full of gross thoughts and feelings. Calm and clarify your mind and you will know yourself as you are. Question, do I need the mind to know myself? Maharaj, you are beyond the mind but you know with your mind. It is obvious that the extent, depth and character of knowledge depend on what instrument you use. Improve your instrument and your knowledge will improve. Question, to know perfectly I need a perfect mind. Maharaj, a quiet mind is all you need. All else will happen rightly once your mind is quiet. As the sun on rising makes the world active, so does self-awareness affect changes in the mind. In the light of calm and steady self-awareness inner energies wake up and work miracles without any effort on your part. Question. You mean to say that the greatest work is done by not working? Maharaj, exactly. Do understand that you are destined for enlightenment. Cooperate with your destiny, don't go against it, don't thwart it. Allow it to fulfill itself. All you have to do is to give attention to the obstacles created by the foolish mind. Chapter 66 All Search for Happiness is Misery Questioner I have come frown England and I am on my way to Madras. There I shall meet my father, and we shall go by car overland to London. I am to study psychology, but I do not yet know what I shall do when I get my degree. I may try industrial psychology, or psychotherapy. My father is a general physician, I may follow the same line. But this does not exhaust my interests. There are certain questions which do not change with time. I understand you have some answers to such questions and this made me come to see you. Maharaj, I wonder whether I am the right man to answer your questions. I know little about things and people. I know only that I am and that much you also know. We are equals. Question, of course I know that I am. But I do not know what it means. Maharaj, what you take to be the I and I am is not you. To know that you are is natural, to know what you are is the result of much investigation. You will have to explore the entire field of consciousness and go beyond it. For this you must find the right teacher and create the conditions needed for discovery. Generally speaking there are two ways, external and internal. Either you live with somebody who knows the truth and submit yourself entirely to his guiding and molding influence, or you seek the inner guide and follow the inner light wherever it takes you. In both cases your personal desires and fears must be disregarded. You learn either by proximity or by investigation the passive or the active way. You either let yourself be carried by the river of life and love represented by your guru, or you make your own efforts, guided by your inner star. In both cases you must move on, you must be earnest. Rare are the people who are lucky to find somebody worthy of trust and love. Most of them must take the hard way, the way of intelligence and understanding, of discrimination and detachment viveka veragia. This is the way open to all. Question. I am lucky to have come here. Though I am leaving tomorrow, one talk with you may affect my entire life. Maharaj, yes, once you say I want to find truth, all your life will be deeply affected by it. All your mental and physical habits, feelings and emotions, desires and fears, plans and decisions will undergo a most radical transformation. Question, once I have made up my mind to find the reality, what do I do next? Maharaj, it depends on your temperament. If you are earnest, whatever way you choose will take you to your goal. It is the earnestness that is the decisive factor. Question, what is the source of earnestness? Maharaj, it is the homing instinct which makes the bird return to its nest and the fish to the mountain stream where it was born. The seed returns to the earth when the fruit is ripe. Rightness is all. Question, and what will ripen me? Do I need experience? Maharaj, you already have all the experience you need otherwise you would not have come here. 
you need not gather any more, rather you must go beyond experience. Whatever effort you make, whatever method sadhana you follow, will merely generate more experience, but will not take you beyond. Nor will reading books help you. They will enrich your mind, but the person you are will remain intact. If you expect any benefits from your search material, mental or spiritual, you have missed the point. Truth gives no advantage. It gives you no higher status, no power over others. All you get is truth and the freedom from the false. Question. Surely truth gives you the power to help others. Maharaj, this is mere imagination however noble. In truth you do not help others because there are no others. You divide people into noble and ignoble and you ask the noble to help the ignoble. You separate, you evaluate, you judge and condemn in the name of truth you destroy it. Your very desire to formulate truth denies it because it cannot be contained in words. Truth can be expressed only by the denial of the false in action. For this you must see the false as false viveka and rejected varajya. Renunciation of the false is liberating and energizing. It lays open the road to perfection. Question. When do I know that I have discovered truth? Maharaj, when the idea this is true that is true does not arise. Truth does not assert itself, it is in the seeing of the false as false seen rejecting it. It is useless to search for truth when the mind is blind to the false. It must be purged of the false completely before truth can dawn on it. Question, but what is false? Maharaj, surely what has no being is false. Question, what do you mean by having no being? The false is there, hard as a nail. Maharaj, what contradicts itself has no being, or it has only momentary being which comes to the same, for what has a beginning and an end has no middle. It is hollow. It has only the name and shape given to it by the mind, but it has neither substance nor essence. Question, if all that passes has no being, then the universe has no being either. Maharaj, whoever denies it, of course the universe has no being. Question, what has? Maharaj, that which does not depend for its existence, which does not arise with the universe arising, nor set with the universe setting, which does not need any proof but imparts reality to all it touches. It is the nature of the false that it appears real for a moment. One could say that the true becomes the father of the false. But the false is limited in time and space and is produced by circumstances. Question, how am I to get rid of the false and secure the real? Maharaj, to what purpose? Question, in order to live a better, a more satisfactory life, integrated and happy. Maharaj, whatever is conceived by the mind must be false, for it is bound to be relative and limited. The real is inconceivable and cannot be harnessed to a purpose. It must be wanted for its own sake. Question, how can I want the inconceivable? Maharaj, what else is there worth wanting? Granted, the real cannot be wanted as a thing is wanted. But you can see the unreal as unreal and discard it. It is the discarding the false that opens the way to the true. Question, I understand, but how does it look in actual daily life? Maharaj, self-interest and self-concern are the focal points of the false. Your daily life vibrates between desire and fear. Watch it intently and you will see how the mind assumes innumerable names and shapes like a river foaming between the boulders. Trace every action to its selfish motive and look at the motive intently till it dissolves. Question, to live, one must look after oneself, one must earn money for oneself. Maharaj, you need not earn for yourself but you may have to for a woman and a child. You may have to keep on working for the sake of others. Even just to keep alive can be a sacrifice. There is no need whatsoever to be selfish. Discard every self-seeking motive as soon as it is seen and you need not search for truth. Truth will find you. Question. There is a minimum of needs. Maharaj, were they not supplied since you were conceived? Give up the bondage of self-concern and be what you are, intelligence and love in action. Question, but one must survive. Maharaj, you can't help surviving. 
The real you is timeless and beyond birth and death, and the body will survive as long as it is needed. It is not important that it should live long. A full life is better than a long life. Question, who is to say what is a full life? It depends on my cultural background. Maharaj, if you seek reality you must set yourself free of all backgrounds, of all cultures, of all patterns of thinking and feeling. Even the idea of being man or woman or even human should be discarded. The ocean of life contains all, not only humans. So first of all abandon all self-identification, stop thinking of yourself as such and such, so and so, this or that. Abandon all self-concern, worry not about your welfare, material or spiritual, abandon every desire, gross or subtle, stop thinking of achievement of any kind. You are complete here and now, you need absolutely nothing. It does not mean that you must be brainless and foolhardy, improvident or indifferent. Only the basic anxiety for oneself must go. You need some food, clothing and shelter for you and yours, but this will not create problems as long as greed is not taken for a need. Live in tune with things as they are and not as they are imagined. Question, what am I if not human? Maharaj, that which makes you think that you are a human is not human. It is but a dimensionless point of consciousness, a conscious nothing. All you can say about yourself is, I am. You are pure being awareness bliss. To realize that is the end of all seeking. You come to it when you see all you think yourself to be as mere imagination and stand aloof in pure awareness of the transient as transient, imaginary as imaginary, unreal as unreal. It is not at all difficult, but detachment is needed. It is the clinging to the false that makes the true so difficult to see. Once you understand that the false needs time and what needs time is false, you are nearer the reality, which is timeless ever in the now. Eternity in time is mere repetitiveness like the movement of a clock. It flows from the past into the future endlessly, an empty perpetuity. Reality is what makes the present so vital, so different from the past and future, which are merely mental. If you need time to achieve something it must be false. The real is always with you, you need not wait to be what you are. Only you must not allow your mind to go out of yourself in search. When you want something ask yourself, do I really need it? And if the answer is no, then just drop it. Question, must I not be happy? I may not need a thing, yet if it can make me happy should I not grasp it? Maharaj, nothing can make you happier than you are. All search for happiness is misery and leads to more misery. The only happiness worth the name is the natural happiness of conscious being. Question, don't I need a lot of experience before I can reach such a high level of awareness? Maharaj, experience leaves only memories behind and adds to the burden which is heavy enough. You need no more experiences. The past ones are sufficient. And if you feel you need more, look into the hearts of people around you. You will find a variety of experiences which you would not be able to go through in a thousand years. Learn from the sorrows of others and save yourself your own. It is not experience that you need but the freedom from all experience. Don't be greedy for experience, you need none. Question, don't you pass through experiences yourself? Maharaj, things happen around me but I take no part in them. An event becomes an experience only when I am emotionally involved. I am in a state which is complete, which seeks not to improve on itself. Of what use is experience to me? Question, one needs knowledge, education. Maharaj, to deal with things knowledge of things is needed. To deal with people you need insight sympathy. To deal with yourself you need nothing. Be what you are, conscious being and don't stray away from yourself. Question, university education is most useful. Maharaj, no doubt it helps you to earn a living. But it does not teach you how to live. You are a student of psychology. It may help you in certain situations. But can you live by psychology? Life is worthy of the name only when it reflects reality in action. 
No university will teach you how to live so that when the time of dying comes, you can say, I lived well, I do not need to live again. Most of us die wishing we could live again. So many mistakes committed, so much left undone. Most of the people vegetate but do not live. They merely gather experience and enrich their memory. But experience is the denial of reality, which is neither sensory nor conceptual, neither of the body nor of the mind, though it includes and transcends both. Question, but experience is most useful. By experience you learn not to touch a flame. Maharaj, I have told you already that knowledge is most useful in dealing with things. But it does not tell you how to deal with people and yourself, how to live a life. We are not talking of driving a car or earning money. For this you need experience. But for being a light unto yourself material knowledge will not help you. You need something much more intimate and deeper than mediate knowledge, to be yourself in the true sense of the word. Your outer life is unimportant. You can become a night watchman and live happily. It is what you are inwardly that matters. Your inner peace and joy you have to earn. It is much more difficult than earning money. No university can teach you to be yourself. The only way to learn is by practice. Right away begin to be yourself. Discard all you are not and go ever deeper. Just as a man digging a well discards what is not water, until he reaches the water-bearing strata, so must you discard what is not your own, till nothing is left which you can disown. You will find that what is left is nothing which the mind can hook on to. You are not even a human being. You just are a point of awareness coextensive with time and space and beyond both, the ultimate cause itself uncaused. If you ask me, who are you? My answer would be, nothing in particular. Yet I am. Question. If you are nothing in particular then you must be the universal. Maharaj, what is to be universal not as a concept but as a way of life? Not to separate, not to oppose, but to understand and love whatever contacts you, is living universally. To be able to say truly, I am the world, the world is me, I am at home in the world, the world is my own. Every existence is my existence, every consciousness is my consciousness, every sorrow is my sorrow and every joy is my joy. This is universal life. Yet, my real being, and yours too, is beyond the universe and therefore beyond the categories of the particular and the universal. It is what it is, totally self-contained and independent. Question, I find it hard to understand. Maharaj, you must give yourself time to brood over these things. The old grooves must be erased in your brain, without forming new ones. You must realize yourself as the immovable, behind and beyond the movable, the silent witness of all that happens. Question. Does it mean that I must give up all idea of an active life? Meharaj, not at all. There will be marriage, there will be children, there will be earning money to maintain a family. All this will happen in the natural course of events, for destiny must fulfill itself. You will go through it without resistance, facing tasks as they come, attentive and thorough, both in small things and big. But the general attitude will be of affectionate detachment, enormous goodwill without expectation of return, constant giving without asking. In marriage you are neither the husband nor the wife. You are the love between the two. You are the clarity and kindness that makes everything orderly and happy. It may seem vague to you, but if you think a little, you will find that the mystical is most practical, for it makes your life creatively happy. Your consciousness is raised to a higher dimension, from which you see everything much clearer and with greater intensity. You realize that the person you became at birth and will cease to be at death is temporary and false. You are not the sensual, emotional and intellectual person gripped by desires and fears. Find out your real being. What am I? Is the fundamental question of all philosophy and psychology. Go into it deeply. Chapter 67. Experience is not the real thing. Maharaj, the seeker is he who is in search of himself. Soon he discovers that his own body he cannot be. 
Once the conviction, I am not the body becomes so well grounded that he can no longer feel, think and act for and on behalf of the body, he will easily discover that he is the universal being, knowing, acting, that in him and through him the entire universe is real, conscious and active. This is the heart of the problem. Either you are body conscious and a slave of circumstances, or you are the universal consciousness itself, and in full control of every event. Yet consciousness, individual or universal, is not my true abode. I am not in it, it is not mine, there is no me in it. I am beyond, though it is not easy to explain how one can be neither conscious nor unconscious, but just beyond. I cannot say that I am in God or I am God. God is the universal light and love, the universal witness. I am beyond the universal even. Questioner, in that case you are without name and shape. What kind of being have you? Maharaj, I am what I am, neither with form nor formless, neither conscious nor unconscious. I am outside all these categories. Question, you are taking the neti neti not this, not this approach. Maharaj, you cannot find me by mere denial. I am as well everything as nothing. Nor both, nor either. These definitions apply to the Lord of the universe, not to me. Question, do you intend to convey that you are just nothing? Maharaj, oh no! I am complete and perfect. I am the beingness of being, the knowingness of knowing, the fullness of happiness. You cannot reduce me to emptiness. Question, if you are beyond words what shall we talk about? Metaphysically speaking what you say holds together, there is no inner contradiction. But there is no food for me in what you say. It is so completely beyond my urgent needs. When I ask for bread you are giving jewels. They are beautiful no doubt but I am hungry. Meharaj, it is not so. I am offering you exactly what you need awakening. You are not hungry and you need no bread. You need cessation relinquishing disentanglement. What you believe you need is not what you need. Your real need I know not you. You need to return to the state in which I am, your natural state. Anything else you may think of is an illusion and an obstacle. Believe me, you need nothing except to be what you are. You imagine you will increase your value by acquisition. It is like gold imagining that an addition of copper will improve it. Elimination and purification, renunciation of all that is foreign to your nature is enough. All else is vanity. Question, it is easier said than done. A man comes to you with stomach ache, and you advise him to disgorge his stomach. Of course without the mind there will be no problems. But the mind is there most tangibly. Meharaj, it is the mind that tells you that the mind is there. Don't be deceived. All the endless arguments about the mind are produced by the mind itself, for its own protection, continuation and expansion. It is the blank refusal to consider the convolutions and convulsions of the mind that can take you beyond it. Question, sir I am an humble seeker while you are the supreme reality itself. Now the seeker approaches the supreme in order to be enlightened. What does the supreme do? Maharaj, listen to what I keep on telling you and do not move away from it. Think of it all the time and of nothing else. Having reached that far abandon all thoughts, not only of the world, but of yourself also. Stay beyond all thoughts in silent being awareness. It is not progress for what you come to is already there and you waiting for you. Question, so you say I should try to stop thinking and stay steady in the idea, I am. Maharaj, yes, and whatever thoughts come to you in connection with the I am, empty them of all meaning, pay them no attention. Question, I happen to meet many young people coming from the West and I find that there is a basic difference when I compare them to the Indians. It looks as if their psyche and takarana is different. Concepts like self, reality, pure mind, universal consciousness the Indian mind grasps easily. They ring familiar, they taste sweet. The Western mind does not respond or just rejects them. It concretizes and wants to utilize at once in the service of accepted values. These values are often personal, health, well-being, prosperity. 
sometimes they are social, a better society, a happier life for all. All are connected with worldly problems, personal or impersonal. Another difficulty one comes across quite often in talking with the Westerners is that to them everything is experience, as they want to experience food, drink and women, art and travels, so do they want to experience yoga, realization and liberation. To them it is just another experience to be had for a price. They imagine such experience can be purchased and they bargain about the cost. When one guru quotes too high in terms of time and effort, they go to another who offers installment terms, apparently very easy, but beset with unfulfillable conditions. It is the old story of not thinking of the gray monkey when taking the medicine. In this case it is not thinking of the world, abandoning all selfhood, extinguishing every desire, becoming perfect celibates, etc. Naturally there is vast cheating going on all levels and the results are nil. Some gurus in sheer desperation abandon all discipline, prescribe no conditions, advise effortlessness, naturalness, simply living in passive awareness, without any pattern of must and must not, and there are many disciples whose past experiences brought them to dislike themselves so badly that they just do not want to look at themselves. They are not disgusted, they are bored. They have surfeit of self-knowledge, they want something else. Maharaj, let them not think of themselves if they do not like it. Let them stay with a guru, watch him think of him. Soon they will experience a kind of bliss quite new, never experienced before except maybe in childhood. The experience is so unmistakably new that it will attract their attention and create interest. Once the interest is roused, orderly application will follow. Question, these people are very critical and suspicious. They cannot be otherwise, having passed through much learning and much disappointment. On one hand they want experience, on the other they mistrust it. How to reach them God alone knows. Maharaj, true insight and love will reach them. Question, when they have some spiritual experience, another difficulty arises. They complain that the experience does not last, that it comes and goes in a haphazard way. Having got hold of the lollipop, they want to suck it all the time. Maharaj, experience however sublime is not the real thing. By its very nature it comes and goes. Self-realization is not an acquisition. It is more of the nature of understanding. Once arrived at it cannot be lost. On the other hand, consciousness is changeful, flowing, undergoing transformation from moment to moment. Do not hold on to consciousness and its contents. Consciousness held ceases. To try to perpetuate a flash of insight or a burst of happiness is destructive of